The Trail of the Fox. The Search for the True. Field Marshal Rommel. First published 1977. On the Trail of the Fox. IT is May 18, 1944. At Hitler's war conference he is told that the enemy has carried out two spy operations during the night on the heavily defended French coastline. At one place, near Calais, German troops have found shovels and a flashlight lying on the beach after a shootout. At another, in the estuary of the River Somme, two British officers have been captured. They came ashore by rubber dinghy, General Alfred Jodl, chief of Wehrmacht operations, tells Hitler. Their interrogations so far have revealed that they were set down by a British motor launch. The scene changes to a French chateau built against a steep rock face overlooking the Seine Valley. It is two days later. A small German army staff car swerves into the driveway to the chateau and comes to a halt. Two soldiers climb out, stiff from their 150-mile drive from the coast of the English Channel. They lead two other men, blindfolded and handcuffed, from the car. These two men wear no insignia, but the empty stitching on their khaki battle dress shows all too clearly where the purple combined operations badge and the narrow special service shoulder flash have been removed, they are British commandos. Their blindfolds are untied, and they blink in the sunlight. Their expressions are grim, they know that Hitler has given standing orders that all commandos are to be turned over to the Gestapo and shot. When they are pushed into their cells, they find tea and sandwiches waiting for them. One of them, Lieutenant Roy Woodridge, curtly refuses to talk. The other, Lieutenant George Lane, is less tight-lipped and is taken to see Colonel Hans Georg von Templehof. A suave and handsome blonde, Templehof stands up and holds out his hand. It must be very beautiful in England just now, he says pleasantly. Lane's face betrays his surprise at the colonel's flawless English. Templehoff explains, my wife is English. For a moment he stands eyeing Lane, then briskly directs him to wash his face and hands, clean his fingernails and smarten himself up. You're going to meet somebody very important. Very important indeed. Field Marshal Rommel. The Allied invasion of Nazi-occupied France is just 17 days away. In English harbours a mighty invasion fleet is assembling for the operation. Here in France, Hitler has put one man in command, his favourite field marshal, Erwin Rommel, the celebrated Desert Fox. Rommel is a veteran of campaigns against the British and Americans. He knows what makes them tick. He believes he can anticipate their every move. Luftwaffe reconnaissance planes have sighted landing craft massing across the channel from the Somme estuary. This latest commando spy operation on that very coastline confirms to him that this is where the Allied invasion will come. How is Rommel to know that the landing craft are dummies and that these commandos have been deliberately played into Nazi hands to feed misleading information to him? It is all part of a deception plan code named Fortitude, masterminded by British intelligence. Rommel has chosen this chateau as his tactical headquarters because it is honeycombed with cellars. He has blasted more bomb-proof tunnels deep into the cliffs behind it. For the last five months he has been preparing the German army for the coming battle and devising ingenious and deadly anti-invasion defenses, spiked staves, barbs, submerged booby traps, minefields and entanglements. He is not surprised that the British are willing to take risks to find out what he is up to. As Lane is brought into Rommel's study, the field marshal is seated at his desk in the far corner, gazing out of his window. It is a long room, hung with four priceless tapestries, rare carpets lie upon the highly polished floor, vases and lamps of ancient porcelain stand along the walls. Rommel himself is a short, stocky man with receding close cropped hair, a set jawline and penetrating grey-blue mastiff eyes. He is stand from weeks of touring the new coastal fortifications. At his throat glitters the rare blue and gold cross of the Paula Merite, the highest medal in Prussia's power to give, awarded him in 1917. Rommel rises, walks around his desk and courteously greets the British officer. 
Then he motions Lane over to a low round table, surrounded by antique chairs, on which orderlies have laid a rather incongruous collection of cheap metal teapots and exquisite bone china. So you're one of those commando gangsters? Rommel asks the prisoner. I'm a commando and proud of it. But not a gangster. None of us are. Perhaps you aren't a gangster, but we've had some nasty experiences with you commandos. They haven't always behaved as impeccably as they should. Rommel smiles distantly. You're in a bit of a spot. You know what we do with saboteurs. Lane turns to the interpreter and comments, if your field marshal thinks I'm a saboteur he wouldn't have invited me here. So you regard this as an invitation? Asks Rommel, grinning. Lane bows slightly. I do, and I must say I'm highly honored. At this everybody chuckles. Rommel casually inquires, how's my old friend General Montgomery? Very well, thank you, replies Lane. I hear he's planning some sort of invasion. Rommel feigns surprise. You mean there really is going to be one? So the Times tells us, the prisoner answers, and it's usually reliable enough. You realize this is going to be the first time that the British have had to put up a proper fight? What about Africa, then? That was child's play, scoffs Rommel. The only reason I had to retreat there was that no more supplies were getting through to me. For twenty minutes Rommel reminisces about the war and lectures Lane on Britain and its fading empire and on the great future of Hitler's Third Reich. Lane listens spellbound and finally asks permission to put a question himself, would your excellency tell me whether you regard military occupation as an ideal situation for a vanquished country? Rommel argues that by their very upbringing soldiers make ideal dictators. Soldiers are accustomed to crisis, they know how to master even the direst emergency. If you travel around occupied France today and keep your eyes open, you'll see everywhere just how happy and contented the French people are. For the first time they know just what they have to do, because we are telling them. And that's the way the man in the street likes it. After a time the blindfold is replaced on Lieutenant Lane. In this brief interview something of Rommel's magnetism has electrified him, and as he is led out to the car to resume his journey to a prison camp and safety, as the field marshal has personally guaranteed, Lane grasps the arm of Colonel Anton Storbuzer, Rommel's intelligence officer. Do me one favor, he says. Tell me, where am I now? Storbuser politely refuses, for security reasons. Lane tightens his grip and pleads with him, I swear I'll never tell anyone. But when this war's over I want to come back here with my wife and children, I want to show them where I met Rommel. The records that relate Erwin Rommel's illustrious career are now widely scattered in archives throughout the Western world. This story of the commandos, for example, is documented in the German army's interrogations of the two British prisoners, and these interrogations are among the papers of a former German intelligence officer, stored in the Black Forest. The incident is referred to also in the shorthand notes taken on Hitler's daily war conferences, deposited in an American university. It is recounted in the private diaries of German officers close to Rommel, and in the recollections of George Lane himself which he wrote when he returned to England. To get beyond the myth marshal of historiography and discover the true Rommel, one must search in sources such as these. The trail of the fox leads from vaults in West Germany to government files in Washington, from a military museum in South Carolina to presidential libraries in Kansas and Missouri, from the drawing rooms of Rommel's surviving comrades to the musty attics with their tantalizing boxes and files of papers as yet unopened by the widows and families of the comrades who died. These records conduct us through the hills of Rommel's native Swabia, up alpine gorges, across the sand-swept tableland of Cyrenaica, to the tangled bocage of Normandy. Sometimes the trail grows faint, or vanishes. There are gaps in the evidence that none of the documents, memoirs or interviews can fill. Those aspects of Rommel must remain a mystery. But the trail leads eventually to a fuller understanding of this extraordinary man, and to the final mystery, 
why he chose to die as he did. In 1944 Rommel was already a living legend. He was known as a great commander in the field, distinguished by that rare quality, a feeling for the battle. Bold, dashing and handsome, he was relentless in combat, magnanimous in victory and gracious to his vanquished enemies. He seemed invincible. Where he was, there was victory, he attacked like a tornado, and even when he withdrew, his enemies followed very gingerly indeed. What were the principal elements of the Rommel myth in 1944? The first was his romantic image, a general, small in stature, with a vulpine cunning and a foxy grin, time and time again confounding a vastly superior enemy. He was regarded as a modern Hannibal, running rings around his foes, bewildering them, demoralizing them and snatching victory after victory until force majeure obliged even Rommel to cut his losses and retreat. He was young for his rank, a born leader, adored by his troops. He was said to have revived a long forgotten style of chivalrous warfare. In a war brutalized by the Nazi extermination camp and the Allied strategic bomber, Rommel's soldiers were ordered to fight clean. Prisoners were taken and then treated well, he ignored Hitler's order to execute captured members of the Jewish brigade. Private property was respected. In his files, dated October 15, 1943, is his secret instruction to all his commanders in Italy forbidding arbitrary looting, to preserve the discipline and respect of the German Wehrmacht. He rejected the use of forced labor in France, workers were to be recruited and paid in the normal way. He disregarded Hitler's notorious commando order of October 1942, which made the execution of captured enemy commandos mandatory. When destitute Arabs were hired by the enemy to sabotage Axis installations, Rommel refused to encourage reprisals or the shooting of hostages. It is better to allow such incidents to go unavenged than to hit back at the innocent, he said later. He took no delight in the death of an enemy soldier. A Montgomery would order, kill the Germans wherever you find them. An Eisenhower would proclaim, as far as I am concerned, any soldier that is killing a German is somebody for whom I have a tremendous affection, and if I can give him something so he can kill two instead of one, by golly I am going to do it. Rommel never descended to such remarks. He outwitted, bluffed, deceived, cheated the enemy. It was said that his greatest pleasure was to trick his opponents into premature and often quite needless surrender. He was, most spectacularly, a battlefield general eagerly flinging himself into the fray, oblivious to danger. No enemy shell could cut him down, though men to his right and left were shot away, no mine could shatter his body, no bomb would fall near enough to kill him. He seemed immortal. So powerful was Rommel's myth that it captivated even his enemies. The Allies unwittingly and then later deliberately publicized his invincibility, at first to explain away their own misfortunes in battle against him, then to make their victories over him seem worth that much more, and finally to conjure up a kind of anti-villain, a benign Nazi in contrast with whom the regular run of Nazis would seem all the more despicable. The time came when Rommel's name alone was worth entire divisions. When he fell ill, his name was left on the battlefield to fight on in absentia. When the enemy realized that he was indeed gone, they anxiously speculated where the fox could now be. The OSS files in Washington bulged with reports that Rommel was now commanding a secret army in Greece, in Romania, or Yugoslavia. Or was he really in Italy, or France? Twice he received the ultimate accolade, unprecedented in Allied military history assassins were sent to gun him down. Each time they missed. Like Hitler himself, Rommel seemed indestructible, and believed it himself. The mesmerization of the Allies was so extensive that in March of 1942 General Sir Claude Orchenlech, the British commander in North Africa, felt it necessary to warn his top officers in a memo, there is a real danger that our friend Rommel will turn into a bogeyman for our troops just because they talk so much about him. He is not superhuman, energetic and capable though he is. And even if he were a superhuman, it would be most undesirable for our soldiers to attribute supernatural powers to him. 
Four months later a copy of this admonition came into Rommel's hands after a battle on the Egyptian frontier, and he smiled at Orchin Lek's unconvincing postscript, I am not jealous of Rommel. Still later, Rommel learned that Orchin Lek's successor, Bernard Montgomery, had a framed portrait of Rommel hanging in his battle trailer. Rommel, however, was never bewitched by any of his enemies. In the thousands of pages of the Rommel diaries there is not one reference to an adversary by name. If the enemy was enthralled by Rommel, how much more were his own people? As early as 1941, Rommel was the name on every German's lips. No film star was ever so lionized. Generals writing to other generals kept referring to this Rommel phenomenon, in lines tinged with both admiration and drew. He won battles that other good generals would probably have lost, they granted him that. But he had learned his tactics and strategy on the battlefield, an imperfect school, for a general, combat experience was not enough. Rommel disdained the war academies and their trained and elegant products, the officers of the general staff, and he tried to do without the skills they set such store by, intelligence, logistics, signals, personnel operations. General Inno von Rintelen later said, scoffing, Rommel was just not a great strategist. He lacked the general staff training for that, and this put him at a large disadvantage. General Gerard von Schwerin, who fought under Rommel, said sardonically that Rommel learned a lot by his own mistakes. Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt spoke of him contemptuously as just a good division commander, but no more than that. Some of these criticisms were well founded, even so, they revealed underlying hostilities. Unlike many of the older general staff officers, Rommel was for most of his career a hardy supporter of Adolf Hitler and the new Germany, and this dedication repelled them. And there was envy. Much of it was fixed upon the publicity lavished upon Rommel as Hitler's favorite field marshal. It is true that Rommel quickly mastered the art of combat propaganda and appreciated its psychological effect on his own troops and also the enemy. A kind of Rommel cult emerged, a general later wrote. He seldom went anywhere without a posse of personal photographers. Many of the dramatic pictures of Rommel are as carefully posed as the famous raising the flag on Mount Zuribachi. The various tactical headquarters in Africa soon learned that one way to attract his good humor was to station men with cameras at his arrival point, even if they had no film in their cameras. This attention-seeking struck many generals as unprofessional and they found it galling. Among the private papers of tank expert General Heinz Guderian is a letter written from the Moscow battlefront in which he instructed his wife. Under no circumstances will I allow any propaganda belly who over me a la Rommel, and I can only strengthen you in your determination to prevent it. The envy of Rommel was expressed in many forms. Every week he used to talk on the telephone with Hitler in person, said one general, repeating the popular allegation about Rommel, and eagerly went over all his technical ideas with him. In fact, Rommel phoned Hitler only once during the entire war and was so pleased to speak with his Führer that he mentioned it in many letters afterward. Thus the envy was to some degree a product of the myth. We shall find that the jealousy of his fellow generals played a significant part in Rommel's own tragic end. When he needed friends among his peers, there were none. Since Rommel's death, his legend has grown. For many reasons, men have kept alive the fantasy image of the fox. In post-war West Germany, the reputations of other field marshals have been allowed to lapse, as if in embarrassment or even antipathy, but Rommel's name has been burnished. It has been given to a warship by the Navy, and the army has Rommel barracks in many a German town. There are Rommel streets, a unique distinction for any World War II German general, and there is even an alley named after his adjutant. His former enemies the Americans produced an adulatory film, The Desert Fox, and it was exceedingly popular. There has been little effort, however, to get behind the legend and come to terms with Rommel himself, was he a Nazi, to be despised, or a hero of the anti-Hitler resistance? This is one section of the trail we must pursue.
There is a moment in the Rommel story where he is in command of a panzer corps and has been advancing along an established, well-paved road. Suddenly he must take his entire reputation in both hands, abandon that road and plunge across a desert wilderness, uncharted and forbidding. It is like that with the trail on which we now set out. After a while we find that the legend is not enough. The follows an unknown land, into which we must now plunge. The Useful Soldier In a mid-Victorian building just off St. James's Park in London a safe is opened and a thick brown pasteboard folder tied with string is pulled out. The cover label was printed by the presses of the Prussian War Department long before the days of Hitler. It exudes the familiar stale paper smell that excites the senses of every trained historian, not that any other historian has been allowed to set eyes on this folder before. Annotation in English has been written on it, top secret. Personal file of Field Marshal Rommel and a copy of his way pass. The way pass, his service record book, is missing, no doubt removed by souvenir hunters. But the rest is there intact. The first documents state all the way back to March 1910, an 18-year-old youth, full name Johannes Erwin Eugen Rommel, a sixth former at the secondary school in the Swabian township of Gmund, is trying to get into the army. Erwin Rommel was a pale and often sickly youth. He had not set his heart on an army career. He had a mechanical bent and a vague hankering to be an aeronautical engineer. As a 14-year-old he, with a friend, had built a full-scale box-type glider in a field in nearby Aylan, there is a tiny, faded brown photograph of it among family papers. He proudly boasted in later years that the glider did fly, although not far. It was still a triumph, considering that this was 1906, the year of the first powered flight in Europe. His mother, Helene Rommel, was the daughter of a senior local dignitary, Reggie Rungs Brassid and von Lewes. Erwin took his looks from her, and adored her. His father was a schoolmaster, like his father's father before him. Headmaster of the secondary school at Aylan, Erwin Rommel, senior, was strict and pedantic. His short hair was slicked down to either side of a fashionable middle part and his stern pince-nez eyeglasses rode tightly on the dominating nose. The face was characterless, which even a bushy walrus moustache failed to conceal. After his death in 1913, Irwin would mainly remember that his father constantly pestered him with educational questions, what's the name of this building? What's the species of that flower? He was harsh and overbearing and once provoked Irwin's older brother, Carl, into attacking him with a chair. The family diverged in their careers. Brother Carl volunteered for the army, but only so as to avoid taking his final examinations. He became an army reconnaissance pilot, and his fine photographs of the pyramids and the Suez Canal are in the family papers. Gerard, youngest of the Rommel brothers, and still alive today, became a struggling opera singer. All three brothers and their sister, Helene, were closer to their mother than to their father, and his early death was little loss to them. It was Rommel's father, however who prodded the reluctant Irwin into the career for which he proved so splendidly suited. In a letter he recommended his schoolboy son to the Württemberg army as thrifty, reliable and a good gymnast. Both the artillery and the engineers rejected young Rommel's application, but in March 1910 the 124th Württemberg Infantry Regiment ordered him to report for a medical examination. The doctors found that he had an inguinal hernia but was otherwise acceptable. His father arranged for the necessary operation and signed the papers promising to pay for his son's upkeep and to buy him a uniform as a Farnan Junker, an officer cadet. On July 19, six days after leaving the hospital, 18-year-old Derwin joined his regiment. Soon afterward he was posted to the Royal Officer Cadet School in Danzig. In his personnel file are two faded sheets in Rommel's own handwriting. At that time a regular, spiky copper plate, setting out the brief story of his own young life in so far as he believed it would interest the army. Aylan, March 1910. I was born on November 15, 1891, 
at Heidenheim on the Brenz as the second son of the schoolmaster Erwin Rommel and his wife Helene, Nailius, both of the Protestant faith. As far as I can recall my early years passed very pleasantly as I was able to romp around Iard and Big Garden all day long. I was supposed to start primary school in the fall when I was seven, but as my father was promoted to headmaster at Ailen that year and there is no primary school there, I had to acquire the necessary knowledge by private tuition in order to be able to get into the elementary school at Ailen. Two years later I entered the Latin school, and stayed the five years. At about this time occurred the deaths of my dear maternal grandmother and my grandfather on my father's side as well. In the fall vacation of 1907 I had the misfortune to break my right ankle jumping over a stream. But the foot was well set and it has healed satisfactorily, so that despite even the most strenuous activities I have never noticed any after effects. In the fall of 1908 I started in the fifth grade of the Royal Secondary Modern School Latmund and a year later the sixth grade, to which I still belong. The subjects that have most attracted me of late are mathematics and science. I have occupied my spare time with homework and reading, and apart from that with physical exercises like cycling, tennis, skating, rowing, skiing, etc. Erwin Rommel when Rommel finished cadet school, in November 1911, the Commandant wrote an evaluation of the earnest young man. In rifle and drill work, said the Commandant, Rommel was quite good. At gymnastics, fencing and riding he was adequate. But, said the Commandant somewhat anxiously, he is of medium height, thin and physically rather awkward and delicate. Still the lad was firm in character with immense willpower and a keen enthusiasm. Orderly, punctual, conscientious and comradely. Mentally well endowed, a strict sense of duty. Cadet Rommel was, said the Commandant in prescient summary, a useful soldier. At Danzig, one of Germany's most beautiful Hanseatic ports, the cadets were obliged to attend regular formal balls in the officers' mess, functions of stifling propriety at which the daughters of the good Danzig citizens were invited to present themselves. Young Irwin's attention was captured by a particularly graceful dancer, Lucy Mollin, a slender beauty whose father, like Rommel's, had been headmaster of a secondary school, but was now dead, she had come to Danzig to study languages. At first she found Irwin overly serious, but soon they fell deeply in love. She was tickled by the way he sported a monocle in the Prussian fashion. He always tucked it out of sight when a superior officer met them in the city. Cadets were forbidden to wear monocles. When Irwin received his lieutenant's commission in January 1912, he had still not proposed to Lucy. Upon his return to Württemberg he began a daily correspondence with her, writing secretively to her in care of her local post office so that her mother could not intercept the letters. One photographic postcard to her pictures him in a straw hat at a period fashion ball. It is dated March 28, 1912. I received your nice card from your hometown, wrote Irwin. I'm still waiting for the photos. I'm going to get mad at you soon if you make me wait much longer. I'm looking forward hugely to your long letter. I hope you're going to make it really intimate. The photo that Lucy sent him was a stunner. She had just won a tango competition, and her looks certainly had not let her down. All her ancestors' Italian and Polish blood was to be seen in her finely drawn features, and one sees in the family photo album that as Lucy matured, her beauty grew as well. There is a conventional portrait of Lucy and Irwin, she in a dark, wide-brimmed hat, he in the ferocious spiked helmet of the Württemberg army. There is a later picture of them. Lucy by now a Red Cross nurse and Irwin with an iron cross pinned to his uniform. And there is the most charming picture of them all, of Lucy, by now his wife, sitting with her head demurely inclined while Lieutenant Irwin Rommel stands proudly behind her, with the suggestion of a moustache upon his lip and a rare medal for valor on a ribbon at his throat. The 124th Infantry was garrisoned in the ancient monastery at Wingarten near Stuttgart. For the next two years Rommel drilled recruits. He had little in common with the other lieutenants. 
virtually non-drinker and a non-smoker, he was serious beyond his age, dedicating himself with monastic devotion to his career. Nor did Rommel and the local women of Wingarten have time for each other. Later, in the years of his fame, he received many inviting letters from women, and he then said jokingly to Lucy, if only I had got all these offers when I was a young lieutenant. On March 1, 1914, Rommel was attached to the 49th Field Artillery Regiment at Ulm, not far from his hometown, and he was commanding a battery in this unit as the darkness of the First World War enveloped his fatherland. The original manuscript of his memoirs, later published as a book, vividly describes what he saw and felt at the time. Ulm, July 31, 1914. Uneasy lies the German countryside beneath the sinister threat of war. Grave and troubled faces are everywhere. Fantastic rumors are running wild and spreading with lightning speed. Since dawn the kiosks have been besieged by people, as one extra follows another. About 7 a.m. the 4th Battery of the 49th Field Artillery clatters across the city's ancient cobblestones, with the regimental band in front. The strains of the watch on the Rhine echo through the narrow streets. Every window is flung open, old and young join in the lusty singing. I am riding as platoon leader of the neat horse-drawn battery I have been attached to since March 1st. We trot out into the morning sun exercise as we have done on other days and then ride back to barracks again accompanied by thousands of cheering people. For me this is the last exercise with the artillery. As things are now growing very serious indeed, I must get back to my own parent regiment, the 124th Infantry, at all costs. I must get back to the riflemen of No. 7 Company, whose last two years recruits I have trained helped by my orderly, Hanl, I hastily pack my worldly possessions. After I reach Ravensburg late in the evening, I walk to our garrison town, Wingarten, with my pal Lieutenant Bayer who has come to meet me. We talk about the grave times ahead of us in war, particularly for us young infantry officers. In August 1914 the regimental barracks in the massive monastery at Wingarten is a beehive of activity outfitting in field grey. I report back from my posting and greet the men of seven company whom I'll probably be leading into battle. How all their young faces glow with joy, anticipation and fervor, surely there can be nothing finer than to lead such soldiers against an enemy. At 6 p.m. the whole regiment is on parade. After Colonel has has inspected his rifleman in field grey for the first time, he delivers a fiery speech. As we fall out, the mobilization order itself arrives. So this is it. An exultant shout of militant German youth echoes around the time-honored walls of the monastery. Our supreme commander is calling us to arms. What we have only just promised to our regimental commander we can and shall now prove by our deeds as well, faithful, unto death. As darkness fell next evening, Rommel watched his regiment leave Ravensburg station for the western frontier, with bands playing and crowds cheering. He himself followed three days later. The journey through Sway by as pretty valleys and meadows was unforgettable. The troops sang, and at each station they were welcomed with fruit, chocolates and bread. At Korn was time, wrote Rommel, I see my mother and two brothers and sister for a few moments. Then the locomotive whistles that it is time for farewells. One last look, a clasp of hands. We cross the Rhine at night, as searchlights finger the skies for enemy flyers and airships. The singing dies away. The riflemen fall asleep on seats and floors. I myself am standing on the loco's footplate, staring into the open firebox or out into the rustling and whispering of the oppressive summer night. Will I ever see my mother and family again? We arrive late on the afternoon of August 6, and we are happy to get out of the cramped transport train. We march through Diedenhofen to Rugsway Isle. Diedenhofen itself is not a pretty place. The streets and houses are dirty, the people hostile. It is also different from our sway by an homeland. We march briskly onward. As night falls, it begins to pour. Soon we are soaked to the skin. 
Our packs weigh us down. A fine start this is. We can hear sporadic shooting from the French frontier a few miles away. The captured Rommel personnel files exhaustively document his subsequent campaigns and battles. For more than two years he stayed on the slaughterhouse battlefields of France. In September at Vienne he was wounded by a ricocheting rifle bullet in his left thigh, characteristically for him, he was confronting three French soldiers alone and with an empty rifle. He was awarded the Iron Cross, second class. When he returned to the 124th Infantry from the hospital on January 13, 1915, it was fighting in grueling trench warfare in the Argonne Forest. Two weeks later he crawled with his rifleman through 100 yards of barbed wire into the main French positions, captured four bunkers, held them against a counter-attack by a French battalion and then withdrew before a new attack could develop, having lost less than a dozen men. This bravery won Rommel the Iron Cross, first class, the first for a lieutenant in the entire regiment. In July he was again injured, this time by shrapnel in one shin. He hoped to be sent to the new Turkish war theatre, and even began learning Turkish. But in October he was posted, as a company commander, to the new Württemberg Mountain Battalion. After a year of training, the battalion's six rifle companies and six mountain machine gun platoons were transferred to Romania, where the Germans were fighting the Russians. Even this early there was something that marked Trommel out from the rest. Theodor Werner, one of his platoon leaders, recalled, when I first saw him, in 1915, he was slightly built, almost schoolboyish, inspired by a holy zeal, always eager and anxious to act. In some curious way his spirit permeated the entire regiment right from the start, at first barely perceptibly to most but then increasingly dramatically until everybody was inspired by his initiative, his courage, his dazzling acts of gallantry. Later, Werner became Rommel's aide. Anybody who once came under the spell of his personality, Werner wrote, turned into a real soldier. However tough the strain he seemed inexhaustible. He seemed to know just what the enemy were like and how they would probably react. His plans were often startling, instinctive, spontaneous and not infrequently obscure. He had an exceptional imagination, and it enabled him to hit on the most unexpected solutions to tough situations. When there was danger, he was always out in front calling on us to follow. He seemed to know no fear whatever. His men idolized him and had boundless faith in him. January 1917 found Rommel commanding an Abtei e Lung, an ad hoc detachment varying in strength from three to seven mountain companies. Until July the battalion was again stationed in France, then it returned to the Romanian front. On August 10, only two days after his arrival there, Rommel was again wounded. A bullet fired from far in the rear passed through his left arm, but despite this injury Rommel fought on for two weeks. On September 26 his battalion was transferred to a far more demanding theater, northern Italy. Since entering the war in 1915, the Italians had been fighting Austria with the hope of winning back the Adriatic port of Trieste. By the time Rommel arrived, eleven battles had already been fought on the frontier river, the Isenzo. A year later the Italians staged their twelfth attempt, fifty infantry divisions supported by thousands of guns had crossed the middle reaches of the river. Heavily outnumbered, the Austrians appealed for help. In response, the German Supreme Command created a 14th Army, under General Otto von Below, to go to the Isenzo front. This was why in October 1917 Rommel again found himself marching toward the sound of gunfire. The battlefield here was very different from France, it was a breathtaking backdrop of towering mountains, bottomless ravines, treacherous precipices, swirling mists and rushing rivers. Every enemy shell burst threatened to bury General von Below's troops under avalanches of rocks, every shot filled the air with razor-sharp rock splinters that killed or maimed any man they hit. It rained heavily, which helped conceal Below's coming offensive from the Italian defenders. 
but the rain had turned mountain streams into raging torrents that swept officers, men and pack animals to their deaths. General von Below's aim was to penetrate the main defense line south of the Isonzo River. The high points of the line were the towering Monte Matea, Monte Cuke, Colovarat Ridge and Hill 1114. Tens of thousands of Italian troops and well-constructed gun sites commanded each of these high points, and the German unit commanders scrambled to take them, knowing that honors would be the reward. The rivalry among these young officers, leading proud units from the German provinces of Bavaria, Silesia and Rommel Swabia, was ferocious. Lieutenant Ferdinand Sona, a Bavarian commander, set the pace, driving his coughing, staggering volunteers so ruthlessly forward, despite their heavy loads of machine guns and ammunition, that one of his men dropped dead from exhaustion before the unit reached the objective, Hill 1114, key to the whole Colliverat Ridge. For taking Hill 1114, so Anna was awarded Prussia's highest medal, the Paula Merite. That outraged Rommel. He considered that the credit was due him. Rommel's part in breaching the Colverat position was indeed great. As night fell on that first day of the offensive, Sona's promising position had seemed thwarted by Italian fortifications. Rommel's superior, Major Theodos Proessa, commander of the Swabians, wrote a battle report, a faded copy of which still survives, which describes the emplacements. Like fortresses, he wrote, the strongly built concrete gun positions look out over us. They are manned by hard-bitten machine gunners, and bar our further advance to south and west. During the night Rommel reconnoitred the enemy defences and found a gap, and shortly after dawn his Abte Elung penetrated the Italian lines. Three hours later he stormed Montecuc itself. Finding Rommel in their ear, the Italians panicked, their line began to crumble and German infantry poured through the breach. But so Anna, the Bavarian, got the Paula Merite. Rommel was stung by this injustice, and after the war he asked the official army historian to make petty corrections to the record, he even arranged for future editions to read Lieutenant, not Arbolatnant, in referring to Sona, and he persuaded the Reich government to print a 14-page supplement which in part set out his own role in more vivid detail describing how 40 Italian officers and 1,500 men had surrendered to Oberleutnant Rommel, how he had pressed on ahead of his unit with only two officers and a few riflemen, how the Italians had surrounded and embraced him and cheered him on their shoulders and rejoiced that the war was over for them. This sort of prideful revisionism would become part of the Rommel style. But Rommel still had a chance for a Paula Merite. General von Below had specifically promised one to the first officer to stand atop the loftiest Italian high point, the 5,400-foot Monte Matera. Rommel intended to be that officer. His own 14-page supplement to the official army history tells the story, before the prisoners from the Hill 1114 engagement were removed. Some German-speaking Italians betrayed to Lieutenant Rommel that there was another regiment of the Salerno Brigade on Monte Matteo that definitely would put up a fight. Heavy machine gun fire did indeed open up as their Swabians reached the western slopes. By nightfall, after hours of hard fighting, Rommel was at the base of the last rise of Matteo. He and his men were dog-tired, but he drove them on. The report of his superior, Major Sproessa takes up the account, there is an Italian with a machine gun sitting behind virtually every rock, and all the appearances are that the enemy has no intention of giving up Monte Matteo so easily. Although their strength is almost at an end after 53 hours of continual full pack march and battle, Rommel's Abte Elung crawls into close quarters. After a hail of machine gun fire, which has a murderous splinter effect among the rocks, the enemy tries to escape into a ravine. Hesitantly, one Italian after another came out into the open and surrendered. At 11.30 am the last 120 men on the actual summit surrendered to Rommel. Ten minutes later he stood there himself. He ordered one white and three green flares fired to announce his triumph. 
Rommel had reached the top first and victory was his, all the sweeter, too, for having cost the life of only one of his men. The victory soon turned sour. Next day General Erich von Ludendorff, chief of the general staff, announced the capture of Monte Mattea, by the gallant Lieutenant Wall Vishenba, a Silesian company commander. Schimba accordingly carried off the prize promised by General von Below for the feat, the coveted Paula Merite. It was obvious to Rommel that Schimba had captured the wrong summit. Choking with anger, he complained to his battalion commander, Major Spruessa. Spruessa advised him to forget the matter, but Spruessa did mention in his dispatch of November 1st that during the hour that Rommel's Abte Elung had rested on the Matea's summit they never saw any signs of the Silesian regiment. Rommel was not satisfied, and, according to his own account many years later, he sent a formal complaint all the way up to the commander of the Alpine Corps, claiming that the medal belonged by rights to him. Silence was the only reply. This disappointment did not affect Rommel's fighting zeal. He stayed hard on the heels of the retreating Italians. His Abte Elung was at the head of Spruessa's battalion of Swabians, and that battalion was the spearhead of the whole 14th Army. On November 4 the river Taglimento was reached. Now Rommel began a relentless pursuit of the demoralized Italians, using the same tactics of bluff, bravado surprise attack and rapid pursuit that were to distinguish him later as a tank commander. He had found his metier. He had learned how to exploit sudden situations, even when it meant disobeying orders from superiors. He led his troops to the limits of human endurance so as to take the enemy by surprise, climbing through fresh snowfalls that were murder to the heavily laden men, scaling sheer rock faces that would give pause even to skilled mountaineers risking everything to work his handful of intrepid riflemen and machine gunners around behind the unsuspecting Italian defenders. He suddenly attacked the enemy, however greatly he was himself outnumbered, from the rear with devastating machine gun fire on the assumption that this was bound to shatter the morale of even the finest troops. His little force's victories were remarkable. On November 7, Rommel's companies stormed a 4,700-foot mountain and captured a pass. Two days later he launched a frontal attack on some seemingly invincible Italian defenses and captured another pass. Then followed an action of the purest Wild West, one that wonderfully illustrates Rommel's physical courage and endurance. He was following an extremely narrow and deep ravine toward the town of Longarone the kingpin of the entire Italian mountain defensive system. What Rommel found ahead of him was a road blasted into the vertical rock face soaring 600 feet above. The road first clung to one side of the ravine, then crossed to the other side by a long bridge precariously suspended some 500 feet above the ravine floor. Relentlessly the pursuit goes on toward Longarone, Major Spruessa wrote. Now the big bridge spanning the Vajon Travine lies ahead. Not a moment to lose. Lieutenant Rommel and his men dash across, tearing out every demolition fuse they can see. The Swabians took the next stretch of road at a trot. But when they emerged from the valley, they came under heavy rifle and machine gun fire from the direction of Longarone, about a half mile away. Between them and the town lay the river Piv. Almost at once a loud explosion signaled the demolition of the only bridge across the river. Through field glasses Rommel could see endless columns of Italians fleeing south on the far side of the river. The town itself was jam-packed with troops and war paraphernalia. He ordered one of his companies and a machine gun platoon to advance downstream. He himself went with them, then watched as eighteen of his men successfully braved the Piv's fast-flowing waters under violent enemy machine gun fire. More men followed and by 4 p.m. they had established a position on the other shore, a short distance south of Longarone. From there they could block the road and railway line leading out of town. Over the next two hours this small force disarmed 800 Italian soldiers who ran into their trap. As dusk fell, Rommel himself forded the river, followed by five companies of troops. Taking a small party, he began to advance on Longarone. Stumbling into a street barricade manned by Italian machine gunners, 
Rommel ordered a temporary retreat, and now the Italians began running after him. It was a tricky situation, there were some 10,000 Italian troops in Longarone, so Rommel was vastly outnumbered. In fact, he had only 25 men with him at that moment, and when the Italian officers saw how puny Rommel's force was, they confidently ordered their men to open fire. All Rommel's force here was wounded or captured, but he himself managed to slip away into the shadows. He reassembled his Abte Elung just south of Longarone in the darkness. Six more times the Italian mob tried to overrun him, but six times Rommel's machine gunners sent them running for cover back into the town. To prevent the enemy from outflanking him in the darkness, Rommel set fire to the houses along the road, illuminating the battlefield. By midnight, reinforcements began arriving from Major Spruessa and from an Austrian division. Rommel decided to renew the attack at dawn. His official account concludes, there is, however, no more fighting to be done. South of Rivalta, Rommel's Abte Elung meets Lieutenant Serfel, who was taken prisoner during the night's skirmish, coming toward them. Behind him follow hundreds of Italians, waving all manner of flags. Lieutenant Serfel brings the glad tidings of the surrender of all enemy forces around Longarone, written by the Italian commander. An entire enemy division has been captured. Exhausted and soaking wet, their warriors fall into well-earned beds in fine billets and sleep the sleep of dead men. In his later published account of the Battle of Longarone, Rommel romanticized. There he described how he himself had swum the icy piv at the head of his Abtei Lung. Yet there can be no doubt of his own physical courage in battle, even if these 1917 victories over the Italians were purchased relatively cheaply. In the ten-day battle ending in the Italians' humiliating defeat at Longarone, Spruessa's entire battalion lost only 13 enlisted men and one officer. He fell off a mountain. At Longarone, Rommel captured 8,000 Italians in one day. Not for another quarter century would Rommel really meet his match. One month later, the Kaiser gave him the tribute he ached for, the matchless Paula Merite. The citation said it was for breaching the Colivret line, storming Matea and capturing Longarone. Rommel preferred to attribute it to Matea alone, unless he was in Italian company, then he took a certain sly pleasure in saying he won it at Longarone. Rommel was never diplomatic. After that he always wore the distinctive cross on a ribbon around his neck. But he sensed the envy that his fellow officers felt about it. He told his old school friend Hans Seitz years later, you can't imagine how jealous the officers are of my Paula Merite. There's no spirit of comradeship at all. There weren't many men entitled to wear the medal, a Maltese cross of dazzling electric blue enamel trimmed in gold, on a black and silver ribbon. Most of them, men like air heroes Ernst Hutt, Werner Molders, and Baron von Richthofen, became legends in their own lifetime. Where is Rommel's medal now? In a little village office in Swabia is a cheap metal cupboard, pretentiously described as the Rommel Archives. The archives are opened only one day a year, October 14th. The day I visited, it was October 16th. But they opened it for me all the same, showed me the contents and asked me to lock up before I left. I found a few letters, photograph albums, and other memorabilia. On the cupboard floor was a dusty cardboard box. In it was the Paula Merite, its enamel slightly chipped where once it struck an asphalt road. In the same box was a high peaked cap. A pair of yellowing perspex goggles. Three glass bottles filled with desert sands of different colors. And a khaki sleeve brassard, with a silver palm tree motif and one word, Africa. The instructor. Erwin Rommel had gone briefly on leave to Danzig later in 1916, and there he had married his Lucy. She was 22, dark-eyed and lithe. He had just turned 25, was upright, fair-haired and jerky. After his return to the battlefield their correspondence resumed, in fact, they kept up a daily correspondence throughout their marriage, whenever they were apart. He was deeply dependent on her emotionally, 
and he yearned for home life with her. When he returned from the First World War, Lucy was no longer a girl but already a woman of resolute character, with a direct gaze and handsome features. Gone was the delicate ballroom bloom of Danzig. She still liked to laugh, long and loud, but she was not easy going. She completely dominated Irwin. He adored her. It was wonderful to see how much Irwin fussed around her, one of her women friends recalls. His favorite phrase seemed to be, whatever you say, Lucy. Toward the end Lucy became something of a virago. If she cast out a friend, all her other friends had to ostracize that woman, too. Rommel indulged her, but in 1944, as we shall see later, it had the most unforeseen consequence for him when Lucy picked a row with the wife of his chief of staff. The First World War ended with Rommel 27 and an army captain. He had been posted early in 1918 to the staff of an army corps, and this brief experience of paperwork had cured him of any desire to become a staff officer. The rigors of war had made a tough and wiry man of him. He was stocky now and no longer a weakling. He offset his shortness by a parade ground voice and manner, reverting to the lisping sway by and dialect only when among friends. Germany in 1918, after its collapse, was in the throes of upheaval, political, social and economic. Bands of communists and revolutionaries roamed the streets. The armies had marched back into Germany following the armistice in good order, and the new republic turned to the army officers to restore stability. In March 1919, Rommel found himself sent to Friedrichshafen on Lake Constance to command No. 32 Internal Security Company, a truculent bunch of red sailors who jeered at his medals and refused to drill. He soon licked them into shape. His file shows that in the spring of 1920 he was also involved in operations against rebels in Munsterland and Westphalia, and his adjutant Ernst Streicher has described one episode in which Rommel used fire hoses like machine guns against revolutionaries storming the town hall of Gmund, dampening their violent ardor. He was in fact very lucky to be able to stay in the army, many officers were being let go. A civilian existence would have been unthinkable for Rommel. The army was his life. The few existing photographs of him in plain clothes show him an awkward, shambling misfit, a figure somewhat reminiscent of a small-time hoodlum. Without that uniform, helmet and, above all, the blue enamel medal, he was not one-tenth the man. In these last years before Hitler, the German army was in the doldrums, but Rommel was busy. On October 1, 1920 he went to Stuttgart to command a rifle company in an infantry regiment, part of the tiny army permitted to Germany by the Treaty of Versailles. He stayed a company commander in Stuttgart for the next nine years, expanding his knowledge of the art of war. He studied the heavy machine gun, becoming proficient at firing and dismantling it. He learned all there was to know about the internal combustion engine. He also found time to teach his riflemen the social graces, even organizing dances. He acquired a dog, started a stamp collection, resumed his painful attempts to learn the violin and pulled a motorcycle apart and put it together again. He showed his men how to build a ski hut in the mountains and how to make a collapsible boat. Rommel put a lot of emphasis on sports. Lucy, too was forced to join in some of these arduous endeavors with him. She lamely protested, I swim just about as well as a lead duck. He nearly lost her when she capsized a boat. On one occasion he took her skiing, but she sat down stubbornly in the snow and moaned about the cold. Irwin called back to her, you'd better get up, I don't recommend death by freezing. She stayed put, so he had to give in and let her ride back down the mountain. And so went the early years of the marriage and Rommel's early career, the uneventful 1920s. In 1927 he sat Lucy on the pillion seat of his motorcycle and took her around the scenes of his war exploits in Italy. But German officers were not popular there, his camera aroused hostility in Longarone and he was asked to leave. After that trip Lucy was allowed a respite, because she was expecting a child. The baby was born in December 1928, a boy. 
Rommel called him Manfred and had great hopes for him. In Rommel's confidential personnel file are several of the annual evaluations of him written by his superiors with ponderous Teutonic thoroughness. How different his personality at this time seems from that of his later years. In September 1929 his battalion commander described him as a quiet, sterling character, always tactful and modest in his manner. He went on to Lord Rommel's very great military gifts, particularly his sure eye for terrain. He has already demonstrated in the war that he is an exemplary combat commander. He has shown very good results training and drilling his company. There is more to this officer than meets the eye. The officer suggested that Rommel might make a good military instructor. This advice was heeded. On October 1, 1929, Rommel was posted to Dresden's School of Infantry. A junior instructor, he concentrated on turning out lieutenants who would make good company commanders. I want to teach them first how to save lives, he would say. This was one lesson Rommel had learned from the war, he wanted different kinds of commanders from those who had so callously sent good men to their slaughter. Shed sweat, not blood, was another of his maxims, he wanted the lieutenants to realize the value of proper digging in. Here at Dresden he ran into Ferdinand Sona, his old rival from the Italian campaign, who had infuriated Rommel by winning the Paula Merite for the capture of Hill 1114. Soana was also an instructor now, and a favorite of the school's commandant, who, like Soana, was a Bavarian. Soana often played practical jokes on Rommel, who did not always know how to reply. One of Soana's frequent pranks was to plant silver cutlery from the mess in the pockets of guests at formal banquets and watch their embarrassment when the spoons and forks fell out. Rommel, when it happened to him, was not amused. Their rivalry persisted to the end. It was generally friendly, and once, after so Anna had made a name for ruthlessness bordering on brutality in the Crimea in 1944, Rommel solicitously took him aside and candidly urged him to try a different method. So Anna won Hitler's last major victory against the Russians, in 1945, and to him went an unusual posthumous distinction. On his death as a field marshal in 1974 the West German government secretly circularized all offices, forbidding any tokens of respect. How different from the case of Rommel, as we shall see. Rommel was one of the most popular instructors at Dresden. As a virtuoso at small-scale wars in difficult terrain, he lectured on the system he had used to heat the bunkers in the Argonne Forest and his cunning employment of machine guns in the mountain warfare in Romania and Italy. He never spoke more than ten minutes without sketching an illustration and projecting it onto a screen for the cadets to see. When other lecturers tried it, the cadets dozed off in the darkness. One instructor complained that having been allotted the difficult Monday morning slot, Rommel volunteered to fill it, I can guarantee they won't fall asleep on me. Most popular of all was his talk on Matea, the battle around which his whole young life revolved. Another instructor wrote years later, you can understand Rommel only by taking his storming of Mount Matea into account. Basically he always stayed that lieutenant, making snap decisions and acting on the spur of the moment. In a confidential report in September 1931 the school commandant wrote on Rommel, his tactical battle lectures, in which he describes his own war experiences, offer the cadets not only tactical but also a lot of ideological food for thought. They are always a delight to hear. A year later the senior instructor added, he is a towering personality even in a milieu of hand-picked officers. A genuine leader, inspiring and rousing cheerful confidence in others. A first-rate infantry and combat instructor, constantly making suggestions and above all building up the cadets' characters. Respected by his colleagues, worshipped by his cadets. In October 1933 he moved up to a battalion command in Goslar in the Harz Mountains of central Germany. The 3rd Battalion of the 17th Infantry Regiment was a Jaja battalion, literally hunters, but in fact a rifle battalion distinguished by a traditional service color of green instead of white. Rommel, however, 
insisted that all his officers should learn to hunt and shoot, until stalking and killing became second nature to them. Here, in the forests with horse and gun, he spent two of his happiest years since the war. From the start he outclassed all his men in toughness. On the day he had arrived at his new command, his officers had tried to deflate him by inviting him to climb and ski down a local mountain. He did so, three times, when he invited them to a fourth ascent, they blanched and declined. Head and shoulders above the average battalion commander in every respect, was how the regiment's commander appraised him in September 1934. A year later his successor wrote of Rommel, now a lieutenant colonel, his JJ battalion is in fact the Rommel battalion. He is preeminently qualified to be a regional commander or senior instructor. It was at Gosler in 1934 that Rommel had his first incidental meeting with the man who was to be his destiny, Adolf Hitler. The Nazis had swept to power in January 1933 on a rising tide of unemployment and militant unrest. Within a year, by radical reforms and revolutionary economic measures, Hitler had cured most of the economic troubles and restored the country's lost national pride. He secretly assured his generals that the German army's famed strength would be restored and that a campaign of imperial conquest in the east would be launched when he was ready. Thus he won the generals' support. Just how he captured the colonels too is evident from Rommel's case. Rommel was virtually non-political. If anything, he leaned toward the socialists, the typical reaction of a combat soldier to the callous upper classes whom he blamed for the horrors of the battlefield. At home once, his son, Manfred, asked what war was like. By way of answer Rommel deftly sketched a surrealist scene of ruined horses, broken trees, mud and slaughter, as he was also a patriot, the appeal of the Nazis was strong. Most of their radical slogans left him unmoved. When Manfred once pointed to the hooked nose of the Gosler battalion's medic, one Dr. Zecklin, and innocently asked, Papa, is he a Jew? Rommel was highly indignant. Like most of his brother officers, he loathed the brown-shirted bullies of Ernst Romstermabte E. Lung, the Saar, the private army of two million men who had strutted and persecuted as they policed the Nazi rise to power. The regular army, of only 100,000 professional soldiers, had good cause to fear the Shah now that Hitler was in power, there were signs everywhere by early 1934 that Rom was preparing a takeover. Rommel could see the Saar's preparations right under his nose in Gosler. Then, in the notorious Night of the Long Knives in June 1934, Hitler struck, he massacred Ernst Rom and many of his unsavory cronies. The entire army hailed Hitler's strike with relief, and Rommel was relieved, too, although to his adjutant he privately expressed criticism of the actual massacre. The Führer did not have to do that, he said. He doesn't realize how powerful he is, otherwise he could have exercised his strength in a more generous and legitimate way. Still, according to Manfred his father's tolerant attitude toward the Nazis, to put it no higher, can be traced back to that date. Manfred was only six at the time, but his father obviously discussed it quite openly with him in later years. Lucy's letters show that she came to admire Hitler with an almost religious fervor, while Erwin's stolid prose betrays at most an initial gratitude for the esteem in which Hitler held the army, followed by admiration for his incisive leadership, as shown against the Tsar, and his military genius. I tried hard to establish the date of their first meeting, Hitler and Rommel. In his early biography of Rommel, Brigadier Desmond Young ascribed it to September 1935, but all the sources, including Young agree that the occasion was when Hitler came to Gosler to meet a farmer's delegation before the annual harvest festival, a huge open-air rally of million farm workers from all over Germany. My researches indicated that they in fact met on September 30, 1934, from Martin Bormann's diary we know that there was no other date when Hitler visited Gosler at a time when Rommel still commanded the JJ battalion. I put the question to Manfred the next time I visited him. Manfred said, I think I can settle that right away. He went upstairs and returned with a framed photograph of the event. 
It bore the pencil inscription, 1934. It shows Hitler inspecting the battalion's guard of honor at the Kaiserpfalz castle, with Rommel's surprisingly small figure at his side. Rommel is wearing a steel helmet that looks as large as a coal scuttle, and polished riding boots. Their meeting was in fact only formal, and we have no evidence of Rommel's impressions that day. One year later, in 1935, he was posted to Potsdam, the cradle of Prussian militarism. I have been earmarked as a full-blown instructor at the new Potsdam School of Infantry, he wrote delightedly to Lucy. Top secret. So make tracks for Potsdam. But keep it under your hat. The Kriegsil was alive with activity. In March of 1935 Hitler had defiantly proclaimed the expansion of the Wehrmacht and the reintroduction of conscription. Thousands of new army officers were undergoing training. Two hundred at a time, the cadets marched into the academy's hall of field marshals and listened spellbound to Rommel's lectures, while the oil paintings of forty German and Prussian field marshals looked down approvingly from the walls. Rommel emphasized the need for physical fitness. When Cadet Helmuth Freyer, asked for his views in 1937, respectfully submitted, two hours early morning PT is too much, we are too tired afterward to follow the lectures properly, Rommel barked at him to be about his business. Most of the cadets liked his style and individuality. They adored his disrespectful attitude toward the red trousered general staff officers. Those men are like marble, he told Kurt Hess, who lectured on the history of Prussia. They are smooth, cold, and black at heart. When his cadets quoted Clausewitz at him, Clausewitz was the staff officer's military gospel, Rommel would snap back, never mind what Clausewitz thought, what do you think? His idol was Napoleon, a man of action. As a lieutenant he had bought an engraving of Napoleon on St. Helena, gazing out to sea, and hung it on the wall. It took Lucy to bring a portrait of a German military hero, Frederick the Great, into their matrimonial home. Erwin and Lucy lived very quietly near the Potsdam Academy and did not mingle with Berlin society or the new elite. Unlike other war heroes, Rommel did not frequent the luxurious restaurants such as the leather paneled horches. He kept fit, went riding, practiced his hobbies. He memorized the table of logarithms, no small feat as mathematicians well know, and could thus perform astounding mental calculations like extracting the seventeenth root of any given number. He tried to interest Manfred in mathematics too, indeed, he spent the last days of his life vainly trying to explain differential calculus to his willfully uncomprehending son. My father, says Manfred now, had three ambitions for me. He wanted me to become a fine sportsman, a great hero and a good mathematician. He failed on all three counts. Rommel naturally tried out his own dogmas on Manfred. Courage is easy, was one of them. You just have to overcome fear for the first time. Manfred still winces when he recalls how his father tried that idea on him when he was eight. I found myself marching gamely at his side to the Potsdam swimming pool. Manfred said, clutching his hand, with a big rubber swimming ring under my other arm. He made me go up to the top diving board and told me to jump. That's when I discovered there's a big difference between theory and practice. My father had collected all his cadets to watch. I said, I'm not going to jump. He asked why not, and I shouted back down to him, because I value my life. I can't swim. My father reminded me that I was wearing the ring. What if the ring bursts, said I, and my father reddened and shouted back that then he would jump in and save me. You're wearing riding boots? I pointed out, and he replied that he would take them off if the need arose. Take them off now, I challenged him. My father looked around at all the cadets, and refused. So I climbed back down the ladder. One might say that Manfred had inherited and employed the strategy of the indirect approach many years before his father first used it to brilliant effect in his own campaigns. When Manfred was seven, his father took him to the academy for his first ride on a horse, it was done in secret, for Lucy believed the child was too young to ride. 
His feet were tucked into the stirrup straps, since his legs were too short to reach the stirrups. The horse bolted and dragged the boy for a hundred yards by one leg. Manfred's head was gashed, and Rommel was horrified. He pressed a coin into the boy's hand. If you tell your mother you fell downstairs, when you get home, you can keep this. At home the wound was bathed in iodine. Manfred howled with pain. Rommel furiously demanded his money back, but Manfred was a good swaybein and had already tucked the coin away. Colonel Rommel did not let him ride again. Very early in my researches, I turned to the thousands of letters exchanged between Rommel and Lucy during their years together. The letters had been taken from the family by the Americans in 1945 but were eventually returned intact, except for a few written early in 1943, in which Rommel, somewhat prematurely, questioned the ability of certain U.S. generals. I learned that the letters are now in an archive in Germany, but closed until the coming century. Then I discovered that the Americans had made a microfilm copy, and that it was in the National Archives in Washington. But this copy was locked away too. No one was allowed to see it. I appealed to Lucy. She gave me a handwritten letter of access, and the officials in Washington finally produced the film from their safe. Irwin's letters display what had by now become large, flourishing penmanship. He dashed them off once and sometimes twice a day on whatever paper came to hand in his office or battle headquarters. Lucy's are carefully composed in a tight and regular hand. Her later letters were typewritten. Her former manservant Rudolf Loisel told me, she was a real night bird. I used to hear her typing until two or three in the morning, letters to him. Her letters show shrewdness and perception unusual for a soldier's wife. Although she was initially a rather more uncritical admirer of Adolf Hitler than her husband, some of her letters after 1939 show that nonetheless she was concerned about Germany's future. Irwin's letters sometimes disappoint. Their language is often dull, their grammar is unsteady, they are repetitive and even philistine. His only cultural reference in them is to a visit to the ballet, it had bored him. He was in fact a single-minded army officer, wrapped up in army life. Theodore Werner, his aide in the First World War, writes, there wasn't much talk on his staff. I can't recall that there was ever any discussion of religion or philosophy. Yet their value as biographical documents is undeniable. There are snap judgments on contemporaries, there are lines written with casual disregard for secrecy. Above all, they are reliable as source material where, for instance, war diaries are not. Diaries can always be backdated or altered to their author's advantage, but letters once consigned to the mailbox are beyond the correcting hand guided by hindsight. To read everything that a man writes over thirty years to his wife is to gain some insight into that man's soul, his inner torments and ambitions, his moods and intimate beliefs. The sheer frequency with which certain ideas recur in Rommel's letters is a guide to his inner imperatives. The letters show him well endowed with all the traditional sway by and characteristics, thrift, frugality, homesickness, loyalty, industry. They show him hungry for responsibility and greedy for medals and acclaim. Rommel relished rivalry and made no attempt to set aside old feuds or restore broken friendships. He bore a fashionable contempt for the privileged classes and the nobility. When he learned in 1939 of an embezzlement scandal involving an aristocratic cavalry captain, Rommel triumphantly wrote to Lucy, and he had married a countess too. C. now agrees that my views on the aristocracy have proved more accurate than his own. It was September 1936 before Hitler really noticed Rommel. He had been attached to Hitler's escort for the Nazi party rally in Nuremberg, a fairly routine job which made Rommel responsible for little more than security arrangements. One day Hitler decided to go for a drive, and instructed Rommel to ensure that no more than half a dozen cars followed. At the appointed hour Rommel found the road outside Hitler's quarters seething with ministers, generals, gauleters and their cars all jostling for a place in Hitler's excursion. Rommel let the first six pass, 
then stepped into the road and halted the rest. The party notables loudly swore at him. This is monstrous, Colonel, I intend to report this to the Fuhrer. Rommel replied that he had stationed two tanks farther down the road to block it. Hitler sent for Rommel that evening and congratulated him on executing his orders so well. Another matter soon brought Rommel to Hitler's attention again. While senior instructor of the A course at Potsdam, Rommel had taken his lecture notes, dramatically rewritten them in the present tense, edited them into a taut, exciting book and submitted it to a local publisher, Vogdien Ritters. It appeared early in 1937 as Infantry Grifton, The Infantry Attacks. Hitler certainly read it, and it was probably one of the best infantry manuals ever written. It attracted wide acclaim and went into one edition after another. Rommel confessed to his fellow instructor, Kurt Hess, it's astounding. The money there is to be made from such books. I just don't know what to do with all the cash that's flooding in. I can't possibly use it all, I'm happy enough with what I've got already. And I don't like the idea of making money out of writing up how other good men lost their lives. For tax reasons too. The royalties were an embarrassment. In 1976 the Stuttgart Revenue Office returned his old tax files to the family, and these indicate just how he contrived to conceal his considerable literary income from the Reich fiscal authorities. Perhaps it was sheer innocence, but more probably it was the foxy cunning that marked Rommel out even among Swabians. He simply directed Vogdien Ritters to pay to him each year only 15,000 Reichsmarks from the accumulating fortune and to keep the rest on account for him, gathering interest. On his tax returns, Rommel declared only the 15,000 Reichsmarks. As Rommel's book became a bestseller, Germany's youth came to worship him, and he liked it. Working with the lads here is a real joy. He had written to his adjutant from Dresden in 1931. His views about youth were conservative. Once he told an army officer he met skiing in the mountains, I regard it as my job to combat the mood of modern youth, against authority, against their parents, against the church and against us too. This sort of attitude won favor with the inspector of war schools, Lieutenant General Georg von Kutschler who wrote a report noting that Lieutenant Colonel Erwin Rommel was a senior instructor with a particularly powerful influence on youth. Somebody's ears evidently pricked up at this last sentence, because in February 1937 Rommel was assigned an unusual new job. The War Ministry's special liaison officer to Bald Ur von Skirak, leader of the Hitler Youth. At 29, Skirak was leader of 5,400,000 boys. His organization gave them sport, culture and the Nazi philosophy. The war ministry had decided that they must receive paramilitary training too. Had not the Battle of Koenigratz been won in the classrooms of Prussia's elementary schools? The Führer himself had written in Mein Kampf, the army is to be the ultimate school for patriotic education, and had stated, in this school the youth shall turn into a man. The liaison was doomed to failure. Skirak was eleven years younger than Rommel, handsome and westernized, his mother was American. Rommel was so Prussian that Skirak was astounded to hear him talk in the Swabian tongue when they first met in April in the youth leader's lakeside home. Rommel stayed to supper, Skirak recalled. My wife drew his attention to the beautiful view onto the Bavarian mountains from our window. This cut no ice with him. Thank you. But I'm very familiar with mountains, he said, without even so much as glancing out of the window. Henriette had unintentionally given our guest his cue, because Rommel had received the Paula Merite in 1917 for storming some mountain or other in the Julian Alps. He now held forth on this for two hours. I found his story quite interesting, but to Henriette all such military matters were anathema and she nearly fell asleep. A month later Skirak reluctantly introduced Rommel to 3,000 Hitler youth leaders during a camp at Weimar. At about this time Rommel produced a startling plan, the way Macht's young bachelor lieutenants should be brought in to train the Hitler youth. 
Skirak said he strongly doubted that young army officers had nothing better to do with their free weekends than drilling hordes of boys in how to stand at attention. Rommel replied, they will just be ordered to. Skirak fobbed him off. Rommel was put out by this, said Skirak. He then journeyed up and down the country a lot, speaking to my Hitler youth leaders. The content of his speeches was always the same, how he had stormed Monte Mater. Willing to hear a worship though they were, my more intelligent leaders took umbrage and protested to me. Rommel, moreover, was propagating some kind of pre-military education, which would have transformed my Hitler youth into some kind of junior Wehrmacht. Rommel himself virtually admitted as much in a private letter to a general in August 1938, in my view post enlistment training should be left mostly to those Saar, brown shirt, leaders whose own service record shows they are well prepared for the nation's greatest testing time, by which I mean war. Skirak's bitterness toward Rommel did not lessen. At a gala theater performance he sat in the first row and put Rommel in the second. Rommel pointedly moved forward into an empty seat next to him, loudly announcing, I represent the Wehrmacht, and in this country the Wehrmacht comes first. The chief of the Wehrmacht's National Defense Branch, Alfred Jodl, sadly noted in his diary that Skirak was trying to break up the close cooperation initiated between the Wehrmacht and the Hitler Youth by Colonel Rommel. Eventually, Skirak succeeded. But the clash with Hitler's favorite, Skirak, did not blight Rommel's career. On the contrary, he was suddenly selected to act as temporary commandant of the Führer's headquarters. At Munich on September 30 the great powers had forced Czechoslovakia to cede to Germany the disputed Sudeten border territories, and Hitler had decided to tour the ancient German cities there. Rommel's job would be to command the military escort. For an ambitious officer, the posting was a godsend, it catapulted him into the very highest company overnight. In Washington, D.C., in the captured albums of Hitler's personal photographer, are prints showing Rommel and SS Chief Heinrich Himmler sharing a table in Hitler's special train, laughing uproariously. These bloodless Nazi victories impressed Rommel as they did millions of other Germans. He saw for himself the liberated German communities of Usk, Eger and Karlsbad turning out in their thousands to cheer the Führer. Twice, in Austria in March and now here in September. The man of action had been proved right and the general staff pessimists confounded. It is a certainty that by 1938 Hitler was a man greatly to Rommel's own liking. While many of his brother officers still hesitated to commit themselves to the Nazi philosophy, Rommel's conversion was undoubtedly complete. Even in private postcards to his friends, he now signed off, Heil Hitler. Yours, E. Rommel. In January 1937 and again one year later he had attended nine-day Nazi indoctrination courses for the Wehrmacht. After listening to Hitler speak in secret in the big hall of the war ministry on December 1, 1938, Rommel approvingly noted down two sentences that had particularly struck him, today's soldier must be political, because he must always be ready to fight for our new policies, and, the German Wehrmacht is the sword wielded by the new German Weltanschauung, philosophy of life. The extent of his dedication to Nazi ideals is evident, for instance, from the report he submitted to Berlin a few days later, after lecturing in various Swiss cities on his war exploits at the invitation of Swiss army officers. Although Swiss army officers emphasized in conversation with me their desire for independence and the need for a national defense, Rommel wrote, they show that they are strongly impressed by the momentous events in Germany. The younger officers, particularly, expressed their sympathies with our new Germany. Individuals among them also spoke with remarkable understanding of our Jewish problem. A new posting awaited him now that Hitler had annexed Austria, commandant of the officer cadet school at Wiener Neustadt, near Vienna. He arrived on November 10, 1938, the day after an orgy of anti-Jewish looting and destruction in the Reich. He, Lucy and Manfred lived in a charming bungalow in a large garden not far from the Maria Theresia Academy, the mighty castle-like structure that housed the school. 
Rommel's ambition was to make this the most modern Kriegsiel in the Reich. Distant though he was from Berlin, he could not escape the pull exerted from Hitler's chancellery. Twice in March 1939 the Führer again sent for him to command his mobile headquarters, during the occupation of Prague on the 15th, and once again on the 23rd when Hitler sailed into the Baltic port of Memel to supervise its voluntary return by Lithuania to Germany. The invasion of Prague in mid-March showed Rommel that Hitler had physical courage, and that impressed him. The elderly Czech president Emil Hacker, who, under threat of air bombardment, had signed the invitation to the Wehrmacht to invade, was still in Berlin when Hitler left for the frontier. Rommel met him in a blizzard at the Czech border. The SSS court was late, but the Panzer Corps commander, General Erich Hopner, proposed nonetheless that Hitler drive on into Prague to show who was now the boss. Himmler and the other generals were horrified at the idea. Rommel later bragged to his friend Kurt Hess, I am the one who persuaded Hitler to drive on, right to Radkini Castle, under my personal protection. I told him he had no real choice but to take that road right into the very heart of the country, the very capital, to the citadel of Prague. To a certain extent I made him come with me. He put himself in my hands, and he never forgot me for giving him that advice. That night Rommel wrote to Lucy from Prague, all's well that ends well. Our bigger neighbors are putting a very sour face on things. This was a reference to Poland and France who had both lost Czechoslovakia as an ally. Rommel added, thank goodness you packed enough warm underwear for me. Hitler now raised claims on Poland, too, for the return of former German territories. At first Rommel was confident that Hitler would get his own way. But as he followed in the Nazi newspapers the growing clamor against Poland, the reports of border incidents and saw Poland's intransigence he realized that Hitler was going to have to invade. It would be idle to pretend that Rommel did not share the relish with which virtually every red-blooded German army officer looked forward to attacking Poland. His own affection for the disputed city of Danzig was as strong as Lux's. It had been German when they met there and fell in love and for centuries before, becoming a free city only after World War I. Rommel did not expect it to be a long war. Early in August 1939 he was given a typhus vaccination, which confirmed his expectations. On August 22 he was summoned to Berlin and briefed about the new job awaiting him. My guess was right. He tersely informed Lucy on a postcard postmarked Berlin. He was to command the Führer's war headquarters during the attack on Poland. Hitler's General I left the Reich Chancellery as a brand new general. Wearing a brand new general's uniform, Erwin Rommel proudly wrote to Lucy. He had formally reported to Hitler as commandant of the Führer's headquarters at 3.45 p.m. on August 25, 1939. Berlin sweltered in a heat wave. Just 43 minutes earlier, Hitler had stepped out of a conference with Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop and announced that he was going to attack Poland at dawn. At 4.45 p.m., on Hitler's orders, Rommel started his escort battalion moving toward Bad Polzin, a little railroad town in Pomerania, not far from the Polish frontier, where Nazi troops were massing for the attack. The battalion had a total of 16 officers, 93 non-commissioned officers and 274 enlisted men. It was equipped with four 37mm anti-tank guns. 12 20 mm flak, anti aircraft, guns, and other weapons. He wrote ingenuously that day to Manfred, now 11, What do you make of the situation? His next letters laid bare his own robust optimism, he believed that the war would last only 14 days, that Hitler was doing what was best for Germany, that Britain and France would keep out, and that even if they did not, Germany could easily deal with them too. Perhaps he was dazzled by his own promotion, in fact, Hitler had instructed that Rommel's promotion should be backdated to June 1st, a great sign of his favor. I find that very decent, Rommel wrote, and displayed a sneaking pleasure that so Anna, his rival from the Italian campaign, had been promoted only to honorary colonel. 
a proud letter composed two weeks later tells much about his character, I'm together with the FRA, very often, even in the most intimate discussions. It means so much to me that he confides in me, far more than being promoted to general. When Rommel arrived at Bad Pons in that evening, he learned that the Reich Chancellery had phoned an hour before, the invasion of Poland had been suddenly postponed. Rommel was baffled. We now know that during the afternoon all Hitler's political assumptions had proved wrong. Britain had firmly ratified its treaty with Poland, and Italy had refused to declare war at Germany's side. For a week there was an extraordinary stalemate, while Hitler hedged and hesitated. Rommel's troops helped local farmers with the harvest while he and many other generals chafed at the bit. He flew to Berlin on the 27th to find out what was happening. Apart from the privilege of lunching at the Führer's table, there was little new, he confided to Lucy. The troops are waiting impatiently for the order to advance, but we soldiers must just be patient. There are some snags, and they'll take some time to straighten out. The Führer will obviously reach whatever decision is proper. Four days later Rommel went farther than that, I'm inclined to believe it will all blow over and we'll end up getting back there, disputed Polish, corridor just as we did the Sudeten territory last year. If the Poles, British and French really had the guts to act, then these last few days were far and away the best time for them to do so. Later that day, August 31, 1939, he added, waiting is a bore, but it can't be helped. The Führer knows what's right for us. Almost at once the telephone call came, ordering him to stand by. That evening, the phone rang again in the railroad station waiting room where he had set up his office. The invasion begins tomorrow, 4.50 a.m. Thus the Second World War began. Nobody, least of all Erwin Rommel could foresee that the military operations that began on September 1st, heralded by ranting and self-justificatory Reichstag speech by the Führer, would inexorably involve one country after another, would last six years, would leave 40 million dead and all Europe and half Asia ravaged by fire and explosives, would destroy Hitler's Reich, ruin the British Empire and end with the creation of new weapons new world powers and a new lawlessness in international affairs. Rommel wrote excitedly next day, What do you make of the events of September 1st, Hitler's speech? Isn't it wonderful that we have such a man? But Lucy's feelings were mixed, part those of a woman, wife and mother, part those of a fanatical follower of Hitler who now asked her friends and visitors, Do you too say a prayer for the Führer every night? Despite everything, she wrote to Erwin on September 4 from Wiener Neustadt, We were all hoping to the very end that a Second World War could be avoided, we all hoped that reason would prevail in Britain and France. Now the Führer has left last night for the Polish front. May the dear Lord protect him, and you too, my beloved Erwin. She mentioned that she had discussed Hitler's speech with all her friends and shopkeepers, and all agreed that he had done the only proper thing. All of them beg me to ask you to plead with him not to expose himself to unnecessary dangers. Our nation cannot possibly afford to lose him. One shudders at the very thought. At 1.56 a.m. on September 4, Hitler's special train, it was incongruously codenamed America, nobody knows why, pulled into the railroad station. Fifteen minutes later Heinrich, the headquarters train of Himmler and the senior Nazi ministers, also arrived. Rommel's troops put on their Führer's HQ brassards. A security cordon was thrown around the station, and the anti-aircraft guns were manned. Rommel had expected Hitler to pay only a formal courtesy visit to the front. But the Nazi dictator stayed for three weeks. Almost every day he climbed into an armored half-track and drove forward, through forests still infested with Polish snipers, along roads blazing with the wreckage of Poland's antiquated army, to the very banks of the sand to watch his storm troops force the river crossing. Rommel's eyes also were everywhere, watching, assessing, absorbing, learning the paraphernalia and techniques of a kind of warfare unknown to him during his own exploits, 
such as the employment of fast-moving tank units and assault troops and the use of dive bombers in close support. One after the other, Hitler's secret predictions to his staff were dramatically fulfilled. Britain and France had so far not fired one shot for Poland, just as he had maintained. I think the whole war will peter out, once Poland is done for, and that won't be long now, wrote Trommel on the 6th. Three days later he stuck his neck out farther, I think I'll be home before winter. The war's going just the way we planned, in fact it's exceeding even our boldest expectations. The Russians will probably attack Poland soon. Two million men. Every evening there's a long war conference here. I'm allowed to attend it and even chip in from time to time. It's wonderful to see the firmness in the way Hitler deals with problems. The Führer's in the best possible mood, he wrote just after they had visited the Warsaw Front. I have quite frequent chats with him now, we are on quite close terms. By September 19th it was virtually all over. Hitler ceremonially entered Danzig and broadcast to the Reich, and to the world, from the Ports Artusch of Guildhall building, erected by German craftsmen in the 14th century. Today sees our entry into magnificent Danzig, Rommel jotted down. The Führer will be speaking to the entire world. I was able to talk with him about two hours yesterday evening, on military problems. He's extraordinarily friendly toward me. I very much doubt that I will still be at the Kriegsiel much longer, when the war is over. When Hitler visited the Polish port of Dynia, there was an incident that knocked the first nail into Rommel's coffin. After a desperate battle, the last Polish stronghold had just fallen and Hitler's party decided to drive down to the water's edge. The street was narrow, and the descent was steep. Again playing the role of traffic controller, Rommel brusquely ordered, only the Führer's car and one escort car will drive down. The rest wait here. As at Nuremberg he stepped into the road to make sure his order was obeyed. The third car moved forward then halted. Rommel could see in it the burly Nazi party chief, Martin Bormann. Bormann gesticulated and shouted but Rommel refused to budge. I am headquarters commandant, he announced. This is not a kindergarten outing, and you will do as I say. Bormann purpled under the snub and waited five years to take his revenge. In his exuberance over victory, Rommel turned a blind eye to the grimmer aspects of Poland's defeat. On the 11th, he blandly observed that there were masses of Poles everywhere in plain clothes, most are probably soldiers who have managed to organize civilian clothes after the tide of battle turned against them. They are already being rounded up by our police and deported. A few days later he amplified this observation, guerrilla warfare won't last much longer in Poland. All able-bodied men are being rounded up and put to hard labor under our supervision. The fate of the Poles once deported did not occur to him. Once Lucy wrote asking him to trace a particular Pole who had vanished. Erwin replied that the inquiry must go through proper party channels. I'm getting similar requests every day. On September 14th, he did visit her uncle, a Polish Catholic priest, Edmund Rozczynielski, somewhere in the liberated corridor. After that the priest vanished without a trace. This time Rommel did write, on May 1, 1940, to Himmler's adjutant for information. Months later an SS letter informed General Frommel in cold terms that all inquiries about the priest had drawn a blank. The possibility must be faced that he has fallen victim to the vagaries of war or to the cruel winter. In fact the priest was probably liquidated like thousands of other Polish intellectuals by the SS task forces, a horror of which Rommel learned only four years later. By September 23, 1939, Poland was nearly finished. Only Warsaw was still holding out, under terrific Luftwaffe and artillery bombardment. The Führer's in a relaxed mood, Rommel contentedly informed Lucy. We eat at his table twice a day now. Yesterday evening I was allowed to sit next to him. Soldiers are worth something again. But his rise in Hitler's esteem attracted the envy of the dictator's staff, and Colonel Rudolf Schmundt, 
three years Rommel's junior and Hitler's chief Wehrmacht adjutant, made no secret of it. Rommel returned with Hitler to Berlin on the 26th and confided to Lucy next morning, at present, relations with Schmunt are strained. Don't know why, apparently my position with F, Ara, is getting too strong. Not impossible that a change will be insisted on from that quarter. Of course I want to know just where I stand. I've no desire to be pushed around by younger men. He went on leave to Wiener Neustadt with his family. On October 2 he flew to Warsaw to prepare Hitler's victory parade. After the brief respite with Lucy, the Polish capital was a horrifying, stinking nightmare. He returned to Berlin and dined that evening with Hitler at the Chancellery. Warsaw has been badly damaged, Rommel wrote to Lucy. One house in ten is burst to a shell. There are no shops left. Their showcases are smashed, the shopkeepers have boarded them up. There has been no water, power, gas or food for two days. The main streets were blocked off by barricades, but these stopped all civilian movement too and often exposed the public to a bombardment from which they then couldn't escape. The mayor puts the dead and injured at 40,000. The people are probably relieved we've come and put an end to it all. After the army's two-hour victory parade on the 5th, the newsreels show General Rommel standing right in front of Hitler's tribune, he returned to the boredom of barracks life in Berlin. Next day Hitler again made a fabulous speech to the Reichstag, this time formally offering peace to Britain and France, now that Poland no longer existed. Rommel was confident that he would soon be back with Lucy. I'm glad to say that H. Hitler's speech is being openly discussed in Paris and London, he wrote on the 8th. The neutrals are in favor. I attended Hitler's conference for an hour and a half yesterday. The Führer's in good spirits and quite confident. That was the conference where Hitler announced that, if he attacked the West, he would invade Belgium too, to keep the war well away from his vital Ruhr factories. Rommel began to feel the cold, but hesitated to ask Lucy to send his winter coat to Berlin in case he was suddenly moved elsewhere. On the 9th he wrote, Apart from the Führer's war conference, which is always highly interesting and lasts anything up to two hours, there's nothing doing here. We're still waiting for the other side to decide, in the light of Hitler's speech. All Hitler's hopes of a peaceful settlement with Britain and France had gone. When a time bomb, planted by an eccentric clockmaker, Georg Elzer, exploded in November a few feet from where Hitler had only just delivered a speech, he blamed the perfidious British. That Munich bomb attempt has only redoubled his resolve, Rommel wrote his wife. It is a wonderful thing to see. He was aghast that Hitler's security staff had not protected the dictator better. Five feet of rubble covers the spot where the Führer spoke last night. That's how violent the explosion was. If the bomb attempt had really succeeded, it just doesn't bear thinking about. By late November 1939, the general staff were dragging their feet over Hitler's idea of attacking the Western powers at such a numerical disadvantage. Rommel had no doubt that Hitler was right, but other generals lacked this confidence. On November 23, Hitler summoned his senior generals to the chancellery and gave them the rough edge of his tongue. He was highly critical of the generals and downright abusive about the general staff. Rommel relished every word. Afterward he related it all to Lucy, I witnessed yesterday's big speech to the military commanders and their chiefs of staff. The Führer didn't mince his language. But it seemed to me to have been highly unnecessary, because when I speak with my fellow generals I rarely find one who supports him body and soul. This mutual admiration between Hitler and Rommel explains how Rommel now got the new posting that he did. In October he had hinted that he would like to command a division. The chief of army personnel suggested that a mountain division at Innsbruck or Munich would be appropriate, in view of Rommel's famed exploits. Rommel, however, asked Hitler for something better, indeed, the best, a real panzer division. The army personnel chief refused. Rommel, he pointed out, was only an infantry officer and knew nothing about tanks. 
Hitler overruled him, and on February 6, 1940, Rommel received a telegram telling him to report four days later to Bad Godesburg on the Rhine, where he was to take over the 7th Panzer Division. At 7 a.m. on the 10th Rommel was looking from his train window at the fast-flowing Rhine. A few hours later his new officers were parading before him. Unlike any other general they knew, Rommel had greeted them with Heil Hitler. But that was just the beginning. He announced that he would to their sector next morning, ignoring their protests that it was Sunday. He found that instead of the usual two tank regiments, the division had only one, the 25th Panzer. To his surprise he also learned that of this regiment's 218 tanks, over half were lightly armored and of Czech manufacture. The men of the division were largely from Thuringia, a province not noted for producing soldiers of great promise. Rommel would have until the spring to lick them into shape. He briefly reported back to Hitler at midday on February 17, and later he wrote to Lucy, Jodl, Hitler's chief strategic advisor, was flabbergasted at my new posting. Hitler had handed him a farewell gift, a copy of Mein Kampf inscribed, to General Rommel with pleasant memories. Then they had gone into luncheon with four other generals, all newly appointed corps commanders. Hitler began to talk about the notorious Almark incident, in which a British destroyer party had just traded an unarmed German vessel in Norwegian waters, knowing it to be carrying hundreds of British captives. The Nazi press was shrieking vengeance for this violation of neutral waters, but within the chancellery walls, Hitler now praised Britain's bold act. History judges you by your success or failure, he pontificated. That's what counts. Nobody asks the victor whether he was in the right or wrong. Before Ommel returned that evening to his new division, he called on his publisher in Potsdam and collected ten copies of Infantry Grifton, for his subordinates to read. This was one clue to how he proposed to use his tanks in the coming battles, adventurously, like an infantry commander on a storm troop operation. Years later one corps commander, Leo J. von Schweppenberg, recalled a second clue, a snatch of playful conversation he had overheard while waiting in line in the chancellery for Hitler to appear that forenoon. Rommel had asked Rudolf Schmidt, who had been his commanding officer in the 13th Infantry Regiment, in a loud stage whisper, tell me, General, what's the best way to command a panzer division? Schmidt growled back, you'll find there are always two possible decisions open to you. Take the bolder one, it's always best. Spook Division. Six o'clock on a blustery February morning in 1940. It is still dark, but the solitary stocky figure of a man nearly fifty is jogging methodically along a narrow woodland path near Godesburg. His clenched fists are held close to his chest, in the manner of a long distance runner. From the Rhine comes the distant hooting of passing barges. This is General Erwin Rommel the new commander of the 7th Panzer Division, determined to regain his physical fitness after six fat and lazy months as a member of Hitler's entourage. During the Polish campaign he noticed the first heart complaints, and once he felt distinctly faint. He has told nobody but Lucy. She has sent him a big packet of lecithin medicine. But jogging is his tonic, ten minutes every morning he runs a mile like this, as shock treatment for his slumbering frame or as he himself puts it, to fight back the inner Schwinhund in me that pleads, stay in bed, just another fifteen minutes. As he trots back through the barracks gates it is ten past six. I don't suppose I'll find many men anxious to follow my example, he writes to Lucy later this day. Most of my officers are very comfortably inclined. And some are downright flabby. Rommel's arrival had electrified the division. His first act as commanding officer was to send his regimental commanders on leave. I won't be needing you until I've learned the ropes myself. At five to seven each morning his Mercedes rolled out of the barracks, taking him to his troops. He listened to the German and foreign newscasts on the car radio at seven, and again at twelve thirty, when he returned for lunch. He felt fit and on top of his job, and he began to throw his weight around. 
On February 27 a battalion commander displeased him. Rommel dismissed him and had him on his way within 90 minutes. Word of this rapid firing will soon get around, he wrote, and some of the others will pull their socks up. Politically, too, the division's officers did not come up to scratch. When a top Nazi was attached to his staff, Rommel observed, it's no skin off my nose. I won't need to watch my tongue, but some of the others will have to be on guard. Seems that National Socialism is still a bit of a stranger to the folks around here. The Nazi official was Karl August Hank, 36, one of the senior aides of Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels. He was assigned as a lieutenant to Rommel's staff. Rommel put him in a Panzer IV tank, the most modern he had. A number of other Nazis were also sent to him, including Corporal Karl Halls, chief editor of the anti Jewish tabloid Der Sturmer. The arrival of these men, all in their mid 40s, raised eyebrows at Godesburg. His main striking force was the 25th Panzer Regiment, for which Berlin had given him Colonel Karl Rothenberg, a tough ex police colonel who had, like Rommel, won the Paula Merite as a company commander in 1918. At 44, he was one of Germany's finest tank regiment commanders. Like Rommel, he figured that he had escaped death so many times that he was already living on an overdraft of life. He was the kind of man who knows no fear because death holds no terrors for him. He met his death the next year on the Russian front. Day after day Rommel watched the tanks exercise at one, marveling at the feats performed by these monsters veritable fortresses that clanked and creaked their way up even the steepest inclines. It was no secret that the Western powers heavily outnumber Germany in tanks and aircraft, but the German tanks were better. The best tanks in Rommel's force were Panzeras and Ivs, 20-ton behemoths, nearly 9 feet tall, each with a 5-man crew, a 320-horsepower Maybach gasoline engine and a top speed of about 25 miles per hour. Half of Rommel's tanks were Czech-built 38 TS. The 38 T weighed less than 9 tons, because it had even less armor plate than the relatively thin-skinned Panzer III and IV, but it was faster, and its gun packed a bigger punch. By April 1940, Rommel had steeped himself in the theory and practice of tank warfare and developed a few ideas of his own to surprise the enemy. He began taking his units cross-country in large and small formations, fast, and practicing radio procedures and gunnery. Evenings, he briefed all his officers, right down to platoon level, then did his paperwork until 11 p.m. at 6 a.m. he was already up again, jogging through the woods along the Rhine. His stamina and condition were phenomenal. Rommel's 7th Panzer Division and another, the 5th, would be controlled by General Hermann Hoth's 15th Corps. Hoth had already won the Knights Cross in Poland, and Rommel liked him. Hoth's corps was the armored spearhead of General Gunther Hans von Kludge's 4th Army, which would advance into Belgium when Hitler gave the code word. After the main British and French forces had thus been lured forward to meet them, the real German breakthrough would follow across the Meuse, to Rommel's left. This major thrust would, Hitler hoped, end in the rapid encirclement of the enemy. Such was the strategy underlying Hitler's Western campaign, the plan was his, and not the general staff's. It was top secret. From the 7th Panzer Division's rest area on the Rhine, all the way forward to the Belgian frontier, Rommel had signposted his designated route of advance with the symbol DG7, for Dirch Gangster S, through A, 7. This violated all the rules of the general staff, but Rommel meant to push that DG7 right through to the Channel Coast ahead of all his rivals. On May 5th, a rainy Sunday, he wrote his last letters to Lucy and Manfred, to be delivered to them if he did not return from the coming battle. On May 9th, Rommel was with Colonel Rothenburg watching his tanks and artillery maneuvering on the firing range at 1. At 1.45 pm the code word, Dortmund reached Rommel. It meant that the attack in the west would begin at 5.35 am the next day. He drove frantically back to the barracks in Godesburg, and seized a pad to write to Lucy, 
We're leaving in half an hour. Don't worry. Things have always gone well so far, and it's going to be all right. We jump off at dusk, how long we've been waiting for this moment. As dusk fell, he drove off down through Way 7 in an armored command vehicle. The road was jammed with elements of the Second Corps, inexplicably crossing Rommel's through Way. The chaos was awful, it was like a bad start to a horse race, with all the contestants fouling each other's lanes. Rommel was enraged. Not until twenty minutes before zero hour did the last of his riflemen reach their allotted positions. The air filled with German planes. As dawn came he could see that his engineers had crossed the Belgian frontier according to plan. He could hear no gunfire at all, just distant thumps as the retreating Belgians demolished bridges or blew up roads. In the first villages he drove through, followed by his radio truck and two dispatch riders, the response was quite unexpected, we were greeted everywhere with shouts of Heil Hitler, and delighted faces, he wrote in the first draft of his history of the campaign. In Belgium, and then in France, Rommel renewed his fame. Over the next 19 days his Panzer division blazed its throughway 7 across the countryside at breakneck speed. Rommel's technique was to push forward boldly, ignoring the risk to flanks and rear, calculating that, as at Matea in 1917, the shock to enemy morale would more than offset the risk. His division poked like a long forefinger straight through the enemy line, sometimes advancing so fast that it became detached from the main fist of Kludge's 4th Army, and continued to race along its throughway on its own, with only the most tenuous connection in the rear to its logistical support. Rapid and determined enemy actions could have sheared this finger off, but as Rommel had calculated, the enemy was too confused and alarmed to move decisively. Always, Rommel rode at the very tip of his Panzer division. His command vehicle was a specially adapted Panzer III. Sometimes he would ride in Colonel Rothenberg's Panzer IV command vehicle, sometimes he flew over the battlefield in the Army's light Storch observation plane and landed among the leading tanks. After two days, by late May 12th, his division had reached the Meuse River. Rommel's assault troops forced a crossing in rubber boats at 4.30 a.m. the next day, but took heavy casualties. Rommel himself, already hoarse from shouting orders, crossed that afternoon, oblivious of enemy small arms fire, in time to restore his troops dwindling morale. That night he ordered a pontoon ferry to be rigged up, and had his anti-tank guns and tanks hauled across the 120-yard stretch of water. The attack was resumed. Onward through the Belgian towns of Flavian and Philippville swept the Panzer Division. Rommel's new tactics were paying off. His inventiveness never failed him. To provide a smoke screen for the Meuse crossing, he had simply ordered houses set on fire, just as at Longarone. To maintain security when radioing orders to his tank commanders, he had devised the Stoslany system, a line of thrust penciled by all officers between two prearranged points on their maps, any point could be described by giving its distance along and from this line. To find out which enemy villages were defended, he devised his famous fireworks displays, the entire Panzer regiment opened fire, thus provoking any defenders to betray their positions. If the enemy was holding, say, a wood, then Rommel just drove in, with every barrel shooting indiscriminately into it. The day goes to the sides that is the first to plaster its opponent, he later said. And in a private letter that he wrote to Rudolf Schmunt, Hitler's adjutant, begging for a second Panzer regiment, there's no hope through proper channels, too much red tape, Rommel stated, the method that I have ordered, of driving into the enemy with all guns firing and not holding fire until they are already knocking out my tanks, has worked magnificently. It costs us a lot of ammunition, but it saves tanks and lives. The enemy have not found any answer to this method yet. When we come up on them like this, their nerves fail and even the big tanks surrender. If only they knew just how thin our armor is compared with theirs. His method did, of course, cause mishaps. 
one of his tank commanders, Ulrich Schroeder, described it in a private manuscript, on the way we met a column of trucks coming toward us. They evidently mistook us for British and drove sedately on. Our front company let them come within a few yards, then let the truck drivers have it with machine gun fire. With horrible regularity they slumped over to the right in their driving seats, one after another, all dead. The trucks swerved off the road into the ditch, eight or ten of them, all ending up there in the same convoy spacing. Unfortunately, as we passed them we found out they were ambulances. So the front company was ordered to cease fire. On balance, however, Rommel's rough tactics saved lives on both sides. His dramatic breaching of the Maginot Line extension was an example. Between this main bunker line and the French frontier were woods in which the French had dug forward fortifications. Rommel reached the wood at Surfontaine on May 16, 1940. He wanted to get through it fast, so as to reach the bunkers themselves before dark, but how, without alerting the bunkers that he was coming? Rommel took the microphone and quietly ordered all tank commanders to drive through the woods, this time without firing a single shot. Their crews, gunner, radio operator, loader and commander, were to ride outside the tanks and wave white flags. He himself rode Colonel Rothenberg's Panzer IV. Ulrich Schroeder recalled, the enemy was in fact so startled by this carnival-like procession that instead of shooting at us they just stood back to either side and gaped. With the woods now safely behind them, Rommel ordered the last battalion to about face and cover them in case the troops that decided to fight after all. His tanks were arrayed behind a long hedgerow. At a signal from him, they fired smoke shells at the bunker ahead, while assault engineers crawled forward and burned out the closest bunkers with flamethrowers. At midnight, with the way ahead lit by the glare of fires, the 7th Panzer Division began to roll through a gap blasted in the bunker line. The leading tanks fired into the darkness ahead, all the rest fired broadside to keep the enemy's heads down. It was a fantastic spectacle. As they gathered speed westward, an inferno of gunfire began. The tanks roared through French hamlets with names like Sola Le Chateau, Sars Patries and Sermousses. Sleeping villagers were wakened by the thunderous sound and flung open their windows. Terrified civilians and French troops huddled in the ditches. Refugee carts laden with household goods, abandoned by their fleeing owners, were smashed under tracks or overturned. None of the French had expected the bunker line to be breached so fast. Immediately behind the bunker line, wrote Schroeder, we came upon astonished French troop columns, some fleeing inland, others pushing toward us. After a while Rommel stuck his head out of the tank's hatch. Ahead of us, he wrote, the flat countryside unfurled in the moon's wan light. We were through, through the Maginot line. In that one night he and Colonel Rothenberg advanced 35 miles. His right-hand neighbor, the 5th Panzer Division, far better equipped with tanks than was Rommel, was lagging about 30 miles behind. Rommel did not pause until he reached Tavessens, his tactical objective. Even then he drove right through the town and waited in the hills to the west for the rest of his Panzer division to catch up. Impatiently he sent his aide, Lieutenant Hank, back down the road in a Panzer IV to hurry on the stragglers. We waited with mounting impatience, recalled Schroeder, as we wanted to get moving again. After about an hour we heard tank engines and tracks approaching from the rear. Rommel assumed this was the rest of our division, and ordered the advance resumed. In fact the sounds came from a French heavy tank unit, which had counter-attacked in Rommel's rear and already destroyed several tanks. All alone Hank's Panzer IV drove these attackers back, an act of bravery for which a grateful Rommel recommended him for the Knight's Cross. Rommel's repeated radio calls for further orders for the division went unanswered. So he resolved that at dawn he would rush the bridge across the Samba at Landrisses, eleven miles farther on. At 5.15 a.m. the Panzer Regiment moved off, followed by the motorcycle battalion belonging to Rommel's division. It was also like the early victories over the Italians in 1917. There was no firing. 
every French unit he met meekly surrendered and, at Rommel's suggestion, began plodding eastward into captivity, the enemy evidently believing that their position was more precarious than Rommel's, which was not so. That day he took 3,500 prisoners, according to his Panzer Division files. One brave French lieutenant colonel tried to defy Rommel. He looked like a fanatical officer, recalled Rommel in his history. His eyes burned with hatred and impotent fury. I decided to take him with us. He had already gone on about fifty yards farther east, but he was brought back to Colonel Rothenberg. Rothenberg ordered him up onto our command panzer. But as the French officer curtly refused, three times, in fact, to come with us, there was nothing to do but to shoot him down. Rommel often discussed this disturbing episode with Manfred. He took no pleasure in killing, but for a soldier it was sometimes necessary. A thousand yards east of Marbeille, he wrote, a French car emerged from a side road on the left and crossed our armored car's path. It was flagged down, and a French officer got out and gave himself up. A whole convoy of trucks had been following him, raising a lot of dust. I quickly decided to divert the convoy to a vessence. Lieutenant Hank swung aboard the leading truck. I myself stayed briefly at the crossroads, indicating by sign language and shouts that the war was all over for them and that they were to throw down their arms. There were machine gunners on some of the trucks, manning machine guns against air attack. I couldn't see how long the convoy was because of the dust. After ten or fifteen had driven past, I went to the front of the convoy and drove to a vessence. At length we reached the southwest entrance to the town. Without halting, Lieutenant Hank swiftly led the truck convoy following us onto a parking lot and disarmed them. Only now did we realize that no fewer than forty French trucks, many carrying troops, had tagged along behind us. It would have taken only one trigger happy Frenchman to end Rommel's career there and then. He made no attempt to conceal his rank or person, his natty army uniform, his high peaked cap, his medals and loud voice marked him out above his tank commanders, but he continued to lead this charmed existence, as countless episodes revealed. Here is Rommel, standing defiantly on top of a railway embankment directing the battle while his men are being picked off one by one by Scottish snipers, or walking up to a motionless German tank, through a hail of fire, and rapping on the turret to know why it is not firing. And here is his new aide, Lieutenant Most, suddenly sinking to the ground at Rommel's side, mortally wounded, with blood gushing from his mouth. Rommel reports laconically to Lucy, Major Schrappler has come back already. His successor was killed just a yard away from me. And here are Rommel and Major Erdmann, who commands his reconnaissance battalion, running for cover under heavy gun fire as a 150mm howitzer shell lands between them, Erdmann's back is torn open and he perishes instantly, Rommel is shocked but unscathed. It is incidents like these that give a man a dangerous belief in his own immortality. Once Lieutenant Hank saved his life, near Sivry on the Belgian frontier. They had suddenly driven smack into a large force of French bicycle troops. Hank mowed them down with his machine gun, thereby extricating me as division commander from a very tricky situation, Rommel admitted in his commendation of Hank for bravery. During this campaign and in all those that followed, there was a camera slung around Rommel's neck. It had been given to him by Goebbels, and with it he took countless photographs. His captured albums are in a London museum, and they tell us as much about him as about the subjects themselves, we find ourselves seeing the war through Rommel's eyes. As I turned the album pages, I saw the dramatic spectacle of Rommel's division drive, in formation, across the French cornfields, the columns of trudging prisoners, French black troops. Ducks in village ponds and fine horses gambling with their newborn foals, oblivious to the onrush of war around them. Here too are bewildered refugees sitting near cart horses, disarmed troops in kilts at Rouen and the French war memorial at Ficamp. A year later the weekly Frankfurt Illustrated published some of Rommel's photographs.
Manfred got it out of the shopping basket, Lucy wrote to Rommel on the day the magazine appeared, and after a few seconds suddenly whooped with excitement and shouted, Mama, look, it's Papa. At first I thought you might be paying us one of your favorite surprise visits, but then he showed me the magazine with your picture on the front page, snapping pictures from your tank turret. For a while, Rommel was so far up front that the press could not keep pace with him. His friend Colonel Kurt Hess, the former Potsdam lecturer, now touring the battlefield with a group of German war correspondents, found it almost impossible to catch him. He was always ten miles ahead of us. Once French forces, including tanks, had already pushed in between the little advance party with which he spearheaded his attack and the main force of his division. Even this did not stop him from just driving ahead. They will just have to battle through as best they can, was his only comment. Hess wrote a description of Thruway 7, I have never seen anything like the scenes along Rommel's route of advance. His tanks had run into a French division coming down the same road, and they had just kept advancing right on past it. For the next five or six miles there were hundreds of trucks and tanks, some driven into the ditches, others burned out, many still carrying dead and injured. More and more Frenchmen came out of the fields and woods with abject fear written on their faces and their hands in the air. From up front came the short, sharp crack of the guns of our tanks, which Rommel was personally directing, standing upright in his ACV with two staff officers, his cap pushed back, urging everybody ahead. A Fesaker inflamed him, he brooked no opposition, from friend or foe. If somebody could not keep up, then let him stand back if only he, Rommel, and two or three tanks could reach the river Somme. Rommel caught sight of Hess and barked at him, in this war the commander's place is here, right out in front. I don't believe in armchair strategy. Let's leave that to the gentlemen of the general staff. Hess wrote that down, and Rommel's next remark as well, this is the age of Seydlitz and Zyathan all over again. We've got to look at this war like a cavalry action, we've got to throw in tank divisions like cavalry squadrons, and that means issuing orders from a moving tank just as generals once used to from the saddle. These tactics appalled the general staff and roused apprehension at the Führer's headquarters. But on Rommel rolled. On May 18th, he found that beyond Landrisses he had to pass through a sprawling forest concealing a big, well-guarded enemy ammunition dump. To avoid a time-consuming pitched battle, he used the same trick of waving white flags and having the crews ride outside their tanks. Again the gaping Frenchman stood aside and willingly obeyed the tank commander's shouts of a Barsley arm. At the other end of the forest was the village of Pomrel. Rommel's tanks formed up in a defensive hedgehog on top of the hill beyond the village, tails in, guns pointing outward. On the far horizon they could see La Cat, their next objective. He collected the commanders. Your route now will be La Cat, Arras, Amiens, Rouen, Le Havre, he bellowed. Fuel up. Advance. They were stunned at Rommel's words. Le Havre was on the English Channel and they had barely slept for a whole week. Soon, however, he and his tank commanders were fighting off determined attempts by the French to wipe out their hedgehog. To make matters worse, the tanks were nearly out of gasoline and after a while Rommel learned why. The rest of his division was still back in Belgium, and his chief staff officer, Major Otto Heidkamper, having heard nothing from him and having written off both him and Colonel Rothenberg as lost had made no attempt to send them fuel. Hyde Camper's conclusion shocked Hitler's staff. The Führer himself later sent word to Rommel, your aid cost me a sleepless night. I couldn't see any way of extricating you from that snare. Somehow, in the confused way of battles, the French relaxed their grip on Rommel and he escaped again. But weeks later he still fumed at Hyde Camper's feebleness. I'm going to get rid of him as soon as I can, he snarled in one letter. This young general staff major stood back some twenty miles behind the front, terrified that something might happen to him and the operations staff, 
and naturally lost contact with the combat group I was commanding at Cambrai. Then, instead of rushing everybody forward to me, he drove back to Corps headquarters and got them all worked up into believing that my division was slipping out of their control. To this day he still thinks he was a hero. Rommel had taken Cambrai with little opposition, capturing 650 enemy troops there on the 19th and 500 more the next day. But on May 20th, he felt as though he had butted his head into three feet of solid masonry, for the first time he came up against British professional soldiers, the enemy he learned to respect, fear and admire every time they crossed his path over the next four years. By the 21st, Rommel was in a jam. The enemy were regrouping for a desperate attempt to break out of the Flanders pocket, and Rommel's infantry and guns were now confronted by a tank they could not stop, the slow, cumbersome but heavily armoured Matilda Mark II. The standard 37mm shell was useless against it. Rommel must have been dog tired, but he did not show it in this crisis at Arras on May 21. He personally directed the fire on the approaching Matildas. He found by harsh experience that only the heavy flak, the big 88mm guns, had sufficient muzzle velocity to stop these brutes. With the enemy tanks so dangerously close, he wrote in his manuscript, only rapid fire from every gun could save the situation. We ran from gun to gun. I brushed aside the gun commander's objections that the range was too great. It was here that his adjutant lieutenant most was killed one yard away from him. Moments like these distinguished the true born battlefield commander, and Rommel's example inspired his troops to stand their ground that day. After the bloody fighting at Arras, the 7th Panzer Division briefly rested. Equipment was repaired, tanks were refueled, letters written. Hitler had ordered all the Panzer forces to halt anyway on reaching this canal line, running westward from Labassi. On May 26 Hitler lifted the order. Rommel immediately threw a bridgehead across the canal. A rifle regiment got across, but a machine gun battalion to its right was prevented by heavy sniper fire. This unit's history relates that Rommel himself now appeared. He complained that we weren't doing enough to combat the British snipers and climbed up on top of the railroad embankment, then, standing upright amid the enemy fire, proceeded to dictate targets to the anti-tank gun crews of numbers 4 and 7 companies. One after another their leading gunners and gun commanders were shot dead, clean through the head, but the general himself seemed totally immune to the enemy sniping. By the afternoon of May 27, Rommel's troops had established two makeshift bridges. To the chagrin of Lieutenant General Max von Hartlieb, who was senior to Rommel, the corps commander, Hoth, now placed the 5th Panzer Division's two tank regiments under Rommel's temporary command for the coming attack on Lille. This was a powerful reinforcement indeed, and Rommel was very impressed by the large numbers of brand new tanks in the regiments. He called a conference of both divisions tank commanders, and had a blazing row with Colonel Johannes Stray each, of the 15th Panzer Regiment, who pointed out that Rommel was not reading the maps right. At the end of the conference there was a ceremony that surprised Rommel and staggered the others present. His aide Karl Hank appeared, wearing his steel helmet and full war paint, saluted him and announced, on the Führer's orders I here with bestow on Herr General the Knight's Cross. This made Rommel the first divisional commander to get the award in France, and the obvious Nazi party string pulling caused dry faces among the other officers, at 6 p.m. Rommel began his push northeastward from the canal. Lille was one of France's biggest industrial cities, and Rommel was determined to get the first. When his panzers reached the day's interim objective, he heard that his rivals' divisions were bivouacking for the night. Jubilantly, he decided to press on, mount up, start engines, advance, and he alone continued the attack. This action blocked the enemy's escape to Dunkirk, where the evacuation of the British army across the English Channel had already begun. Now far in front of the main German forces, Rommel found he was taking fire from both enemy and German guns. He was exhausted, but he badly wanted to be the first German in Lille. 
After one and a half hours sleep, I took fresh troops forward to the front line, and fuel and ammunition for the tanks, he wrote to Lucy. That was the night that Major Erdman was killed a few feet away from Rommel. The next morning he himself drove into Lille, out of sheer eagerness. The war nearly ended for Erwin Rommel there and then, because the streets were still swarming with enemy soldiers. He rapidly reversed his car and escaped unharmed. By his coup he had trapped half the French First Army. Infantry divisions moved up to occupy Lille and allow Rommel's troops a few days rest. I've been in action for days on end, he wrote, constantly on the move in a tank, armored car or staff car. There's just no time to sleep at all. In a mechanized division you've got to be damned fast. So far I have been, hence the 7th Panzer Division's huge successes, about which the public still knows absolutely nothing. In the rest area, Rommel rapidly composed an interim dispatch on his campaign. He had taken 6,849 prisoners, captured 48 light tanks and knocked out 18 heavy and 295 light tanks. Not bad for Thurinans. He observed triumphantly to Lucy. He proudly sent copies of the dispatch to Hitler and Tushmunt. His ulterior purpose in doing so was quite clear from a candid remark to Lucy, I've got to act fast, or the same thing will happen as happened after. Hill 1114. The memory of that Paul Amerite awarded to the wrong officer in 1917 still rankled him. When Rommel was in a philosophical mood in later years, he liked to quote, Victory in battle can boast of many fathers, but defeat is an orphan. Hitler was impressed by the dispatch. The upshot was that Rommel, alone of all the division commanders, was invited to meet Hitler on June 2, 1940, when the Fuhrer called his commanders to Charleville in the Ardennes to discuss the last acts in the defeat of France. Hitler put on his familiar avuncular act. Rommel, he cried, we were all very worried for your safety during those days you were on the attack. At the secret conference that followed, Hitler told his generals that the new offensive would begin on June 5th. France would be given the coup de grace. General Wilhelm von Lech noted in his private diary these words of Hitler's, it will be easy to find a basis of peace with Britain. But France must be smashed into the ground, and then she must pay the bill. Back in action, Rommel forced his Panzer division across the Somme, which he found to be a wretched little stream rather than a river, early on June 5th, using two railroad bridges that the enemy had failed to demolish. For a few hours, enemy artillery pinned him into a small bridgehead. His men took large numbers of black prisoners, French colonials fighting for a fatherland they were seeing only now for the first time. At 4 p.m. he began his dramatic thrust southward. He had thought up another brilliant new idea. The Flachen Marshaw formation drive in which the entire Panzer Division steamrolled across the open, undulating countryside in a box formation. A tank battalion formed the front and sides, while the rear was brought up by anti tank and reconnaissance battalions. The rifle regiments filled the center of the box, their wheeled transport following the tracks flattened through the waste high corn crops by the tanks. Uphill and down dale they rolled around the villages, through the hedgerows, spewing fire and leaving behind pillars of smoke and wrecked enemy equipment, while herds of riderless horses stampeded along in the wake like the end of a disastrous steeplechase. On some farms the carts were ready harnessed and laden with furniture. Petrified women and children cowered beneath them as this deadly monster engulfed their farmsteads. Rommel's officers shouted to them to stay where they were. Never before had a panzer division moved so fast. It was averaging 40 or 50 miles each day. The enemy was never ready for him. At Thoy a British truck convoy was overrun and looted, it was rich in cigarettes, chocolates, canned sardines and Libby's canned fruit. There were tennis rackets and golf clubs too, Rommel guffawed, observing that the British had clearly not been expecting the war to take its present nasty turn. His approach caused chaos behind the French lines. At Elbeuf, a woman rushed up and caught him by the arm, Vaus at Songlay? Rommel shook his head. 
Oh, lay barbares. She screamed, and vanished back into her house. With a bit more luck, he would even have been able to rush the Seine bridges at Elbeuf, but a handful of determined men managed to blow them up before Omel arrived. He reached the river at Sotteville toward midnight on June 8. Rommel's was the first German unit to arrive at the Seine. The adjutant of a tank battalion described the arrival, our battalion HQ was billeted on Anthux, near Elbeuf. I found a chateau there, but its heavy oak gates were closed and didn't open even after much ringing. So I forced it open with my tank. The chateau was well furnished, but abandoned by its owners. We inspected the various rooms and decided on who should sleep where. We had just finished upstairs when we heard voices downstairs, General Rommel and the division's adjutant, Major Schrappler, were also looking for a billet. Rommel asked me which room he could have, I just want to sleep a couple of hours, then get moving again. He then really did sleep only two hours, lying fully dressed on a sofa, and drove on again before the rest of my battalion even arrived. While he was sleeping I picked some strawberries in the garden. When he awoke I served them to him on a rhubarb leaf, to his evident delight. On June 10 Rommel's troops saw the sea at last. It was near Diepe. At his order, the 25th Panzer Regiment drove flat out toward the coast. When it arrived, Rothenberg smashed his sturdy Panzer IV right through the seawall and drove the tank down the beach until the waves of the channel were lapping around its grey painted hull. Rommel, riding with him, clambered on top, to be photographed for the press back home. Then they backed out and rolled on toward for camp, through wildly cheering crowds who tossed flowers into their path, again mistaking them for Englishmen. Twenty-four hours later Rommel was on the cliffs south of St. Valery. On the narrow path below the brow of the cliffs they found thousands of British troops cowering, waiting for the flotilla of small boats lying offshore to come and rescue them. They waited in vain. The French admiral in authority had until now refused permission for the evacuation, the French high command was still hoping to launch a counter-attack toward the Somme. Now Rommel had come and his guns drove off the rescue flotilla. Grenades were dropped onto the cliff path, forcing a steady stream of prisoners to the top. Rommel called on Saint Valery to surrender by 9 p.m. The French troops wanted to accept, but not the British. They built barricades with their bare hands and fought like wildcats all day. So at 9 p.m. Rommel called down heavy artillery and a terrifying dive bomber attack on the town. That did it. When he drove in the next morning, through narrow streets full of trucks, tanks and equipment that the enemy had hoped to salvage and take back to England, there was little fight left in the defenders. The commander of the French 9th Corps surrendered to him in the market square, followed by 11 more British and French generals. Newsreel cameras filmed the scene. The British were rather annoyed at the way things had turned out. Major General Victor Fortune who had commanded the 51st, Highlands, Division, eminently disliked having to surrender to such a youthful general. The French smoked cigarettes and accepted their defeat with more aplomb. One grey-haired general, old enough to be Rommel's father, clapped him in typical Gallic manner on the shoulder and advised him, You are far too fast, young man. Another Frenchman asked with morbid curiosity which was Rommel's division. Rommel told him, Sacre blur. Exploded the Frenchman. The spook division again. First in Belgium, then at Arras and on the Somme and now here, again and again our paths have crossed. We call you the spook division. For four days the spook division enjoyed the Channel Sun beaches and hotel wine cellars. At 5.30 am on June 16 this idyll ended. The division crossed the Seine over a Waymacked bridge at Rouen and raced south. The next day Rommel heard on the car radio that the French were appealing for an armistice. Hitler ordered his army to occupy the French Atlantic coastline fast, clear down to the Spanish frontier, and Rommel covered the distance at an incredible speed. On June 16, 100 miles. On the 17th, 200. It was a wonder that the tanks survived. He met no resistance until June 18th, 
at Cherbourg, France's most important deep water port. Hitler had ordered its immediate capture. Although his division was outnumbered twenty times or more, and the fortress guns were still powerfully intact, Rommel took Cherbourg in his stride, that day the stride was over 220 miles. I don't know if the date's right, he wrote to Lucy on June 20th, as I've rather lost touch, what with the combat actions of the last few days and hours. He added, only by striking fast were we able to execute the Führer's specific order that Cherbourg was to be captured as rapidly as possible. Later he wrote, I've slept seven hours now, and I'm going out to look over my troops, the immense booty and our prisoners, there are twenty or thirty thousand in and around Cherbourg. Thus ended Rommel's blitzkrieg through France. He and the Spook division had taken 97,000 prisoners, at a loss of only 42 tanks. Despite the brilliant success, tongues began to wag in the German officer camps. Many generals were frankly envious of the glory that Rommel had earned. Others, like General Georg Stumm, who had commanded the 7th Panzer Division before him, were quietly impressed. Rommel's corps commander, Hoth, praised him in public, for instance, at the division staff dinner later that summer. Rommel proudly noted, he says that my predecessor, Stumm, who is regarded as a real dynamo in Poland, is a lame old cart horse compared with me, and much else. Of course all this was said under the influence of much alcohol, but it does my commanders a lot of good to hear how highly their corps commander rates our division's achievements, but in private Hoth expressed interesting reservations. In a confidential report on Rommel in July, he warned that the general was too prone to act on impulse. Rommel would be eligible for a corps command, said Hoth, only if he gained greater experience and a better sense of judgment. Hoth also accused Rommel of being ungenerous about the contributions others had made in the battles Rommel won. Kludge, the fourth army commander, echoed this criticism. When Rommel invited Kludge to contribute a foreword to a manuscript on the campaign, Kludge agreed, but gently pointed out to him that several of the book's diagrams and references had been falsified to the 7th Panzer Division's advantage. The part played by the Luftwaffe, he said, and particularly the dive bombers, was virtually ignored. Rommel's left-hand neighbor, the 32nd Infantry Division, was shown making much slower progress than it really had. Nor would Kludge accept Rommel's caustic references to his right-hand neighbor, Lieutenant General Hartlieb's 5th Panzer Division. Hartlieb, in fact, had formally complained to Berlin about Rommel. It seems that Rommel had used up all his own bridging tackle on the first day, and so on May 14, when he wanted to bridge the Meuse, he had helped himself to Hartlieb's tackle. Hartlieb insisted on its return, but Rommel refused, saying that his own division was going to cross first. This delayed Hartlieb's movements for hours on end. Rommel then had the gall to complain that the 5th Panzer Division was falling too far behind. Colonel Stray each later added a sidelight. Rommel seized this opportunity to filch my own heavy tanks for use in his division's advance as well, he wrote. When my general, Hartlieb, protested, he was told that General Hoth had sanctioned it, I myself don't believe for a minute that Rommel asked his permission. Our infantry took very heavy casualties as a consequence. At the River Scarp on May 25th, the same thing happened again and there was a furious scene. Later Rommel piously claimed in a letter to Bodwin Keitel, the army's chief of personnel, no coarseness resulted that I am aware of. Johannes Stray each later commented in a manuscript, during the war a book entitled The Spook Division was published. In it, various operations successfully executed by our 5th Panzer Division were cynically claimed by the 7th Panzer that the 7th Panzer took far heavier casualties than any other division in the West, including even infantry divisions, shows how ruthlessly Rommel treated it. Another factor in the growing controversy over Rommel was his favoritism toward the Nazi bigwigs in his division. Thus for the final assault on St. Valery he had given Karl Hank command of a tank company, although even Hank protested that he was not qualified. 
a shell fragment soon jammed the turret of Hank's Panzer IV, whereupon Hank panicked and halted, thus blocking the entire regiment's advance. Rothenberg had to send his own adjutant in person to get him to move over. Hank was also at the center of one of Rommel's most scandalous acts. He had recommended Hank for the Knight's Cross, and, again a sign of blatant favoritism, sent the citation up by special courier to the Führer's headquarters, bypassing all regular channels. Almost at once, however, Hank offended Rommel. He happened to mention that as a state secretary in the propaganda ministry he held a rank that technically was greater than Rommel's as major general. Rommel immediately sent an adjutant to the Führer's headquarters to intercept his own citation for Hank's medal. It was viewed as an unusually spiteful step. This action, wrote one tank commander, became common knowledge in the division. It badly tarnished the image that all of his troops had gained of him on account of his courage and genius as a leader. Not a penny for Africa. To the Nazi propaganda writers, Rommel's exploits that summer of 1940 were a gift. Like one of the horsemen of the apocalypse, they called him. His panzer division was like a ghost fleet. His magic word is speed, boldness is his stock in trade. He shocks the enemy, takes them unawares, outflanks them, suddenly appears far in their ear, attacks them, outflanks them, encircles them, uses his genius and everything he's got, taking night and fog and river and obstacle in his stride. Thus his tanks carve long blood-stained trails across the map of Europe like the scalpel of a surgeon. So wrote one glorifier an officer who had served with Rommel in the First World War and now met him again. Like a film, his story goes on, isolated acts of bravery shine briefly, there are the individual tragedies, crises and death. I look into his eyes. There is still the intrepid look I saw all those years ago, but something of it is overshadowed by the sheer grandiose scale of today's events. Another propagandist produced these words, Yes, they know him now in France, they know this face, with its blue eyes and their hint of hidden cunning, the straight nose, the firm jaw with its lips tightly compressed when he is thinking, and the chin that says all there is to he said about these noble features, their energy, their willpower, uniformly modeled, strong and masculine to look at, but of a severity softened by the twinkling eyes and the two small wrinkles at the corners of his mouth that show he is not averse to irony and wit. The way Macht troops settled into occupied France and prepared for the next operation, the invasion of England. Rommel may not have been aroused by the buxom French girls promenading in only their bras and panties, because of the heat, but he noticed them, he ingenuously mentioned them in a letter to Lucy that August. In fact he had little time for women and did not take them seriously. His friend Kurt Hess wrote, I only recall him talking about them once. He had been to visit a town in East Prussia, and told me he had noticed that it was full of pretty girls. What he liked were horses and dogs, but he never spent money on them either. Rommel, added Hess, always dressed correctly, but never with great style. He felt most at home in riding boots, an old army tunic, with his cap slightly cocked and a riding whip in his hand. He rarely carried a pistol, but he was an expert shot and if he ran into the enemy, then he grabbed the first trifle or machine gun he could lay his hands on. He spent his off-duty hours shooting with French landowners, who tended to be pro-German out of staunch anti-communism, or at his farmhouse headquarters writing up his own campaign history. Do you want to see how I write? He asked Hess, and pointed to a row of boxes under his bed. Here, let's take the 23rd of May. First folder, orders received and reports sent up to my superiors. Second folder, orders to the troops and their reports to me. Third folder, maps and sketches of May 23rd. Fourth folder, my photographs. Fifth folder, other items of historical interest like letters found on the dead, captured enemy orders and home news items about my division and myself. He explained, all this is going to occupy me on my retirement. I'm going to write a sequel to Infantry Grifton.
the Nazi propaganda minister, Goebbels, asked him to collaborate on a big army film about the campaign, Victory in the West. Rommel spent part of August reenacting for the movie cameras the spook division's crossing of the Somme. He had a great time playing movie director, and he schooled his troops in acting techniques. A battalion of French black troops was hauled out of the prison camps to stage the surrender of a village. Again, this time for the cameras, Rommel's tanks charged, guns blazing. He told the blacks to come out toward the tanks with their hands up and looking scared, but the men overacted, rolled the whites of their eyes, and screamed with terror. Rommel cut the cameras, and patiently explained through interpreters that actors had to show their emotions more subtly than that. The battle scenes were finally filmed on such an epic and reckless scale that several more lives were lost, though through no fault of Rommel's. No expense has been spared to show it as it really was, he wrote on the last day of shooting. There were blacks in it again today. The fellows had a whale of a time and thoroughly enjoyed putting up their hands all over again. During this period his following among the younger army officers grew phenomenally. They came from far and wide to see Rommel. He got on well with the troops, too, asked about their wives and families and inquired about their furloughs and medals. The Nazi press was filled with his exploits. But the publicity brought him more enemies in the OKW, the German high command, and among the army's general staff. Hess, by now the army's press chief, wrote privately to him, warning of the ill feeling being stirred up. Rommel dismissed it as the old general staff resentment against any up-and-coming outsider. The summer of 1940 passed, with Rommel's division practicing relentlessly for the invasion of England. He continued to thirst for new distinctions, but the thirst went unquenched. In Hitler's Reichstag speech of July 19 many promotions were announced, but none for anyone below the rank of corps commander. In August, Rommel again felt slighted when Friedrich Paulus and Karl Kriebel, two of his pre-war friends, moved up to Lieutenant General, to be leapfrogged by two general staff officers particularly stung him. It seems that as usual we combat soldiers are only good for cannon fodder, he muttered in one letter. As long as this clique is at the top level, things will never change. Rommel's heart leapt one evening when he was ordered by telegram to present himself at Hitler's chancellery on September 9. So certain was he that he was about to be awarded the Oak Leaves Cluster for bravery that he purchased a new medal bar for his uniform. But Hitler had planned just a polite meeting with his generals. Rommel sat on his left at the luncheon and stood on his right at the subsequent war conference. Just official business, so a fresh medal wasn't in the offing he wrote to Lucy. Not that I care, he added unconvincingly. The air battle over southern England was reaching its height that September and the meeting in the Chancellery took place only a few days after Hitler's famous speech threatening to wipe out Britain's cities if Winston Churchill would not desist from his night air raids on Berlin. The Führer showed me the results we have obtained already. It's quite astonishing how many military objectives we have already knocked out in London. And all this is probably only just a beginning. Afterward he called on his friend Kurt Hess, a mild, thoughtful man, in a suburb of Berlin. Hess told him that rumors in the general staff had it that Hitler intended involving Germany in Italy's adventures in North Africa. Rommel reassured him, not one man and not one penny for Africa, that's what the Führer has just told me in person. Hess then asked how Hitler intended to defeat England. Rommel sprang up. His eyes blazing, he says he's going to smash Britain to smithereens and wrap the country in a shroud of death. His voice echoed Hitler's harsh, guttural tones. Rommel returned to the Channel Coast. At Rouen on September 14 his division practiced embarking tanks and trucks onto invasion barges concrete-lined river barges, primitively converted for their new function with improvised landing ramps instead of sterns. The idea was that tugs would tow strings of these unwieldy craft across the channel when Hitler gave the order. What Rommel did not know was that the whole show was one enormous bluff. Hitler had secretly abandoned his invasion plans long before and was turning to other, 
indirect ways of influencing Britain. More weeks passed. Manfred Rommel, nearly twelve now, wrote to him proudly that he had won good marks in Latin, but only a satisfactory in math, and that he had had difficulty getting letters for his rabbits. It was a shame, the boy wrote, that his father was so seldom home. Do you still go hunting? He inquired wistfully in November. Rommel sent him snapshots from a recent hunt. Manfred replied, I'm green with envy after seeing those hunting photos. The only good thing about it all is that you'll soon be here again, and surely you'll take me hunting in the forest with you. But only one week after Rommel had ventured home to Wienerneustadt on leave he was suddenly recalled to his division, it was being transferred to Bordeaux. So he missed sharing Christmas with his family. On my second visit to Manfred Rommel at his home in Stuttgart, of which he is the mayor, he brought out an oversized album-like book, bound in red leather and tooled in gold. This was his father's idea of how a war diary should look. Rommel had worked it up into a continuous narrative, at his friend Rudolf Schmundt's suggestion, and sent it to Hitler. As I turned the heavy cartridge paper and looked at the meticulous maps facing each page, I could imagine how pleased the Führer must have been by the general's thoughtfulness. Hitler's response, our letter dated December 20, 1940, was in a file I studied afterward in Washington. You can be proud of your achievements, he wrote to Rommel. Rommel reported this ecstatically to Lucy, for the Führer to have found time, despite his burden of work, to look at my history of the division and to write to me, that makes me enormously proud. There is no doubt that it was a smart and timely move on Rommel's part, as events soon showed. It was early in February of 1941. In Berlin, crowds were thronging the movie theater showing the new film Victory in the West. Rommel went home to Austria again, hoping to resume his interrupted furlough. But on the evening after his arrival at Wiener Neustadt, one of Hitler's adjutants appeared with a message ordering him to fly immediately to Berlin for a meeting with the commander-in-chief of the army and with Hitler himself. Obviously something was in the wind. He left Lucy next morning, the 6th of February. Some days later the postman brought her a letter from him, plane landed at Staken Airport at noon 45. Drove first to Commander-in-Chief who briefed me on my new job, then to Efara. Almighty hurry! My kid's coming here. I can only take barest essentials with me. You can imagine how my head is swimming with it all. So our furlough was once again cut short. Don't be upset, either of you, that's just the way it has to be. The new job is very big and important. But where was he going? Next day there was another letter from Berlin. Slept on the new job last night. It'll be one way of getting my rheumatism treatment. Lucy remembered that the doctor treating Irwin's rheumatism in France had once advised him, you need sunshine, general. You ought to be in Africa. She guessed where destiny was about to take her husband. After the last British soldier embarked at Dunkirk in June 1940. There was no point of contact between the British and German armies. Two weeks later, Italy's proud dictator, Benito Mussolini, greedily declared war on France and Britain, hoping for a share of the spoils. Since 1890 Italy had had colonial possessions in Africa, and there were now 220,000 Italians under arms in Libya, the closest colony to Italy itself. Mussolini ordered his army to attack the British in Egypt and captured the Suez Canal. In September 1940, Marshal Rodolfo Graziani launched a ponderous offensive into Egypt. It was halted at Sidi Barani, not far inside the frontier. Hitler offered Mussolini, his new ally, a German panzer division in support. Mussolini's generals were too arrogant to accept, and Hitler's representative in Rome, General Inno von Rindelen, was informed in October that Italian forces were considered sufficient for the offensive and that it would be resumed late in December. Thereafter, the Italians conceded, perhaps one or two German divisions might like to join in the attack on the Nile Delta, where there are about 200,000 British. Nothing came of all this. 
on October 28 Mussolini invaded Greece from Albania. This was a severe shock to Hitler, who had secret plans of his own. He was furious and piqued by Italy's act. Nothing for Libya and nothing for Albania, he said to the general staff on November 1. Two days later he spelled it out to the army's tank warfare expert, General Wilhelm von Terma, he had decided against sending over that panzer division, at any rate for the time being. He would send only air force units to the Mediterranean, to help prevent a complete Italian fiasco, which would have side effects on Germany's own strategy. Italy's pride took severe knocks in North Africa during December 1940. The British army opposing them at Sidi Barani, just inside Egypt, had assembled motorized forces from all over the empire and staged a counter-attack under Lieutenant General Sir Richard O'Connor's local command. It gained ground so fast that in ten days the British were besieging the Libyan fortress at Bardia, where Marshal Graziani's September offensive had begun. Now Mussolini appealed for German aid, he wanted that Panzer division after all and all some materials and equipment for his own forces. Hitler let him stew in his own juice until January 9, 1941. By then Bardia had fallen and the heavily fortified port of Torbuk, farther to the west, was under British siege. Only now did Hitler decide that a small armoured force should begin moving to Libya, in February. At a meeting in Berchtesgaden, Mussolini accepted. Meanwhile the rate of Italian collapse in Libya quickened. On January 22, before the Germans left for Africa, Tobruk surrendered to the British. This was a real calamity. Also alarming was the report that came three days later from the commander of the 5th Light Division, the blocking force chosen to help the Italians defend Tripoli. This officer, Major General Hans Baron von Funk, a splendid aristocrat of the old school, had gone to Libya to assess the situation for the German general staff. He found that the proposed blocking force would be too small to save Libya. A week later he stated this to Hitler in person. According to one of Hitler's adjutants, the Führer was shocked. The lunacy about it all, he said is that on the one hand the Italians are screaming blue murder and painting their shortages of arms and equipment in the blackest terms, and on the other hand they are so jealous and infantile that they find the idea of using German soldiers and German materials quite repugnant. Mussolini would probably like it most if the German troops would fight in Italian uniforms. Hitler's first reaction was that a bigger German force would have to go. The British must be exhausted both in personnel and material terms after their long advance, he explained to Field Marshals Key Eitel and Braukic on February 3. If they come up against fresh and well-equipped German forces, it will be a very different kettle of fish. He ordered the general staff to prepare a complete panzer division for the transfer to North Africa on the heels of the original blocking force, the Fifth Light. The Führer's second reaction was instinctive, General Funk was too gloomy about North Africa, he was evidently tainted by the Italian debacle. Another general must be found to command the fifth light. The choice fell on Johannes Streich, 49. It was pointed out that a corps staff would also be needed for the overall command of the expedition. Hitler selected Rommel. In 1942 he told an Italian diplomat he had also considered Erich von Manstein for the job. But I picked Rommel because he knows how to inspire his troops, just like Dyatlop in Narvik. This is absolutely essential for the commander of a force that has to fight under particularly arduous climatic conditions as in North Africa or the Arctic. Thus Rommel was called to the Chancellery on February 6, 1941. Hitler showed him British and American illustrated magazines with photographs of Sir Richard O'Connor's victorious drive into Libya. Rommel gleaned several ideas from these photographs. When he left, he had in his pocket written guidelines from Key Eitel, the chief of the high command, for any dealings he might have with the Italians in Rome and Libya. The document reflected Hitler's uncompromising mood, German troops will not be committed to a pointless battle. By this he meant the Italians' current intention of defending only Tripoli itself. This area was too small to allow the Luftwaffe an air base. 
if the Italians would not agree to hold a line far to the east of Tripoli, then Rommel was to express regrets to Marshal Graziani that there was no point in sending Germans over. With the formal title of Commander-in-Chief, German troops in Libya, Rommel left the Reich capital tingling with anticipation. Characteristically, for his ambitions were undimmed, he clung to that designation even when his command was formally designated the German Africa Corps a few days later, Commander-in-Chief, Befehl Schaber, was one rung higher in the military jargon than Commander and a general, the commander of a corps. His mission was ostensibly to explore the military situation, but Rommel intended to take absolute command the moment his own troops arrived. I hinted to General von Rindelen, our military attaché in Rome, that such was my intention, he later wrote. He advised me to drop the idea, saying that that way I only stood to lose my name and reputation. When his plane brought him onto North African soil for the first time, at noon on February 12, 1941, the Italians were still in full retreat toward Tripoli. Rommel found them busy packing to catch what ships they could back to Italy before the British came. Graziani had been replaced by General Italo Garibaldi as field commander. Garibaldi was a burly North Italian with a white moustache and not much more tact than the average non-commissioned officer. When Rommel now talked of manning a forward defence line at Surti, far to the east of Tripoli, he just shrugged and retorted that Rommel should go take a look out there for himself. Rommel climbed into a Heinkel bomber that afternoon and did just that. From the Heinkel's cockpit, Rommel could not see much sign of any field defences around the port of Tripoli. East of it, he noticed a belt of sandy country that would probably be useful as a natural obstacle to enemy vehicles. He still had to find out the most elementary facts. For example, could heavy tanks drive in the desert at all? Italian generals said that they could not. A few days earlier, Rommel had asked Lieutenant Hans Otto Berendt, a lanky, mild-mannered Egyptologist assigned to him as an Arabic interpreter, whether even wheel trucks could drive in sand. Behrend was the author of a pamphlet entitled Tips for Desert Drivers in Egypt. He replied that the secret was to drive on slightly soft tires. As Rommel flew east, he saw the Surti desert himself, shimmering hot and inhospitable. He wondered how well his troops would survive the heat, assuming that the British allowed them time to acclimatize. Along the Mediterranean coastline he could see the highway built by Marshal Balbo, the Via Balbia, extending from Tripoli right to the Egyptian frontier. He wondered what cooperation he would get from the Italians, his first impressions of both the generals and their men had been uniformly favorable. Back in Tripoli he found General Garibaldi waiting with the Italian Chief of General Staff, Mario Rota. After talking bluntly with them, Rommel sent this radio message to Germany, first talks with Generals Garibaldi and Rota have passed off satisfactorily. Our suggestions are being put into effect. Foremost fighting units are at Surti. Personally flew reconnaissance mission out there myself. That evening he dined with the Italian generals at a Tripoli hotel. One inquired where he had won his Paula Merite. Rommel retorted without thinking, Longarone. That killed all further small talk that evening. Two days later his first combat troops sailed into Tripoli, the vanguard of the Africa Corps. The Elite Corps. On the 14th of February, 1941 a troop ship sails past the wrecked hospital ship at the entrance to the port of Tripoli, the richest jewel in Italy's colonial empire. Rommel's soldiers line the decks for their first glimpse of Africa. They see glistening white modern buildings, palm trees, broad boulevards, and cool shadows. Some of the men even begin to think they are going to like it here. They belong to the 3rd Reconnaissance and 39th Anti-Tank Battalions, the vanguard of Rommel's force. Despite the risk of air attack, Rommel orders the ship to be unloaded by floodlight that same night. 6,000 tons of war equipment are put onto the dockside between dusk and dawn, breaking all records for the port, trucks, guns, ammunition, armored cars, tents, mosquito netting. 
At 11 the next morning a military parade is held in front of government house. Watched by curious Italians and Arabs, the German troops march past smartly in their new tropical uniforms and pith helmets under the baking African sun. Rommel, the Italian general standing pompously at his side, takes the salute himself. He is stocky, fit and sharp-featured. One of his staff war correspondents, Hans Gert von Speck, wrote of him at this time, he has a high, symmetrical forehead, a forceful nose, prominent cheekbones, a narrow mouth with tight lips and a chin that juts defiance. There are hard lines from his nostrils to the corners of his mouth, but they are softened by something often akin to an artful smile. And in his clear blue eyes, too, cold and appraising, penetrating and keen, there is something of a cunning that brings real warmth to this man's features when it breaks through. Rommel delivers a brisk speech. The German and Italian national anthems are played and the men drive off directly to the east. This is only the first of many such parades, as the units of Rommel's Africa Corps begin to flow into Tripoli. They are small in number but they become a dedicated and professional elite which Rommel will lead with such skill and unorthodox methods that 18 months later Winston Churchill will declaim, Rommel, Rommel, Rommel exclamation mark what else matters but beating him. Colonel Rudolf Schmunt, Hitler's Jugger chief adjutant, had been attached to Rommel's party. Rommel sent him back to Germany with a report on Rommel's initial impressions. If the British advance on Tripoli immediately without regard for casualties, Rommel wrote, our general situation will be very grave indeed. Schmunt gave the document to Hitler two days later and wrote afterward to Rommel, I reached the Berghof on Sunday and found the Führer already waiting feverishly for news. I briefed him just as you said, and the Führer was obviously delighted with the initiative you have shown in tackling the job, Herr General. He is deeply apprehensive about the Libyan war zone, and dreads the next two weeks. Hitler, Sedgmunt, granted all Rommel's requests. He agreed to ship anti-tank weapons, mines and the 5th Light Division's main armored fist, the 5th Panzer Regiment, to Libya at once. Moreover, the 15th Panzer Division would follow in a few weeks' time. Schmunt also touched on the prestige issue so dear to Rommel's heart. On this much you can rest assured, he informed Rommel. The Führer will take care this time that there won't be any historical distortion of where the credit goes. For Rommel, this initial build-up went agonizingly slowly. In a letter to Lucy on February 26, he described the first minor skirmish with a British tank, 470 miles east of Tripoli, and added, the next two or three weeks are going to be crucial. After that things will even up. The enemy know now that we are here, and they have begun digging in. Two days later Hitler assured Mussolini, if we get just 14 more days, then any fresh British advance on Tripoli is bound to fail. When our first Panzer Regiment arrives, I think it will tilt the balance very dramatically in our favor. Some days later the 5th Light Division's Panzer Regiment disembarked at Tripoli. Now Rommel was really in business. There was the usual propaganda parade. The sight of the squat, powerful German tanks rattling through the Libyan capital brought an awed silence, then gasps and cheers from the crowds. There seemed in fact no end to the number of tanks, partly because Rommel had cleverly ordered them to drive several times around the block like a stage army, before rolling off to the east. We've got to keep the enemy guessing about our strength, that is, about our weakness, until the rest of the 5th Light Division gets here so he told the Panzer Regiment's officers. He had another trick up his sleeve. To fool the enemy's air reconnaissance, he ordered his troops to manufacture hundreds of dummy tanks of wood and cardboard. Some were stationary. Others were mounted on ordinary Volkswagen cars. Trucks and motorcyclists drove around between them, and real tanks methodically churned tracks across the sand for the enemy planes to photograph. According to the Fifth Light War Diary, intercepted enemy radio messages report having sighted medium tanks. This shows that our deception has worked. 
Rommel's information about the British early in March 1941 was sketchy. He reported one rather puzzling aspect about Torbruk, a port far behind the enemy lines. Torbruk Harbour is full of shipping, and there are big troop concentrations around Torbruk. Were the British bringing in reinforcements by sea, or were troops being pulled right out of North Africa for some other campaign? Unknown to Rommel, the British were withdrawing their best units from Libya, to launch what was to prove a highly unprofitable expedition in Greece. Too late the enemy would learn from radio intercepts of Luftwaffe signals that Hitler had actually sent a German expeditionary force to North Africa. For the enemy to withdraw troops on the very eve of victory in Tripolitania, however, was so patently absurd that Rommel did not dwell on it. Instead he ordered General Johannes Streich, who had arrived a week later, to explore eastward along the coast from Surtey with advance units of his 5th Light Division. Streich easily reached El Mugda, on March 4, without even seeing the enemy. From here a salt marsh, virtually impassable to vehicles, extended inland from the Via Balbia, creating a defensive position which materially strengthened Rommel's hand. He wrote a buoyant letter home, the front is now 480 miles east, of Tripoli. My troops are coming over. It's the tempo that matters now. From the surviving documents, it is clear that this easy advance dazzled even Rommel. He began to daydream of great conquests. On March 5th, at a gala showing of victory in the West in Tripoli, he proclaimed to his audience that one day they would be seeing a film called Victory in Africa. When a young lieutenant, just driven out of Eritrea by the British Army, reported to him as a staff officer, Rommel bragged, We're going to advance to the Nile. Then we'll make a right turn and win it all back again. And on March 9 he boldly predicted in a draft letter to Berlin that he would resume his drive early in May, and keep going eastward along the coast until the summer heat stifled all further operations. My first objective, he declared, will be the reconquest of Cyrenaica, my second, northern Egypt and the Suez Canal. The canal was 1,500 miles east of Tripoli, but Rommel meant every word of what he said. Of course, he was far outnumbered by the British. He had altogether only one panzer regiment, two machine gun battalions, two reconnaissance battalions, three batteries of artillery and a flak battalion, only about the same forces he had commanded in France. But he had big ambitions. In his draft letter to Berlin he airily dismissed the most obvious drawback, organizing supplies for such operations will be extremely difficult but the brunt of the fighting will come in Cyrenaica, and there is water in abundance there. He hopefully mailed to Berlin this ambitious plan for conquest. He himself flew to Berlin on March 19 and saw Hitler in person next day. Hitler began the audience by pinning on Rommel's chest the Oak Leaves medal that he had been coveting ever since France. It was the only pleasant moment. The general staff threw cold water on Rommel's plans. General Franz Halder, the accident professional chief of general staff, firmly advised Hitler not to accept them. It is clear from remarks made by Halder in prison camp in August 1945, recorded by a concealed British microphone, that he hated Rommel. At the time I was constantly telling Field Marshal von Braukic that with the enemy dominating the Mediterranean the very most we could send over and keep supply were three or four divisions. Sooner or later things were bound to go against the Italians, but the longer we could stave it off, perhaps even for several years, the better. Rommel explained that he would soon conquer Egypt and the Suez Canal, and then he talked about German East Africa. I couldn't restrain a somewhat impolite smile, and asked him what he would be needing for the purpose. He thought he would need another two Panzer Corps. I asked him, even if we had them, how are you going to supply them and feed them? To this I received the classic reply, that's quite immaterial to me. That's your pigeon. There was a momentous secret Rommel could not be told. Hitler was going to invade Russia, and he would need every available division for that. So Rommel was instructed merely to hold his present line and prepare a strictly limited attack. 
these verbal orders were reinforced by written instructions the next day, March 21. He flew back to North Africa disgruntled, disappointed and determined to disobey. In the desert, the tank is the capital weapon of the war and the tank man is the chosen warrior. To the infantryman falls the exhausting, debilitating fighting in the open, naked to his enemies, digging for cover where the ground is too hard to dig, thirsting where there is no water, trudging to the fight and trudging back again. But the tank crewman has the exhilaration, even arrogance that comes from commanding twenty tons of snorting armor plate and steel, a fire spewing monster that can rumble clean through brick walls or copses of trees, and here in the open desert can thrust die straight across the wilderness as long as the going is reasonably firm and the gasoline lasts, 110 miles in a Panzer III. Mount up. Five men climb through the round entry hatch atop the thick steel turret, and thread their bodies into their assigned places. Driver, radio operator and commander cannot see each other's faces, but all are connected to the tank's radio receiver, and the gunner manning the high-velocity 50mm gun and his loader can also talk by intercom. The outside world is visible only through slits in the armor, narrow enough to keep out bullets. There is the stench of raw fuel and gun oil and sweat. The heat is stiffing when the turret hatch is bolted down, the metal already baking in the African sun, and the temperature climbs impossibly as their heat from the engine and the guns is added. The men wear black and work in shirt sleeves. Their machine is a citadel unto itself, with two and a half inches of armor plate in front a gun by crops of Essen that can throw a high explosive or armor piercing shot a mile or more, and two machine guns that can scythe away the enemy's naked opposing infantry. But God help the five men if their machine should founder, trapped in a treacherous slough of sand or its track blown off by a mine or shell. They are inside a mechanized bomb, with hundreds of gallons of gasoline stowed behind them, one hundred shells in the racks beside them and 3,750 machine gun bullets in belts, all waiting to erupt and engulf them if one enemy projectile should explode inside this space. Only in front is their armor thick, to either side and in the rear it is only half as strong, and on top and below it is even thinner. The tank surges across the battlefield. Its tracks churn up dense and choking plumes of sand. The noise inside is deafening. The 320 horsepower Maybach engine roars and races as the driver shifts up and down through the manual gears. The hot spent shell cases clatter around the metal deck. The tank stops, the gun barks, and then again, continuing until the enemy is destroyed or the target is lost. Here in the open desert the rules are the same for both sides. Every tank commander instinctively dreads the sight of enemy tanks appearing on his flank. He and his opponent both try to come up behind low rises, pull down, so that they can open fire while exposing nothing of their bulk. Both know the penalty of error, entombment in the blazing tank, with the hatch jammed and flames licking toward the ammunition racks. A tank crew thirsts for battle but is immensely relieved when delivered from it. Then they can lever themselves up into the open air emerging from their oven into the relative cool of the desert heat, they can stretch out in the tank's shadow and brew coffee. They are an elite, men of high esprit, like submarine men, their comradeship forged by shared hazards and the shared intoxication of manning intricate, almost invincible machines. In Libya, Rommel found on his return, the tantalizing British retreat had continued. El Agla a dirty fort in watering point twenty miles east of El Mugta, had just fallen to stray each his light forces with hardly a fight on March 24. The British withdrew thirty miles to Mersa Brega, a narrow village straddling sand hills near the coast, it was a tactical bottleneck relatively easy to defend. The speed of stray each his advance put Rommel in a dilemma. As he explained in a letter to Lucy, I've got to hold my troops back now to stop them from galloping on ahead. According to his directives from Berlin, and from General Garibaldi, he was not allowed to attack Mersa Brega until the end of May, when he would have the 15th Panzer Division II. But his radio intercept company had arrived, 
with skilled English speaking operators listening into the enemy's signals, and from these signals and Luftwaffe reconnaissance Rommel knew that the enemy were digging in and bringing up reinforcements. By May, the enemy defenses might be impregnable. On March 31st he ordered Streich to attack Mercer Brega, regardless of the directives from Berlin. The British abandoned their positions, and Rommel ordered a strong belt of mines and anti-aircraft guns installed to prevent them from coming back. In a good humor, he drove forward to Streich's command post at noon next day. Now, when are we going to meet in Ajidabia? He called out. Ajidabia was the next big town, 50 miles farther up the Via Balbia, far beyond the stop line ordered by Halder. Stray each could not tell whether Rommel was serious or not, and purposely did not ask. We'll have to see about that, he replied, matching his superior's bantering tone as closely as he could. After Rommel had gone, Stray each ordered his division to resume the advance next morning, April 2nd. He did not inform Rommel, and Rommel, most unusually, avoided contact with him until 1 p.m., when he caught up with the 5th Light's foremost troops, feigned surprise, and exclaimed, What's going on here? Stray each evenly replied, I thought we ought not to give a retreating enemy any chance of digging in all over again. So I have moved my whole division forward to here, and I'm about to attack Ajidabia. Rommel replied without a trace of anger, those weren't my orders, but I approve. Thus Ajidabu also fell at 4 p.m. that afternoon. Rommel reappeared in time to hear the great news. In his memoirs, War Without Hate, he subsequently took full credit. Several times afterward, Stray each got a raw deal from Rommel, but he is not a man to bear grudges. When I ran him to ground for an interview, in an old people's home outside Hamburg in northern Germany in 1976, he was a spry, slightly built, soldierly figure of 85, neatly dressed, going deaf, eating dainty cakes in a circle of elderly ladies who cannot have asked him very often to recite these dramatic weeks with Rommel. The conversation was not very productive, but it did bear fruit later. Out of the blue came a lengthy sheaf of close type script, written by Johannes Stray each many years before but never published, entitled Memoirs of Africa. The war diary of his 5th Light Division has also turned up in private hands, and bears out Stray each's version in every detail. Now Rommel realized that the British had begun a general withdrawal from the bulbous peninsula of Serenaica, evidently they were desperate to keep their remaining forces intact. Ajidabia was the starting point of half a dozen desert tracks cutting across the peninsula. Rommel determined to exploit them to the east. On April 2nd a stern veto came from Garibaldi, this is in contradiction to what I ordered. You are to wait for me before continuing with any advance. Rommel did not wait. On April 3rd he decided on a dramatic three-pronged thrust across the peninsula. If he moved fast enough he might destroy the entire enemy force right there. The sunmost prong of his thrust would cut clean across the desert, following an ancient caravan trail known as the Trielebd. The trail led from Ajidabi onward through Bengania, Batangida, Bahachiim and Barel Gubai to the Egyptian frontier. A bear was a waterhole, in theory. Rommel put Count Gerard von Schwerin, a spiky but experienced half-colonel, in charge of a mixed German-Italian force for this prong. Stray each would lead another task force on a parallel track and, since a passing Italian priest had just tipped him off that even Benghazi, capital of Cyrenaica, was being abandoned, Rommel sent a reconnaissance battalion straight up the coast road to the big port. They drove in through cheering crowds at 10 p.m. that evening, just as a furious General Garibaldi was confronting Rommel about this disobedience of his veto. An orgy of destruction and murder had marked Benghazi's second change of owners in three months. The British had detonated 4,000 tons of Italian ammunition and fires were still raging everywhere. A German Navy commander sent next day to investigate this port's capacity for supply ships reported, Australian troops and Arabs looted the buildings and robbed the Italian civilians of all their valuables at pistol point. 
one of his officers wrote of a building he took over, in the rooms where the young girls had been slaughtered I arranged for photos to be taken of the pools of blood before they were mopped up. But now General Sir Philip Neem's motley Cyrenaica command was being hustled straight out of the peninsula by Rommel's unexpected advance. Rommel unquestionably knew that he was disobeying. He boasted about it to Lucy that day, my superiors in Tripoli, Rome and perhaps Berlin, too, must be clutching their heads in dismay. I took the risk, against all orders and instructions, because the opportunity was there for the taking. Probably it will all be pronounced okay later. They'll all say they would have done just the same in my shoes. In Berlin there was indeed consternation. How was the impetuous general to know that his exploits were unbalancing months of meticulous secret planning for the Nazi intervention in the Balkans and Russia? The German high command gave him a sharp rap across the knuckles. Key Eitel radioed him, using the so-called Enigma code, on April 3rd that Hitler had firmly specified that Rommel's job was to stand fast and tie down British forces. Any limited offensive moves that this necessitates are not to exceed the capabilities of your small force. Above all, you are to avoid any risk to your open right flank, such as is bound to be entailed in turning north to attack Benghazi. If the British armor pulled out of Cyrenaica, of course, then a new situation would arise, but even then Rommel was still to await fresh orders. Now history received a taste of Erwin Rommel the master of deception, the headstrong adventurer who always got his way. At 9 p.m. that same day the fat Italian commander Garibaldi confronted Rommel in his trailer headquarters at Aegidabia, his white gloves twitching with fury, and demanded absolute obedience. Rommel merely grinned. There's no cause whatever for concern about our supple situation, he declared at one stage. They nearly came to blows. After three hours they were interrupted by the radio signal from Key Eitel ordering Rommel to stay put. Rommel read it, then announced to Garibaldi that it stated that the Führer had given him complete freedom of action. This was very far from the truth, but Garibaldi was too slow-witted to spot it. Rommel even persuaded himself, it seems, because he told Lucy, from the Führer have come congratulations for our unexpected successes plus a directive for further operations that entirely fits in with my own ideas. His own commanders were appalled at the prospect of striking out immediately across the desert peninsula. Stray each objected that he needed at least four days to replenish the fifth light's supplies, all their dumps were way back at the Arca de Filene, Marble Arch, the towering white triumphal arch built by Mussolini in 1937 on the frontier between Tripolitania and Cyrenaica. Rommel curtly ordered him to unload all the division trucks in the open desert immediately and send them back empty, each carrying a spare crew, provided by the tank crews, for a round-the-clock trip to collect gasoline and ammunition from those dumps. Stray each warned lugubriously, then my division will be stranded for at least a day. Rommel insisted, this is the way to save bloodshed and to conquer Serenaka. The words are in the Africa Corps diary, he made a mental note to get rid of this quarrelsome general. The crossing of Cyrenaica then began. A Luftwaffe general wrote at this time. Cyrenaica is an almost treeless and therefore shadowless lunar land escape. The Jebel El Akhtar is a wildly fissured mountain range broken only by a few valleys in which sand, usually white or reddish yellow, stunts the growth of any vegetation. Mobility is restricted almost entirely to the desert road so it is startling in the midst of this barren waste of sand and stone to fly across the tents, flocks of sheep and camels of Arabs of whom no European knows, what caravan trails do they use, what is their living, what laws and customs do they obey. The farther east you go along the desert road, the more inhospitable the landscape becomes, while for about 30 miles east of Benghazi the colonizing work of the Italians is evident. Around Erna and Torbuk there are no signs of human habitation. Even the pitiful stunted pines fall off. The thorny shrubs barely struggle up to knee height. For one week, that April of 1941, Rommel's little force trekked across this desert, 
through the shimmering heat of a high noon sun that raised the arid air to 120 degrees Fahrenheit and more, and the cold of nights that dropped in one hour to freezing point. There were sand vipers and scorpions and armies of loathsome flies. The worst enemy of all, after their cruel thirst, was the sudden sandstorm. It would start as a curious little dust devil whirling between the bushes and develop into a torment of 70 mile an hour winds whipping billions of tons of hot, fine red sand across the desert. The storm might last for days on end. The fine sand penetrated everything, even the watches the troops wore. It choked the engine filters, it got into dent, eyes and noses, it ran off car windshields like rain, it cut visibility. Can't see more than three yards, wrote one of Rommel's company commanders in a diary. In the afternoon, thank God, the storm subsides. We all crawl out, like moles from our holes, and begin the job of digging everything out again. Rommel's great gamble began on April 4. Schwerin's little force was already moving east, with orders to cut straight across the peninsula to the other coast at Mimi. Rommel could never get his tongue around that word, and stammered my mini instead, and blocked the coast road there against the withdrawing British troops. At 2 p.m. Colonel Gustav Penneth's 8th Machine Gun Battalion also plunged eastward into the raw desert, with trucks carrying enough gasoline, food and water for 300 miles, their target was Derna, also on the other coast. Rommel had assured Schwerin that supplies would be airlifted to him. Since the 5th Light Division's trucks had not yet returned from the dumps, Rommel looked for Stray each, found him sleeping fitfully in his cubal car, and announced, you are to empty all the gas tanks of your remaining transport into your combat vehicles and tanks, and advance at once through Bengania to the coast, between Derna and Torbruk. The rest of your division can catch up when the trucks get back from the fuel dumps. An Italian general anxiously interrupted Rommel, but that trail is a death track. We saturated it with thermos mines two months ago during our retreat. Rommel brushed his objections aside. By fading light, one driver after another, accustomed only to the easy motoring of Europe's asphalt highways, turned off the firm via Balbia and ploughed into the desert sand and gravel. Stray each's tanks were crewed by stand-ins, since the tank drivers were away trucking gasoline back from the dumps. Soon the wheeled equipment was up to its axles in sand drifts. The trucks that followed tried to skirt around them and bogged down too. Tractors went forward in the darkness to haul them out. Within hours, Stray Each's whole force was crippled and spread over a wide area, he was not pleased at all and he ordered all headlights switched on and the trucks to winch each other out and keep together as well as they could. They soon lost sight of the desert trails, and the maps provided by the Italians proved useless. Guided by compass or stars alone, some elements managed to make some headway, but others were stranded and left behind to face thirst and hunger in the desert. Hefty explosions suddenly lit the sky as the first thermos mines were hit. An ammunition truck erupted in a ball of fire, illuminating the desert for miles around. By dawn most of Stray Each's force was again immobilized and out of gasoline. The heat of the sun brought new problems. At Bengania the tanks halted as the engine oil overheated and ran thin. Virtually all radio communication failed. Rommel could not raise his base headquarters, and they could not reach him. Days of unremitting chaos were beginning, how many of his drivers would ever reach the other coast after 200 miles of this? Rommel ranged across the desert in a Junkers 52 transport or light storch plane, trying to control the movements. Twice he blundered into enemy units he had mistaken for his own. He landed to berate generals and colonels for their slowness, and cursed them because the enemy was slipping eastward out of their grasp. Once Schwerin saw the Storch flitting past overhead and swore, that must be Rommel. Another time a struggling motor column dared to pause for breath. The Storch zoomed in at shoulder height and a piece of paper fluttered to the ground, if you don't move off again at once, I'll come down exclamation mark Rommel. Those who were lost, he found and pointed in the right direction again. 
but which direction was right. There was one solitary signpost, in mid-desert, but not a trail or track to be seen. The key to the desert seemed to be the ancient Turkish-built fort at Mechali, a crumbling white stone pile rising above the desert mirages, the hub from which seven desert trails radiated like spokes to the coasts and the distant interior. Rommel believed it would be only lightly garrisoned. He rose at 4 a.m. on the 5th and wrote to Lucy, Big things are happening in Africa. Let's help we can pull off the coup we've now launched. Air reconnaissance that day detected that the fort at Mechili was occupied by quite strong enemy forces after all, but Rommel decided to concentrate first on Mechili anyway. His base staff back at AGW disagreed, we would prefer, they noted, to see Torbuk as the objective, to interrupt the coast road there and stop the enemy escaping, and to leave just a masking force at Mechili. Rommel was of two minds. Twice on the 6th he gave different orders to Penneth's machine gun battalion. First, attack Mechali. And then forward to Derna. After all. Then a plane was sent to head off Count von Schwerin and an officer ran over with a message, Rommel orders you to turn north and attack Mechali. 6.30 am on April 6 found Rommel only 15 miles south of the fort, but he was virtually alone. His Africa corps was still stranded across the desert. After a while his aide Lieutenant Berendt, the Egyptologist, arrived with a few trucks, the first of Schwerin's party. Rommel sent him skirting around Mechali to block its exits to the east. Another aide found Stray each at 7.30, halted at a dried salt lake some miles away. Rommel called Stray each and Schwerin to a furious conference. They were lightly clad in khaki shorts. He was in full uniform, with riding boots, breeches and thick great eunuch. In the broiling heat his temper snapped, and he ordered them to attack the fort at 3 p.m. Stray each refused, and pointed out that his tanks and vehicles were still scattered back across the desert for 100 miles, with broken frames, overheated engines, no gasoline. Rommel screamed at him that he was a coward. Stray each unhooked his knight's cross one for Galantary in 1940, and snapped, nobody has dared tell me that before. Withdraw that remark, or I'll throw this at your feet. Rommel muttered a withdrawal, but showed he did not mean it. Later that afternoon, Rommel returned, pulled out a watch and barked at Stray each, it is now 5 p.m. you will attack Mechali at 6 with Schwerin's group, and capture it. I will order the Italian artillery to support you. At that moment Stray each had only two trucks armed, with light anti-aircraft guns, and no other weapons at all. Schwerin had little more and perhaps a few machine guns. How were they to move the 15 miles to Mechali before the sun set, with its usual abruptness, at seven? And where was Schwerin now, and the Italian artillery? Stray each set out with his few trucks, looking for Schwerin. He failed, lost his way returned long after dark and reported to Rommel. The latter said nothing, he had in the meantime tried to find the Italians and failed. That night Rommel tried to capture the fort himself with the few platoons he had. This operation miscarried, Stray each's war diary dryly observes. Rommel's own memoirs do not mention it. Twice during the seventh he sent a lieutenant into the fort with an ultimatum to bluff the British. On both occasions the officer was sent back blindfolded, the second time with a scribbled message, no intention of surrendering. Several times next day Rommel took off in his storch to look for his main task force, Colonel Albrich's 5th Panzer Regiment. Not until the sun had set did he find it, picking its way around a boulder-strewn region that not even tanks could cross. He flew off the handle, and privately decided that Albrich too would have to go. After dark he landed near Stray Each's command post. Eight tanks had now arrived from the company commanded by Major Ernst Bolbrinker. Rommel tersely ordered yet again, you will capture Mechali tomorrow. Before dawn he climbed wearily out of bed and wrote dutifully to Lucy, don't know if the date's right. We've been advancing across an endless desert for days on end, and we've lost all notion of time and space. Today's going to be another decisive day. 
after a 220 mile march across the desert sand and stones, our main forces are arriving and are going into action. Now there's going to be another canny, modern style. Canny was Hannibal's most famous victory. At about six he again left in his storch to a battle area. His aide, Lieutenant Herman Aldinger, wrote a few days later. The storch lifts off for a quick look over the front lines and battle dispositions. The pilot gets a sign, go lower. But no sooner is he down than the Italian troops, in error, are letting fly at it with all they've got. Bullets begin hitting his wings, and with a burst of aerobatics the pilot just manages to get the hell out of there. Far to the west are dust clouds, they must be our troops. On the run in, the general gets a real shock, they are British troops heading west. Stragglers? Or a British counterattack? He's got to warn our troops moving up from the west about this danger. Eight miles later the general sees our own leading troops, and goes into land. The pilot doesn't see a big rock, the storch loses half its undercart. Desert pile up. Our troops have an 88mm gun with them, but they tell the general that it was disabled last night in a shootout with the British. They're heading north now to try to contact the rest. The general asks, what transport have you got? A truck. Then let's get the hell out of here. The British will be here within five minutes. They mustn't find us. We'll make a detour through the desert. I know the way. Everything is loaded aboard, and a crazy drive begins. On the way we pick up three or four more trucks that have lost their way. Despite all these adventures, the general gets back to our command staff safely. Meanwhile we can see a sandstorm brewing, a ghibli. His command staff are ready to move off. We haven't gone 800 yards before we are suddenly engulfed in the violent storm. All our staff are scattered and we find ourselves alone. We can only guess which way we are going by compass and speedometer. We zigzag, we strain our eyes ahead, sometimes the sky lightens, sometimes it turns dark red. We see three dispatch riders in the sandstorm, their heads bent, their motorcycles covered, we take them with us and grope our way toward the airfield. There we find more stragglers. We ask them how the attack is going. Nobody knows. Slowly we feel our way along the telephone line, and suddenly we find that we are just outside the fort of Mechali. There are weapons and equipment lying around, and hundreds of prisoners cowering on the ground while the sandstorm rages and covers everything, like a blizzard in dense fog. In the fort's yard the division commander, General Stray each, reports to the general, Mechali has fallen. We have taken 1,700 prisoners, including 70 officers and a general, and we have captured quantities of guns, trucks and food. Thus Rommel missed the party at Mechali. So did Colonel Albrich's main tank force, it did not arrive until noon. His tank turrets were jammed tight by the sandstorm anyway. Rommel approved the suggestion that the turrets should be dismantled and cleaned, and he sent Schwerin's force and a pursuit group along the desert track to Derna on the coast. Lieutenant Behrend had taken the same desert trail to Derna on the day before in an eight-wheeler, and had driven right into the beautiful, well-laid-out port. The British had already passed through, and Arabs flocked in brightly colored cloaks around the way macked trucks, offering eggs, oranges, dates and other delicacies for sale. Gustav Penneth's machine gunners had followed in Behrendt's tracks, and after a heavy firefight had established a foothold at Derna airfield. When Rommel drove onto the airfield at 6.30 that evening, April 8, Colonel Penneth proudly announced the capture of 900 prisoners, including four more generals, one of them Sir Richard O'Connor himself. Penneth added that his machine guns were down to literally their last belt of ammunition each. His troops were worn out, but Rommel was relentless. He ordered Penneth to continue eastward at once along the highway, toward Tmimi and Torbruk. Disenchanted with both the colorless General Stray each and Colonel Albrich, Rommel handed over command of the leading units reaching the highway from the desert to Major General Heinrich von Pretwitz, who had only just arrived in Libya in advance of his division.
the 15th Panzer. This was a slap in the face for Streich, but the successes that Rommel had achieved so easily against a startled and fumbling enemy had dangerously inflated his estimate of his own ability. Speed was all that mattered. His intention for April 9 was that an Italian infantry division should kick up just west of Torbuk, while the 5th Light Division circled around it inland and attacked unexpectedly from the southeast quarter. I had imagined that the 5th Light was already on the move, he later wrote, forgetting that he himself had sanctioned the dismantling of the turrets for cleaning. When at 6.30 pm he found the Panzer Regiment still doing this at Mechali, way back, he again lost his temper at the inoffensive General Streich. By his unexpected strike across the peninsula, Rommel had certainly caught the British on the wrong foot, for a reason that he never dreamed of. All his secret communications with the German high command were being encoded by the Enigma machine, rather like a small, wooden boxed electric typewriter. The Nazi code experts had pronounced this machine absolutely safe from enemy code breakers. The messages were radioed in this code to Rome, and transmitted by wire to Hitler's headquarters. Deep in the English countryside, however, the enemy had constructed a far superior machine, as big as a house, capable of decoding the secret Enigma signals. Radio listening posts fed the German signals to the machine. A large multi service organization translated and interpreted the fantastic results and they were transmitted back, marked ultra secret, to the enemy commanders facing Rommel. It was the biggest secret of the war. However, more than once Rommel disobeyed the orders issued to him in Enigma code. For example, on this occasion, in April 1941, the British knew only of the orders issued to Rommel to stand fast at Benghazi. Not yet knowing Rommel, they had assumed he would obey. This explains the surprised collapse of the British defence of Cyrenaica when he advanced. But now Winston Churchill had signalled from London that Torbuk was to be held to the death without thought of retirement. On the night of the 8th the main Australian force, retiring from Cyrenaica, had reached Torbuk and began manning its Italian-built fortifications, in pursuance of Churchill's order. Rommel did not realize this. Early on the 10th he was still confident, and he predicted, the enemy is definitely retreating. We must pursue them with all we've got. Our objective is the Suez Canal, and every man is to be informed of this. As he was dictating these words into the Africa Corps war diary, the machine gunners of Penneth's battalion reached kilometer stone 18 on the Via Balbia, 11 miles short of Torbruck heavy artillery fire began to drop around them. By a supreme effort, Penneth managed to take his storm troops 2,000 yards closer, but here murderous anti-tank and machine gun fire swept the road. The German troops dived for what little cover there was and waited for heavy artillery support. Farther back down the asphalt highway, Pritwitz arrived at Schwerin's command post in some perplexity. Rommel has sent me to take command of the attack. But I've only just arrived in Africa, I don't know the first thing about the troops or the terrain. Schwerin briefed him and the general snatched some sleep. At sunrise, Rommel stood at the new general's tent flap, bawling to know why the attack on Torbuk was stagnating. The British are escaping, he bellowed. Pritwitz flushed pink with confusion. Schwerin loaned him his car and driver and saw them drive off at high speed down the highway toward Torbuk. They were driving into the unknown. Rommel had no maps or rare photos of the fortress. He had no notion of its defenses. He might have survived the next few minutes, but Pritwitz did not have Rommel's nine lives. The astonished machine gunners, now at kilometer 16, saw the car with the general's pennant racing through them from the rear. A gun crew nearest to the highway screamed a warning, Halt! Halt! Pritwitz stood up in his speeding car and shouted back, Come on! Forward! The enemy is getting away! At that instant a British anti-tank shell slammed into his car and tore clean through him. He and his driver were killed outright. Schwerin found out at once. I saw Red, he said in 1976. 
I marched straight over to the famous White House where Rommel had set up his headquarters. Rommel drove up, and I informed him that the general that he had just sent up front was already dead. That was the first time I saw him crack. He went pale, turned on his heel and drove off again without another word. Rommel drove south of Torbut to inspect the lie of the land there. A number of trucks and a 20 mm gun were in his party. A lookout spotted two small vehicles speeding and bumping along their wheel tracks, catching up from the rear. Through his telescope, Rommel saw that one was a British command car, the other looked like its German equivalent. He was a brave man, but also prudent. Get the gun ready, he ordered, and all the trucks halted. In no time the two strange cars were upon them and skidded to a halt. Out of one jumped General Strange, red-faced and angry, shouting the news of Pritwitz's death. Rommel coldly interrupted him, how dare you drive after me in a British car. I was about to have the gun open fire on you. Strange did not flinch. In that case, he retorted you would have managed to kill both your panzer division commanders in one day, Herr General. Kilometre 31. Rommel needed Torbuk for two good reasons. This grubby port was still the best harbour in Cyrenaica, in fact, in all North Africa. It blocked out a 22-mile stretch of the coastal highway, forcing his supperly convoys moving forward to the Egyptian frontier onto a 50-mile inland detour along a desert trail of indescribable condition. With Torbuk in enemy hands, even Rommel dared not resume his offensive toward Egypt and the Nile Valley, because the Torbuk garrison could lance down across his supperly lines at any time. At first it did not dawn on him that the enemy intended to fight the to the death until far into April 1941 he eagerly believed every morsel of radio or photographic intelligence that indicated that the British were pulling out, that they had only escaped from Cyrenaica into this port to stage a second Dunkirk-style evacuation. Rommel wasted many lives and much ammunition before he realized his mistake. In fact, this situation raised the most disturbing problems for Rommel and at first he refused to address himself to them, above all, the problem of how to supply his own forces during the siege. Initially this snag was easily overlooked by the German public. He was the hero of the press. The public liked to measure a general's triumphs in simple terms, and as the Afrika Korps swept eastward toward Egypt the sheer distances he covered seemed to testify to his greatness. They had raced southward past Torbuk and captured Bardia on April 12, and next day Fort Kapuzzo, barring the frontier road into Egypt itself, fell and the frontier wire was breached. Solom, the first town on Egyptian soil, was captured too. But in the desert, as in war at sea, distances count for little, not even the capture of prisoners counts for much. What matters most is the destruction of the enemy's hardware, their tanks and guns. Without them, in the desert, an army cannot fight. The enemy's material strength, particularly in the fortress of Torbuk, was intact. Before Rommel could permit his main forces to follow east along the Rommel Bain, as his staff sometimes dubbed the Via Balbia, he had to secure his lines of supply. The prerequisite for this, he said on April 13, is the capture of Torbuk. By that date his first attempts had failed, disastrously, the first rebuffs that any of Hitler's commanders had ever suffered. Rommel blamed his generals, writing in his memoirs later, remarkably, some of my commanders kept wanting to pause so as to take on ammunition, fill up with gasoline and overhaul their vehicles, even when an immediate thrust by us would have had superb chances. Years later, reading the book, General Stray each scornfully scribbled in the margin, disgraceful nonsense. And what about fuel? As Stray each pointed out, that was always the salient point, that there just wasn't any gasoline for Rommel's pipe dreams. And that wasn't the fault of some of his commanders, but of Rommel himself. Standing on a high plain above the Mediterranean, facing toward Egypt, Rommel surveyed the landscape features that would dictate his battle tactics. 
To his left, a sheer cliff face fell away to the rim of the sea, the coast was like this virtually all the way to the Egyptian frontier. To his right the land rose in 100 foot steps, until a maximum height above the sea level of 500 feet was reached about 20 miles inland. These steps, or escarpments, would become important battle objectives. Diagonally across this rising plain ran gentle rib-like undulations, like waves in the sand, up to three miles apart and fifteen feet high. These would aid Rommel. He could advance between them, conceal his tanks hull down behind them. But there were also wadis, dry gulches or river beds where battle vehicles could negotiate crossings only in few places. In the morning and late evening, visibility was unlimited, but by day the hot air shimmered and reflected and would play hell with the gunner's aim. All around them appeared great lakes of water as mirages, but the real water had shriveled down into the bowels of this continent millennia before, and now there were only dried up or poisoned cisterns built by the Arabs to capture the winter's brief rainfalls. All day long the sun grilled the soldiers' bodies, dehydrating, blackening, peeling. The hot wind cracked lips, tangled hair, veined eyes with red. The whole nervous system was under excruciating strain, which exacerbated the depression and loneliness of the men who fought in Africa. Rommel now lived in a small Italian built trailer, protection against the sub zero nights. He moved it, along with his battle headquarters, to a shallow stony gully just south of the Torbuk front line, where the increasingly troublesome enemy planes could not so easily find him. Every waking hour was taken up with preparing the assault on Torbruk. He did not even find time to write Lucy and detailed his Batman to write to her instead. This morning Herr General has ordered me to write to you, Corporal Gunther began his compulsory letter to her on the 11th, Lucy cannot have been much flattered. With his legs spread out beneath his stocky figure, his face blistering in the African sun. Rommel gripped his Zeiss binoculars and peered at Torbruk. He wondered just what and where its defenses were. He pushed his cap back to a jaunty angle so that the sun glinted on the big perspex goggles that were to become a famous part of his image, he had seen them in the booty at Mechili and taken them for himself. Then he climbed back into his command vehicle, Mammoth, and drove on to another vantage point. Mammoth, which means mammoth in German, was his name for the British ACV given him by Stray Each, who had captured three of these enormous conveyances at Mechali. A black and white Wehmacht cross painted on its sides marked its change of owners. War reporter Fritz Luck described it in a soldier's newspaper a few days later, an armoured box as big as a bus, on giant balloon tyres as big and fat as the undercarriage wheels of a junker's plane. A spent machine gun bullet is still embedded in it. The walls are windowless and painted in blue-gray camouflage tints. Only the driver and his co-driver have windshields, protected behind armored visors. Rommel's mammoth became a familiar sight to his troops in Libya. What happened next, in this second week of April 1941, rattled Rommel and shook his soldiers' faith in him. Torbuk defeated him. He learned the hard way, by bloody tactical biopsies, just how strong its defenses were. He ordered Stray Each to make the first attack on the 11th. Stray Each sent in Panath's weary machine gun battalion 8 from the south, and all all bridges available tanks, about 20, on a parallel approach just to the right. Air reconnaissance somehow suggested that the British were evacuating Torbuk by sea. You'll have to move fast. Rommel had ordered. Raise a lot of dust. At 4.45 pm the tanks began to roll. The machine gunner's war diary tells the rest, close behind the last tanks our battalion leaps out and runs behind them and the advancing wall of fire. But to our horror the tanks suddenly turn around and come back at speed through our lines still accompanied by heavy shelling. One of their officers screams to our commander, Panath, there's a very deep and wide anti-tank trench 400 yards farther on. We can't get over it. An hour later Colonel Panath, a tall, handsome, now haggard man, was reporting this in person to Rommel and Stray each. 
behind the tank trap he had also seen an extensive barbed wire barrier. The attack was halted, his men were pinned down, unable to withdraw. His battalion had lost eleven dead, just to find out this most elementary information. Next day, April 12th, a furious sandstorm began. Rommel ordered a new assault, using the sandstorm as cover, to begin at 3.30 pm just before then, however, the storm abated. Stray each asked, are we still to attack? Rommel ordered, that attack must be carried out at all costs. Stray each ordered Rommel's words recorded in his division's diary, and sent in sappers to try to blow up the tank obstacles. A hail of artillery fire met them, at point-blank range. British bombers joined in. Nevertheless, later that day Rommel again decreed, your division is to take Torbruck. The result was the same. At 6 p.m. Albridge, the tank regiment commander, reported back. Again his tanks had failed to breach the defences, and the attempt had been costly, too. The 5th Panzer Regiment had started these battles with 161 tanks. Now it was down to less than 40. Of the 71 best tanks, the Panzer is, only 9 were left. Stray each accordingly refused Rommel's demand for a new assault until it could be properly prepared, he wanted proper air photos, dive bomber attacks on the enemy guns, air cover and spot to planes for his own artillery. The war diary does not record Rommel's reply. However, the plight of Penneth's machine gunners, only a few hundred yards from the enemy lines, left Rommel no option but to renew the attack, they had to be rescued soon. By night they froze, by day they had to lie motionless beneath the baking sun, the slightest movement attracted a hail of rifle fire. The ground was too hard to scoop out foxholes. The defenders seemed to be concealed in some kind of bunkers. Our division cannot even inform us where the enemy positions are, the machine gun battalion complained in its diary. At midday on the 13th, Easter Sunday, Penneth was called back to Rommel's headquarters. When Penneth crawled forward again to his machine gunners at 5 pm, he dictated this order to his adjutant, lying full length in the dust and sand next to him. The general, Rommel, has ordered a new attack on Torbruck. Before that, from 6 to 6.05, six, oh six artillery battalions will pour concentrated shell fire onto the wire barrier ahead of us. Sappers would then move forward and blow in the tank ditch, and Penneth's battalion would infiltrate to the far side and establish a bridgehead for the tank regiment to exploit just before dawn. In effect, Rommel would be pitting 500 machine gunners and about 20 tanks against a fortress defended by 34,000 of the British Empire's toughest troops. That evening, as Penneth's operation began, Rommel called all his assault commanders to his mammoth and set out his plan for the dawn attack. He told them that radio reconnaissance had again indicated that the enemy were pulling out of Torbuk by sea. If the enemy do pull out, he told General Stray each, then we'll follow through with our tank regiments at once, tonight. He put Stray each in command of the attack, and disappeared from the vehicle. Toward midnight Penneth's adjutant appeared, hot and disheveled, and told Stray each that his machine gun battalion had breached the tank ditch and wire without any enemy resistance at all, should they press on? Stray each smelled an ambush and forbade any further move until first light. The German bridgehead was about 500 yards wide. But as the assault troops quietly dug in, and how easy that sounds exclamation mark disturbing things began to happen. Shadows flitted against the moonlight and then vanished, leaving soldiers with their throats slit or stabbed by bayonets. Were there enemy defenders hidden just nearby? An hour passed, then a mass of enemy troops suddenly rose out of the blackness, singing it's a long way to Tipperary, forty more Germans were cut down, then the enemy vanished back into their hidden bunkers. In fact, without realizing it, the Germans had penetrated right into the midst of the first line of enemy bunkers, they were built flush with ground level, and the Australian defenders were only waiting for the dawn to come to mow them down. As yet it was still dark. At 3.30 am, 
An hour before the tank regiment was due to go into the breach, Rommel was still confident. The battle for Tobruk will probably come to its conclusion today, he informed Lucy. The British are fighting stubbornly with a lot of artillery, but we're still going to pull it off. An hour later Olbrich's tanks roared into the breach. Rommel had given Stray each the use of an Italian artillery regiment and a flak battery for close support. At first light, Rommel drove up the road from Melodem toward Torbruck, from the light signals and gunfire in the north he could see that Penneth's machine gunners were well inside the tank ditch. But something alarmed Rommel. He now drove off to the Italian armoured division Ariat and ordered it to follow all British tanks through the breach. Ariat, however, had only just arrived and could not help. The story of the next three bloody hours can be briefly told. At dawn the British troops pinched off the breach behind the machine gunners, preventing their escape. At 7.45 am all British tanks were forced to turn back by the enemy guns, the enemy also threw aircraft and superior Matilda tanks into the battle. Olbrich drove to Rommel and spelled out the failure of his attack. He had seen the liquidation of virtually the entire machine gun battalion with his own eyes. Of 500 men only 116 were left to escape during the following night. The rest were dead or in enemy captivity. The flak battery had fought heroically but had lost most of its equipment. Olbrich himself had lost half his tanks, and the turrets of most of the others were jammed. Rommel was angry and perplexed. In a rage he ordered Stray each to attack again at 4 pm if not to capture Torbuk, at least to help Penneth's hapless surviving machine gunners to escape. Stray each did not refuse, he merely declined to accept responsibility. Earlier he had told Rommel's operations officer, Major Ehlers, Herr General Rommel may not like to hear it, but it is my duty as next senior officer to point it out, if the British had had the least daring, they could have pushed out of their fortress through the breach and not only over on the rest of my division, but captured the Afrika Corps headquarters and mine as well. That would have been the end of the German presence in Libya, and the end of Herr General's reputation. Be so good as to tell your general that. Ehlers returned with this message for Stray each, Rommel has instructed you to revert to an offensive defense. Stray each walked out, shaking his head. Olbrich supported Stray each's refusal to attack again. Count von Schwerin said, over my dead body. All considered that any further slaughter incurred in attacking defenses of which they knew nothing would be a crime. Rommel's headquarters diary limply concludes. A second attack was scheduled. But did not take place. He masked this ghastly defeat in his evening report to the general staff, casualties cannot yet be assessed. But it could not be entirely concealed. The brave commander of the machine gun battalion, Gustav Bernath, was dead, so were most of his men. A crisis of confidence began, for the first time an anti-Rommel faction emerged among the troops. He had burned good men rather than prepare the assault properly, they said. Major Bolbrinka, Olbrich's successor, subsequently criticized Rommel for ignoring his tank commander's advice. Rommel would not admit his own fault and continued to put the defeat down to other reasons. During the offensive in Serenaica, he explained to the war office in July, and particularly during the early part of the siege of Torbuk, there were numerous instances when my clear and specific orders were not obeyed by my commanders, or not promptly, there were instances bordering on disobedience, and some commanders broke down in face of the enemy. To Berlin he telegraphed an appeal for more troops. He lamented that he was now so preoccupied by Torbuk that despite unique opportunities offered by the overall situation, he could not resume his offensive to the east. The plaintive tone brought peals of unsympathetic laughter from the general staff. At last Rommel had been taken down a peg or two. Franz Halder, chief of the general staff, quoted Rommel's words mockingly in his diary and added, Now at last he is compelled to admit that his forces are just not strong enough. We have heard that impression here for quite some time. Over the next days, 
Rommel continued to salvage his self-esteem by finding scapegoats for the disaster. He blamed Streich and Olbrich for the slaughter of the machine gun battalion. I don't get the support I need from all my commanders, he confided to Lucy in one letter. I've put in for some of them to be changed. He fell out with his own chief of staff, Colonel von dem Born, a calm, circumspect officer. He sent his operations officer Major Rios home and engineered his dismissal from the general staff. Rios had suggested in the court diary that if Rommel had not gone gallivanting across the desert to Mechili on April 5, it might have been possible to reach Torbuk before the enemy instead of getting bogged down. Rommel even regained some of his lost confidence. On the 16th he assured Lucy, the battle for Torbuk has calmed down a bit. The enemy are embarking. So we can expect to be taking over the fortress ourselves very shortly. Visiting the shattered remnants of the machine gun battalion that day, he encouraged them, we'll be in Cairo eight days from now, pass the word around. He made no attempt to call on General Streich's nearby headquarters although it was his 50th birthday. Streich guessed his days there were numbered. Herr Lieutenant General Rommel regretted the casualties our battalion took, a machine gun officer reported to Streich, and told us, you mustn't let it get you down. It's the soldier's lot. Sacrifices have to be made. Rommel blamed the battalion's faulty leadership for not having first opened up a wider breach in the defenses. He explained it to us on his map with short pencil marks. When Lieutenant Prahl pointed out that the battalion just did not have the means available to widen the breach, he replied, then the division should have taken care of it. Already Rommel was planning new exploits. He exuded fresh optimism when two top Luftwaffe generals flew in two days later, General Hoffmann von Waldor, the deputy chief of air staff, and Field Marshal Melch, Hermann Göring's deputy. While Waldor shivered in a bitterly cold tent, Milch shared Rommel's warm trailer and later wrote this account, it is among his private papers. The time I spent with him was short but sweet, as we both got on well with each other. He was very happy about the increase in fighter plane strength elements of the 27th fighter wing had just arrived at nearby Ghazala, as he was one of our more air-minded generals. He was quite starry-eyed about his prospects. Bending very close to his maps, he was desperately short-sighted, he exclaimed, Look, Melch, there's Torbruk. I'm going to take it. There's the half fire Pass. I'll take that too. There's Cairo. I'll take that. And there, there is the Suez Canal, I'm taking that as well. What else, wrote Melch, could I say to that except, and here am I. Take me too. Roars of laughter came from the trailer. But other, less congenial visitors were already on their way from Berlin to Rommel. On April 23 General Halder recorded sharply in his diary, Rommel has not sent us a single clear-cut report all these days, and I have a feeling that things are in a mess. Reports from officers coming from his theater, as well as a personnel letter, show that Rommel is in no way equal to his task. He rushes about the whole day between his widely scattered units, stages reconnaissance raids and fritters away his forces. Thus it came about that as Count von Schwerin lay prostrate in the desert, scanning Torbruk's defenses through field glasses while enemy shells and machine gun bullets pierced the shimmering air above him, he felt a tugging at his sleeve and found Halder's deputy, Paulus, lying next to him. Paulus had flown from Berlin, driven and finally crawled to this battlefield to try to find out what was happening. Paulus and Rommel, both army captains at the time, had both been company commanders in the same regiment in 1927-29 in Stuttgart, he's probably the only man, reflected Halder, with sufficient personal influence to head off this soldier gone raving mad. It was April 27th when Paulus arrived at Torbrut to see things for himself. Rommel's nerve was already tattered. The terrible heat and the backbiting on all sides did not help. Twice in the last week he had missed death only by inches, an enemy salvo had dropped right on them as he stopped to talk to infantry officers digging in west of Elladem, one lieutenant was killed outright, 
another lost an arm. And on the 20th, as he was returning from a visit to Bardia, hurricane fighter planes had suddenly swooped out of the dying sun and machine gunned his mammoth at zero altitude. His driver was hit before he could close the steel door. A truck driver and a dispatch rider were killed outright. The radio truck was destroyed. Rommel himself bandaged his driver's bad head wound and climbed into the mammoth's driving seat. Rommel now had only puny forces left to hold Bardia and the Egyptian frontier, and they reeled under the blows of enemy tanks, bombers and even ship's guns. On April 24, Rommel had sent renewed appeals for help to Berlin. Situation at Bardia, Torbjörn Graver from day to day as British forces increase. He demanded an airlift of the promised 15th Panzer Division, the early expansion of the 5th Light to a full bodied Panzer Division, powerful Luftwaffe reinforcements, and U boat operations along the coast. He added briefly, Italian troops unreliable. When Hitler heard of Rommel's plight next day, one of his staff jotted in a private diary, Fury uses very strong language. Two days later, the leading elements of the 15th Panzer Division began to arrive by air in Benghazi. Hitler's language about the general staff was mild compared with the oaths that rang out from Rommel's officers now, as they at long last received from the Italian High Command detailed plans of the defences of Torbuk, now they could see what they had been up against. Italian engineers had designed and built 128 interconnected strong points all along the 30 mile long perimeter. Like the tank ditch guarding each strong point, the gangways were all covered with wood and a thin layer of sand to conceal them, they housed anti tank gun and machine gun positions and were all finished off flush with ground level to make them invisible to attackers until they were right on top of them. There were heavy barbed wire entanglements around them. Little wonder that Rommel's last attempt to rush Torbuk had been repulsed so bloodily. Besides, as Paulus commented privately to Stray each, can you give me one instance in history where a penetration of enemy lines that was begun in the evening was ever successfully exploited on the following morning? As Stray each had pointed out, the evening move gave the enemy all the advance warning they needed to be on guard when the main push began. It was about this time that Rommel called the Italian commanders and Stray each for a joint conference on his new battle plans. Stray each interrupted. A few days ago, he said, some of my officers and I had a look over the ground southeast of Torbuk. It's level and offers us a good chance of moving our troops forward at night, right up to their fortifications, without being noticed, they can then attack at dawn. Rommel scornfully rebuked him. I don't want to hear any ideas from you, I just want to hear how you intend to put my plan into effect. After all else had failed, it was Stray Each's plan that he was to adopt successfully later on, once the general had left Africa. Rommel was still optimistic. He admitted privately to Lucy on April 25, I've rarely had such military anxieties as over the last few days. But things will probably look very different soon. Probably Greece will be finished soon, and then I'll get more help. He repeated this help some days later, so it is quite clear that even his old associate General Paulus had not revealed to him Hitler's Operation Barbarossa, the plan to hurl 200 divisions against Russia in June. The relationship between Paulus and Rommel was awkward now. They were both lieutenant generals, but Paulus had a few months' edge on him and since he was hauled as deputy he could pull both rank and station on Rommel. Rommel had no choice but to obey. He suspected that the general's surprise visit was an intrigue by the general staff. Probably he was right. He sent Paulus around the perimeter of the siege ring and told him he was planning a big new attack on Torbuk's southwestern sector on the last day of April. Paulus was skeptical. Dissatisfied with Stray Each, Rommel put General Heinrich Kirchheim in command. Kirchheim was a war office tropical warfare expert who just happened to be in Libya at the time. This appointment would have fateful consequences for Rommel. In October 1944, the attack would be by night, focused at first on the shallow hill 209, known to the long vanished local Arabs as Razelm Dorua. From 209, 
the enemy was harassing Rommel's rear lines of communication. Again he had great expectations, we've got high hopes, he wrote to Lucy that morning. The enemy artillery has fallen very silent, although we're giving them hell ourselves. Surprise was complete, thanks to Rommel's well-planned deception tactics. But again the attack failed, and again it was because of German ignorance of Torbuk's fortifications. Rommel drove through to the first line to observe the battle from his mammoth. At one stage he crawled the last few hundred yards forward to where Kirchheim's shock troops were pinned down near one bunker. By 9 a.m. a machine gun battalion had taken Hill 209 from the rear, and the main attempt to drive northeastward toward Torbuk itself began but the penetration was too narrow, and as the troops advanced they stumbled on yet more well-concealed strong points. On May 1 Baron Hans Karl von Erspeck, Pritwitz's successor in the 15th Panzer Division, informed Rommel, our troops and particularly officers have suffered heavy casualties from infantry and anti-tank fire coming from numerous undetected bunkers and from saturation artillery fire. Most units have 50% casualties, some even more. Morale is still absolutely magnificent, both among our shock troops, who went in as planned to attack the objectives, and among the infantry companies, who followed them eastward in heavy close combat with the reviving bunker crews and held out despite artillery fire. A stinging sandstorm sprang up and stifled the rest of the battle. Rommel hung on to Hill 209, and to several hundred prisoners, including Australian troops, some of the largest, most muscular Australian troops he had ever seen. But Paulus ordered him peremptorily to call off the rest of the attack. Rommel's soldiers had suffered further appalling casualties, over 1,200 men killed, injured and missing. More significant, his ammunition dumps had been so depleted by warding off enemy counterattacks that he found himself facing his first real crisis of supplies. Rommel first hinted at these supply difficulties in a letter home on May 9. Paulus had rubbed it in, the fact was that Rommel's brilliant but undisciplined advance to Torbuk had failed to bring decisive victory but had added another 700 miles to his already extended lines of supply. Torbuk Harbour was denied to him by the Australians. Benghazi was closer than Tripoli, but the Italians were refusing to send supply ships the for reasons of which Paulus thoroughly approved, the port had only limited capacity, the sea route was longer and the danger of British interference that much greater. German Navy officers sent to organize Rommel's supply routes had returned to Italy having been unable to speak to him. General Rommel had flown off to the front with his chief of staff and had been out of contact with his operations staff for 24 hours. This left only the long road from Tripoli Harbour to Torbuk. It was 1,100 miles long, the distance from Hamburg to Rome, and this introduced another serious bottleneck, the truck transport itself. The mathematics of his situation were plain enough. For bare survival, the Africa Corps at this time needed 24,000 tons of supplies each month. To stockpile for a future offensive, it needed another 20,000 tons a month. The Luftwaffe needed 9,000 tons of supplies. Add to this the 63,000 tons needed by the Italian troops and Italian civilian population in Libya, and a staggering monthly requirement of 116,000 tons arose. But the facilities at Tripoli could handle only 45,000 tons a month. Juggle as they might with these hard facts, the German representatives in Rome could not find any way of providing Rommel with more than about 20,000 tons a month, less than bare survival. It was a problem of Rommel's own making, and the knowledge of this only angered him the more. How easy it had been to make that retort to Halder in March, that's your pigeon. As the supple crisis worsened, his venom turned on the Italians, responsible for supply shipments across the Mediterranean, and he even suggested that Italy's troops should withdraw, leaving the fighting to the Africa Corps, as the Italians were useless mouths to be fed. His injustices toward the Italians derived from the frustration of his hand-to-mouth existence. A temporary crisis in shipping occurred because the nearby British-held island of Malta, 
with its naval and air bases, had not been effectively neutralized. But over the whole period of the war in Africa, the Italian Navy performed its convoy duties well. The figures show that, on average, each transport ship had more than one naval escort, a ratio never reached by the Allies. Of 206,402 men shipped to Africa, 189,162 arrived safely, over 91%, of 599,338 tons of fuel, 476,703 tons arrived, 80%, of trucks and tanks. 243,633 tons arrived of 275,310 tons sent, 88%, 149,462 tons of arms and ammunition, of 171,060 tons sent, 87%. As far as the German forces alone were concerned. Rommel got 82% of the fuel and 86% of the other supplies that were sent to him. This hardly justified the words he used with increasing amplitude to explain his supplely crisis, Italian treachery. For Rommel's troops besieging Torbruck, stifling, static war began. More than once, in the scribbled pencil notes of his staff on the anxious talks with other commanders, explicit comparisons with Verdun crop up. But where were the trenches? Here there was just dirt, and hard rock, and ferocious sun and flies. His men were ill and strained. The least grays, unavoidable when digging holes in this barren ground, and the slightest scratch from the camel thorn bushes stayed unhealed for months as a permanent running sore on arm or leg. Noses peeled, lips cracked and blistered. The tough commander of the forces holding the Egyptian frontier at Solom, Colonel Maximilian von Herf, a man of ludicrous affectations, but a brave one, wrote in a letter to Berlin, gastric disorders, a kind of chill, are rife here. They occur about once a month and leave you very weak for a while. After three days of it recently I felt so bad that I fainted three times in one day. But I got over it without reporting sick. At any rate all of us Africa warriors, officers and men alike, will be glad to see the back of it. We say, never again Africa. Herf earned his ticket back to Berlin some weeks later and became chief of personnel in Himmler's Waffen SS. Erwin Rommel had to endure Africa for two more years. Even men half his age found the going tough. The food was monotonous, the diet lopsided. His troops had to survive on biscuits olive oil, because butter would go rancid, canned sardines, coffee, jam, soft cheese in toothpaste tubes and unidentifiable meat in Italian government cans embossed am the soldiers suspected it stood for old man, old man. Of course there were no eggs, ham or milk, let alone fresh fruit or vegetables. All the greater was their envy of the British. How pitiful our equipment is in every respect, compared with the British wrote Herf. Just look at the supplies they get, mineral water, canned preserves and fruit, things that we sorely lack. This lack is becoming increasingly evident from the damage to our youngsters health as the days get hotter. Even our 25 year olds are already losing their teeth and their gums just won't stop bleeding. It's not going to be an easy summer. It was by now so hot that Rommel drove around in shorts a real concession in a general so stiff and formal. Every day began at six, as he began the intensive training of all ranks in the unfamiliar infantry tactics they would need to eliminate Torbuk's defenses bunker by bunker. The knowledge that he had failed, and at such cost, oppressed him and he could guess the tone of Paulus's report to Berlin. Everywhere he sensed the murmur of rising criticism. Even Herf had written to Berlin about the losses his regiment had suffered so far in the war, in the West we had already lost over 1,000 men, then the sinking of a convoy cost me 250 more and my gun company, and Torbuk alone has already cost me nearly 450 men. Nobody here understood these first attacks on Torbuk, 
Although the strength and garrison of the fortress were well known, each newly arrived battalion was sent in to attack and naturally enough didn't get through. The upshot is that there isn't a unit at Torbuk that hasn't taken a mauling. A lot of the more impulsive commands issued by the Afrika Korps we junior officers just don't make head or tail of. Herf's telling letter was placed in Rommel's personnel file, like a permanent black mark. There was a German army cemetery near Torbuk, beside the Via Balbia. Many times Rommel paused that to read the names on the newest graves. I remember, said one of the war correspondents assigned to him, seeing General Rommel stand there one day, at kilometer 31 outside Torbuk, the last kilometer in so many brave soldiers' lives, and I watched him meditating. That long summer of 1941 the war cemetery here swelled to quite a size, and in the eerie twilight of a sandstorm it seemed to us, in all its cruel loneliness, something of a symbol of man's transience. We were looking at the grave of an officer. For a while he stood there, absolutely motionless. Then he turned away without a word and left. But in his eyes I believe I saw what moved him, there was deep sorrow in them. It was the sorrow of a man saying farewell to an old friend and comrade. The high African summer was upon them. Tanks standing in the open, and in the desert there was nowhere else for tanks to stand, heated up to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. They were too hot to touch. Rommel ordered his movie cameraman to take pictures of eggs being fried on the tanks, to impress the public in Germany. The eggs refused to fry, so Rommel sparked an acetylene burner and applied the flame to the metal. His old genius had not left him yet. The commander's revolt. Take the road that Marshal Balbo built, as Rommel does so often now, from Torbuk eastward along the Via Balbia to the next big town, Bardia. It is an hour's fast drive, with the sea never far away to the left and the tall escarpment to the right. After Bardia the road climbs ten miles until it meets the Tricapust so, the old camel route across the high plateau. Here the Italians have built a stone fort, Ridotta Capust so, to guard the frontier with Egypt just two miles farther on. The frontier is a broad barbed wire entanglement originally built to keep the rebellious Sanusi warriors out of Libya. It stretches into the desert, as far as the eye can see. A few hundred yards beyond the frontier, into Egypt, the road begins a steep, tortuous descent of the escarpment toward the town of Solom. Its untidy keys are silhouetted against the deep blue of the Mediterranean. Left of the coast road that runs on from here are dazzling white sand and sea. To the right the escarpment again rises, steep and uneven, to heights of 600 feet and more. This road goes on to Cairo, but a few miles after Solom another road forks off to the right and scales the escarpment in a series of hairpin bends, serpentines, the Germans call them. This is the Harfire Pass, which Rommel's troops under Colonel von Hoef have captured late in April 1941. Only at Solom and Harfire can tanks easily climb the escarpment to the desert plateau and thus gain access to Libya. This is the importance of the Solom front, if it caves in, Rommel is vulnerable to a British attack from Egypt, he will have to abandon the siege of Torbuk, and fall back on a line at El Ghazala or retreat even farther west. Obeying Paulus, he has issued blueprints early in May for the fortification of the Solom Front, he has sketched the designs himself, based on Torbuk bunkers that he himself inspected under fire some days before. On May 22, he takes this road in his mammoth to visit Herf and his troops. Hermann Aldinger, his aide, writes that day a portrait of life in the Afrika Korps. After days of tough fighting on the Solom, Kapuzzo front the general has today paid a visit to this sector and called on the troops. We leave his headquarters at dawn and set out over 45 miles of roadless, pathless desert across boulders and camel thorn shrubs. The ACV rolls about as though we are on the high seas, and we are thrown about inside however tight we hold on. The general and I climb up and sit on the roof, there are three exit hatches on top and keep a lookout on all sides, because enemy aircraft can be a real menace. 
convoys of trucks, swathed in clouds of dust, are moving hither and thither. Day and night the drivers have to go about their arduous and not unrisky duty, because the front is by no means closed and the enemy's armored cars and sabotage units are also moving about. The troops stand to attention and salute, and are delighted when the general speaks to them. We reach the Via Balbia and have to go on more miles to the east. The road is badly worn and there are potholes big enough to swallow half a car. Soon we reach the Solim front and we have one conference after another. But then the general feels the urge to meet the men actually face to face with the enemy, he has to speak with them, crawl right forward to them in their foxholes and have a chat with them. You can see the real pleasure on their faces, when these ordinary soldiers are allowed to speak in person to their general and tell him about the hard fighting here over the last few days. The ground is hard rock, impossible to dig in, cover can only be made by heaping up rocks, and a canvas sheet is stretched out over them to provide some shelter from the scorching sun. This is why the soldiers don't wear much either, often just a pair of shorts. The lads are as brown as negroes. And so we move from position to position, infantry, artillery, tanks, observers, etc. Victories over the last few days, and defensive successes, give them all great hope. When Rommel saw this front on May 22, Colonel von Herf had just inflicted a crushing rebuff to the British. Rommel told me when he visited us, wrote Herf that he was scared stiff for us, as there wasn't anything he could have done to help us, Rommel had ordered Hef one month earlier to adopt an aggressive and fluid defense, sending raiding parties far behind the enemy lines. The colonel showed great initiative. He exploited the first sandstorm to attack the British and steal their trucks. He dug positions. He trained his joint German, Italian force of some 6,000 men. For the Italians he had high praise, with patience and energy, he recorded some weeks later, I succeeded in making useful and brave soldiers out of them, they held out to the end against the enemy and knew how to die without fear. This was just as well, because the British decided to strike here with 55 tanks of the 7th Armored Division and the 22nd Guards Brigade before Ommel's new Panzer Division, the 15th, could arrive. The blow fell at dawn on May 15. At least ten of the enemy's tanks were the dreaded Matildas, all but impervious to the German anti-tank guns. It was obvious to Rommel from the radio intercepts obtained by his intelligence staff that this was a major enemy attempt at relieving Torbuk from the rear. He admitted a few days later, it hung by a thread. However, Herf made the right decision, to roll with the enemy's initial punch although this meant abandoning ground, and then sidestep after dark to strike unexpectedly on the enemy flank the next morning. Herf's narrative continues, by afternoon, May 15th, I had things under control again. I withdrew that night with all the German troops and early on the 16th I struck back with eight tanks into the enemy's flank. By evening I had recaptured all the lost ground except the half hour pass. This first battle of Solim had given Rommel a nasty fight, and he sent a string of jumpy signals to Berlin at two or three hour intervals as it ebbed and flowed, cajoling, beseeching, reassuring, warning, appealing and then triumphing as Herf, aided by a battalion of the 8th Panzer Regiment, restored the situation. Rommel's nervousness nearly brought an abrupt end to his African career, already under a cloud because of protest letters reaching Berlin over the slaughter in Torbruck. Field Marshal von Braukitsch himself sent a six-page signal to him on May 25, demanding that in the future the general's signals be sober and show a certain continuity, he was not to get rattled when the enemy threw surprises at him. You are to avoid reporting too optimistically or too pessimistically under the immediate influence of events, Braukic directed. Rommel petulantly dismissed the commander-in-chief's telegram as a colossal rocket, the reason for which is completely beyond me. Fortunately for his prestige, Rommel's Solemn Front commander now launched a counter-attack that proved a stinging blow to the enemy. The British had left the 22nd Guards Brigade to garrison the half-hour pass. Late on May 26 Herf, 
again supported by the 8th Panzer Regiment, decided to spring a surprise attack on this garrison next morning. We rolled into action at 4.30 a.m. first light, on May 27, Herf said, and by 6.15 the pass was in our hands. The British took to their heels along the coastal plain towards Sidi Barani. We picked up a lot of booty, above all artillery, nine guns, tanks, seven Matildas, including three in working order, and the trucks we so badly need. This was a useful boost to Rommel's reputation. He wrote a jaunty and aggressive reply to Braukic's telegram, the reply is not in the files but it was clearly a threat to shake the dust of Africa off his feet. He wrote Lucy ironically on May 29, I had a big rocket from the Army High Command, to my mind quite unjustified, in gratitude for all we have achieved so far. I'm not going to take it lying down, and a letter is already on its way to Von B. A few days later he amplified on this, my affair with the High Command is still extant. Either they do have confidence in me, or they don't. And if they don't, then I have asked them to draw the appropriate conclusions. I'm curious to see what will come of that. Belly aching is so easy if you're not having to sweat things out here. In the Reich, Rommel's fame was spreading, assiduously fanned by the core of news and cameramen he had attached to his staff. It was no coincidence that his chief aide was, like his predecessor Karl Hank, one of the senior officials of the Nazi propaganda ministry, the 36-year-old Lieutenant Alfred Bernd. Burley, wavy-haired and dark-skinned, Bernd had the lumbering gait of a bear and a physiological oddity, six toes on one foot. He was literate and personable, poked his nose in everywhere, and was put in charge of keeping the Rommel diary. Before joining Rommel's staff as a kind of party commissar, he was already a tough, ambitious Nazi zealot. Bernd had a brash frankness that Rommel readily accepted, fearing otherwise to slight his feelings. In April, for instance, Bernd had advised him with a cheeky grin, Mein Lieber, I would not advance too far if I were you. In return, Bernd skillfully nourished the Rommel legend. And when anything unpleasant needed saying to Adolf Hitler, then Rommel sent Alfred Bernd, because he was a brave man. Bernd died proving it in Hungary in 1945. An avalanche of letters descended on Rommel. The Nazi women's organization sent him parcels of chocolate, though how it fared in the desert heat defies imagination. A ten-year-old girl saw her idol in a newsreel and wrote to him from Augsburg. I don't have to be frightened of getting a cold reply from you like from the others. To you, General Rommel, I can speak from the bottom of my heart. I admire you and your Africa Corps so much, and dearly hope you will win through to victory. Rommel, the people's general, replied to the child with equal warmth. He knew, however, that victory was a long way off. The Air Force was doing what it could to destroy Torbuk's water supply and prevent British supply ships from coming in. But he acknowledged that the Africa Corps had met its match. The Australian troops are fighting magnificently and their training is far superior to ours. He privately told Lucy. Torbuk can't be taken by force, given our present means. So he settled down for a long, exhausting siege and began to retrain his troops in the old-fashioned infantry tactics that had succeeded in similar situations in World War I. He taught his men how to dig in, and how to prevent unnecessary bloodshed. He's a master of deception and disguises, said Lieutenant Burnt in a propaganda broadcast, and always does what one least expects. If the enemy believe we are particularly strong at one place, then you can be sure we are weak. If they think we are weak, and venture close to us, then we are definitely strong. With your general we just didn't know where we were exclamation mark that's what one British prisoner complained. If he stages attacks coupled with faint attacks, then the enemy virtually always think the wrong one is the real one, and lay down their entire artillery fire on that. If the enemy act on what they regard as the typical signs of faint attacks, then next time it is different and then they are wrong again. If they think they are dummies and ignore them, then they're the real ones. For a time, 
Burnt continued, the enemy at Torbuk were annoying us by shelling our observation posts. So Rommel orders the erection of observation towers, whole streets of telegraph poles are sawed down and thirty such towers are erected during the night around Torbuk, complete with uniformed dummy soldiers intently keeping watch on the enemy and now and again climbing up and down the ladders, on ropes operated from a dugout. The enemy are puzzled and open up a murderous bombardment on them. For days on end they give these towers every shell they've got. Some are knocked down, others remain. After a while they give up the effort, and that is when we replace the dummy soldiers with real flesh and blood observers. What was the secret of Rommel's success in North Africa? He was a born desert warrior, discovering talents that not even he had previously suspected. In terrain often devoid of landmarks he developed an uncanny sense of location. His memory seemed to have registered every empty oil drum, broken can or burned out tank littering the sands. He had acquired the desert dweller's sixth sense, too. Driving far out in the desert one day with his chief of staff, he suddenly cried, let's pull out. In half an hour the enemy will be here. Soon a dust cloud appeared on the distant horizon, betraying the approach of enemy armored cars. In this new environment he developed a new style of battle command. He liked to leave a fixed operations staff in the rear, in permanent contact with his Italian superiors and with the lower echelons and then drive off himself with a small command staff in a few open cars, followed by mobile radio trucks to keep him in touch with the operations staff and combat units. This did produce problems, because radio sets often failed under the extraordinary climatic conditions, and batteries rapidly ran down. With its black, white and red command flag on its fender, his own Volkswagen Kubel car was clearly visible. From it, he set the angle and tempo of the attack. If his car was shot up or ran over a mine, he simply commandeered another. Thus he could appear in the thick of any battle and take personal command, without the time-consuming waiting for messages that bedeviled other, and particularly the enemy, commanders. When battle began, Rommel rarely slept and seldom met. He could survive for days on a few pieces of bread or a quick cold snack served up by his orderly, Corporal Herbert Gunther. Uncompromising, hard and realistic with himself, he demanded endurance and courage from his commanders. Once he found a general still breakfasting at 6.30 a.m., you will return to Germany. He barked at him. The number of commanders who failed to meet his standards was, at the beginning, very high and their turnover was great. Italian troops who fought under him came to worship him. They had rarely seen an Italian general on the battlefield. They relished the brusqueness with which he treated those of the porky and indifferent Italian generals who fell foul of him. Above all, he humanely recognized that the Italians had their limitations, and that it was callous and foolish to dictate impossible battle tasks to them. There are more virtues in life than just being a soldier he reminded his aide Lieutenant Behrendt that summer. In October 1943 a German intelligence report noted the astounding fact that Italian soldiers were expressing the view that Italy should be governed by a leading German like Goring or Rommel. The first half of June 1941 saw Rommel reshuffling his commanders and preparing for even harder challenges. The rest of the 15th Panzer Division had arrived. Under the youthful Colonel Walter Newman Silkow's command, it was sent to the Solemn Front. In the other Panzer Division, the 5th Light, Rommel had taken harsh steps to eliminate what he termed the crisis in the officer corps. He had court-martialed a tank battalion commander for bursting into tears during the last vain attack on Torbuk, on May 1st, and refusing to attack the impregnable Matilda tanks. He had made Major Ernst Bolbrink of the Panzer Regiment's new commander after Colonel Albrich reported sick to avoid what he described as further flattery from Rommel. And he had got rid of Streich. One day at the end of May he telephoned Streich's command truck. Streich, he said, I have asked for you to be replaced. You will continue in command, however, until your replacement arrives. Does Herr General have any further orders? Streich coldly inquired, 
and hung up before Rommel could reply. The reason Rommel gave for sacking him was that he had questioned Rommel's orders and embarked on long-winded discussions. His successor was Major General Johannes von Ravenstein, who arrived on May 31st. Aristocratic, lean and good-looking, he was a bit of a dandy, but like Rommel he wore the Paula Merite. The sauna temperatures of Libya were too much for his constitution, and he spent his first few days lying exhausted on a camp bed. Streich left Africa a few days later, his career permanently blighted by his differences with Rommel. As they parted, Rommel gruffly rebuked him, you were far too concerned with the well-being of your troops. Streich saluted stiffly. I can imagine no greater words of praise for a division commander, he replied. As his mammoth bucked and jolted around the desert, Rommel developed a gut feeling that the British were about to launch a big offensive. He told the Italians that he had had a premonition in fact, his radio monitors had intercepted enough evidence. On June 6 they warned him of a change in the enemy dispositions. A week later they identified messages from British armored red units at Habata calling for ammunition. Habata was the only place, apart from Solom and Half Fire, where tanks could climb up to the Libyan desert plateau. Rommel wrote to Lucy, the British have moved off 40 miles into the desert. The trouble is, I don't know if they're falling back or preparing a new attack. We're ready for them. This was the enemy's Operation Battle X. On Churchill's orders that Rommel was to be destroyed, a convoy had sailed the Mediterranean to deliver 238 new tanks to Alexandria. It was a colossal increase in strength. Sir Noel Beresford Pierce commander of the British Western Desert Force, decided to attack promptly. On June 14 Rommel's monitors heard every British unit being warned by radio that Peter would be next day. A name like that had also preceded the attack in mid-May, that evening, therefore, he alerted the Solemn Front and ordered his mobile reserves to stand by. At 4.30 am the next day a two-pronged British attack developed there both down on the coastal plain and on the high plateau. By nine it was clear that this was a major enemy offensive. It was the first time that Rommel, the Africa Corps, indeed, the entire modern Nazi Wehrmacht, was confronted by such an offensive, and the first time it had to fight a major defensive action. The eyes of the world were on him, and he was acutely conscious of the fact. Throughout the first day, June 15, 1941, violent and bloody tank and infantry battles raged under the scorching heat and choking dust clouds. Rommel's prospects did not look good. He had fewer tanks than the enemy, about 150 to their 190, and only 95 of his were real battle tanks, Panzeris and Ives. Of the enemy's force, about 100 were the fierce Matildas, twice as heavily armored as the Germans, and invulnerable to the 37mm pack, anti-tank, gun. The Diary of Machine Gun Battalion 8 that day describes how eight Matildas came into attack. Again our 37mm pack is powerless. Its shells just bounce off the tank's thick armor, only a lucky shot in its tracks or turret bearings has any effect. So they rumble onto within 100 yards of our position halt and then knock out our packs one by one. We watch bitterly as one gun after another stops firing. Even individual acts of gallantry cannot help in this situation. Gun a blank of seven company is still firing on a Matilda at five yards range, no good. The steel colossus rolls on over him and his gun. His comrades bring the brave young lad back to us. Our surgeon has to amputate both legs on the battlefield because they are just pulp. Later he died of his injuries. An incident like this told a lot about the spirit that Rommel had already inculcated into the Africa Corps. But spirit was not all. He had not been idle since the fighting at Torbruck. Knowing that only the 88mm flak gun was a match for the Matilda, he had dug in five of these scarce weapons at Halfire and four on the Hafet Ridge and he had given his other four 88s to the 15th Panzer Division which was standing guard behind the Solem front. In the other strong points along the Solem line he installed the new Pack 38, 
a 50mm gun that was an improvement on the 37mm. By the time of this battle, the line was admittedly only half completed and poorly provisioned with ammunition, food and water. But it was held by one of the most indomitable characters in North Africa, Captain Wilhelm Bark, the gangling, cigar-smoking commanding officer of the 1st Battalion of the 104th Rifle Regiment. Bark was a former pastor, gentle and soft-spoken. He inspired a unique affection from his men. The fighting on June 15th was inconclusive, but that evening Rommel was optimistic. Not only had the half-hour pass held, but of the twelve big Matildas that had lumbered toward its supper, plateau, end, eleven had been picked off by Bark's well-hidden 88s, and four of the six Matildas that had approached from the coastal end were lying knocked out in the minefields Rommel had laid. That night Colonel Newman Silkow reported that the 15th Panzer had destroyed 60 enemy tanks. He was now planning a counter-attack. Rommel, who resisted the urge to rush to the Solem battlefield, staying instead at his corps headquarters 100 miles away, radioed his approval and then spent a sleepless night. The battle will be decided in a hard contest today, he wrote to Lucy at 2.30 a.m. Newman Silkow's tanks opened their counter-attack at dawn, April 16. His plan had been to sweep past the crumbling ruins of Fort Capuzzo, which the British had captured the evening before, cross the frontier wire and then attack the enemy's long flank. But he made little headway. At 7.45 a.m. Rommel's radio monitors told him that a big tank battle was raging. Later that morning the 15th Panzer Division had to disengage. Only 35 of its 80 tanks were still running. Shortly after noon the other Panzer Division, the 5th Light, was also stalled by strong enemy armor near Sidi Omar on the frontier. Without doubt, as Rommel later wrote, this was the turning point of the battle. If the British now concentrated their forces and pressed on regardless, he would have to abandon the siege of Torbruck. So he made a decision, one of the great decisions of his career. Gambling on the evident British nervousness about their flanks, he radioed the 15th Panzer at 12.35 pm to disengage at Kapuzzo and advance south, paralleling the 5th Light's line of advance. Before dawn, these two divisions would cut right into the enemy's flank and strike toward the coast at half fire thus lifting the siege on Captain Bark and cutting off the entire British expedition. Meanwhile he sent a fighter plane to drop a thrilling message to the half-fire defenders, our counter-attack now making fine progress from the west. Enemy forced onto the defensive. Victory depends on your holding the half-fire pass and the coastal plain. The fifth light set off on time, at 4.30 am by 6 it had reached its first objective, Sidi Suleiman. The 15th Panzer Division also arrived at its objective. Intercepted radio messages told Rommel, still at his headquarters 100 miles away, of the enemy's frustration, surprise and then panic. At 7.45 am the enemy's 7th Armored Brigade was monitored reporting that it had no ammunition left, the situation's desperate. A British tank commander was heard calling for Sir Noel Beresford Pierce to come from Cairo to the battlefield. Rommel repeated this great news to his Panzer Division commanders and urged them to act fast. They thundered into the half fire pass in mid afternoon, ending Bach's heroic ordeal. Thus, Rommel had won his first pitched tank battle. The next day, June 18, Rommel drove over to thank his exhausted German and Italian troops. Their faces were reward enough, and he found their new adulation exhilarating. Having rationed himself this time to only one terse message to Berlin each day of the battle, now he announced triumphantly his impressive victory. He claimed to have destroyed 180 to 200 enemy tanks and a few days later revised the figure to 250. The real number was somewhat less than either figure but as he had lost only twelve tanks there was no minimizing his own achievement. The British, he boasted to Lucy, thought they could overwhelm us with their four hundred super-heavy tanks. We had nothing like that weight of armor to pit against them. But our dispositions and the stubborn resistance of German and Italian troops, 
although cut off for days on end, enabled me to mount the crucial operation with every combat group I still had mobile. Let the enemy come again, they'll get an even sounder thrashing. Rommel had won by his superior tactics and better training. He had lured the enemy armor onto his anti-tank guns, he had ambushed them, he had made moves by night and taken them in the flank. He had laid the bogey of the Matilda, too. A captured British major asked to see the gun that had destroyed his tank. Shown the Flak 88, he said, that's not fair, to use an anti-aircraft gun against a tank, the enemy, who did not know the secret, assumed that the Panzer III and IV had delivered the knockout punches. Thus both Rommel and his tanks were now talked of with awe abroad. At home too his reputation was sky high. Three times now, in April, May and June 1941, it had hung on a slender thread in the desert. Each time his nerves had proved stronger than his enemies. And as the fanfares announcing Rommel's solemn victory still blared from the Reich's radio stations, several writers decided that Rommel now merited a full biography. I want to create a work of lasting value, a colonel wrote him. It will show the typical young general of our times offer him to coming generations as an example and thus provide something of a starting point for waves of military enthusiasm and exaltation. Hitler proposed that Rommel should be promoted to full Panzer general. But the general staff rebelled at this. They were outraged at the prospect of Rommel's being raised from lieutenant colonel to full general in less than two years. Their resentment of Rommel had by no means abated over the previous months. Holder was continuing his vendetta. In May he had commented in his diary, Rommel cannot cope, and he had secretly proposed to Braukic that strong reins be put on Rommel. A second chief of staff, Holder suggested, Lieutenant General Alfred Gores, should be attached to the Italian high command in Libya. There had also been talk of setting up a full army headquarters in Libya under Field Marshal Wilhelm List the victor in Greece and a former superior of Rommel's at Dresden. Whatever the designs, fate again played into Rommel's hands. The full army headquarters was not authorized. General Gores was, in fact, sent to Africa, but he was a quiet, polite soul and anything but an intriguer. He chanced to arrive at Rommel's trailer on June 15, the first day of the solemn fighting. He marveled at Rommel's grasp of the battle decided that the Afrika Corps commander could cope very well and promptly placed his entire and impressive staff at Rommel's disposal, 43 officers, 20 civilians, 150 enlisted ranks and 46 vehicles. Holder recalled Gors for consultations in Berlin, then wrote his own summary of Gors's report. Personal relationships are complicated by General Rommel's peculiarities and his pathological ambition, Halter claimed Gors had said. Rommel's faults make him appear a particularly unattractive character, but nobody dares to cross swords with him because of his brutal methods and the backing he has at the highest level. How the generals envied Rommel's easy access to Hitler. The upshot was that the army high command decided to set up a Panzer Group Rommel. A Panzer Group was rather less than an army but its establishment left no alternative but to promote Rommel to full general after all. He would command his old Afrika Corps and the Italian 21st Corps of Infantry Divisions. A few days later he learned that it was his influential aide who had helped push the promotion through, to the highest level. He wrote Lucy, as I have just found out from Lieutenant B. Ernt, who visited the Führer and Goebbels, I have only the Führer to thank for my recent promotion. You can imagine how pleased I am, to win his recognition for what I do and the way I do it is beyond my wildest dreams. A full general at only 49. That meant Rommel had really come up smelling like a rose despite the ugly disputes during the weeks of Torbruck. It's very nice to rise so high while still so young, he reflected just after the promotion became effective. But I'm stocking up with even more stars, just in case. Meanwhile Rommel learned that Hitler had invaded the Soviet Union. His commanders were astounded. Schwerin told his staff privately, that's that. Now we have lost the war. Rommel as usual was optimistic. 
he expected a rapid victory and rejoiced at this blow to Churchill's hopes. Of course, he conceded to Lucy, it would mean delaying his own proposed journey to Germany, I can't very well appear at the Führer's HQ with my own problems at present. Now at last it dawned on him why Hitler and the general staff had refused to flood Banzer divisions, heavy artillery and supplies into North Africa. The truth was that Hitler, the way Macht High Command and the general staff were looking ahead to the post-Barbarossa era, the time when, with Russia defeated, Hitler's invincible way Macht would begin a campaign of conquest along the roads that Alexander the Great and his hoplites had marched more than 2,000 years before. On a rainy day in early June at the Berghof, the Führer's fortified Bavarian mountain home, he had confided to his intimates, the Russians have massed their entire strength on their western frontier, the biggest concentration in history. If Barbarossa goes wrong, we are all lost anyway. As soon as that is all over, Iraq and Syria will take care of themselves. Then I'll have a free hand, and I'll be able to push on down through Turkey as well. These dreams took concrete shape in a draft high command directive secretly circulated three days later. It put Rommel's job in Libya firmly into perspective. He would capture Tobruk first, then investigate ways of invading Egypt from the west, the way Macht, after conquering the Caucasus, would come down and invade Egypt from the east. On June 28 Holder instructed Rommel to submit a draft plan for this. We are making mighty progress in Russia, Rommel commented to Lucy on the 30th, probably much faster than we expected. This is most important to us here, as we're going to have to hold on tight until the Russian campaign is over. Was Rommel betraying a trace of anxiety, now that he realized that many of his assumptions that spring had been groundless, because of the campaign against the USSR? By this time Rommel's personnel dossier in Berlin was bulging with angry letters and complaints from other officers. Many had been privately interviewed by the general staff on their return from Africa, there was the mild-mannered General Streich, Kirchheim, Olbrich, Rommel's chief of staff Colonel von dem Born, a panzer battalion commander, Major Kohn, and Count von Schwerin. Schwerin warned that Torbuk was degenerating into a mini Verdun and appealed for an active regiment elsewhere. The wastage rate of generals and commanders out here is such that I can compute just when my turn will come, he sardonically wrote. Colonel von Hoeff criticized Rommel's erratic leadership and grotesque decisions and characterized as unacceptable Rommel's habit of court martialing any officer who, in his view, failed in action. This has not been the way in the German army before. We are all horrified about it. Stray each called the habit downright proletarian. When Army Commander in Chief Braukic asked him, at Hitler's headquarters, was it so hot down there that you all just got on each other's nerves? The general replied, No, Herr Feldmarschall, but one thing's got to be said there's a big difference between being a brave and adventurous company leader and a field commander of great genius. General Bodwin Keitel, Chief of Army Personnel, was generous enough to blame this rash of backbiting on the grueling African climate and the battle strains that all Panzer commanders are subjected to. But, he said in a confidential memorandum in June, in the Africa Corps there is quite another burden too, that is the general's personality, and his way of expressing it and of giving orders. Indeed, Rommel frequently issued impossible orders, which nobody could take seriously, and then revoked them immediately. He thought nothing of insulting senior commanders like Kirchheim. Courts martial ordered by Rommel mostly acquitted the officers he charged. It is remarkable that in the case of one officer, a battalion commander in the 5th Panzer Regiment, Bodwin Keitel commented, a recommendation for the Knight's Cross, a cowardice charge and his dismissal followed one another in the briefest interval. While in another instance a senior general who had won the Paula Merite was wholly incomprehensibly threatened on the telephone with dismissal while the very next morning, Rommel, denied to his face ever having used such language to him. This must have been General Kirchheim. Full general now or not, Rommel was sent a severely worded reprimand by Field Marshal von Braukic on July 9. 
the commander-in-chief lectured him, I think it my duty to tell you all this not only in the interest of the Africa Corps, but in your own personal interest too. Rommel's reply showed no humility whatever. He probably relished this kind of controversy. Through my new promotion I've leapfrogged over enormous numbers of my comrades, he bragged in a letter on July 12th. And this is bound to attract a lot of envy, a lot. And it did. The end of the year was to find Goebbels complaining at a secret staff conference that, while the birthday of a minor Luftwaffe civil servant had been fated in the Nazi press, the way Macht censorship authorities had forbidden any mention of Rommel's 50th birthday. The General Staff's activation of his Panzer Group, now called Panzer Group Africa, effective from August 15, caused anomalies. Just what was a Panzer Group? And what would Rommel's pay and entitlements as its commander be? I don't rightly know whether this makes me an Oberbefehl Schaber, commander in chief, or not. He puzzled on August 11th. Normally that only goes for a full army commander. Being Rommel. He adopted both styles and waited for reactions. On his headed notepaper he was content with a mere Befehl Schaber, but the very first order issued on August 15th went out with the pretentious headline, Army Order No. 1. As usual, he got away with it. Six days later, he drew the obvious corollary, all my colleagues in equivalent positions are Colonel, Four Star, Generals. If all goes according to plan here, I'll probably be one too by the time the war's over. Studying his first payslip late in September, he found that he was getting an army commander's expense allowance. Sometimes I think I'm dreaming. He exulted to Lucy. Rommel's smash and grab tactics worked because by now everybody knew that he had Hitler's backing. Besides, Libya was far away and the leaders of the Wehrmacht were hypnotized by the pace of their advance into Russia. Among the Italian generals, however, Rommel's rapid advancement struck raw nerves. Somehow this officer, who had arrived with one light division in February to tide them over their misfortunes, was now virtually Axis land commander, North Africa, and vested with considerable territorial and administrative powers as well. The consequence was an undisguised hostility between Rommel and the Italian high command, which was presently based in a marble billet palace far to the rear in ancient Cyrene. On July 12th Garibaldi, the Italian field commander, whom Rommel had come to like for the affable, pliable and avuncular old duffer that he was, was suddenly replaced by General Ito Bastico, a trim, moustached man, a personal friend of Mussolini. Bastico was described by one German as difficult, autocratic and violent so it was clear that there was no room for both him and Rommel in the same desert theatre. Formerly Rommel's superior, he summoned the dusty and dishevelled desert fox to his palace at Cyrene later in July and made it plain he proposed to muzzle him. A journey to Berlin is becoming imperative, said Rommel, fuming, in his next letter home. He flew back to the Reich on July 28. For two days he stayed with Lucy at the War Academy in Wiener Neustadt. Lucy thought he looked unwell and urged him to go see a doctor. Rommel knew she was right but refused to go. I don't trust doctors, he said, chuckling. In 1915 they wanted to amputate my leg. So he flew on to Hitler's headquarters, the Wolf's Lair in East Prussia, on the 31st. Hitler's handshake was itself autonic. The Fuhrer congratulated him on the solemn victory and showed him the battle maps of the Russian front, where huge encirclement operations were breaking the back of Stalin's army. This set Rommel's own mind thinking along these lines, how could he trap and encircle the British army in North Africa? Before Rommel left, Hitler granted all his demands for special measures against Torbuk, except one. German scientists had developed a hollow charge shell of immense penetrating power. It was codenamed Redhead, and stocks were already in Libya. However, it was still top secret and Hitler refused permission to Rommel to use it yet. But he did order the Luftwaffe to throw the first of its new two and a half ton bombs at Torbuk when Rommel's big attack began. He instructed the Navy to move half a dozen U-boats and some motor torpedo boats to the Mediterranean to help blockade Torbruck. 
he asked the foreign ministry to explore ways of using Biza 2 and other ports in Tunisia, still controlled by Vichy France, and he proposed that the vanishing Axis shipping tonnage in the Mediterranean should be replenished by the construction of hundreds of simple war transports of 400 to 600 tons displacement, although Hitler admitted to Rommel that he saw no prospect whatever of persuading Italian shipyards to build them. After that, he sent Rommel to see Mussolini and General Hugo Cavallero, the pompous, ineffectual chief of the Italian high command in Rome. Cavallero always looked more like a poor family lawyer than a general. Rintilen, the German attaché, wrote this account. General Rommel spoke in my presence with General Cavallero and the Duce on the morning of August 6. Evidently going on a report from General Bastico, they took the view that no attack on Torbuk will be possible in the foreseeable future because of transport difficulties and our exclusion from Bizeta. They examined the possibility of abandoning Solom and the Torbuk front instead, and falling back onto a reserve line west of Torbuk. But the Duce was very impressed by General Rommel's confident description of the Solom front, and of our prospects of holding it even against superior forces provided he is assured of adequate supplies. The Duce believes that Britain's next moves will depend on how the situation develops on the Russian front. As usual, Rommel had got his way. His big set-piece attack on Torbuk was to go ahead when he was ready. Mussolini instructed Cavallero and Rintelen to fly to Libya at once to make the necessary plans. Before he left Rome, Rommel noticed in the mirror that his eyes and skin were turning yellow. He spoke of this to no one, fearing that the general staff or his Italian friends would use it as a pretext to stop him from flying back to Libya. On the return flight his Luftwaffe plane developed engine trouble, and it had to land at Athens for repairs. An enemy air raid kept him awake all night at his hotel. He was still complaining about the bugs in the plane's engines when it finally touched down safely on Barnier Airfield, near his new stone-built headquarters, on August 8. Next day, as Rommel was thrashing out with Cavallero and Bastico their common strategy in Libya, he heard that the same Luftwaffe plane had just crashed in flames, killing everybody aboard. He was sorry about the crew, of course but shrugged off the accident philosophically. Just goes to show how quickly it can come to you, he told Lucy. The coming of Crusader. It is a rainy night three months later, in mid-November 1941. Libya is having one of the worst rainstorms in years. Long, dry wadis have become torrential rivers that roll boulders onto the troops bivouacking in them and wash away tanks and trucks. Airfields are flooded and telephone lines torn down. At 30 minutes past midnight, half a dozen shadowy figures run toward the squat two story Prefettura building at Bidilatoria, built on the coast near Cyrene, in a cypress grove. They jump the German sentry guarding the entrance and force their way in. They are British commandos. A British officer living in the town in the disguise of an Arab has identified the building to them as the headquarters of Rommel's Panzergruppe Africa. The sentry tries to raise the alarm. A salvo of shots spread eagles him in the corridor, but the shots wake the men in the ground floor office of the chief armorer's section. Technical Sergeant Kirk Lentzen looks out with a flashlight, a burst of stun gun fire hits him. Lieutenant Kalfholz draws his revolver but the stun gun splatters him in the chest and arms. Hand grenades are tossed into the room and explode with a shattering roar. The lights of the whole building go out, its electricity generator has also been blown up. The noise has alerted the Panzer Group's chief engineer, Major Bull, and Rommel's assistant quartermaster, Captain Wee Eyes, both in conference upstairs. They sound the alarm, lock away their secret files and grab revolvers. By flashlight they can see a body lying outside the office downstairs, so they both report later in writing to Rommel, and firing is still going on around the building. They wait a while, until the firing and shouting cease. By the time they get downstairs, the body has gone, leaving a trail of blood. The chief armorer's office is a shambles, 
water from a shattered radiator is already an inch deep on the floor, mingling with the blood of the other men. Here is Private Kovacic, his stomach torn open by the blast. There is Korfels, moaning barely audibly, I'm bleeding, bleeding to death. Both men die soon after. Outside, patrols find Lieutenant Jager, shot dead as he jumped out of the window. Farther away is the body of a British major. The blood trail evidently came from him. Nearby is an injured British army captain, dressed, like the dead major, in khaki overalls and crepe soled shoes. Of the other intruders there is no trace. Rommel's staff examine the contents of the two men's knapsacks, more explosives, fuses, detonators, grenades. On the major's body they also find Egyptian and Italian money, a girl's photograph, a leather diary, which identifies him as Major Jeffrey Keyes, leader of a 12-man commando killer squad, and other trappings of his trade. Both he and the prisoner have several days' growth of beard. The Panzer Group's investigations established that they and their companions were landed some days back from British submarines, with orders to eliminate Rommel and Bastico and to blow up an important telegraph mast on the eve of a major British offensive. Keyes was killed by one of his own men in the confusion, and the daring raid collapsed. Rommel scanned the reports and shook his head in puzzlement. Why bid a Litoria, of all places? Did the enemy really believe that he, Rommel, would lead his troops from a safe headquarters 200 miles to the rear? The Italians had, admittedly, given him the austere Prefettura building, and he had dutifully set up his Panzer Group headquarters there on August 14, 1941, but he had instantly disliked it. The food was too good, he remarked that he felt like a real military plutocrat and the scenery, 2,000 feet above sea level was too lush. Bidolatoria was well out of danger, well out, he impatiently told Lucy. After just ten days there he handed the prefetur over to his quartermaster's staff, and loaded his own grumbling officers onto trucks to take them to a new headquarters much closer to the battlefields, in the square, white-painted Cantonera, Roadhouse, at Gazala. From there I'll have more influence on the course of events, he wrote. Major Keyes was buried with full military honours a few days after the fiasco, side by side with the four men from Rommel's quartermaster staff who also died. The joint military funeral was symbolic of the chivalry that Rommel encouraged in his men. Rommel's own manuscripts fall silent after Solom and do not resume their narrative until the spring of 1942. But I shortly chanced on a fascinating, very useful document. In an archive guide I saw a reference to a notebook of an adjutant at an African headquarters and asked to see it. An hour later it was lying before me, still dusty and unopened these last thirty years or more, a grubby, Italian-made notebook with a black calico cover. Its two hundred and seventy pages were covered with shorthand writing, but isolated words stood out, Torbuk, Commander-in-Chief. The names of Rommel's generals. It proved impossible to find anybody conversant with both this shorthand system, in Germany there are half a dozen systems, and Second World War terminology. A sample transcript of two pages, done by a specialist firm in Bavaria, proved unacceptable. The heap of shorthand pages tantalized me for many months, until my own secretary, a woman born in Dusseldorf, caught sight of them and announced, I think I can transcribe them. It's not easy to interpret a stranger's shorthand, but for two hundred hours she worked at it, dictating her transcript to me while I typed it. Over the next year we kept going back to the more stubborn portions, until we had cracked the whole document. It turned out to be the long-lost Rommel diary. It had been dictated by Rommel and his staff each day and taken down by his secretary, Corporal Albert Botcher. This was a find of considerable significance, and it yielded many surprises. On Rommel's return to Bardia from Rome in August, his doctors had diagnosed jaundice and prescribed a bland diet and much rest. He adopted the diet but ignored the other advice. Remarkably he survived his own obstinacy, but he was not well, and he knew it, 
suffering particularly from the gastric disorders that plagued both friend and foe. In September he wrote to Lucy with a forced humor that he had been stricken again, it's going to be the usual three-day race, he said, his troops heard that he was ill and sent him gifts of fruit, eggs, potatoes and live chickens, bought after hard bargaining with haggling Arabs. His commanders might grumble, but his troops loved him. They were not a hand-picked elite, but somehow he gave them the feeling that they were. Major Friedrich Wilhelm von Melenthin, the amiable cavalry officer who was his new intelligence officer, put it like this, between Rommel and his troops there was that mutual understanding that cannot be explained and analyzed, but which is the gift of the gods. The men knew that Rommel was the last man Rommel spared, they saw him in their midst, and they felt, this is our leader. He knew how to make them feel somehow immortal. Take this spontaneous remark by Rommel to the cameraman of a propaganda company, recorded by his interpreter Wilfred Armbruster in his diary, tell your men to shave off their beards. We want young soldiers, we're never going to grow old. But Libya attacked the young men's health too, and the mounting sick rate caused Rommel permanent alarm. One division suffered a serious epidemic of diphtheria and jaundice that September. The health of the officers seemed particularly fragile. General Ferdinand Schl, Rommel's successor at Africa Corps headquarters, was too ill to take over. Rommel put the next senior general in Africa, Philip Muller Jebhard, in temporary command, but dysentery forced this general to leave Libya in mid-September and since Lieutenant General Ludwig Cruel did not finally arrive to take command of the Africa Corps until October, having been first on furlough and then in the hospital, the Corps was effectively orphaned for two months. That summer the Libyan stage gradually filled with the cast for the winter battles. Troops were arriving in large numbers, in late August a new division, Special Service Africa, had begun to arrive, it became the 90th Light and the big names who were to dominate Rommel's career came too, he had appropriated most of them with Alfred Gauze's staff. My new staff is much better than the old one, he said of them in one letter. At Banzer Group headquarters his new operations officer was a tall, elegant lieutenant colonel of 39, the aristocratic, arrogant Siegfried Westphal. U.S. officers examining him in 1945 defined him as a typical militarist, highly intelligent and conceited. War is his métier. Westphal would probably have liked the description. He was brilliant and he knew the chief of staff, Gors, who won Rommel's favor. Like a small boy who has found a new friend, Rommel kept telling Lucy how much Gors was to his liking. He was an engineer general, a good dry staff officer from East Prussia. Gors confided in him, telling him for instance that Stray each had tipped him off, you won't stand Rommel for long. Finally, in early October, a 42-year-old colonel arrived to act as new chief of staff to Rommel's beloved Africa Corps, which was still the main striking force in his panzer army. He was Fritz Bayern, a private and non-commissioned officer in the First World War who in this war would become one of Rommel's best-known commanders. Bailen had an obsequious manner, but he was good. He had garnered his tank warfare experience under Heinz Guderian on the Schelskard road to Moscow. He also apparently confided in Rommel immediately. The day he arrived, Rommel wrote, Guderian and he had the same trouble with Stray each as I did. He took an instant liking to Bailen. Rommel moved out of Bidelitoria and set up his forward headquarters at Gambert, bug infested, fly blown and unclean, but midway between the two places where the coming great battles would be fought, Torbruck and the frontier. Here at Gambut the Germans and Italians painstakingly built up their supplely dumps and repair workshops, large, well camouflaged factories excellently provided with machine tools, heavy lifting tackle and vast stocks of spare tank parts. Even badly damaged trucks could be hauled off the field in mid-battle and returned fighting fit, within days. Meanwhile Rommel waged war on the insects in his bed. The war was ruthless, and went on until he exterminated the last of the Mohicans as he called these tenacious vermin, by drenching his iron bed frame in gasoline and cremating them alive. 
now only their bites on my body are left to remind me of these loathsome pests, he wrote to his son Manfred at the end of August. At Gambert, his headquarters was well within range of the enemy's guns at Torbruck. But every day that summer Rommel rode forth in his mammoth, jolting across the desert from outpost to outpost, following ancient camel trails to where German and Italian gangs armed with jackhammers and explosives were building the Torbruck Bypass Road. Then he would drive back again to the Solem Front to watch the work on the new strong points, he ensured that each position was provisioned with enough food and ammunition for eight days battle, and he put extra muscle into the line with reconditioned Italian guns that had been lying rusting and derelict about the desert ever since the winter retreat. Everywhere the troops were training and drilling, with live ammunition, because there was no other in Libya, for the big set-piece attack that he was going to mount against Torbruck as soon as all his artillery and ammunition had arrived from Germany. Not that he took only a parochial view of the war. He devoured intelligence reports on the Navy's fighting in the Atlantic. He marveled at the victories in the USSR. On my walls hang all kinds of maps above all one of Russia, he wrote to young Manfred, now twelve. And on that map every advance we make is immediately drawn in. He was torn between remorse, that it was the panzer divisions of his rivals that were encircling Kiev for besieging Leningrad, a shame that I can't be there, and have to mark time down here and admiration, for Russian armies encircled, he wrote jubilantly on September 20th. I bet that wipes the grins off the Russians' faces. For reasons of prestige alone, he now had to take Torbuk, and soon. His plan remained essentially unchanged from July 1941, when he submitted it to the general staff, through October, when it was issued, as an army order, to his commanders, to the following June, when he was finally able to try it out. Days of heavy bombing would soften Torbuk's defenses. After a heavy artillery bombardment the Africa Infantry Division would open a breach in the southeastern perimeter for the 15th Panzer Division, just where General Streich had suggested. The left flank of this German assault force would be secured by the Italian Infantry Divisions commanded by General Eni Navarini's 21st Corps. The German push would go straight up to the port, and Torbruck would then have to surrender or starve. Rommel privately reckoned with a two-day battle. The snag was, as the shrewd little General Bastico, Rommel called him Bombastico pointed out, that the British were not going to stand idly by and let Rommel get away with it. They would strike from Egypt into his rear, after he attacked, or even try and scoop him all together by launching a major offensive before he was ready to go into Torbruck. Rommel's strategic answer was twofold. He would locate a mobile reserve in the desert, well placed to scotch any such move by the British. And by lengthening the Solemn line of fortifications into the desert, he hoped to force the enemy to make such a lengthy detour that they could not arrive in his rear for at least three days, by which time he would already have dealt with Torbruck. In fact, he was convinced that the British were too heavily committed elsewhere in the Middle East to launch any such offensive here. His prestige enhanced by the great June 1941 victory, he got on well with all his lesser Italian commanders. They try their hardest to get everything right, commented Rommel, and they are extraordinarily polite. But this politeness was absent in Bastico and Bastico's superiors. The Italian high command here is annoyed that it has so little say, Rommel observed with satisfaction. We are always being spited in petty ways but we're not going to stand for it. Perhaps they're casting around for some way of getting rid of me. The truth was that Bastico still regarded Rommel's interest in Torbruck as an unhealthy obsession. In an exchange of letters on September 6 he recommended attacking Egypt without bothering about Torbruck. Rommel sent Gauze, behind Bastico's back, directly to Rome where it was quite simply ruled that since Hitler and Mussolini had both decided that Torbruck was to be captured first, the matter was settled. It was an absolute necessity, Rome said, before any advance by Rommel on the Nile. Rome promised to send supplies to Rommel so that he could attack in early November. He was to draft a suitable plan, 
and Bastico would then authorize it and fix the date. Weeks later Rommel was still gloating over this rebuff to Bastico. His letters are getting downright insulting, he chuckled. Evidently he's trying to provoke a row. Okay by me. He'll come off worse. To consolidate his position, however, Rommel did take some precaution. He invited a close friend of Mussolini, a major Melchiori, to visit Panzergrupp Africa. I have high hopes of this visit, as the feelings against us are running high at present, Rommel wrote. Well, nobody is going to pull any fast ones on me. He took the major, a dapper figure, in neat, tailor-made uniform, hunting in the desert. Rommel's shooting was done with a machine gun from fast-moving open cars. The targets were fleet-footed gazelles, their livers, Rommel told Lucy, tasted delicious. Then he arranged a real spectacular for Melchiori, a day trip into Egypt at the head of a panzer division. This was the operation codenamed Midsummer Night's Dream. Rommel wanted to boost morale after months of idleness. His target was a huge British supply dump believed to be just 15 miles beyond the frontier wire. There is a German saying, your appetite comes with eating, and the entire Africa Corps had developed a healthy appetite for items of British made uniforms, minus insignia, for Dodge, Ford and Rover cars and trucks, for Argentine corned beef, Canadian canned butter, American canned milk and English bacon. So the 21st Panzer Division, the old 5th Light, rolled through the barbed wire into Egypt at dawn on September 14 to envelop the enemy supply dump and meet at Deir el Hamra many miles beyond. Sixty empty trucks followed to pick up the choicest booty. To his aide, Lieutenant Schmidt, Rommel looked more like a U-boat commander as he gave the signal from his tank turret to get moving and shouted, we're off to Egypt. General von Ravenstein's tanks and trucks dragged brushwood with them to simulate a huge tank force. A reconnaissance battalion cruised up and down the frontier and raised bogus radio traffic to simulate an attack by the entire Africa Corps. But there was no enemy to be blinded by these deceits. Probably forewarned by code breaking, the enemy had simply ordered their forces here to fall back across the plateau, far enough for the Germans to run out of gasoline. Muller Jebhard later wrote, our three battle groups pushed about 60 miles into enemy territory and then rendezvoused, without any combat at all. I was stunned to find General Rommel waiting for us at the rendezvous, he had driven on ahead of us all. For nearly three hours they milled around in hungry disappointment, the tanks refueled as best they could. Rommel was puzzled. Then, at 12.55 p.m. Like the moment in Hitchcock's North by Northwest when the lone crop spraying plane turns nasty, the RAF bombers suddenly arrived. Even the newly found war diary of the 21st Panzer Division does not disclose how many tanks were hit. Two trucks laden with gasoline blew up at once, the Panzer Regiment had six men killed, and a flak gunner died too. Rommel's mammoth was hit, his boot heel was blown off by a bomb blast and his driver badly injured. It was a thoroughly unsettling experience. He ordered the pursuit abandoned, and the whole force beat an undignified retreat back into Libya. The enemy lost only two prisoners and one disabled armored car, apparently the orderly room truck of a South African armored car regiment. In the truck were secret documents. Herr General, said the 21st Panzer's commander, Ravenstein, the capture of these documents alone is enough to justify the outlay. The documents included an 8th Army order of battle which, together with the emptiness of the desert he had just invaded, led Rommel to a fateful conclusion, that the enemy was not currently planning any offensive against him. There is evidence that the British had arranged to have Rommel capture these documents. It all went very smoothly. He lied to Lucy. Later in September, warnings began reaching Rommel from both Berlin and Rome that a major British offensive was in the cards. He disregarded them. The almost illegible pencil notes his aide took of a speech Rommel made to his commanders contain the sentences, one thing our sortie of the 14th has shown is that the enemy has no offensive intentions. 
it is to be presumed that he will not be able to launch any attack over the next few weeks, or months. Of all his problems, obtaining the supplies needed for the attack on Tobruk caused most difficulties. British air attacks from Malta presented a renewed risk to the convoy route, because many of the German planes that would have fended them off had been sent in June to Russia. The port of Benghazi was now being used as well as Tripoli, but its capacity was low. October brought little improvement. The same shipping losses were suffered as in September, 23%. Once again it was Hitler who came to Rommel's rescue. Warned by his generals that Britain's only chance of reversing its declining fortunes quickly would be to attack Rommel soon, Hitler decided to transfer an entire Luftflot, Air Force, to the Mediterranean. He put one of the Luftwaffe's best field marshals, Albert Kesselring, in command and designated him commander-in-chief, South. On October 27 he went even further, instructing the Navy to move two dozen U-boats from the Atlantic into the Mediterranean, stifling Navy protests by saying this was necessary to stave off a catastrophe in Africa. So the independent strategy Rommel had pushed since April was beginning to have far-reaching consequences on other theatres. All this wild talk of a British offensive annoyed Rommel. It conflicted with his own wishes, therefore he ignored it. One is reminded of a famous verse by the German humorist Christian Morgenstern. And thus, in his considered view, what did not suit, could not be true. He was timetabling three important events for November. He would fly to Lucy in Rome in the first week, celebrate his 50th birthday in the second week, destroy Torbuk in the third. There was no room for any British offensive in this timetable. Since early September no letter had passed between Irwin and Lucy without his making some mention of these plans. Several times during October, German and Italian intelligence nonetheless warned that Britain was reinforcing its army in Egypt. Rommel refused to panic. He reassured Lucy, the British have other worries just right now. When General Max Summerman, of the New Africa Infantry Division, suggested an armed reconnaissance behind enemy lines, Rommel's headquarters retorted that Midsummer Night's Dream had already established that the British had no intention of attacking. Probably this willful disregard of the accumulating evidence derived from Rommel's fixation on Torbuk, the first objective that had so far defeated him. An artillery commander, Major General Karl Boetcher, had just arrived to direct the German firepower against Torbuk. By mid-November Rommel would have altogether 461 German and Italian big guns ready to rain shells on the city. He directed minor operations to improve the Bologna and Pavia divisional sectors, and, well schooled now in Rommel's tactics, the Italian infantry moved effectively and suffered no casualties. All quiet, he reported to Lucy on October 19. The British barely reacted to our latest gain in ground. Either they are too weak to, or they're shamming. Anyway, rendezvous at Hotel Eden in Rome, November 1st. Bastique had lapsed into a sullen silence. But not his chief of staff, General Gaston Gambara, who also commanded Italy's independent motorized force, the 20th Corps. Rommel badly wanted his corps too, but Gambara put him firmly in his place. Rommel flared out in his next letter home, I never did think much of these fine gentlemen. Shits they are and shits they always have been. Censure of this ferocity was reserved by Rommel only for the Italian officer caste. He blamed the Italian army's misfortunes solely on their officers and their poor weapons, their enlisted men he described frequently, for example, to Milch, as magnificent soldier material. His interpreter Ernst Franz recalls how, after even an elite Bersigliere position was overrun, their commander tearfully pleaded with Rommel, believe me, my men are not cowards. And Rommel replied, who said anything about cowards? It's your superiors in Rome who are to blame, sending you into action with such miserable weapons. Some units in the Solom line were equipped with artillery captured from the Austrians in the First World War quite useless against modern armor. Still Rommel ignored the clamor of warning voices. 
On October 20 the Italian High Command sent an explicit warning to Bastico about a possible British offensive. But six days later Rommel issued his army order for the attack on Tobruk. In my opinion, he told a resigned Gambara on the 29th, the attack can begin on November 20 without our running any risk. His own high command made one last attempt to change Rommel's mind. Given Britain's growing air supremacy in Africa, they asked, would it not be better to wait until 1942? Rommel's headquarters replied that it would not, the Axis land superiority was so great that Torbuk would probably surrender within two days. Having sent this reply to Berlin, Rommel flew to Rome. He was waiting for Lucy at the railroad station the next morning as her sleeping car pulled in. They spent two happy weeks sightseeing in the autumn sun and rain. General von Ravenstein was also there on furlough with his wife. Like typical tourists, they visited St. Peter's. Rommel was not impressed by the architecture, he gripped Ravenstein's arm and said, that reminds me, we've got to insert another battalion on Hill 209. Their rooms at the Hotel Eden were ice cold, but he did not notice. His mind was with his troops and on Torbruk. The maps of the fortifications were already being printed and corrected. Air photographs of each bunker to be stormed were being obtained. Several times he called on the attaché and on the Italian high command, the conferences revolved around the knotty problem of supplies. As if to rub it in, Late on November 8 an entire Axis convoy with 40,000 tons of supplies was sunk. The Italians halted further convoy operations, and no more ships reached Libya until mid-December. None had arrived there since October 16. Cavallero, chief of the Italian High Command, became even more apprehensive. Rommel assured him that Torbuk would fall after 48 hours at most and that the British would never dare to attack if they risked having their retreat cut off. Cavallero acquiesced, but there were level-headed Italians in Libya who were not so easily fobbed off. Bastico's intelligence officer, a major of Etria, was one. On November 11 Rommel's intelligence officer, Melenthin, accosted the Italian's liaison officer. Tell your major of Etria he's much too nervous, he said. Tell him not to worry because the British aren't going to attack. Nonetheless, that same day Bastico urgently warned Cavallero that an enemy attack was looming up. He had photographs of the desert railroad, of new supply dumps and airfields, and reports of radio traffic showing that the British were about to launch a heavy offensive aimed at forcing a final decision. Similar data definitely reached Rommel's headquarters. There was an aerial photograph of a new British airfield south of the Qatar Depression, packed with over 100 planes, dated November 11, it was forwarded to headquarters by the Chief Luftwaffe Reconnaissance Officer, Colonel Augustin. Other photographs showed the military railroad being built across the desert from Mersometria toward the frontier wire. Some of these photos were even shown to Rommel in Rome and Ravenstein saw him snatch the photographs away and irritably dash them to the floor, exclaiming, I refuse even to look at them. Rommel visited Cavallero on November 13 and again argued that his attack on Torbruk must get the green light, despite the supple snags. Two days later, his 50th birthday, Rommel had an audience with Mussolini. The fascist dictator confirmed that Torbruk must be attacked as soon as possible. Afterward his hosts showed him their new film, Onward from Benghazi. Rommel particularly liked the scenes showing Italian troops storming the city. In fact, one of Rommel's smaller units had captured it, very interesting and informative, he told the Italians sardonically. I often wondered what happened in that battle. Outside Torbuk, his storm troops had now moved forward to their starting points. His radio intercept company reported to headquarters on November 17 that a South African division had been identified moving off from Ursa Matriu into the desert. Intoxicated with their coming victory, Rommel's headquarters staff paid no heed to this report. Where was Rommel now? He had left Rome early on November 16, but a thunderstorm forced his plane to land for the night at the devastated city of Belgrade. 
Next day engine trouble necessitated a further overnight stop at Athens. Not until the 18th did he land back in Libya. The news there was that a band of commandos had raided his former headquarters at Pedilatoria. The airfields, indeed, the whole countryside, were awash with rain. Apparently for this reason no reconnaissance sorties were being flown. Rommel believed that he still had several days to prepare his great attack on Tobruk. But he did not, for the enemy's army, now reorganized as the Eighth Army, had that very morning forced the frontier wire, unseen, and was many miles inside Libya. Over 100,000 troops and more than 700 tanks were about to teach Rommel a lesson. Rommel's headquarters staff, in his absence, had not tipped off the lower echelons about the gathering evidence of a coming enemy offensive. Thus, when on the 18th the enemy suddenly commenced radio silence, nobody had inquired why. Behind this veil of silence, the enemy's infantry had advanced to the Solom Line, while a powerful armored force had already outflanked the Solom Line on the desert plateau and was approaching Rommel's domain from the southeast. Here, along the tri elabd a desert track, the 21st Panzer Division had thrown out only a thin screen of armored cars. The 3rd and 33rd Reconnaissance Battalions, united under Lieutenant Colonel Ernfried von Wechmer, at 5.30 p.m. on the 18th Wechmer informed Africa Corps headquarters that seven hours earlier the 33rd had run into an enemy reconnaissance in force and that earlier, at 5 p.m., the 3rd had been attacked by 200 armored vehicles. Vague rumors flew. During the afternoon the 15th Panzer Division informed the nearby Africa Division, British attack intentions are possible in the south. In consequence of all this, Ravenstein proposed sending his Panzer Regiment down toward Gabrasale that night, to meet the developing threat. Gabrasale was just a mark on the map, on the tri elabd 40 miles south of Gambit. Crew well, the Africa Corps is solemn, ponderous Rhinelander commander, found himself in an awkward dilemma and discussed it with his chief of staff, Bailn. On the one hand, he said, Rommel had always dismissed any idea of an enemy offensive as absolutely impossible. On the other, aircraft had now sighted 1,650 enemy vehicles massing along the frontier wire, from Sidi Omar south toward Fort Madalena. At 7 p.m. Bailen privately oriented his divisions. We cannot exclude the possibility of an operation to outflank us from the south. Together, Cruel and Bailen decided to alert the 15th Panzer and to send Ravenstein's panzer regiment south to Gabasale as proposed. First, however, at 8 p.m. they phoned Rommel for permission. Rommel snapped at Cruel we mustn't lose our nerve. He added that Ravenstein was not to send his panzer regiment south, we must not show our hand to the enemy too soon. He invited Cruel to meet him, at noon the next day. This was a display of coolness which the Italians refused to emulate. Although reassured by the Germans at 10 p.m. that there was no cause for anxiety, Gambara knew better and issued orders before midnight alerting both his divisions on the Borel Gubai end of the tri elabd the Ariat and Triest divisions. There followed an even more glaring example of Rommel's obstinacy. At 11 p.m. Africa Corps headquarters telephoned that an Italian patrol had picked up a British soldier near Sidi Omar and the man was claiming convincingly that a large part of the enemy's 8th army was already on the move into Libya. Rommel's staff dismissed this prisoner as untrustworthy. Despite this, Cruel rushed a full interrogation report by dispatch rider overnight to Rommel. The prisoner was driver A.J. Hayes, chauffeur of the commander of one of the crack field batteries attached to the 4th Indian Division. He says Hitler has on several occasions offered Britain good peace terms. But Churchill, inspired by malice and ruthlessness, is leading the British people toward the abyss. The prisoner's manner of speaking makes his testimony seem trustworthy. Rommel read it contemptuously at 9 a.m. next day. His staff formally discounted it as lies and exaggerations. At noon Cruel arrived and bluntly disagreed but he was met with a chorus of jeers from Gores, Melanthin and even Rommel. Over 24 hours had passed since the great British offensive, codenamed Crusader, 
had begun. But not for another 24 hours would Rommel actually believe it. The desperate foray. The operating tent is a lean to, set up behind a three ton army truck. The surgeon, in his white coat and cap, is Major Ian Aird, a British officer. His field hospital near Sidi Omar, on the Egyptian frontier, has been overrun by German troops, but his surgery on the battle casualties, primarily Italians from the Solom line and members of the 4th Indian Division attacking it, must go on. He has explored a dozen abdominal wounds during the night, he is weary enough to drop, but still the casualties are being carried in. It is November 25, 1941, a week since the British offensive, Crusader, began. Already the Libyan desert is littered with the blackened hulks of tanks. Once more the war has spilled over onto Egyptian soil, and Ed and all his hospital staff are prisoners of the Germans. Towards noon there is a flurry of excitement. A stretcher party hurries in with a blood-stained, groaning air attack victim. It is Fritz Stefan, commander of Rommel's 5th Panzer Regiment. Ed examines him rapidly, he notes in his diary that the Panzer colonel has a large sucking wound in the chest. He has been hit by shrapnel and the right lung is all but severed from the heart. The Germans have applied a shell dressing to cut the bleeding, and they ask Ed to apply a pressure dressing so they can fly him back to base. Stefan is conscious, stalwart, but in deep shock. To Ed's strained eye it is obvious that the colonel will not survive without immediate surgery. The German doctor accompanying Stefan hesitates, and hurries out to consult with the panzer officers waiting with their armor close by. Ed starts a transfusion and has the surgical equipment prepared for an immediate operation. Shells attracted by the German column are beginning to drop near the field hospital, making the sand under Ed's feet shudder. The German doctor hurries back to Ed, the Herr General asks you to be so good as to proceed with surgery. The shells are getting closer. An anesthetist points out that the explosions are disturbing the other injured men. Ed, however, does not heed the shell bursts. The surgery already seems a hopeless task. During the operation Ed looks up once briefly and sees that a dozen panzer officers have slipped into the tent and are quietly watching him operate on their comrade. Among them is a general with the blue Paul Merite displayed at his throat, Erwin Rommel himself. A particularly near miss brings another appeal from the anaesthetist. Without a word, the Germans return to their armored vehicles and pull back a safe distance from the hospital. Rommel's doctor pauses to thank Ed and say, we'll return again tomorrow on our way back into Egypt. But none of them met again. Nor did any of them forget this extraordinary desert encounter. Ed, impressed by Rommel's humanity, later traced Stefan's widow, the colonel died a few hours after the operation, and described it to her. And Rommel, asked by Goebbels in a broadcast a year later whether he did not perhaps take unnecessary risks, hesitated and gave a quite unexpected answer. The British fought fairly in the desert, he began. I once paid a visit to a British field hospital. Then he pulled himself together and said, Ah, uh, you don't have to worry about my safety. I know how to look after myself. Stefan died on the seventh day of the extended Crusader offensive. It was a long series of interlocking battles launched by the British to destroy Rommel before he could knock out the Torbuk garrison. The enemy were fielding 724 tanks against him, with 200 more in reserve, while he had only 260, and the Italians 154. For three weeks the battles ebbed and flowed, pausing each day at dusk and resuming at dawn. They began on November 18th and had still not really ended by December 8th, when Rommel angrily announced the retreat. The skies were low and overcast, the melee churned up turbid clouds of dust and smoke. Tanks dueled with tanks or guns over an area some 50 miles square, from the Egyptian frontier wire in the east to the road south out of Torbuk in the west. The tanks ranged across the high coastal plain laboring up the escarpments and spilling down them like rodents running amok over a flight of stairs. It was not an easy battle for even the commanders to follow. 
The Rommel Diary records him cursing on November 22, our signals networks could hardly be worse. This is war the way the ancient Teutons used to fight it. I don't even know at this moment whether the Africa Corps is on the attack or not. Crusader conformed to no pattern, but proved Rommel's own favorite dictum, it is not possible to make any battle plan that holds good longer than the first day. His opponent's plan did not last even as long as that. Lieutenant General Sir Alan Cunningham, commander of the 8th Army, had intended to plant his armored brigades on the points of a triangle around a battleground of his own choosing, whereupon, he hoped, the Africa Corps would duly oblige and present itself the for obliteration. For no particular reason, the site he chose was Gabrasale, a meaningless desert location 60 miles southeast of Torbuk. Cunningham hoped to deduce Rommel's strategy from his reaction to the approach of the British 30th Corps as it rounded Rommel's Solom line and headed for Gabrasale. But Rommel had not even noticed the British movement, and when Ravenstein finally proposed moving his 5th Panzer Regiment, Colonel Stefan's regiment, to Gabrasale, Rommel had instinctively stopped him. We must not show our hand to the enemy too soon, he explained, an astute decision that had the hallmark of the master. His failure to act on the earlier days had stupefied the enemy. The commander of the British 30th Corps, Major General Willoughby Norrie, took matters partly into his own hands. He decided to thrust well beyond Gabrasale, indeed, to attack Sidi Rizeg, just south of Torbuk. Rommel would be forced to defend that. So Norrie faithfully varied the Cunningham plan. On November 19 he sent an armoured brigade to Sidi Rezeg and two others to attack the intervening points of Gabrasale and Ba el Gubai. Merely by not reacting, therefore, Rommel had split his enemy's main armoured force into three diverging bodies. The events of the first four days of Crusader are quickly told. Rommel, Perplexed and infuriated by this interference with his plans to take Torbuk, virtually abdicated all initiative to Gruwell, the Africa Corps commander. For three days Rommel continued plotting the Torbuk attack, even though a British armoured brigade seized Sidi Rezeg, a vital table land only ten miles in his rear. On the afternoon of the 19th, the Germans bestirred themselves at last. Colonel Stefan's Panzer Regiment probed southward to Gabrasale, bumped into another armored brigade there, and destroyed 23 American-built Stuart tanks for the loss of two of his own. This first mobile action of the campaign revealed strengths that augured well for Rommel. First, the Panzer Regiment dared to remain on the battlefield as dusk fell, while the British withdrew into defensive formation called Night Liga. This allowed the Germans to recover the disabled German tanks left about the field. Secondly, the Germans had developed the process of recovering tanks in mid-battle to a fine art. And above all they showed new skill at coordinating heavy mobile guns and tanks, as a result they had inflicted great slaughter on the enemy. The fighting of the next weeks revealed a curious relationship between Rommel and the new Africa Corps commander, Cruwell. Technically, Cruwell was required to obey Rommel's orders without question. But events often showed him acting with an independence bordering on disobedience, and in retrospect it is remarkable that the field marshal put up with it. His own hidden complexes partly explain his reticence. Cruwell was a real cavalier type, the son of a wealthy Dortmund family of printers whose fortunes rested on a church monopoly of him book publishing. Intellectually he was head and shoulders above Rommel, and this fact, coupled with the burning ambitions of his new chief of staff, Fritz Bayern, who had a powerful influence on him, put the Panzer Group commander at a psychological disadvantage. Initially, their differences concerned the enemy's intentions. Rommel still believed on November 20 that the enemy thrusts were not a serious attempt to lift the siege of Torbuk. Cruel was not deceived, however, and decided to concentrate his Africa Corps forces to deal with each of the three enemy brigades in turn. He briefed his two Panzer Division commanders, the aristocratic General von Ravenstein and the dashing General Newman Silkow, at 2.35 pm they were to concentrate on Gabrasale. 
I refuse, said Gruwell, to stand idly by and watch the enemy advance unmolested on Torbruck. What opened Rommel's eyes to the ugly truth was not the arguments of his generals or the air reconnaissance reports, but an open broadcast by the BBC in Cairo. The Eighth Army, said its evening news bulletin, with about 75,000 men excellently armed and equipped, have started a general offensive in the western desert with the aim of destroying the German-Italian forces in Africa. This stung Rommel into action. During the night he telephoned Cruel about the critical situation and ordered the Africa Corps's two Panzer divisions to begin rolling northward from Gabrasalet toward Torbuk at the first light, following in the tracks churned up by the enemy armor. Your objective, rasped Rommel into the telephone, will be the center of the airfield at Sidi Rizeg. The enemy infantry, tanks and gun crews had already installed themselves on this airfield, and were winding up for a last heave to break through Rommel's siege ring into Torbruk. At 6.30, still before dawn, Rommel climbed out of his cubal car at Belamed Hill, where General Bircher's artillery was dug in. This was about three miles north of the airfield. He ordered Boetcher to turn the guns around to bombard the airfield. Looking south through his binoculars at 7.45 am as the light improved, Rommel could see the enemy infantry and tanks forming up on the airfield for their last push on Torbruk. They began to move soon after. Almost simultaneously, the enemy garrison in Torbruk itself, behind Rommel's back, began a fierce tank assault on the siege ring planning to break out and link up with the airfield force near El Duda, a hill weakly held by Rommel's infantry. This really made Rommel's force hear the meat in the sandwich. But as he raised his binoculars over the airfield's horizon to the south, he saw what he was looking for, the towering dust clouds raised by the fast approach of the entire Africa Corps coming to the rescue. Twice that morning Rommel himself took command of the counter-attacks between Belamed and El Duda, thwarting the enemy's attempts to hammer a corridor through to the Torbuk fortress. He drove about the battlefield, took temporary command of the armored cars of Baron Ernfried von Wechmer's reconnaissance battalion, added four of the magnificent Flak 88s to this improvised task force and saw them shoot down tank after tank in flames. Meanwhile a holocaust had begun on the enemy-held airfield at Sidi Rizeg, on the desert side of the sandwich. Boetcher's heavy guns were pounding and cratering the airfield. Rommel could see the dust and blaze as the Africa Corps tanks charged to the airfield perimeter and opened fire at a range of 2,000 yards. By the morning's end the British 7th Armoured Brigade had only 10 tanks left. But another enemy armoured brigade was believed to be coming north to join battle the next day, thus sandwiching the Africa Corps in from the rear too. That night Rommel was unable to sleep. One slip, he knew, might cost him the battle and perhaps lose him the campaign too. At 7am he was already back on Belamed Hill to check that Boetcher's guns knew what they had to do. The hill was a good vantage point for the coming battle. Twice that morning he changed his battle plan, finally, at midday, ordering the 21st Panzer's rather jumpy commander, General von Ravenstein, to launch an immediate direct attack on the airfield. It began at 2.20 pm, with the 57 tanks of Colonel Stefan's Panzer Regiment slamming the field from the west and the infantry trucking in from the north. This was the battle's turning point. The British gunners put up a terrific fire as Stefan's tanks charged them, most of the stalwart gunners fell where they fought. The photographs show their corpses draped unromantically across the wreckage of their 25-pounders. Too late. The British 22nd Armoured Brigade now arrived on the airfield from the south, about 107 tanks in all. How the surviving British gunners cheered! until Rommel's powerful screen of anti-tank weapons began to bark. The enemy tanks were outgunned. The end was inevitable. By dusk the airfield at Sidi Rizeg was again in Rommel's hands. His two Panzer divisions still had 173 tanks in working order. The enemy's 7th Armoured Division, the only force confronting him, had only 144. By superior tactics and with a lot of luck, 
he had more than turned the tables on the Eighth Army. Through field glasses that evening Rommel watched the battle end, and counted the charred and blackened enemy tanks until they disappeared into the darkness. The Germans used the phrase shot down to describe what happened when a shell pierced a tank and ignited all that it contained. The British phrase brew up was more descriptive. Long tongues of flame would curl out of every orifice. The shells and machine gun bullets inside would begin exploding until the whole hull seemed to bulge and convulse. Glistening rivulets of molten aluminium would run from the dead engine like tears, congealing on the desert sand in hard mirrors of spent metal. Then the rubber and oil would catch fire, and a spiral of funereal smoke would rise from the awesome pyre. Around the burnt out tank would lie the corpses of its crewmen, sometimes seeming just asleep sometimes headless or limbless or scorched black. These were the men who preyed on every tank commander's conscience. Rommel himself had no fear that one day this might happen to him, it always happened to the other man, but he had the burden of responsibility, and no man could take it from his shoulders. That evening, November 22nd, he congratulated Ravenstein and his command post. Today's victories have greatly eased our situation, he said. But even now a further disaster awaited the enemy. Crewwell, out of contact with Rommel most of that day, had independently sent the 15th Panzer marauding westward late that afternoon. By chance it rolled right into the night leaguer of the enemy's 4th Armoured Brigade. In the following melee, lit by headlights, blazing tanks, machine gun and cannon fire, Crewell captured 50 armoured fighting vehicles and the headquarters of the British Brigade as well. Thus the enemy's last coherent armoured force was rendered leaderless. The next day saw the greatest of the tank battles so far. This, the last Sunday in November, was the day on which Germany's war dead traditionally were remembered. It was called the Sunday of the Dead Totems and Tag, and by this forbidding name the Battle of November 23rd came to be known. It was very much General Crewell's battle. He and his chief of staff, Colonel Bayon, had not seen Rommel for four days. The battle provided another example of a victory obtained in defiance of Rommel's orders. As the Panzer Group commander, Rommel had sent Crewell a long-winded command directive at 10.30 p.m. on the 22nd, planning the coming battle. It boiled down to a southward push by Africa Corps's two panzer divisions, meeting a northward advance by the Italian armoured division a riot from Brel Gubai. The enemy would be caught and destroyed between these two moving fists. Crewell ignored this directive. At 3 a.m. he issued his own, for what was to be basically an encirclement. When Rommel's overlong directive arrived, evidently around 4.30 a.m., Crewell caustically noted that it contained a surfeit of totally irrelevant detail and tossed it aside. He left with Bailen about an hour later to fight the battle his way. He drove through the gathering morning mist to join the 15th Panzer Division, they would move off to the southwest. Rommel spent most of the day at the 21st Panzer's fixed command post. Again he told General Boetcher that he expected the artillery to decide the day's battle. His diary shows most interestingly that he was already thinking far beyond the day's events, his aim is to annihilate the armoured forces encircled south of Sidi Rezeg today and tomorrow. After that he intends to strike fast toward Sidi Omar and then to prepare to attack Torbruk. General Bircher warned him that they would run into ammunition difficulties if they renewed their attack on Torbruk. By about 11 a.m., under leaden skies and icy winds, Crewell had already massacred the thin-skinned supply echelons of the enemy. Then he began to concentrate his forces in a methodical, determined way until by 2.30 p.m. he had all three of his armoured formations, a riot, the 8th and the 5th Panzer regiments, parading abreast in a line near Burel Gubai, facing north and ready to bully the enemy back toward Sidi Rezeg. Artillery and mobile 88s would travel with them. What was unorthodox about Crewell's plan was his order that the two regiments of infantry were to be trucked close behind the tanks, and were not to dismount until they come under heavy infantry fire. It seemed like a recipe for mass suicide, almost, 
but his officers and men accepted it without question. Of all this Rommel had little or no inkling. At about 2 p.m. his diary had lamented, contact with Africa Corps cannot be established. Neither he nor Cruel yet knew that at dawn that day the Africa Corps's mobile headquarters, complete with its irreplaceable radio trucks, had been overrun by an enemy force advancing undetected toward Sidi Rizeg. At 3 p.m. tank turret hatches clanged shut. A thin drizzle was falling. The trucks were loaded with crouching infantrymen, clips were snapped into rifles, ammunition belts were fed into machine guns and Cruel's triple-headed hammer began swinging northward toward Rommel's anvil, the fixed artillery and infantry holding the escarpments at Sidi Rizeg. Between them was the enemy, by now well dug in and waiting for them. Cruel's tanks rolled north, gathering speed, spewing armor-piercing and machine gun fire. A company commander looked back and saw an unforgettable scene, there were armored troop carriers, cars of various kinds caterpillars hauling mobile guns, heavy trucks with infantry, motorized flak units. A hail of enemy fire met them, shells and bullets whining horizontally past them. The smoke from shells and burning vehicles darkened this infernal scene. The tanks were heavily hit, but most still rolled on, converging on the enemy. As the infantry trucks bumped and jounced over the hard, wet gravel, intense fire greeted them. The German officers stood erect in their cars and trucks, to encourage their men. Lieutenant Colonel Zintel, commander of a rifle regiment, twisted sideways, a bullet having passed through his brain, and toppled from his car. Moments later his battalion commander, Major von Schulman, was killed by a direct hit on his truck. Officer after officer was mortally wounded. The regiment's adjutant, a mere lieutenant, took command. By now they were squarely among the enemy positions. At 6 p.m., the hammer reached the anvil and the enemy's morale cracked. Cruel's costly brout force tactics had resulted in the annihilation of the rest of the British 7th Armoured Division and most of the 1st South African Division. The news of this great victory was passed to Rommel, at Travenstein's headquarters. At 6.50 p.m. he turned a blind eye on Cruel's defiance of his own battle directive. He broke his three-day silence in a letter to Lucy, the battle seems to be the worst crisis. I'm okay, in fine spirits and good heart. Over 200 tanks shot down so far. Our fronts have held. At dusk, as a fires from blazing tanks flung fantastic shadows across the desert south of Torbuk and medics moved from wreck to wreck to tend the injured and ease the pain of the dying, Rommel returned to his own headquarters. His diary relates that he had briefly discussed the order he intended issuing to Cruel next day. Rommel had decided on a raid so audacious and spectacular that even now he kept half of it to himself. Beginning at 10 a.m. the next day he was going to hurl his two panzer divisions down the tri elabd the desert track running parallel to the coast, 40 miles inland, to the frontier wire at Sidi Omar, the desert end of the Solom Front. He would destroy the enemy believed to be massing there, and he would then stand astride the supperly lines of the British units that had invaded Libya to relieve Torbuk. This would give him total victory the 8th army would be done for. He issued the first orders in the hour before midnight. He informed Colonel Westflund and his apprehensive staff, I will put myself at the head of the Africa Corps, and begin the pursuit. I'll probably be away from here until tomorrow evening, or the morning after at the latest. There is no doubt that Rommel ignored the presence of a large New Zealand force advancing on Bardia from Torbruck. His own hand-colored sketches indicate that he was obviously uncertain that such a force even existed, he also overestimated the enemy's disorganization, and overlooked his own. Cruel, fresh from the battlefield, did not. His Africa Corps had lost its own headquarters unit and 72 of his 162 tanks that day. The 15th Panzer Division had also lost its radio trucks and many of Rommel's most outstanding officers had been butchered in the frontal assault on the enemy's guns that afternoon. Cruel was a forceful and thoughtful commander. 
he first heard of Rommel's desperate plan at Sun upon November 24, when he gate crashed a meeting called by Rommel on the Torbuk Bypass Road. He objected and suggested to Rommel a routine mopping up operation first. We have got to clean up the battlefield and salvage the immense booty before the enemy has time to come and fetch it himself, he said emphatically. Rommel disagreed. He told Ravenstein, you have the chance of ending this campaign tonight. At 10.30 that morning the spectacular operation, Rommel's dash for the frontier wire, began. Rommel stood straight up in his open car, the raw wind biting his face, as he piloted the 21st Panzer Division from the city Rizeg airfield. Cruel was some way behind with all that was left of his headquarters unit, his own mammoth, one radio truck, two dispatch riders and two cars. Newman Silkow's 15th Panzer spent the morning patching its injuries, refueling and ammunitioning, at noon it followed in Ravenstein's tracks, heading for the frontier. The sun was breaking through the wet clouds as this, the most erratic act in Rommel's African campaign, began. I'll be back this evening. With Rommel's cheery words ringing in their ears, the appalled Panzer Group staff watched him go. He meant it, too. He didn't even take his toothbrush. His chief of staff, Gors, went with him. And so the Panzer Group responsibilities devolved on Siegfried Westfl, his youthful operations officer. For many days afterward Westfl tried frantically to contact Rommel for instructions. Nobody knew where Rommel was, sometimes Rommel least of all. Westfl's intelligence officer, Melenthin, remembers, huddled in our greatcoat, in the wooden bus that served as our headquarters at Elidem. Westfl and I viewed the situation with increasing apprehension. Because now, with Rommel gone, the real effort of the British to break the siege ring around Torbuk was about to begin. For Rommel the dash to the wire was a grand adventure. Faster and faster he drove toward the frontier, looking neither left nor right as he charged down the very axis of the enemy's 30th Corps. Like picnickers before an angry swarm of bees, the enemy began to flee eastward and southeastward as the Afrika Corps made its unannounced and desperate foray. Near Gabrasale, halfway to the wire, tanks, armoured cars, trucks and guns were caught in the rush, while the German armour charged among them and blasted them at will. Brigadiers, corporals, black drivers, typists, cipher clerks, mechanics, war correspondents, panic gripped them all regardless of rank. The enemy air force scrambled from its landing grounds, the sky was full of hurricanes and tomahawks retreating east. The 8th Army commander, Cunningham himself, just barely escaped in the Blenheim bomber, taking off through herds of trucks stampeding across the rough Gabrasail air strip. At 4 p.m. Rommel and Ravenstein reached the frontier, at Bush Effortson, 25 miles in from the sea. Like a monster caterpillar. The barbed wire entanglement rolled north and south as far as they could gaze. Thus far the gamble had paid off. Recklessly, Rommel dispatched Travenstein northeast into Egypt with orders to establish himself southeast of Half Fire, the pass through the Mediterranean escarpment overlooking Solom, before dusk. This would expose Ravenstein to great danger. He had only the truck he stood in. He had neither tanks nor artillery as yet, for his division's 2,000 vehicles were still strung out behind him along the tri elabd striving to catch up. But gamely Ravenstein obeyed. An hour later, at five, Cruel's mammoth jolted to a halt near the wire. Rommel boisterously announced, I've just sent Ravenstein on up to half-fire. Cruel was appalled. His proud Africa corpse. Yesterday's awesome victor, was now sprinkled across the sixty miles of desert from Gabrasale to Halffire. Rommel told him that the Afrika Corps and the Italian 20th Corps were going to encircle and destroy the enemy. He had not troubled to ask the Italian division here, Savona, just where the enemy was. He assumed, wrongly as it turned out, that they were all in the outer zone of the frontier fortifications. The Panzer divisions will drive the enemy onto the minefields of our Solemn Front and will force them to surrender, he announced. 
Cruel dutifully drove on into Egypt. For a while Rommel stayed at the wire, waiting for his striking forces to catch up. Colonel Stefan's 5th Panzer Regiment, however, with only 30 tanks still running, was stranded in Libya, temporarily out of gasoline and ammunition. A riot was being held up by opposition from a South African brigade. Nor had the 15th Panzer arrived, with its 56 tanks. Rommel had also ordered a reconnaissance battalion to occupy Habata that night to plug this, the defeated enemy's only other escape route from the Libyan plateau to the Egyptian coastal plain. But the battalion pleaded lack of gasoline and ammunition and lay low. Undeterred by these frustrations, Rommel took Gauze across the wire into Egypt after dusk. His aide, Alfred Berndt, later described the venture, his car's steering column snapped. His escort car had been left behind somewhere, and the last trucks of the Panzer Division were vanishing into the distance. His driver had to get out every 100 yards and kick the front wheels into the correct angle. Then the engine died on them. It was bitter cold, and Rommel and Gauze were shivering. At this moment crew well, no less, drove by in his mammoth and graciously offered them a lift. Thus it came to pass that ten German officers and five enlisted men, representing Hitler's Panzergruppe Africa, were packed into a mammoth on the enemy side of the wire. Nor did the black comedy end there. They could not find the gap through the wire to get back into Libya. Rommel himself took the wheel. After battering the wire fruitlessly, like a demented insect against a window pane, he switched off the engine and gave up for the night, they went to sleep. In fact they were just north of Fort Madalena, the British commander's advance headquarters. During the night they could hear enemy dispatch riders and trucks rattling past the stationary mammoth. But the mammoth, which was a captured British vehicle, looked unextraordinary to the passers-by and they paid it no attention. At the first light Rommel started up the engine. Soon he found a gap in the wire and slipped gratefully back into Libya. A thin crescent moon was rising in the morning sky when Rommel rejoined his forces. After a while a lieutenant from a machine gun battalion was brought to Rommel. His name was Borchart, he said, and he had been sent by his battalion, some way down the wire to the south, to find Stefan's 5th Panzer Regiment. Where is the regiment? Rommel asked impatiently. They must have reached the wire about six miles north of here by now, replied Borchut. Rommel set off there at once, past ghostly skeletons of wrecked trucks. He found Stefan and gave him his orders, then returned to Lieutenant Borchut. How many cars have you left in your company? He inquired abruptly. Borchut was taken aback. He had expected appreciation. Ah, uh, three, Herr General. Good, Rommel barked. If you've any luggage in your car you had better get it out at once. I'm taking your car and driver. The next day, November 25th, was like a nightmare for Westfl, who was at headquarters, 70 miles away. But Rommel enjoyed it. It was like being a company commander all over again rounding up straggling troops and pointing them toward the enemy. He omitted to issue any orders at all to the Triest division, so it moved, on whose volition question mark not to the frontier but to Eladem, where Westfall's staff were headquartered. He ordained that a fast raiding force was to be rushed down past Madeline at a Jaira oasis, 120 miles to the south. But nobody could spare the troops, vehicles, gasoline nor ammunition, so nobody went. Rommel obviously believed that the same cowboy tactics he had used at Mechelen in April would work again here, that speed and surprise would always triumph over planning and preparation. He visited Newman Silkow's 15th Panzer Division that morning. It had just arrived at the wire. He ordered it to push northward and seal off the enemy at Solem from the west. He explained that Travenstein's 21st Panzer was doing the same from the east. Kick up dust, he suggested. He repeated this to Cruel next day, we must use every truck and supply convoy we've got to kick up dust, that will deceive the enemy as to our real strength and lead them to surrender. Cruel expressed serious reservations. 
The day's fighting was not glorious. One of Newman Silkow's Panzer regiments beat up a British tank repair workshop of largely derelict and immobile tanks. Meanwhile, Rommel instructed the 5th Panzer Regiment, now commanded by Major Mildbrot, Stefan had just been mortally wounded, to forget about joining up with Ravenstein and to attack Sidi Omar instead. The regiment had less than 20 tanks and no artillery support. Rommel's order forced them to advance across a minefield he had himself laid, and attack enemy field guns that had been well dug in. At 800 yards range the British 25-pounders opened fire. The gunners cheered madly as Salvo followed Salvo. By dusk the German regiment had ten tanks left, of which only three had guns in working order. Neither gasoline nor ammunition reached them, because a higher headquarters had directed all our supperly trucks to simulate an attack elsewhere, the regiment bitterly reported. Late that morning the machine gun battalion that had dispatched Lieutenant Borchardt had reached the coast east of the half fire Pass, still held by the indomitable Major Bark, the ex-pastor. In theory our motor transport should have stopped dead long before, Borchardt later wrote, because the gasoline we had on paper ran out long ago. But we were driving on the difference between what we reported and what we actually had, our maintenance officers. Troop leaders and drivers were always smart enough to have a few jerry cans tucked away. Our real shortage was in water and food. Suddenly Rommel appeared and ordered them to dig in. For the next 48 hours, it turned out, we were the last soldiers to see General Rommel. It is not easy to follow the fox's trail after this. Cruel was not to see him until the next day, November 26th. Rommel, a dynamo of energy appears to have driven from one tired unit to the next. If they had orders from others, he usually revoked or reversed them. The Africa Corps diary refers scalingly to misunderstandings and errors and to Rommel's interference. Just how acid were the feelings against him is indicated by one enigmatic fact, certain pages of the diary from November 25th onward were removed and retyped, evidently in 1942. One of the retyped pages is even carelessly headed the 26th of November 1942. One possible conclusion is that at the time, Crewell, Westfland perhaps Ravenstein, too, had started to conspire against Rommel so as to salvage what they could from the wreck of his erratic grand strategy. The upshot of all this was the entirely unexpected return of Ravenstein's force from Egypt to Libya on November 26th. Who ordered it is a mystery. Rommel furiously ordered an inquiry. His battle report, printed months later, tartly observes, the affair has still not been satisfactorily cleared up. But the sequence of events is clear. Throughout the previous day, Westphal had frantically tried to raise Rommel by radio to tell him that a real crisis was threatening their Torbuk front. What had happened was greatly alarming. A large force of New Zealanders had come from the Bardian area and captured most of the key points south of Torbuk, including the hard-won city Rizek airfield and Belamed Hill. West appealed to Crewwell and Rommel to send a panzer division to attack this New Zealand force in the rear. This was the desperate situation when Rommel arrived at Crewwell's Mammoth at the frontier at 10.30 the sheaf of frantic messages from Westfall made no impression on him nor did the fact that planes sent to drop the relevant maps to him had been shot down. He did admit that he had not realized how grim the situation at Torbuk was, but he stubbornly insisted on destroying the enemy here at the frontier first. He again advised Cruel to kick up dust to dupe the defenders. Then he drove north to the coast with Newman Silkow's 15th Panzer Division. Reaching Bardia at about 1 p.m. the Panzer Division replenished with gasoline and ammunition from Bardia's fortress reserves. He was still at Bardia that evening when Ravenstein appeared, Herr General, I am happy to announce that I have arrived with my division. Rommel was astounded, he had believed the 21st Panzer was on the Egyptian side of the frontier. What are you doing here? He demanded. Ravenstein showed him a signal from Westfl ordering the recall. A fake! shouted Rommel. The British must have our codes. This was not so. 
Westphal had indeed sent this bold order, an act of no mean courage for a half-colonel of thirty-nine. It is not in the files, evidently willing hands destroyed it later, but Ravenstein's battle report tells us, in the afternoon, of November 26, my division is ordered to break through to Bardia. He had moved off at five, as dusk was falling, and broke through into Libya. His infantry and machine gunners suffered cruel losses. During the night Westfle had also radioed the 15th Panzer Division, and this signal has survived, C and C cannot be raised at present. Panzer Group Headquarters orders you to advance at once to relieve our Torbuk front. Situation very precarious. Actung. Rommel must have known that Travenstein's premature return spelled the end of his desperate foray. He was still furious when he eventually got back to Westfell's bus at Elodim. He greeted nobody, one of Rommel's personal staff recalled, but stalked silently into the operations bus and looked at the battle maps. Gors stood behind him. We tried to signal Gors to talk to Rommel to explain Westfell's decision. But it was not necessary. Rommel suddenly announced that he was tired and was going to lie down. When he reappeared from his trailer, he made no further mention of the affair, to everybody's relief. IT was an eloquent silence. In fact, by failing to take an intelligence officer with him, Rommel had contributed to his own defeat. His notion of the enemy's strength and dispositions was completely wrong. A blind man could scarcely have shown less interest than Rommel did in the main supply dumps, six miles square, established by the enemy right under his nose before Crusader. Field maintenance centers 62 and 65 were only a dozen miles south of Gabrasale. They were clearly marked on documents that were captured by the 15th Panzer Division on November 20th and sent up to Rommel's headquarters. Another dump, FMC 50 lay right across the route taken by Stefan's Panzer Regiment on the 24th, the tanks scattered the staff but ignored the stocks, gasoline and a cage of 900 Axis prisoners. Got him himmel, exclaimed Baelin after the war. If we had known all about those dumps we could have won the battle. Yet the last days of November 1941 were still to show Rommel at his best. On paper, his outlook was dim. The Afrika Corps had only 40 good battle tanks left, and 20 panzeries, the enemy outnumbered him 7 to 1 in battle tanks. The New Zealand division advancing on Torbruck from Bardia had 80 Valentines and Matildas, the enemy's 7th armoured division had had two days to replenish and now fielded 130 tanks. And the Torbruck garrison, which finally established a frail corridor through the siege ring to the New Zealanders on November 26, had 70 tanks as well. Despite the odds, Rommel again won an astonishing success by December 1. How did he do it? The factors were perhaps largely psychological. He had established a personal reputation for doing the unexpected, one of the few profits from his dash to the frontier wire. But he also had good tanks fine commanders and brave men. The cooperation between his tanks and the mobile guns was well drilled, his tactics were flexible. The British commanders were in his view ponderous and orthodox. There was one example of this when his operation began the next day, November 27. The 15th Panzer's 50 tanks made a fast start west toward Torbruck but after about 20 miles they were blocked by the 45 tanks of the 22nd Armoured Brigade, and when the 4th Armoured Brigade also arrived with 77 tanks in Newman Silkow's flank at 4 p.m., the Panzer Division was in a really tight corner. Several of his tanks were soon brewing but to his surprise the enemy suddenly called off the action and withdrew to the south. It was dusk and time for the traditional tank night leaguer. The bewildered Panzer Division resumed its westward drive. Another factor was that unlike that of several enemy commanders, Rommel's personal morale was high. He felt that he had regained the lost initiative. I think we are over the worst, he wrote irrepressibly to Lucy on November 27. I'm okay myself. I've been in the thick of a running counter-attack by us in the desert the last four days, without even a thing to wash with. But our successes have been brilliant. 
The new operation has already begun. It is easy to understand that this self-deception infuriated more sober generals. Rommel asked that day for a staff officer from Africa Corps headquarters to come and brief him, he was now back at Gambat Airfield. Cruel grabbed Bailen and a car and drove to Gambat himself, meaning to tell Rommel some home truths about the ugly situation at Torbruck. They arrived and found no sign of Rommel. After much searching they spotted a British truck on the airfield and cautiously approached. Inside, Bailen recalls, were Rommel and his chief of staff, both unshaven, worn out from lack of sleep and caked with dust. In the truck were a heap of straw as a bed, a can of stale drinking water and a few cans of food. Close by were two radio trucks and a few dispatch riders. Rommel now gave his instructions for the coming operation. Once again Cruel ignored Rommel's tactical ideas. Rommel proposed encircling the New Zealanders from their ear. Cruel wanted to avoid splitting up his panzer divisions for this, and he decided to launch them in one grand slam from the east, toppling the New Zealanders forward into Torbruck. He spent the next day reconnoitering the terrain. At about 9 pm Rommel sent him a new plan but Cruel ignored it as too late and summoned both his Panzer Division commanders, Newman Silkow and Ravenstein, to see him at 8 a.m. the next day to make sure they followed his plan. General von Ravenstein never arrived. His Mercedes-Benz car was found empty, showing signs of gunplay. The British have nabbed Ravenstein, Rommel concluded without emotion. He never had liked aristocrats. On November 29 the desert once again rang to the sound of tank turret hatches clanging shut as the Africa Corps rolled into action. In mid-morning the 15th Panzer Division again moved off west along the tri so, followed by the 21st Panzer on its right. The objectives grew well had assigned them were the commanding heights in fact barely 150 feet, of El Duda and Belamed. With only nine battle tanks left. The 21st Panzer was soon halted. But Newman Silkow's 15th, with 31 battle tanks and 12 Panzer is, made good progress. In a curious way, it was in fact Rommel's plan rather than Cruel's that was being put into effect. Newman Silkow had intercepted Rommel's amended plan to Cruel on the evening before, and decided to follow that. Truly, the Africa Corps was an agglomeration of free spirits. Rommel went forward just before noon with several Italian generals to watch the battle with Cruel. The decision will probably come today, he confidently wrote to Lucy. But it did not. Days of heavy fighting, disappointments, misunderstandings and biting winds, which even the thickest blankets and greatcoats could not keep out, still lay ahead. Even the first day went poorly, and by nightfall he was not at all well pleased. Newman Silkow had taken El Duda from the west but lost it again, while the 21st Panzer had barely moved at all from the east. Cruel was gloomy when Rommel again visited his headquarters next morning. Rommel afterwards scribbled to Lucy, The outlook's good, but the troops are dog-tired after twelve days of all this. I myself am well, I'm fresh and I feel enormously fit. In the end it was his enormous resilience and the enemy's corresponding lack of a strong and unified leadership, on which Rommel's own battle report passed comment, that sealed the fate of the New Zealand division. He persisted with his encirclement action, and at 10.30 opened a five-hour artillery barrage on the enemy stronghold at Sidi Rizeg. The enemy failed to concentrate their armour fast enough to help the hard-pressed New Zealanders. At 1.40 pm Rommel again went to Africa Corps headquarters, to watch the jaws close on the enemy. The large caliber guns were tearing huge craters in the enemy positions at Sidi Rizeg, the ridge and airfield were obscured by dust and smoke. The enemy's 25 pounders were running out of ammunition, and at 3.40 Newman Silkow moved in. It was a hard and violent fight, and it was 10 at night before the 15th Panzer could confirm that Sidi Rizeg was once again in German hands. The final act took place next day, the 1st of December. Newman Silkow's infantry battalions got a foothold on the shallow slope of Belamed before dawn. 
then Colonel Hans Kramer's 8th Panzer Regiment passed through them, by 8.30 am they had fought their way through to the other side. The encirclement was complete. Only armour could save the New Zealanders now. An armoured division did arrive from the south at this time, but in the confusion of battle it mistakenly withdrew the way it had come. Rommel wrote in a letter on the second, this eases the situation, but if I am any judge of the British they will not give up yet. His troops were weary beyond measure. One trained enemy I saw them as practically sleepwalkers, men who certainly did not regard themselves as victorious. The Germans had taken heavy casualties in November, 473 dead, 1,680 injured and 962 missing. They had also lost 142 tanks and a large amount of other equipment, and supplies were not getting through to Libya. Rommel, however, still felt on top of the situation. He described December 2nd as a somewhat calmer day, and hinted to Lucy, there are certain indications that the enemy is throwing in the sponge. He wanted to fight one last big battle, to liberate the Solom Front. But first, he knew, he must restore his soldiers' morale. That evening he ordered a proclamation to be issued to all troops. The battle has been brought to its first victorious conclusion. In unremitting heavy fighting with a vastly superior enemy we destroyed by December the first 814 tanks and armoured cars, 127 aircraft, we captured enormous booty and took over 9,000 prisoners. Soldiers. This great triumph is due to your courage, endurance and perseverance. But the battle is not yet over. Forward, then, to the final knockout blow for the enemy. For a third time Rommel and Cruel dramatically differed on how to deliver this knockout blow. Rommel suggested splitting his forces, Newman Silkow taking non Panzer elements of both Panzer divisions to relieve the frontier garrisons, while other formations tackled the enemy at El Duda and far to the south. Cruel hotly protested that first and foremost the Afrika Corps sought to deal with the critical situation southeast of Torbruk. He added caustically, we must not repeat the error of giving up to the enemy the battlefield on which the Afrika Corps has won repeated victories, and embarking on a new far-flung operation before destroying the enemy completely. If, however, Rommel had some good reason, Cruel said, for making what amounted to yet another foray to the frontier wire, then they should commit the whole Africa Corps, apart from its tanks, which needed repair. Rommel ignored Gruwell's logic and suffered the corresponding punishment the next day, December 3rd. Attempting three operations with inadequate forces, he prospered in none. At last, reality caught up with Rommel. Late that day, he took the first grave decision to abandon all ground east of Torbuk, the Afrika Corps headquarters was evacuated from Gambit, and steps were initiated to salvage Rommel's extensive depots and materiel in that area. In a much darker mood he told all this to Lucy, the battle continues, but as it is shifting more to the west we have had to regroup during last night. I hope we have pulled it off. The battle is too difficult for words. Whatever the cause, he had made up his mind on December 3rd. On the 4th, he claimed to have radio intercepts and air reconnaissance evidence of a strong enemy force approaching from the deep south. He reacted by sending south the whole Africa Corps, and meanwhile he quietly thinned out and dismantled his siege apparatus east of Torbruk. Tractors hauled the big artillery westward. Depots and half repaired tanks were blown up. On the 5th, the Africa Infantry Division, now renamed the 90th Light, was first briefed to hold the siege line as long as it could, then informed at 10.15 pm that it too would be pulled out. A discussion earlier that evening had precipitated this final slump in Rommel's hopes. A quiet, objective Italian staff officer, Lieutenant Colonel Giuseppe Montezemolo, had arrived with a message from the Italian High Command in Rome. The message was that Rommel had no hope of getting fresh supplies or reinforcements across the Mediterranean for at least a month. Rommel equally bluntly admitted that the Afrika Corps had only 40 of its 250 tanks left, and wholly inadequate ammunition stocks. 
he proposed abandoning the whole peninsula of Cyrenaica, not just Tobruk. The attempt to hold at the Egyptian frontier was over too. He had already ordered the Italian Savona division to withdraw into the coastal fortress of Bardia, twenty miles from Solom, since the ammunition and food in the Solom line had been used up. Rommel told Colonel Montezemolo that his losses were 4,000, including 16 commanders. The next day, as if to lend emphasis, word came that Newman Silkow himself had been mortally wounded by a bursting shell. Bastico was dumbfounded at the colonel's grave report, and he reported in turn to his superior in Rome, General Cavallero. Cavallero reluctantly agreed to forfeit the stranglehold on Torbuk, but directed that Rommel must not throw away the whole of Cyrenaica without good reason, and he must retain Benghazi as a supple port as long as possible. Bastico sent for Rommel late on December 7. Rommel had withdrawn his headquarters westward to a ravine near Ghazala, some miles west of Torbuk, the interim line that he proposed to defend. He churlishly refused Bastico's invitation, claiming he was too busy to get away. So Bastico drove over by car to see him. According to all the diaries it was a stormy meeting. The colorful Italian record leaves no doubt of that either. Rommel deliberately kept his esteemed Italian superior waiting for 15 minutes, then called him into the trailer that he was using as his headquarters and, very excitedly and in an uncontrolled and impetuous manner, put the entire blame for his defeat on the Italian generals. They were inefficient and had not cooperated with him. Bastico angrily interrupted him, whereupon Rommel, very heatedly, and acting like an overbearing and uncouth boor, yelled that he had struggled for victory for three weeks and had now decided to withdraw his divisions to Tripoli, and to have himself interned in, neutral, Tunisia. A few moments later he snapped, we haven't won the battle, so now there is nothing to do but retreat. Turning the tables. For the FRST time in his life, Rommel is on the retreat, a mortifying experience. How humble one learns to be he says in a letter to Lucy. His first halt is at the Ghazala line, but the slow and panicky Italians, largely unmotorized, are an encumbrance. He does not have the gasoline nor ammunition to fight back, and his best men are failing him. Newman Silkow lies in a soldier's grave. Summerman of the 90th Light Division has also been killed, by an rough attack. Some of his surviving commanders are succumbing to desert plagues. Even Cruel is sick, infected by jaundice. And what will become of the 14,000 troops he has left in strong points along the Solom front and in the Bardia fortress, now that the Panzer group is moving ever farther away from them toward the west? Don't worry, he writes to Lucy, I'm feeling okay and hope my lucky star won't leave me. For one general, the uncertainty of war is over. Ravenstein will soon begin the long journey from Cairo to Canada as a prisoner. He was a good general, but he makes a poor prisoner. He is a gourmet and officer of high breeding, and he misses the captured delicacies that were stowed in the glove compartment of his Mercedes, the Allsbrooks biscuits, the South African cigarettes, the Cross and Blackwell's canned preserves, the Greek brandy and the rum. However, the British look after him well and their director of military intelligence is even chivalrous enough to invite him over once for tea. The brigadier confides to him that the invitation has aroused a storm of protest, but to Ravenstein it seems a natural courtesy between officers and gentlemen. How is he in his naivete to know that the only purpose of luring him from his tent is to enable a microphone to be installed in it? Rommel's generals turn out to be garrulous in captivity. Cruel and his successor at Africa Corps headquarters, both of whom are captured in 1942, will tell British microphones, in the civilized comfort of their English country house surroundings, that Hitler is developing a secret long-range rocket to use on England, in his conversation now with other prisoners, Ravenstein unwittingly reveals much that the British do not know, about the Panzer Group's heavy losses, its mismanagement and, above all, about the widespread dissatisfaction over Rommel's leadership. And yet Rommel has by no means shot his bolt. 
During December 1941 he proves that he is a master of the obstinate retreat. And in January it turns out that he can spring surprises of which a Ravenstein would never have dreamed. Somehow, Rommel survived the first half of December and thwarted every enemy attempt at outflanking the Ghazala line although it was only a dozen miles long and ended in the open, defenseless desert. He was living in a proper house again, with lived chickens cackling and scratching the muddy ground outside. By day he toured his fatigued troops. Rain poured down incessantly, and the desert was sometimes a bottomless morass. The bushes were tinged with green, a sign that in the protected valleys of Cyrenaica the African spring would soon arrive. It was good to be out of range of Torbuk's artillery, but at night it was cold and for some weeks he slept in his uniform and greatcoat, unwilling to bathe or change his underwear. What kept his spirits up even now? First, he knew he still enjoyed Hitler's confidence, even if the Italians had no trust in him at all. As recently as December 11th Hitler had mentioned him by name in an important speech. In that speech Hitler declared war on the United States, an ominous action that Rommel never referred to in his diaries. Secondly, Rommel felt on top of the crisis. Ravenstein might have written him off in Cairo, but the Panzer group was still able to inflict severe losses on the attackers. He had little ammunition or gasoline but a railroad ferry did reach Benghazi on the 19th and unload 22 precious tanks for the Africa Corps. Two days later he cajoled Lucy, don't let your head hang down, I'm not doing that here. He did not intend to remain long at the Gazala position. He had hinted at this to Bastico on the 8th, and he warned Berlin a few days later that he was planning to withdraw right across Cyrenaica shortly. To the world it looked as though the British had Rommel on the run, in fact he was always one step ahead of them. The Italians felt that he should stand and fight at Gazala, and they suspected that if Rommel pulled back, the largely non-motorized Italian troops would be left to the mercies of the enemy. That was not the way Rommel was secretly planning it, however. The Italians would be sent back on the easy coastal road while the Africa Corps and the Italian general Gambara's 20th Corps would fight a delaying action to keep the enemy from outflanking them across the desert. His own generals were as perplexed at first as the Italians. When his preparatory withdrawal order hit the Africa Corps on the afternoon of December 14, Cruel sharply replied that they had inflicted such losses on the British that it was totally unnecessary to withdraw now. Gambara was furious. Bastico flew into a rage because Rommel was not consulting him. The chief of the Italian high command, Cavallero, felt that Rommel might be acting over hastily, that he was ignoring the larger implications of the entry of Japan into the war, there were already signs that Britain was having to shift combat units from North Africa to the Far East. When Cavallero flew to Libya on the 16th, the Italian commanders poured out their hearts to him. Gambara wailed. If you knew how much we have suffered being practically at Rommel's beck and call. Bastico chimed in, he made me wait fifteen minutes. Cavallero asked them if they could suggest any alternative, and curtly snapped, we are all in the same boat. You will just have to grin and bear it. Then Cavallero called on Rommel himself, and blurted out that the loss of Cyrenaica would be a political bombshell for Italy. Rommel outbid him on that the loss of all Tripolitania as well would be an even bigger one. Later that day Cavallero called on him again. Rommel noted in his diary, in a voice charged with emotion he demanded that the order for the retreat must be withdrawn. Bastico and Gambara reacted violently but could propose no alternative. The Rommel diary smugly observes, their delegation left my headquarters having accomplished nothing. The withdrawal formally began at midnight. Crossing the uncharted Cyrenaican desert by night was no easier now than during the exhilarating April offensive. Trucks and tanks bogged down and had to be winched clear. By day enemy planes harried and strafed them. Fuel and ammunition were running low. The local Luftwaffe commander Waldor commented on December 20 in his private diary, Rommel has decided on a further withdrawal to Aegidabia. We cannot judge if he is right. 
it is all a question of supplies. We are losing a lot of equipment, particularly transport planes, yesterday alone 20 junkers. And 14 of them threw bad gasoline, on the same day the new commander of the 90th Light Division discussed their plight with his staff, nobody can see any escape. The British outnumber us enormously. The puzzle is, why are they following so slowly? Time and again they have enabled us to dodge encirclement. There is only one explanation. They're all of General Rommel, and his capacity to surprise, that's why they're following so hesitantly. Benghazi, the sprawling, long-suffering capital of Cyrenaica, with its untidy keys, noisy street markets and ever-open brothels, was once more evacuated by the Axis troops and abandoned to the enemy. Before the British marched in, all the Axis supply dumps were thrown open to Rommel's troops. One German official refused to release warm blankets and clothing from his depot, his orders were to burn them, after that, the Via Balbia, the highway along the coast, was thronged with army trucks overloaded with crates of canned meat, butter, preserves, fruit, chocolate, beer, cigarettes and even fresh potatoes. Morale in the Panzer group began to climb, and Rommel said wryly in one letter, the British were very disappointed not to have cut us off in B, in Azi, and not to have found any gasoline or food there either. For a time, Rommel hoped to make a stand at Ajidabia, south of Benghazi, it was tactically the key to Cyrenaica. If I give it up, I am giving up all Cyrenaica, he told Gruwell, now fighting obstinately with jaundice. Because here I've got my hand on the enemy's throat, and I can return and slice clear back to Gazala at any time again. He jolted around the battle lines in his mammoth checking gun positions and trying to stabilize the Panzer Group's defenses. The Italians were a major headache. Their high command had little sympathy with his retreat, the generals mistrusted him, the troops showed every sign of imminent disintegration, the looting and gunplay in Benghazi were only one symptom of this. Italian unreliability was the main reason he gave when he requested Mussolini's authorization to withdraw still farther west if need be and to surrender the distant besieged garrisons at Bardia, Solom and Harfaya if their food and ammunition ran out. Rommel's language to Mussolini well displays his humanity and moral courage. I will not be responsible for the useless sacrifice of some 15,000 German and Italian soldiers there, meaning in the Egyptian frontier garrisons. Since he had here at age to be less than a dozen of the deadly Flak 88s, each one could spell death to an entire tank company, he ordered the Italians to manufacture dummy guns and told them to dig in the real 88 swell and far apart, just as at Harfire. But a few days later, when he again toured this sector, he found the 88s prominently displayed and attracting heavy shelling. He lost his temper and drove off to find out who was responsible for this sabotage. He returned rather abashed. They are dummies, he admitted. The Italians have knocked them together from telegraph poles. It's the camouflage paint that fooled me. He congratulated the Italian commander, if and when we fall back farther west, take the decoys with you. There's no need for the enemy to rumble as yet, before we can dream up new dodges. On December 28th and again two days later Rommel sprang a nasty surprise on the enemy. Crewwell had noticed an inviting gap between the two enemy brigades closest to Aegidabia, and threw the Africa Corps at one of them, the 22nd Armoured Brigade. In two professional and smoothly executed attacks the Germans destroyed 60 of the tanks that the brigade had painfully brought across the desert, two-thirds of its force. This setback to the British gave Rommel breathing space. He now ordered his forces to disengage surreptitiously and abandon Cyrenaica. He told one division commander on New Year's Day that he was going to rehabilitate and reorganize his forces in a new line running inland from Mersa Brega, and to train them for an attack in the spring. His commanders all needed rest and recuperation. General Gors had left for Rome and Germany, ostensibly to report to Hitler, but in fact because his nerves were badly tattered. The entire staff of the 21st Panzer Division was undergoing an overhaul, 
after it apparently suffered a mass nervous breakdown at the end of November. Like crew well, Colonel Westphal had now also contracted jaundice. I'll soon be the only German officer to have fought here from start to finish, said Rommel. He visited Cruel on January 2, as the withdrawal stealthily gained momentum. Cruel's open, boyish face was pallid and tinged an ominous yellow. He was so weak with jaundice that he was bedridden. Rommel told him that he planned to lay 100,000 mines in the new line, they would be brought over by submarine. I'm going to build a kind of east wall to protect Tripolitania, he said. A tough force of Luftwaffe paratroopers was coming, and Hitler had finally lifted the embargo on the army's important anti-tank secret weapon, the redhead hollow charge shell. The only answer to the crisis caused by Stalin's T-34 tank and the Russian winter on the Eastern Front. Hitler had sent Rommel a personal New Year's message, telling of his admiration for the Panzer Group. I know I can rely on my Panzer Group in the New Year too, he wrote. The nights were cold and damp. Rommel lay in bed and looked at the light of the full moon playing through the window. His final retreat was going according to plan. Sadly, the Bardia fortress had had to surrender after a ferocious battle. Soon the enemy forces that this has released will be another millstone around my neck, he wrote. I am preparing for them. We are working day and night. Under cover of a raging sandstorm, a gift of providence that lasted for two days, Rommel pulled his last rear guards out of Aegidabia. All his forces, German and Italian, were now in the Mercer Brega line on the frontier of Tripolitania. The violent storm, he cheered up Lucy, seems to be over. The skies are turning blue. Probably only combat soldiers can appreciate the size of Rommel's achievement in having retreated across nearly 300 miles in one month without serious loss to his force, while still inflicting savage wounds on his tormentors. Yet although he had salvaged the largely non-motorized Italian troops, Bastico and his comrades did not render appreciation. Understandably, mocked Rommel in a letter, these would-be warlords have pulled wry faces. It's easy to criticize. Praise for Rommel reached him from an unusual quarter. The Africa Corps diary for December 17 had stated, according to subsequent dispatches of the U.S. ambassador in Cairo, we had driven straight through the British 22nd Armored Brigade. He describes it as a masterpiece. How did Rommel know what the American ambassador to Egypt was putting in his dispatches? In September, Italian agents had burglarized the U.S. Embassy in Rome and photographed its copy of the Black Code. For many months thereafter, Italian and German code breakers could eavesdrop on top secret American communications. Of sensational value were the reports sent to the War Department in Washington by the military attaché in Cairo, Colonel Bonifellas, because he was a perceptive battlefield observer and kept himself abreast of all the English Army's plans against Rommel and its expectations of the Panzer Group's next moves. This was a tremendous advantage to Rommel and helps explain his coming triumph. Rommel, normally not overly security conscious, kept these little fellas, as he engagingly termed the American dispatches, close to his chest. There is no mention of them in his diaries, or even his memoirs. Hitler knew about them, however. Let's hope that the US legation in Cairo keeps us well posted about Britain's military planning, thanks to their poorly encoded telegrams, he wisecracked to Hermann Goring over lunch one day in June 1942. One of Rommel's intelligence staff recalls now, Rommel used to wait for the dispatches each evening. We just knew them as the good source. When fellas reported to Washington, the British are preparing to retreat, they are burning secret papers, then Rommel would really see red, there was no holding him. As yet Rommel's preoccupation in January 1942 was survival. But he was growing ever more sanguine. He knew the time was now in his favor. Under Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, a new air force had arrived in the Mediterranean, and squadrons based in Sicily were neutralizing Malta by air raids. U-boats were harassing the British fleet. Rommel wrote approvingly on January 4, K. 
Kessel Rings coming to see me again today. We're both now working hand in glove. And the next day, we're gradually getting more material over here. He's really knocking the stuffing out of Malta. That was the day, January 5, 1942, that nine merchant ships, escorted by no less than four Italian battleships, safely docked at Tripoli and unloaded over 50 tanks for Rommel, and 2,000 tons of aviation fuel. This was Hitler's New Year's gift to his favorite commander. If today's convoy succeeds in getting through, Hitler told General Gores, his guest for lunch in his bunker headquarters, then the British are going to have to look out. A few minutes later Gores commented, it was a relief for us to learn of Japan's entry into the war. Hitler was at that time unperturbed by the fact that he was also at war with the United States, and commented to Gores, yes, a relief. But also a turning point in history. It means the loss of a whole continent, India. And that we must regret, because it is the white race that is the loser. For several days Rommel toured his units, digging in along the line at Mercer Brega. He was now accompanied by his new interpreter, Wilfred Armbruster, a bright young lieutenant with an Italian mother and a talent for mimicry, when Rommel barked insults and orders at the Italian generals, Lieutenant Armbruster barked the translation at them in precisely the same tone of voice. Luck is an important weapon in the historian's armory. I had driven to Milan to meet Armbruster because he had mentioned to me in a letter that he still had some papers. He was German-born, but with the dark round eyes and mobile features of a typical Italian. The papers turned out to be press clippings, and I was beginning to regret the journey when, after several hours discussion, I asked for a certain date. I'll just check my diaries, he said. Diaries. He had never shown them to anyone before. Eventually he did part with them, but not willingly. They were invaluable in the study of the next phase of Rommel's campaign. Rommel's tireless inspections went on. We drive back and forth across the desert, wrote Armbruster, at a hellish tempo. On January 15, with Armbruster still in tow, Rommel twice flew up and down the line in his Storch observation plane. He told Colonel Westfall that the terrain did not please him and he instructed the Africa Corps to prepare itself to make forays in every possible direction. He expected the next clash to come soon. The British were still obviously stockpiling for a new offensive, and radio intercepts showed they were experiencing cruel supply difficulties. These shortages were what Trommel now gambled on. He knew that the British supply line extended over 1,000 miles, while he himself was now only 500 miles from Tripoli. And he knew too that the enemy air force would be weak, because the little fellas told him so, the RAF is transferring aircraft to the Far East, fellas had radioed to Washington, also giving the details of the damage Malta was suffering. For several nights, Rommel sat up late and brooded over the maps, photos, little fellas and quartermaster reports. He demanded that the new tanks coming to him from Tripoli move forward at over 200 miles per day. He estimated that the Panzer Group would now have 150 battle tanks, against the enemy's 360, but this did not deter him. He knew that there comes a point in every retreat when the hunted quarry can round on its pursuers as they filter through some hindering obstacle, like a desert wilderness, and take them on individually and in turn. If he waited any longer, the enemy would regain numerical superiority. The moment for decision came. He wrote to Lucy on January 17 these graphic words, Things are going our way, and my head is chock full of plans, plans I dare not say anything about to the people around me, otherwise they'll think I've gone stark raving mad. But I haven't. It's just that I see farther ahead than they do. You know me he added. It's in the small hours that my best new plans are hatched. What was his new plan? He sent for Heinz Heginrinner, his liaison officer to the Italians. I feel, he announced with a grin, that I've got an attack coming on. Heginrinner was forbidden to say anything to Bastico, however. On the contrary, 
he was to give the impression that Rommel was planning to retreat still farther. The next morning he briefed Gruwell, still bedridden with jaundice, and Baelin about his new intention. The Panzer Group will tackle the enemy build-up southwest of Aegidabia, he announced. At this moment they are fewer in number than we are. We will surprise them, and annihilate them. Armbruster burst with the news and unloaded it into his diary, our plans have undergone a radical change. The Tommies are in for the surprise of their lives. But how to preserve that vital element of surprise? Rommel listed by name the only commanders to be let into the secret. He forbade his artillery to reply with more than desultory shelling. He forbade all truck movements toward the enemy by day, on the contrary, he ostentatiously ran truck convoys westward until dusk, then switched them under cover of darkness toward the enemy. The tanks and guns were expertly camouflaged. He kept the secret from the German high command in Berlin and above all from the Italian high command. So no Enigma signals went by radio either, instead, he arranged for the Panzer Group attack order to be posted on notice boards at roadhouses all along the Via Balbia to the front, after zero hour. Zero hour would be 8.30 am on January 21. As that hour approached, the skies lit up with the fires of buildings and ships along the coast deliberately ignited by Rommel to suggest that a major Axis retreat had again begun. Zero hour. Rommel himself took the lead as he conducted the battle group on the coastal highway through the minefields. On his left was the empty sea, on his right, the barren desert. It was 8.30 am two hours earlier, he had penned his usual letter home, I firmly believe that God is keeping a protective hand over me and will grant me victory. His men were in fine fettle. Cruel's Africa Corps attacked simultaneously, some miles to the right but parallel. He hit heavy going, but Rommel's group jumped the enemy and rolled into Aegidabia the next morning. His enemy lacked battle experience. Rommel outwitted, outmaneuvered and outgunned them. Our opponents have taken to their heels as if stung by a tarantula, he said in triumph. And Armbruster echoed this, the Tommies don't stand and fight. They have just turned and fled. The enemy fell back so fast that Rommel's first attempt at encircling them is fired, but not the second. The Afrika Corps totted up its score for the first five days as 299 enemy tanks and AFVs, armored fighting vehicles, 147 guns and 935 prisoners. Against these our own losses have been very slight, three officers and eleven enlisted men killed three tanks total losses. Rommel's high-handed behavior infuriated the Italians. On January 23 the chief of their high command, General Cavallero, flew with Kesselring to see Rommel. Armed with a directive from Mussolini himself, Cavallero admonished Rommel, make this no more than a sortie, then you must go straight back to Mersa Brega. Rommel rebelled. He knew he had Hitler's personal backing now because just a few days before the Führer had awarded him the swords to his Oak Leaves and Knight's Cross, the first such award to a German army officer. The Panzer Group had been formally raised to army status, and Rommel himself to Oberbefehlschaber, or Commander-in-Chief, Rommel effectively thumbed his nose at the Italians after that. He told the glowering General Cavallero, I intend to keep up the attack as long as I can. And only the Führer can stop me as most of the fighting will be done by German troops. Cavallero departed, growling, according to Rommel's diary. For a time, his quartermaster staff did give him second thoughts. Major Otto, the Panzer Group quartermaster, flew to Crew Wells headquarters on January 25 with word that Rommel would not be able to continue the offensive since the Duce could not promise the same supply effort in February. Rommel ordered the Afrika Corps not to press its advantage but to limit itself to salvaging booty. But the little fellas and radio intercept reports were so alluring, the enemy commanders were rattled and bickering among themselves, there was talk of abandoning even Benghazi, that he saw red again next day. Now the tables are turned with a vengeance, he wrote to his son. We've got the British by the short hairs, 
and I'm going to tear their hair out by the roots. By noon on January 26 he had decided to throw caution to the winds and continue the attack. He radioed Fritz Bailn, Cruel's chief of staff, to fly to the headquarters of Panzer Army Africa. There Rommel disclosed that he was going to do just what the enemy did not expect, go straight for Benghazi while the enemy believed he was heading the other way, toward Mechili, as in April 1941. Benghazi would then be looted of all enemy equipment and stores, and then abandoned again, such was Rommel's intention as he set out at the head of a small force from Seuss at dusk on January 27. A sandstorm blew up, and then heavy rain. Twenty-four hours of grueling country lay ahead of Rommel. But the prospects were promising. Bailen's decoy force fainting toward Mechili had attracted enemy fire, and radio intercept confirmed that it had been noticed, which was very satisfying for Rommel. His plan was working well. In London, Winston Churchill lumbered to his feet in Parliament to answer angry questions about the crisis in North Africa. His own earlier boast that they would soon be in Tripoli rang very hollow now. The hero of the world's press was not Churchill but that accursed Panzer general with the perspex goggles and the Paula Merite, I cannot tell you, said Churchill to the House, what the position at the present moment is on the Western Front in Cyrenaica. We have a very daring and skillful opponent against us, and, may I say across the havoc of war, a great general. North of Benghazi, said Lieutenant Alfred Burnt in a later broadcast, there are long columns of an Indian division wending their way along the highway leading out to Dona. They believe that our forces are only slowly moving up from Ajidabia. Then, suddenly, like a clap of thunder, General Rommel bursts upon them from the east having approached through those mountains in pouring rain with just a few tanks and armoured cars. He had hit the coastal highway at Coifio at 6 p.m. on the 28th. Here the Via Balbia was elevated, with a ditch on either side. Thus the Indian motor transport attempting to escape Benghazi was trapped. In less than an hour, continued Burnt, the Indian division has been smashed. Our troops capture hundreds of trucks. We have done the seemingly impossible, we have overcome every obstacle, driven by our commander's spirit through the marshy wilderness and across the red and slippery mountains of Cyrenaica, and we have struck right into the enemy's flank just as they think that they are safe at last. Down the road, flames and explosions lit the sky over the port. The British were demolishing and preparing to retreat. Once again Benghazi changed hands. Rommel's booty was immense, including 1,300 urgently needed trucks. That night German radio stations interrupted their programs with the news of his victory. The next day Hitler too heaped praise on him in a speech and promoted him to Colonel General. Nobody else had ever made that rank so young. When General Waldenehring, fresh from the Russian front, saw Hitler a few days later on his way to North Africa, the Führer commanded. Tell Rommel that I admire him. Rommel was jubilant and privately wrote of his pleasure to have been able to do my bit for the Führer, the nation and the new idea. As for the old idea, of falling back after sacking Benghazi, Rommel never mentioned it again. From Lucy came an ecstatic letter. All she could think of now was that the Lord must have wanted his general to secure this great victory and new honor. We're all so mighty proud of you, my darling Erwin she wrote, and with us the entire German nation, as the storms of applause proved when the Führer mentioned your name yesterday in his big speech and spoke of our Colonel General Rommel. It was so marvelous for us to hear to listen to the speech yesterday afternoon and again in the evening. Her house was full of flowers from admirers, her telephone rang itself off the hook, the front door bell kept chiming. Rommel's picture was splashed across all the newspapers. Today, Lucy wrote him some days later, they paid special tribute to your name in the evening music broadcast, they played bits of music and the composer's initials spelled out a name backward, the name of our popular hero Colonel General Rommel. You can imagine how my head reels with all this. It's all like some kind of dream, 
and all my prayers go only to the Lord to be with you and keep helping you toward your goal for the Führer, the nation and the fatherland. This is my waking thought every morning and it's my prayer when I go to sleep at night, my dearest Erwin. Now Rommel was making grand plans again. Whereas Hitler had once again prescribed the Panzer Army's mission in terms of merely tying down as many British troops as possible, the Fox had notions of his own. Cyrenaica, thrusting like a balcony into the Mediterranean, with vital airfields dominating Malta and the eastern Mediterranean, must come next. Rommel was going to reconquer all Cyrenaica, capture Tobruk and then advance on Egypt and the Nile. The Italians, who would have to organize the necessary supplies, were not enthusiastic even about what Rommel had already accomplished. Rome is putting on the brakes, said Rommel, and added pointedly, that being so, I think I'm going to have to fly quite soon to the Führer's headquarters. His frustration was again evident in a letter of February 10. Rome, he wrote, would like nothing better than to abandon all Cyrenaica again. But after a triumph like this, his elated troops were willing to go to the ends of the earth with Rommel. Once again he had shown that by his personal presence, by the mere appearance of the mammoth with its waving radio aerial and the familiar stocky figure standing up in its well, bawling orders to other officers with short, characteristic gestures, he could bring punch to just that place in an operation where punch was needed. Here is one voice, Major Karl Kranz, writing in the Nazi newspaper Volker Sebebekter on January 24, 1942, after we have been driving in scorching heat from four in the morning until dusk, ever onward, getting reports from generals and battery and company commanders, he calls a halt for forty winks in the middle of the desert. And there we sleep, the general and his officers and NCOs and enlisted men, side by side as comfortably as we can in our various vehicles. At the first flush of dawn the column starts moving again. And here is the war reporter Baron von Erspeck, writing in July 1944, as we sweep forward to the Egyptian frontier, we find him everywhere, and always there is this strange magic strength that this soldier radiates to his troops, right down to the last rifleman. The privates call him Irwin, just that, Irwin, short and to the point. Not that they intend any disrespect by using his Christian name, it is a mark of profound admiration. Because the guys can understand their commander in chief, when he talks with them he calls a spade a spade, he doesn't sentimentalize with them, but meets them man to man, often uses hard language with them, but also knows how to praise and encourage them and make suggestions, and make complicated subjects easily comprehensible to them. Of course, to start with there were only a few of us, everybody knew everybody else and there was a desert camaraderie, the rifleman saw his general, and for that matter the general his rifleman, eating the same classical Libyan diet of sardines. Not that the Panzer army was only a few now. Reinforcements were slowly coming. Major General Georg von Bismarck had arrived to take over the 21st Panzer Division, Lieutenant General Gustav von Weist the 15th Panzer. Both were fine and talented commanders. And 1,300 Luftwaffe paratroopers, veterans of the murderous Greek invasion, flew in, armed to the teeth with the most modern weapons and equipment the Drommel's officers had ever seen. The captured enemy trucks were distributed, the captured tanks and armored fighting vehicles were repainted in Africa Corps colors, and the palm tree and swastika motif was stenciled on. Rommel drove about the peninsula, chivying and harrying. On February 11 he moved his headquarters to the hub of this desert peninsula. It was still cold, but in Africa spring was coming. His interpreter wrote that day, it was a wonderful drive. Here in Cyrenaica the almond trees are in blossom, and the entire population flocked to the highways to greet us as we passed. Then suddenly this dynamo was gone. Rommel, whose superhuman energy was the despair of his more mortal staff, drove to the airfield on February 15 and took off for Rome. The tempo slackened, the atmosphere at every level of the Panzer Army eased. The 90th Light Division probably spoke for everybody in its diary, C&C &C has left on furlough, 
three to four weeks. Everybody breathes a huge sigh of relief, and looks forward to the coming days of calm. Three evenings later Rommel was in Hitler's secret headquarters in East Prussia. There is no record of their conference, but afterward Martin Bormann's adjutant wrote down Hitler's remarks over dinner, an ungenerous portrait of Winston Churchill, Churchill is the very archetype of a corrupt journalist, sneered the Führer. He himself has written that it's incredible how far you can get in war with the help of the common lie. He's an utterly amoral, repulsive creature. I'm convinced he has a refuge prepared for himself across the Atlantic. He'll go to his friends, the Yanks. Rommel seems to have made no reply. A month would pass before he returned to North Africa. Manfred is now as tall as his mother, soon he will overtake me too, he wrote to a relative. But the general was not good company to either Lucy or their son. I just could not settle down at home, he explained in a letter to a colonel. To know that his army was once again within striking distance of Torbuk, but to have to wait until he had regrouped and stockpiled enough supplies. He was on edge throughout his furlough in Austria. Back in Libya, he wrote this to a cousin, the big question is, who will make the first move? And to an uncle's inquiry as to whether Erwin himself was allowed to decide whether to retreat or launch a counter-attack, Rommel made this reply, I take all such decisions myself, and I'm glad not to have my hands tied in this connection. This war theatre is so remote, besides, that it would be quite impossible for any other authority to get involved in the daily conduct of operations. These letters have survived because he dictated them to his secretary, Corporal Albert Botcher, and Botcher dutifully preserved his shorthand pads. The same pads contain the long-lost portion of the Rommel diary. Over the next two months Botcher filled 140 pages with his tight shorthand while the Desert Fox drove hectically around Cyrenaica in his swastika-decked cubal car, exhorting the troops, instructing them in tactics and gun sight construction and conferring with their commanders. He found time to inspect the rear areas, too, the keys in bomb-shattered Benghazi, the workshops repairing tanks and decrepit trucks supplied by the Vichy French to help drive the Allies out of Africa. He watched tractor and firing trials with the excellent 76.2mm anti-tank guns captured in Russia. He organized lines of listening posts to protect the long desert flank against British infiltration. For one brief month the sandy brown had given way to green, as Cyrenaica succumbed to spring. Lieutenant Arm Bruster, his accompanying interpreter, wrote, I have never seen colors like these. The desert is a coast-to-coast -coast carpet of vivid reds, lemon yellows, purples, lilacs, greens, oranges, violets and white. Rommel was to be seen with a movie camera pressed to his sun-blistered face, filming the extraordinary spectacle for Lucy. His own picture was everywhere that spring. He made the front page of the magazine Illustrated Bookter, and fan letters cascaded in. At one stage he had just finished reading 150 and another 100 await his attention. One secretary is not enough, he told Lucy. And, lovelorn letters from all shapes and sizes of females are on the increase. He sent her some, the newsreels have brought the younger females particularly out of their composure. He had two months to prepare his next move. But his Africa Corps alone was under strength so there was bound to be some delay. Visiting the Axis Air Commanders Vittorio Marchese and Otto Hoffmann von Waldor, he announced, we are going to attack in about two months' time. Our objectives will be first to defeat and destroy the British field arm and prevent its escape into Torbuk, and then to capture Torbuk itself. These are the only forces that the enemy has available for the defense of Egypt. We can follow through into Egypt a suitable time after taking Torbuk. At the end of March he moved house to a stone building at Amers M, near Dona. It was not spacious, Arm Bruster wrote, a fine Schwinner either's going to be if the enemy bombers find us, but it offered protection from the sun and sandstorms. The enemy had also been in residence, because a parting British soldier had chalked on the front door, please keep tidy. Back soon.
The cheeky words brought a smile to Rommel's face. A week later he reshuffled his panzer army. He was still careful not to reveal to the enemy whether he was merely improving his defenses or preparing a new attack. Rommel knew that the attack on the Ghazala line established by the enemy commanders, running down from the coast into the desert, 40 miles west of Torbuk, would not be easy. Along that line, from Ghazala on the water down to Bahachiaim, the British had already laid half a million mines, an achievement that astounded and frustrated Rommel. The enemy line cut across all the good desert tracks. The tactical alternative facing him was either a straightforward frontal attack or a long move circling around the desert end at Berhachiaim. The British would outnumber him, by about 50%, in tanks. As he considered, perhaps he remembered General Schmidt's whispered advice to him, while they stood in line waiting for Hitler in February 1940, take whichever decision is bolder, it's always best. Rommel took the boldest decision of his life. Alfred Gores, his chief of staff, was to write in 1957, his decision to send his army's entire tank strength on an outflanking move around the southern end was one of exceptional daring, particularly since his supple lines would also have to go around that flank. But if he lost this battle, he stood to lose all Africa. He had decided on his basic tactics by April 15, when he met General Ennio Navarini commander of the Italian 21st Corps. We are going to use decoy tactics to cause the enemy to switch the bulk of his forces up to Gazala, he told Navarini. We'll also be using some elements of the Italian motorized corps for this, but most of the corps will stand by to move down south, around the enemy's flank and rear. The killer blow is going to be dealt to them in the south. We have got to prevent them falling back on Torbuk, therefore fast columns of troops are going to push ahead to Torbuk. The British field army must be destroyed, and Torbuk must fall. Intensive training began. The new infantry had to learn how to attack enemy field positions with tanks in support, under smoke screens, officers had to learn how to act as artillery observers in tanks, calling down gunfire from the rear decoys and dummies had to be built. The Rommel diary finds him inspecting a tank repair company temporarily busy converting trucks into tank dummies. He visits Luftwaffe workshops and is shown a mysterious vehicle indeed, a truck with an airplane engine and a propeller mounted on it like a giant rear-facing fan. To what purpose? Rommel knew. CNC is delighted with this design and orders ten such trucks from the Luftwaffe says the diary. Everywhere there were shortages, from gasoline, ammunition and trucks down to radio sets, panoramic gun sights, sandbags and smoke generators, most of the shortages, except for the swastika flags he needed, Rommel expected to overcome by capturing the rich supply dumps that the British were building up for their own forthcoming offensive. The question was, who would start first, Rommel or the enemy? His troops' morale was high, despite the atrocious heat, the thirst and the hard work. Their skin was like brown leather caked with the hard grey dust of the desert in which the brave spring flowers had already withered. The German and Italian soldiers just light up when Rommel comes, wrote Armbruster on April 25th. And on the same day Rommel described the moonscape around them thus, Dawn has a fairy tale beauty in this region of table mountains temperatures around freezing point, but it soon gets warm. He added, I had a couple of lively meetings yesterday with, Admiral Ebard, Weckold and with General, Curio, Barbassetti, Gambara's successor as Chief of Staff to the High Command in North Africa. Apparently Gambara was sent packing because in the presence of some officers he said he only hoped to see the day when he might lead an Italian army against us Germans. The idiot. The next day Armbruster related, we went hunting a British reconnaissance unit with the CNC this morning, but the guys beat it. In the afternoon the Führer spoke, we all stopped with Rommel in the middle of the desert and listened to the speech. We got back at 7.30 pm this was the last speech Hitler ever made to the Reichstag, he announced that henceforth he was assuming absolute power. At the end of April, 
Mussolini and Hitler met at Berchtesgaden to discuss Mediterranean operations. At a secret conference on the 13th, they ruled that Rommel's attack on the British should come before Hercules A planned German-Italian invasion of Malta, the main thorn in the flesh to Rommel's seaborne supply lines. This fit in with Rommel's own concept. On May 5 he outlined it to his corps commanders at El Cheramar and showed them on a map the moves he planned to make, Operation Alpha, the encirclement and destruction of the enemy field army, and Beta, the seizure of Torbruck. They were instructed to brief their division commanders and to have all written orders burned after receipt. A dense sandstorm blew up as they left, Rommel could hardly see even the hood of his car. He longed for his native Swabia. How beautiful is home, compared with this barren land, he wrote. Not everybody shared his confidence. Alfred Gores, his chief of staff, had warned him, you will be risking your entire reputation. But Siegfried Westfl, his operations officer, argued that on balance they had no option but to attack, to wait any longer on the defensive might put the entire Panzer army in danger. Once, early that May, Rommel sent for Fritz Bayern, the skilled chief of staff of the Afrika Corps, what would you do if you were the British commander? He asked, after showing him the battle plan. Bayern did not mince his language. If I was the British C&C, he said, I wouldn't be so dumb as to peg all my mechanized forces up here at Gazala and just wait for you to encircle them. The moment I saw what you were up to, I would pull them back down here he pointed to a spot southwest of Torbruck. Then I would fight a running battle with you. I'd strike right into your lengthening flank as you headed no toward the coast. Bayern could see that Rommel was not pleased by his reply. As the hot, stormy days of May 1942 paraded in languid sequence across the Cyrenaican desert, Rommel sensed the almost palpable nervousness that gripped the army. The British are expecting us, he commented. And we are expecting them. With Malta temporarily subdued by the might of Kesselring's bombers, supplies were reaching Rommel on an unprecedented scale. At 9.40 a.m. on May 12, he briefed all his senior commanders. Again botch a stenograph to record for the diary, the enemy army facing us consists of three or four divisions, of which the South African division and elements of the British divisions are in fixed field positions. The enemy is not all that mobile. Their mobile forces consist of one or two armoured divisions, Eckel and Well to the rear, in fact, tailing back to the area south of Torbuk itself. Our job is to lead this British field army as far west as possible. With his short, brisk hand movements he pointed about the map. We're going to achieve this by creating an impression that we are not going for an outflanking move to the south so much as a frontal breakthrough in the north. This will oblige the enemy to move up his armor. This is why each phase of our attack is staggered, the first feint by our forces will lead them up to the Gazala end of their line. That will begin at about 2 p.m. on next day. Our main force will go in round here at dawn the next day and he pointed to the desert end of the enemy line. The main force will have begun moving down to its starting line after dark on X day, starting at 9 pm now, after Africa Corps's units have reached the start line I want all armored and mechanized units to get as much rest as possible. During the night we are then going to simulate a big panzer build up opposite the Gazala end of their front. He then gave the commanders their separate objectives and jump off times from the start line. The real tank force would start rolling at 4.30 am by X plus 2, the enemy's field army would have been encircled and wiped out, in his reckoning. You will not stop to draw breath then, but go straight on to take Torbruck. You are to reach your start lines for the attack on Torbruck by X plus 3 at the latest. Four days later Rommel briefed the commanders of the infantry. Now he uncovered some more of his planned tactics. Cruel would command the two infantry corps at the northern end of the front. Their faint attack would begin at 2 p.m. on X day, that is, in broad daylight, and push about 10 miles into the enemy positions. A major tank attack would then apparently begin. A German panzer battalion and a unit of captured tanks will attack from 21st Corps sector, 
but as soon as dusk falls the German battalion will withdraw and join up with our main armored push down here and he pointed around the desert flank. Seeing puzzled looks, Rommel explained the purpose of the daylight assault in the north. It is of vital importance to stimulate a heavy tank attack here. What we want is for the enemy to abandon their present armored forces deployment, and move them up in front of your two infantry corps. That is why we have scheduled your attack as early as 2 p.m. The calm before the storm. Rommel sat up late, peering short-sightedly at maps, checking distances with calipers and talking quietly with his staff. He tackled the rest of his mail. There were many, many letters to write to widows whose husbands would never return from Africa. Hausburg, his own adjutant in 1939-40, had been killed. Schrappler, his successor, had been run over by the mammoth. And he wrote a belated letter to Hans Kietel, the bespectacled school friend who had helped to build the glider in 1906. Tell him about the sandstorms here and tell him we're squaring up for the coming march. Rommel instructed his secretary, the standard reply. Back in Wiener Neustadt, Lucy's home seemed to have become something of a meeting point for most of the general's wives. They met for coffee, shared the latest news from North Africa and eagerly scanned news photos for pictures of their men. How awful for Schreppeler to have been killed in such a terrible way, she wrote to Rommel. Does his widow know how it happened? I'm thinking of inviting her down here. Because all her thoughts are still in Africa. Frau von Ravenstein, the captured general's wife, also wrote to her, very sad that her husband would not command the 21st Panzer Division in the advance. She had a greetings telegram from him via Sweden at Christmas, Lucy informed Rommel, but she's heard nothing from him since then and doesn't even know where he is. General Gruwell had passed through Wiener Neustadt on his way back to Africa from Hitler's headquarters, his features still glazed with shock, his wife of only 34 had suddenly died, and he had just buried her. To Lucy it seemed that Gruwell now had only the coming battle to live for, and she wrote down her impressions for Rommel. Rommel at this time had duties to fulfill as a father. Manfred, now 13, had entered adolescence. He had progressed from boyhood Red Indian games to his swearing in ceremony into the local Hitler Youth Troop, Farnl, and his letters were full of the excitement of his brand new uniform, the camps, scout craft sessions and exploration. He went bicycling by himself around the town and had his first traffic mishap. There has been a very stupid accident, Papa, he confessed in one letter. I ran down an old lady at Adolf Hitler Platz. She broke a leg, and Rommel's insurance had to pay. Worse was to follow, Manfred's next school report. In geography, mathematics and Latin he was barely satisfactory, in physical training and stenography quite inadequate. The teacher's evaluations of Manfred were summed up by Lucy as hair-raising. This pupil, she said, quoting one report, does not make the slightest attempt to cooperate in the physical exercises. He talks out loud and lacks discipline. Rommel noticed that although Manfred had done well at his Hitler youth sports, swimming and skiing classes, the school gym teacher was spiteful and insulting, the man had said that Manfred would never get anywhere in life except by string pulling. You expect these teachers to have a grain of common sense, Rommel wrote in reply. I only wish I could get away. At his urging Lucy tackled the teachers about their unfavorable reports and they changed their tune. That satisfied Rommel. In fact, he observed, the school ought to be pleased and proud that they can number a son of mine among its pupils. Other schools would scramble for the chance. But this whole institution has now fallen into the hands of priests and clerics. It's not in the least pro-German, let alone national socialist in outlook. But Rommel realized that three years without a father were beginning to affect Manfred, and he sought to remedy the problem with a stern paternal letter. As you can see, your teachers have had cause to complain about you. You must do your duty in all your subjects and behave properly. That is your main task in this war. I'm particularly pleased to hear that your Hitler youth duty is to your liking. 
it will be of great value to you in later life. What else could he say? Manfred too got the standard Africa commentary, our supplies have got much better, so my worries are that much less. Soon we shall be squaring up for the coming match. The Glittering Prize Romulfk's text day for May 26, 1942. Everybody was in position at the right time, but after that everything went wrong. If ever Rommel thought back to this first phase of the new battle for Torbruk, despite the human memory's happy faculty for blotting out what is unpalatable, he probably saw nightmare glimpses like a lantern slide lecture on a battle that is about to be catastrophically lost. The first flashes of General Rommel waiting for dusk on next day and then, about 8.30 p.m. announcing, Operation Venezia. That is the signal for his entire striking force of 10,000 vehicles to begin its southward move. He moves his car right to the front. Behind him, the two Italian infantry corps have been steadily battering at the Gazala line since 2 p.m., and the enemy will have noticed tanks assembling there all afternoon, clattering and roaring and raising an immense pall of dust against the setting sun. Now, however, in the evening, the dust cloud is being churned up by aircraft engines with propellers, mounted on trucks which are slowly circling in the desert. Only one Italian tank battalion is still there now, for the German panzer battalion has already slipped away at 7 pm to join Rommel's daring advance around the enemy's desert flank. The next image is of Rommel one hour later, in his car jolting southward across the moonlit desert. Flickering flames from gasoline cans mark the routes. To his left is the 20th Corps, with 228 Italian tanks, to his right are the Africa Corps and the 90th Light Division. Frequently Rommel checks his compass, the car's tachometer, the compass again and his watch. Throughout May he has hammered into his generals the importance of getting the timing right. Elodem, on the Axis Bypass Road south of Torbuk, is to be reached at 8.30 a.m. by afternoon at the latest, the ring is to be closed around the enemy, he has ordered. At 3 a.m. he reaches the first stop line for his force, near Bahachiim, a desert outpost 40 miles below Torbruk. That means they have already successfully outflanked the British line, and there has been no opposition yet. Here the entire force rests. The Africa Corps is in formation with Bismarck's 21st Panzer Division on the left and Weyst's 15th Panzer on the right. Each division is in area formation minus 332 tanks followed by sappers, artillery and signals, with the infantry, in trucks, and anti-tank units on the flanks. In the center is their hump, the thousands of trucks of the supperly echelons. Everybody takes on extra gasoline, and at 4.30 a.m. the whole monster heads north. Now they are slicing up behind the enemy's fortified Gazala line. What follows is chaos. Rommel's intelligence staff has provided a fatally incomplete account of the enemy's positions and strength. On the maps it prepared for him it has left out one enemy tank brigade and four brigade groups. The enemy has only partly fallen for his decoy tactics. There is enemy resistance, and for hours on end he makes little progress. It is 11.30 am before the 90th light reaches Elodem, three hours late. Here is the next image, it is of Rommel, staring through field glasses at an enemy tank silhouette like none he has ever seen before. His intelligence men have not warned him about this new monster either. He barely has time to take in its high structure and the big gun in a side turret, before this tank and its fellows are hurling the first shells into the 21st Panzer Division, at extreme range, and high explosive shells at that. These are the American built Grants, and their 75mm gun packs a bigger punch than any of Rommel's tanks, better even than the 19 new Panzer III specials that he has obtained in time for this battle. Rommel's interpreter scribbles in his diary, it's a massacre, our squad reels first to the left and then to the right, it's terrible. Tanks are breaking through on our right flank. A route begins, Africa Corps headquarters, divisional and regimental staffs helplessly intermingled with towed guns and trucks. Wall the nearing, commander of the Africa Corps, 
is conferring with a flak regiment commander, Alwyn Walls, as this stampede engulfs them. Colonel Walls describes it, in the midst of this avalanche I caught sight of some flak 88s. We raced over to them and suddenly found Rommel there, completely hemmed in by panicking troops. He angrily rebuked me that my flak was to blame for all this, because it was not shooting back. I managed to stop three 88s and then the other half of the heavy flak battery of the core combat group. The armada of enemy tanks was closing in and only 1,500 yards away, 20, 30, 40 big tanks. Ahead of them were the Africa Corps's fleeing supply trucks, all quite defenseless to tank attack, and in the midst of this chaos are Rommel, the headquarters of the Africa Corps, regiments, signal trucks, in short the entire muscle and nerve center of the combat divisions up front. The first 88s open fire, the enemy tanks stop, and this first crisis is barely overcome. Here is another episode from that first day, May 27, described by the 15th Panzer's commander, Gustav von Veyst. The northeastward advance of his armor is halted by enemy tanks. So Veist sends one of his two panzer battalions circling around to the right to surprise the enemy on their flank. After 30 minutes of give and take in which Veist loses 30 tanks and the enemy 20, the enemy detects the flank danger and retires hastily, leaving the route of advance temporarily free again. Veist's leading tank company commander calls to him by megaphone, which way ahead now. Before Veist himself can reply. His adjutant shouts back, that way. There's Rommel. Follow him. And there indeed is Rommel, standing upright in his car as it bounces across the smoking, wreckage littered battlefield right at the head of his panzer troops. But by the end of this first day Rommel has advanced only as far as Berlefer. He has already lost one third of his tanks. Veist's tanks are dry of fuel and low in ammunition. The Panzer Army's supply columns have become detached. In fact, instead of encircling the enemy field army by his bold sweep around the Gazala line, Rommel's own army is now virtually encircled. The cause, in Siegfried Westphal's view, is the total lack of Italian combat effort. The two Italian infantry corps still west of the Gazala line have made no serious effort to assault it frontally and this has allowed the enemy to move its armoured reserve down to meet Rommel's advance. The Italian armoured divisions under his command are equally leery. For two days we lost all contact with them, Westphal recalls, although we supplied them with German radio trucks. At the time we could not help believing that they were lying very low. Rommel, careering around the battlefield, seems to have lost control of the fighting. The next day, the Luftwaffe commander General von Waldor begins his diary with the acid observation, it is difficult to assess the situation owing to the complete absence of reports from Panzer Army's headquarters. Since Waldor does not know where the Axis front lines are, the Air Force is unable to go to Rommel's help. On the day after that, Waldor repeats his complaint in his diary, but this time he does send in Luftwaffe dive bombers to attack. Often they mistakenly scream down on German tanks and guns and bracket them with bombs. Rommel, temporarily defeated, has to recall his tanks to the west, leaving their supporting infantry to dig in as best they can on the barren battlefield. Radio communication breaks down, and wild rumors sweep about in the vacuum created by the absence of higher command. The Africa Corps has been encircled and is about to capitulate. The Tommies have captured all our supplies. The British have surrounded us and taken Dona. Rommel, Nehring, Cruel are all dead. Not until May 30 does Rommel re-establish radio contact with Waldor. Now Waldor can safely commit his entire air strength. He sends 326 aircraft to sweep the battlefield, and the tide begins to turn in Rommel's favor. And then the last lantern image. On June 2, 1942, as this first phase ends in victory for Rommel after all, planes fly to heavily bandaged battle casualties back to Waldor's airfield for immediate hospitalization, Alfred Gores and Siegfried Westphal, Rommel's two top staff officers.
Waldo regards their comments on Rommel as unprintable. General Gores and Lieutenant Colonel Westfall came back with severe injuries, says Waldo at the end of that day's diary entry. Their detailed report on command issues does not lend itself to setting down in this diary. Rommel's absence on the battlefield may have caused command problems, but there is no doubt that the example he thereby set to his men tilted the balance against the far less flexible enemy. The remarkable events of May 28 and 29, 1942, demonstrated this. On the 28th, the day Waldor had called totally obscure Rommel ought to have been a very worried man indeed. His army was widely dispersed. His headquarters had been scattered by shell fire and supplies were scant. Once again the ominous instruction had gone out forbidding all troops to wash or shave, water was running low. General grew well now well enough to resume command of the Africa Corps, was shot down when his torch flew over an unsuspected British strong point, and was taken prisoner. Rommel's Parents His father was a stern and autocratic schoolmaster who decided his son should have an army career. From the Rommel family papers. Irwin fell in love with Lucy Mollin, a dark-eyed beauty who won prizes for dancing. In 1911 when he was 20, he gave her a photo of himself in the uniform of the officer cadet school at Danzig. From the Rommel family papers. In 1906 Rommel and a school friend built this glider. It flew, but not far. From the Rommel family papers. Marital portraits taken before and after the galvanic achievement of the young Rommel's career, the winning of the Paula Merite, Prussia's highest honor. From the Rommel family papers. Rommel at the Western Front in 1914. Auspiciously, he had a fox as a pet. From the Rommel family papers. The Rommel's only child, Manfred, was born in 1928. When Hitler's war broke out, Rommel hardly had time to see his family. From the Rommel family papers. September 30, 1934, the first meeting between Hitler and Rommel. Hitler visits Kozler, and Rommel, helmeted, at right, leads the honor guard. From the Rommel family papers. In the Polish campaign, Rommel commanded Hitler's headquarters. As officers report here to the Führer at Kiel Airfield on September 12, 1939, Rommel finds himself between Hitler and the powerful Nazi party leader Martin Bormann, U.S. National Archives. Rommel's first Panzer drive ended at St. Valery, on the English Channel. A British division surrendered to him, there was bitterness on the face of its commander, Major General Victor Fortune. Rommel Family Papers Karl Hank, a lieutenant in Rommel's Panzer division but also one of the most powerful Nazis in the Goebbels propaganda ministry, reports to Hitler during the French campaign, U.S. National Archives. Rommel's troops arrive in Africa, on March 31, 1941, he and the Italian field commander, General Garibaldi, inspect the Africa Corps. German official photo, from the Rommel family papers. Rommel in Africa. His chief aide was Lieutenant Alfred Berndt. He too was a top Nazi, often dealing with Hitler in Rommel's behalf. From film captured by British troops, U.S. National Archives. Rommel's scribes. Interpreter Wilfred Armbruster kept a private diary that is revealing about Rommel's operations. Albert Botcher, Rommel's secretary took down the Rommel diary in shorthand, now transcribed by the author, Helmuth Lang kept the Rommel diary in 1944. From German newsreel footage, Anthony Botcher, Helmuth Lang. Rommel and Fritz Bailen of the Afrika Korps confer between his Mammoth command truck and a Panzer III. Trommel Family Papers. After the defeat, Christmas 1941, Rommel, General Alfred Gores, Colonel Siegfried Westfl and Major Friedrich Wilhelm von Melenthin wait outside their headquarters for Italian generals to arrive. From Baron Constantin von Neurath. Bayern with Rommel during the fighting at Kasserine. Major Wilhelm Bach, the ex-pastor who directed the heroic defense of the half Fire Pass. Rommel Family Papers General Georg von Bismarck, Panzer Division Commander, 
studies the battle plan prepared by Rommel, whose lips are blistering in the sun. Rommel Family Papers General Johannes Streich, who fell afoul of Rommel and returned to Germany. Lieutenant General Ludwig C. R. Sedilla Well, Rommel's successor as Africa Corps commander. Captured by the British, he, like von Termer, talked volubly. In November 1942 the Africa Corps Commander General Wilhelm von Thoma surrendered to the British at El Alam. Some say he deserted. From Johannes Streich, U.S. National Archives. Hitler bestows the Field Marshal's baton upon Rommel in September 1942 in his Reich Chancellery in Berlin. His entire staff looks on, Army Adjutant Gerard Engel, Chief Adjutant Rudolf Schmunt, Navy Adjutant Karl Jesko von Puttkamer, Chief of the High Command Wilhelm Kiitel, SS Adjutant Richard Schulz. Rommel, as always is accompanied by his aide Alfred Berndt, far right, U.S. National Archives. The same day, Rommel is the hero of a huge public rally in Berlin. Next to him is Field Marshal Kiitel, Rommel Family Papers. Markings on this map are Rommel's own sketches of his plan to seize Cairo and the Suez Canal. From the Rommel family papers. The rutted desert. Low ridges such as the one at the rear were of tactical importance during the battles. From captured film. A typical empty desert battle scene, with the crew of a German half-track watching an enemy vehicle burning on the horizon. The Panzer III, here in the earlier short-barreled form, was the backbone of Rommel's battle tank force. A Panzer IV, with Rommel aloft, advancing through the Camelthorn scrub. From captured film, and Hans's Miss von Erspeck's negatives. German infantrymen, in foxholes burrowed into the desert, wait for an attack. From captured film. Uneasy about what was happening to his two Panzer divisions, Rommel drove late on the 28th onto a hill from which he could see the desert battle. Black smoke clouds rolled up into the scorching sky, giving the landscape, in Rommel's eye, a curious, sinister beauty. He decided to concentrate his forces the next day and truck emergency supplies through to them somehow, using the same route that he himself had just taken. There were about 1,500 truckloads waiting south of the battlefield. After dark a huge convoy of supple trucks was organized. Here is Armbruster's account, in his diary of May 29, at 4 a.m. I drove off with the CNC and we piloted the supple column up behind their riots line, heading for the Africa Corps. Tanks were again attacking us in the flank. Rommel ordered them to be encircled. We found Westflagen and took him along with us. A riot fell back slightly, and again there was chaos. Shelling began again and Schneider was injured standing next to me. Rommel then led the whole bunch right up to the Africa Corps. It was a fantastic drive, we were surrounded for a time, but everything came off terrifically. Thus he had the Africa Corps back in business. Rommel set up his Panzer Army headquarters and took stock with Westfl, Gors and Bayeln. It was obvious that Crew Wells' relief attack toward them from the west had not materialized. Rommel decided to abandon his original battle plan, he would screen off the British tanks on the east of his force with anti-tank guns, and himself smash a wide gap through the minefields to the west to restore a main supply route to his troops. Operations next morning, May 30, began badly for Rommel. His headquarters came under heavy artillery and air bombardment and three men were killed. His attempt to smash a breach in the enemy line ran slap into a strongly fortified box a pattern of minefields and entanglements heavily defended by infantry and guns, between the two trails Trielabd and Tricapustso. The local Arabs called this shallow saucer-like depression the Gotella Aleb, Rommel's troops later called it the Cauldron. He had lost 11 tanks before he realized that his intelligence maps were wrong. A desperate battle began with the enemy brigade holding the box. It was now that Field Marshal Albert Kesselring dropped in on Rommel. They were very opposite characters. Kesselring was at 56 one of the best staff officers and administrators produced by any service. 
His courage as a Luftwaffe commander was legendary, his optimism was well known, some said it was inborn cheerfulness, others saw it as just an obligatory facade. His permanent toothy grin was his trademark, and he was as popular as Rommel with the troops. He was a soldier's general. He knew ordinary soldiers by name. He was affable and fatherly. Hitler had sent him out to Rome as commander in chief, south, with orders to see that Rommel got his supplies, and he had got the Luftwaffe moving, where Major General Stefan Frolich, the lazy Austrian born commander in North Africa, had failed. By mid May 1942, however, Rommel suspected Kesselring of adopting the airs of a supreme Wehrmacht commander in the south. He can run his head against a brick wall for all I care, was Rommel's unhelpful commentary on this. But smiling Albert, as he was known, was an officer of integrity and not an intriguer. His attitude toward Rommel was one of admiration, tinged with real concern. He had stepped temporarily into the missing General Cruel's shoes as commander of the field forces west of the Gazala line, and was astounded at Rommel's loose battlefield control. From what eyewitnesses told me about the goings on at Rommel's headquarters on the first day of the tank battle, he later wrote, they just beggared all description. He now demanded a face to face meeting with Rommel, and took off, piloting his own storch as always, for the southern end of the front. Rommel drove westward out through the minefield and met Kesselring at 10th Corps headquarters. Rommel calmly munched a sandwich to express his disrespect for Kesselring. Kesselring's first act was one of characteristic pragmatism and tact, he voluntarily placed himself under Rommel's command, although he was a field marshal himself and six years older than Rommel. In private, out of earshot of the Italians, Kesselring told Rommel to get a grip on his army. Then they discussed tactics. He found Rommel's plan quite good. Basically, it was for the Panzer Army to stay put, behind an anti-tank gun screen, let the enemy batter itself to pieces on the screen and then counter-attack. On May 31st, Rommel renewed the attack on the enemy brigade box at the cauldron. The next day Waldor's bomber squadrons joined in, and Rommel scrambled from platoon to platoon as the main assault force worked its way toward the British positions. The enemy was well dug in and fought as usual to the last round. Counterfire was intense. Westfall was badly hit by mortar fragments. But after a while Rommel shouted to a panzer grenadier battalion commander near him, I think they've had enough, Riesman. Waved to them with white flags, they'll surrender. Werner Riesman was skeptical, but his men did as Rommel had suggested, one man pulled off his shirt, others took handkerchiefs or scarves and the miracle happened. The firing died away, and the enemy wearily crawled out of their foxholes and trenches with their hands in the air. Three thousand troops marched into captivity. More important, a considerable breach, five miles wide, could now be torn in the British line of fortifications from Gazala down to Bahachiaim. Thus Rommel had his bridgehead. Later that afternoon heavy artillery fire began to drop around his headquarters. The operations bus was wrecked, and Alfred Gores was severely injured, to Rommel's very real regret, he had begun to find his chief of staff quite irreplaceable. Even months after, when Gores returned, he still suffered bad headaches and needed repeated furloughs, three of Rommel's other officers were killed. We could have spared ourselves all this if we had only moved off earlier, was Armbruster's diary comment. Rommel wondered how much Lucy and Manfred knew of this desperate battle. In Lucy's letter of May 28 she had written, I've got to admit that I listen to the way Max News communicate every day with thumping heart, and I'm always relieved whenever you're having a relatively quiet time. On the 30th, the general sent Corporal Botcher to Ina Neustadt laden with mysterious parcels and packets for her marked, not to be opened until June 6. That was her birthday. The packets contained beautiful Arab bracelets, ear pendants and other trinkets, and the latest battle photographs. Oh, Owen, she wrote to him after opening the gifts, how happy I could be from the bottom of my heart about all this, 
If only I knew that you were in safety. The letter took many days to reach the battlefield. Meanwhile, Rommel's armor reorganized and repaired its wounds, and he planned his next move. Enemy artillery was pounding the breach he had torn through the minefields, trying to halt his supplely convoys. I can hardly put pen to paper, wrote Armbruster on June 2nd. Today was appallingly hot, and we had sandstorms too. Men could go crazy in such conditions. Balen is now our chief of staff and Melanthin is operations officer. Rommel drafted a special announcement to proclaim the fall of the Ghazala line, but the next day he had to shelve it, there still seemed to be some fight left in the enemy. The world speculated. Newspapers debated whether victory was his or the Allies. On June 2nd Moscow declared that Rommel had been captured, no doubt it had confused him with Gruwell. Cruel had arrived in Cairo, and was shown the famous Shepherd's Hotel. He remarked on its luxury and said, it will make a grand headquarters for Rommel. His irony pleased Hitler, and the words went around the world. Rommel decided to deal next with the fort at Berhachiim, the strong point at the line's southernmost end, and announced that two non-pains of divisions and dive bomber attacks would do the job. He did not rate the fort as worth much attention. Alfred Bernd later contemptuously referred to its garrison of 4,000 French troops, including a Jewish brigade and many legionnaires, as Gaulists, swashbucklers and criminals of 20 different nations. But in seven days the battle would still be raging, and the fort's heroic resistance to Rommel and the German air force has gone down in the annals of military history. Many months afterward Rommel was shown the diary of a British prisoner taken at Hatchiheim, it graphically described the battle. May 30. Light enemy shelling. We've no stretchers and there are 236 injured friends lying all around, free French troops. Their moaning fills the silence of the night, it's just unbearable to hear. They've given us only 10 gallons of water and the French 50. The heat is oppressive and we're tortured by thirst. June 1st. At noon there was a terrible hail of bombs from wave after wave of dive bombers. The trenches and walls of the fort caved in, burying men alive. It's a horrific sight. June 2nd. Another hail of bombs from 20 airplanes. They come right down low and machine gunners. We can't hold on. More men are killed, many more. To round off this hellish day the rough comes and bombs us twice, so much for the help they promised us. June 3rd. This afternoon we were bombed three times by German and Italian airplanes. We couldn't get any water until evening. There are more injured everywhere. Their screams of agony ring around the ruins of the fort. We just don't know what to do with them. They beg for water, but there's no water to be had. On June 4th, the diary records endless bombing attacks, but still the fort at Berhachi I'm held out. The air is full of smoke, and in this motionless hot air it just lies in coils around us. I'm dying of thirst, but nobody's got any water to give. At 6.20 pm the RAF again flies over and drops some bombs on us. And the next day there were new air attacks. We don't have any stretchers, we've got no water, we can't even bury our dead. The choking stink of the exploding bombs mingles with the foul smell of rotting bodies, just to see them leaves our nerves in shreds. Early that day, June 5, 1942, the British launched their only serious attempt to evict Rommel from his bridgehead through the minefields. But thanks to faulty British planning and coordination, 58 of the 70 heavy tanks in the attack were lost to Rommel's guns and an unsuspected minefield. Another force of enemy armor and infantry attacked the eastern rim of Rommel's bridgehead, it fared no better. Rommel counterattacked that afternoon and overran the tactical headquarters of both the attacking enemy divisions in the confusion. The next day, he repeated the slaughter on the enemy forces that had managed to penetrate the cauldron. Armbruster wrote, we knocked out 56 tanks yesterday. First class. And on top of that we closed the second pocket during the night and took in 4,000 prisoners and several hundred guns. 
The material losses that Rommel had inflicted on the British in these two actions were the turning point of their whole offensive. Six months later, when the tide of battle again passed close by the same cauldron battlefield, a British artillery officer felt drawn to revisit the scene. The guns were still in position, surrounded by burnt out vehicles. The gunners lay where they had fallen, the faithful gun layers still crouched over their sights. During the cauldron battle, the fighting at Berhachiim had debbed. The tenacity of the defense astonished and vexed Rommel. There were 4,000 French troops, well protected by a complex system of pillboxes, bunkers and foxholes, and there were 1,000 volunteers of the Jewish Brigade as well. All were commanded by Colonel Pierre Koenig, one of the French Army's finest officers. He later became Governor of France's occupation zone in Germany, their ferocious defense was raising problems for the whole Mediterranean campaign. Marshal Kesselring watched with mounting impatience, knowing that the battle was using Luftwaffe planes he would soon need for his German-Italian assault on Malta. Rommel, however, still refused to commit his tanks against the fort, because the ground around it was heavily mined. On June 7 Kesselring flew by Stuka dive bomber to Rommel's headquarters. The heat was unbearable. There was a new, violent argument. By the time he left, Kesselring had extracted a firm timetable from Rommel, he would wipe out Berhachiim the next day, thrust through to the coast on the 9th or 10th, pry open the Ghazala line, let the infantry divisions pour through to the east and then, the long sought prize itself, from June 18th to 22 the attack on Torbuk, in which connection C in C south, Kesselring, rules that June 25th is the very last date possible for the attack to be concluded. At 6.21 am the next day the cruel attack on Berhachiim began. Stuka dive bombers screamed down on the fort, 45 of them, supported by three Junker 88s and 10 twin-engined Messerschmitt 110s escorted by 54 single-engined fighters. But Rommel's men were not ready to attack so the Luftwaffe effort was wasted. Twice, at noon and again at 5.30 pm, Rommel called for fresh dive bomber attacks and each time the infantry failed to follow through. In his diary Waldor raged, the army still completely misapprehends the air force's capabilities. Waldor himself climbed into a dive bomber and flew over to Rommel's headquarters. When he landed neither Rommel nor Bailn, the new chief of staff, was available, they were on the battlefield commanding an assault group. Armbruster recorded, Hachiim is still on our menu tomorrow, those guys are damned tough. Waldor was shocked to receive a fresh demand that evening from Rommel, for a dive bomber attack next day. Just after sunup the bleary fort defenders once again heard the Stuka scream. There is a thunder like an artillery barrage, wrote Armbruster but still we can't smoke them out of their confounded nest. Rommel's infantry were weary, too, and had no desire to die on this hot and barren desert, storming across minefields toward an enemy they could not even see. Rommel now brought up a tank battalion and artillery, and again called for one last attack by the dive bombers that evening. Waldor retorted that he had flown 1,030 sorties against the fort already. Kesselring reproached the Panzer army in a signal, I am unhappy that the heavy and successful Stuka attacks have not been followed up by Panzer, infantry assaults of similar intensity. The Luftwaffe is being prevented from carrying out other important tasks. He followed this with something of an ultimatum. The next morning, June 11th, there would be a dive bomber assault on the fort. I expect tomorrow's full-scale Luftwaffe attack to be followed by a panzer attack of sufficient strength to deal once and for all with Hachiim. From the captured British prisoner's diary, Waldor and Rommel later learned that the fort's defenders were by now almost deranged with terror from the air raids. We're alone and abandoned, wrote this soldier on June 7. Only God can help. In the eyes of my friends I can see a new gleam they look like madmen. All of us keep looking involuntarily at the sky. I'd never have believed that air raids could kill so many men. Again the RAF came and bombed them by mistake. Now, 
On June 10, the man wrote, Another hellish day. Water, water, water. That's the scream of the injured, the cry of the survivors. How are we expected to carry on? A bombing raid at 9 a.m., another at 10 and the rattle of machine gun fire all day long. The stink of corpses is just unbearable and saps all our powers of resistance. The RAF are as good as gone, and it's just as well because they've caused us enough casualties as it is. At 11.30 p.m. we get orders to hand in our heavy trucks and artillery, we're going to see if we can get away. But where to? Nobody bothers about us anymore. We're finished. The next day, June 11th, the diary ends, with these words, I'm a prisoner, and in good hands. During the night Colonel Koenig had ordered the garrison to sneak out of the fort under cover of darkness. Trucks were waiting to pick them up. Some 2,700 of the surviving defenders made it to the enemy lines. Thus, three days behind Kesselring's tight schedule, Rommel had finally taken Bahachim. For Rommel, the self-professed master of infantry assaults on defended positions, the stubborn stand at this fort had left a bitter taste. The fighting of these days produced a nasty revelation. Rommel's troops had captured secret British documents which included instructions on prisoner interrogation. Captured Axis soldiers, said the orders, were to be grilled while still upset and distracted. They are not to be given food, drink or sleep or other comforts. Rommel's staff sent this text to Berlin on June 5th. The next day, Armbrust recorded the repercussion, on the Führer's orders, British prisoners are to be given no water, meals or sleep until the, British, order is cancelled. So our radio message has caused quite a stir. The British then complied, and Rommel was not faced with an agonizing crisis of conscience. The capture of part of the Jewish brigade at Berhachiaim raised more sinister issues. On June 9, the German High Command sent a secret message to the Panzer Army. There were reports, it said, that numerous German political refugees were fighting on the side of the Free French. The Führer has ordered that they are to be terminated with extreme prejudice. They are to be liquidated mercilessly in combat. Where they are not, they are to be shot afterward, immediately and forthwith, on the orders of the nearest German officer, insofar as they are not temporarily reprieved for the extraction of intelligence. The communication of this order in writing is forbidden. Commanders are to be given oral briefing. There is no copy of this message in Rommel's files, and none of his staff alive today remembers hearing of it. Given his record of clean fighting, it is possible to assume that he destroyed it and made no mention whatever of it to his commanders. The belated capture of Bahachiim released Rommel's forces to cope with the Ghazala line. He had regained the initiative and could counterattack. He still had some 124 battle tanks besides the 60 Italian tanks and 25 Panzeris, but his infantry strength was low. The enemy had only an ill-assorted melange of tanks left. And among Rommel's tanks were, in addition to the long-gunned Panzer III specials, several of the Panzer IV specials with the vicious, long 75mm main armament. On June 12 and 13, prior to his main assault on the rear of the enemy Ghazala line, Rommel fought two big tank battles. By the end of the second day, the enemy had lost nearly 140 more tanks and Rommel was master of this sector of the battlefield. The British now in fact had only about 70 tanks left, and they could not hope to salvage any of those left lying disabled about the desert. These pawns were swept off the desert board in Rommel's favor. Early the next morning the enemy began to pull their remaining troops out of the Ghazala line, and to evacuate the rich forward supply base that they had established at huge expense at Belamed, southeast of Torbruk. The Arabs needed no Nazi radio communiques to know who was winning now. Vagrants clad in fragments of British, German and Italian uniforms robbed from the bodies lying about the desert, began to appear and led the German commanders to the last hideouts and field stores of the scattered British troops. Last winter they led the Tommies to our hidden caches, commented a German war diary contemptuously. 
they applauded in April 1941 as we drove into Derna, they cheered the British when they began advancing to the West in December, they were hysterical with praise when we returned to Derna again two months ago, and they will be out there cheering again if. And who can blame them? Our war is no concern of theirs. Rommel informed Lucy, the battle has been won and the enemy are disintegrating. The enemy still held Torbuk and there were garrisons at Elodem and Belamed, but late on June 16 Elodem fell. By the following evening the much ravaged Sidi Rizeg battleground was also once again in Rommel's hands. But there had been a desperate fight, the panzers had come under intense shuttle bombing from the nearby Gambut airfield, and Marcade hurricane fighters had appeared, armed with a new and deadly anti-tank cannon of 40mm caliber. This fearsome weapon had cost General von Bismarck two tanks, four men were killed in one tank outright. It was now June 17. Rommel's net was tightening around Torbruck. He knew the time was running out, Field Marshal Kesselring would shortly be withdrawing Luftwaffe squadrons for the assault on Malta. That morning Kesselring landed near his headquarters and brought Hitler's congratulations on the big victory won so far. At 3 p.m. the tanks of the Afrika Korps and Ariat moved off east, to complete the encirclement. Ariat fell back, and Rommel impatiently radioed to the panzer divisions to press on. At 6.30 p.m., he himself swung the 21st Panzer Division round to the north again. To set the tempo he took his own combat squad right out in front and drove at gathering speed, past bemused British gun tractors and armoured cars toward the coast. It was growing dark, and the 21st Panzer ran into an uncharted minefield, a tank blew up in an ugly ball of flame, killing three men, so Rommel unwillingly called a halt until the first light. But a reconnaissance battalion did reach the Via Balbu at midnight. At 8.05 am, June 18, he proudly radioed to the General Staff and Kesselring, Fortress, of Torbruck, encircled. Of the RAF there was no trace. It had now had to abandon its forward airfields at Gambit. Rommel was driving back down the Axis bypass, to establish a new headquarters, when he sighted several empty German trucks. They had run into a belt of mines and their crews had evidently been taken prisoner. Rommel swung nonchalantly out of his car, knelt down and began carefully lifting the mines with his own bare hands. His personal staff followed his example, and within five minutes they had cleared the mine belt away. Torbruck. At last he could launch his dramatic panzer and infantry attack on the stronghold that had claimed so many German and Italian lives. He had outlined his basic plan to his commanders weeks before, for instance, to his trusty friend General Navarini on April 15, the attack on Torbruck will be made from the southeast probably with the Afrika Korps on the right and the 20th Corps on the left. He had assured them then that the fortress was much weaker than in 1941. Gone were the tough Australian troops. Indeed, the minefields and entanglements had been robbed to strengthen the Gazala line. The tank ditch had silted up in desert sandstorms. This time Rommel was not going to repeat the errors that had wasted so much Luftwaffe effort at Berhachiaim. On June 18, he called General von Waldor to his new command post, the Haitian Strong Point, just captured from the British, and discussed Luftwaffe tactics for the opening assault. He asked for a maximum dive bombing effort against certain of Torbuk's perimeter strong points, the ones designated R 49 through R 71. At 5 20 am, Waldor thought that was too early, but agreed to carry out a trial at that time the next day the 19th. The assault would begin on June 20th. Liaison channels were arranged, army and Luftwaffe maps exchanged. Rommel's artillery would fire smoke shells when the Luftwaffe squadrons arrived, to mark out the section of the perimeter defenses to be assaulted. At noon on the 19th, Field Marshal Kesselring came and approved all this. The description of the operation fills 20 pages of the shorthand Rommel diary. It shows him craftily resuming operations toward the Egyptian frontier, even before the attack on Torbuk, that very afternoon. 
he promptly advanced on Bardia, well down the coast toward Egypt. C and C accompanies the advance with his combat squad, raising the maximum possible dust in the desert to the left and right of the highway until 18 miles before Bardia. The two German panzer divisions followed. At 4.30, however, they were ordered to turn back, while only elements of the 90th Light and other, lesser units continued. Soon it was dusk. Berndt described the scene, there was a moon, but it was one of those moonlit African nights on which all the silhouettes seemed to shimmer. It was hard to drive, you couldn't tell where the surface ahead rose or dipped. In two columns our tanks and trucks rolled on. Soon our artillery commander reported something quite astounding, our entire heavy artillery sights from 1941, to the south and east of Torbuk, were still intact, and near them had been found thousands of rounds of heavy caliber shells. We need only drive in and open fire. That would save us a lot of time and gasoline. All night long there were suppressed shouts and grunted commands, and a rumbling and shifting about and now and then a green or red signal from a pocket lamp. At 2 a.m. Rommel reached his own command post at Haitian again. He tried to sleep, but the familiar pre-tack excitement kept him awake. At about 3.30 a.m. he was told that the panzer divisions had reached their appointed starting lines. Then he slept for a while, shivering slightly like his troops, because of the intense cold before dawn. At 4.30 a.m. he was already in his car. Today's the big day, he had just written to Lucy. Let's help Lady Luck stays faithful to me. I'm dog-tired, otherwise okay. At 5.30 a.m., punctual to the minute, the masked German and Italian artillery opened fire. For nearly half an hour there was no sign of the Luftwaffe. But then General Nehring, the Afrika Corps commander, who was standing on the hill next to Rommel, got the news that the squadrons were just coming. The Stukas peeled off and screamed down on their targets. They were unopposed by flak or enemy fighter aircraft, and there were direct hits on all the bunkers. Now it was the turn of Rommel's infantry. Company and platoon leaders stood up and blew the whistle for the attack, and in a chaos of choking dust and smoke, fires and shell bursts, the engineers raced to build a steel bridge across the ditch. At five to eight a bridge was ready, and panzers began to roll into the fortress. From the Rommel diary, about 8 a.m. C and C drives forward into 15th Panzer's sector, taking his combat squad. Then he drives in an armored troop carrier accompanied by a car, Lieutenant Burns to the mine gap and watches the tanks and rifle company attacking through the minefields and the bunkers already captured in the rear defense line. The defenders are laying down considerable shell fire on the mine gaps. There are traffic jams in the gaps, and trucks that have run into mines or been shot up. Rommel could see six British Crusader tanks ablaze. By nine he was confident of victory. He drove to the tank ditch and inspected two captured bunkers. Then he performed an act of calculated bravado, he motioned to a war correspondent to come over, and into his microphone Rommel spoke an announcement for German radio. Today, he exclaimed, his voice rasping onto the recording disc as the battle still thundered around him, my troops have crowned their efforts by the capture of Torbruck. With his eyes turned, perhaps, to the sheeted corpses of the riflemen who had only made it this far, he added, the individual soldier may die, but the victory of our nation is assured. A dispatch rider took the disc to an airfield and it was flown straight to Berlin, for broadcasting that same evening. His plan was going like clockwork. Everywhere were burning and abandoned trucks and guns, and the geysers of dust thrown up by bursting shells. The air was deadly with flying fragments of razor sharp rock and shell. By 2.45 p.m. Bismarck's tanks had advanced to an escarpment from which Rommel could see clear down the incline to the port. Columns of enemy prisoners marched past him, their faces sorrowful with defeat. At 7 p.m. the German tanks rumbled into the port. An hour later the two big forts, Belastrino and Solero, surrendered. Nothing, not even Rommel could now save Torbruck. 
for months his troops had crouched outside this malicious, hostile parcel of Libyan desert, tortured by flies and plagues, tormented by sub-zero temperatures and baking sun, unable to raise their heads or seek cover between dawn and dusk, and now here he was, standing in the midst of the fortress. He thought of Lucy and Manfred, how proud they were going to be at the next day's news. By candlelight that evening he ate a supper hastily concocted from captured British stores, his eyes betraying that his mind was far away. After the meal he turned to Colonel Bailn, his chief of staff, and blurted out, you know, it's not just leadership that produces a triumph like this. You've got to have troops who will accept every imposition you put upon them, deprivation, hardship, combat and even death. I owe everything to my soldiers. Again he was too excited to sleep, yet sleep he must, it was vital if he was to maintain this tempo over the next few days. Midnight saw him slumped in a corner of his car, his head leaning wearily against the window, while his staff lay on the hard ground wrapped in blankets, waiting for the dawn. Rumbling detonations shivered the air as the trapped enemy blew up their big fuel and ammunition dumps. A pall of smoke hung over the port, lit by the fires from below. Against the reflection of the fires in the bay Rommel could see the silhouettes of the funnels and masts of ships partially sunk in the harbour waters. At sunrise he drove down into the town. Corporal Botchus telegraphed an account in the diary, after looking around Torbuk, CNC drives west along via Balbia and meets General von Bismarck. CNC draws particular attention to the coastal wadis where there are still countless prisoners at large. A British army tank brigade offers to surrender. CNC stipulates that its trucks and tanks must be turned over to us intact. The brigade hands over 30 tanks in running order. Left and right of the highway are blazing vehicles and tanks, some set on fire by shelling, others by the enemy themselves. Among the captured South Africans are numbers of drunken blacks. They all look cheerful, and wave and shout, the war's over. The capitulation of the rest of the Torbuk garrison followed. At 9.40 a.m. C&C meets General Klopper, Co of 2nd South African Division and Commandant of Torbuk, on the Via Balbia four miles west of Torbuk. Klopper offers capitulation, says he has ordered all resistance to cease. C&C orders the General's car to fall in behind his own. On the way he passes 8 to 10,000 prisoners, jamming the highway. At 9.40 a.m. C&C gives staff a signal for OKH, in Berlin, entire fortress Torbuk surrendered, over 25,000 prisoners including several generals. Five minutes later Rommel repeated this to his panzer army, and ordered the army to get ready to press straight on toward Egypt. He set up his headquarters in the Albergo Torbuk, a former hotel, and sent for the enemy generals. H. B. Kloppo was a short, wiry South African, the typical staff officer rather than a combat general. Rommel instructed him to see to the repair of the water supply immediately. Again the Rommel diary records an edict that was typical of him, while the overflowing power cage on the airfield is being set up, South African officers demand to be segregated from the blacks. This request is turned down by the C&C. He points out that the blacks are South African soldiers too, they wear the same uniform and they have fought side by side with the whites. They are to be housed in the same power gauge. Back in Germany, the news still had to break. Lucy had heard nothing from Rommel since the 10th, and knew only that the Panzer Army had again formed up around Torbruck. She recalled with a shudder how many lives the fighting there had cost during the year before. They say you've already taken Sidi Rizeg. She wrote. I wonder where you will be now, my darling, at this very moment. At midday on June 21 she heard the radio announce that there was to be a special communique from Hitler's headquarters. Her first thought was that Shivestopol, Stalin's last fortress in the Crimea, had fallen to General von Manstein's siege. But then trumpets sounded the England fanfare 
the music always played when there was news of victory over England perhaps German U-boats had sunk another 100,000 tons of British shipping? When the announcer proclaimed that Rommel had captured Torbuk, Lucy felt faint with shock. Her first instinct was to ask for congratulations to be radioed to him, but she did not, there must be far more urgent messages for the radio waves to carry. In Germany the newsreels were already being printed and dubbed, Rommel on a small mound, silhouetted against the sky, Rommel in his command car, after the port's capture, Rommel with Bernd and Bailen, driving down into the town in an armored car. Rommel knows no rest, the battle must go on, the soundtrack proclaimed. Lucy and Manfred went to a movie theater with continuous performances and watched enthralled. Her next letter to Rommel read almost like an editorial from Das Reich, full of just pride and admiration, the entire people, and we too in particular, look up to you now that you have pulled off the incredible feat of capturing Torbuk in such a short time. I wonder what you felt like, entering Torbuk with your gallant men. In all the surviving 650 handwritten letters from Lucy to Erwin Rommel, there is never any hint of intimacy nor in his replies. Whether warmer letters existed and were later destroyed by Manfred, or whether the couple hesitated to expose their inner emotions to the Nazi censors, the entire correspondence leaves the curiously cold, clinical impression on those few permitted to have read through it. At any rate, they are the typical letters of a government issue field marshal's wife. Luftwaffe reports on June 21 suggested to Rommel that the British were so dazed by the speed of Torbuk's collapse that they were no longer preparing to make a stand even on the Egyptian frontier. Field Marshal Kesselring realized that Rommel would probably be tantalized by this situation and flew into Torbuk at midday. According to Friedrich von Melenthin, of Rommel's staff, the smiling field marshal reminded the Panzer Army commander of the need to throw all their air strength into the Axis invasion of Malta, scheduled for August. Until that island was captured, Rommel's supply lines would always be exposed to air and sea attack. Rommel disagreed emphatically, now that we've got the British on the run, there is a unique opportunity for us to push right onto the Suez Canal. Bailen, standing in for the injured Gauzer's chief of staff, later stated that Kesselring came around to Rommel's point of view, adding, we'll organize supplies for you somehow. Rommel did not really care what Kesselring thought anyway, he had already sent a member of his personal staff to Berlin with a private letter to Hitler seeking permission to invade Egypt. At once. All afternoon German and Italian troops loaded up the booty of Torbruck, there was enough gasoline for hundreds of miles of advance. The Panzer Army had captured entire warehouses stacked with pure white flour, cigarettes, tobacco, foodstuffs, jam and clothing. There was beer galore, not the insipid liquid that masqueraded as beer in Britain, but brown, stubby bottles with the familiar blue Municlone Brow labels. The British had bought it in Lisbon. At 4 p.m. Bismarck wedged his Africa Corps cap firmly onto his close-cropped head, mounted his Panzer IV and signaled the 21st Panzer Division to drive east. As the trucks, now more of British origin than German, fell in behind on the Via Balbia, there was cheering and laughter. Captured radio sets were tuned to music broadcasts and foreign stations. One Axis newscaster quoted yesterday's Times of London, Torbuk's defenses are now stronger than ever before. Another reported a New York radio station's view, Rommel and the tattered remnants of his defeated army may well be skulking somewhere outside Torbuk. But to talk of any possibility of his capturing the mighty fortress is plain absurd. To his secretary, Corporal Botcher, Rommel had dictated an entreaty to his troops to destroy the British army. During the days to come, he ended. I shall be calling on you all to make one last great effort to bring us to this final goal. Toward evening he made one more brief tour of the Torbuk battlefield and enormous captured dumps. Then he returned to the hotel. After all I've been through, he wrote to Lucy, I've just got to grab a few hours sleep. Not since the capture of Langarone, 25 years before, had he felt as tired as this. 
Mussolini's directive to Rommel in May of 1942 had given him authority to advance only as far as the frontier wire. Before he attempted to invade Egypt, two major problems, in the Italian view, needed tackling first, the Italian navy lacked fuel oil, and Malta was reviving after its ordeal of air attack and blockade. Although supply shipping losses in June were not much greater than in May, the lack of oil meant that Italian warships could escort fewer supply convoys. The disastrous result was that supplies to Libya dropped from 150,000 tons to only 32,000, and these were delivered to distant Tripoli, not the much nearer Benghazi. Marshal Hugo Cavallero, chief of the Italian High Command, drew the Nazis' attention to these two problems in a letter that reached Hitler on June 21. Colonel Walter Scaff, historian for the German High Command, noted Hitler's reaction in his diary, the Führer's attitude to Operation Herkules, the planned Axis invasion of Malta, is still hostile. Standing over the map table in the elegant surroundings of the Reich Chancellery in Berlin, as a colonel deftly unrolled the charts of Nazi Germany's spreading dominions, Adolf Hitler saw no need for a pedantic strategy. He had the British on the run, from the Arctic right down to Libya. His army was inflicting annihilating blows on the Soviet forces and advancing on the Caucasus. Our letter had just come from Rommel emphasizing his Panzer Army's sparkling morale and reporting the treasure troves of Torbuk, which would enable him to pursue the British deep into Egypt, provided Mussolini agreed. Hitler sent a telegram to Mussolini. In it, Hitler described Rommel's victory as a turning point in Africa. The goddess of victory approaches commanders in battle only once, he advised. If they do not clutch her then, she often never again comes within their reach. It was now June 22. The whole Nazi Reich was intoxicated with the news from Africa. A new bridge was named after Rommel. From Gauleiters and generals alike the congratulations poured into Lucy's house at Wienerneustadt. General Stresius, commandant of nearby Vienna, purloined Hitler's own title by writing to Lucy, Rommel's name will be ranked among those of the greatest warriors of all time. Lucy's home was awash with flowers. She spent that evening with neighbors, the first and bugs, and a dozen other friends listening to the special broadcast of recordings flown direct from Torbruck. There was army specialist Lutz Koch, Rommel's personal war correspondent, broadcasting his own eyewitness description of the fall of Torbruck, and then Lucy heard the general himself, speaking from the battlefield. She would have preferred to listen alone to his sonorous voice coming from so far away, it was a once-in-a-lifetime moment for her too. Then the program ended and Herr Furstenberg stood up and switched off the radio set, and went downstairs to get champagne. Hitler too had sat with Goebbels and his personal staff around a radio set that evening. As the program ended, Goebbels commented on the quality of the material, there's hardly any other general so imbued with the vital importance of combat propaganda as General Rommel. He's a modern general in the best sense of the word. At the word General Hitler raised his hand for silence and pointed with a knowing grin to the loudspeaker. Trumpets were sounding a fanfare. There was going to be a special announcement. From the Führer's headquarters, June 22. Began the voice. In his trailer, 1,500 miles away, Rommel slept. He had been too tired to join his staff as they clustered around the radio in Lieutenant Bernd's car, tuned to the special broadcast from Berlin. At a quarter to ten, Rommel was suddenly wakened by whoops of delight. A fanfare had sounded from the loudspeaker, and the announcer had said, from the Führer's headquarters, June 22nd. The Führer has promoted the commander of Panzer Army Africa, Colonel General Rommel, to the rank of Field Marshal. Field Marshal Rommel. To have become a Field Marshal is like a dream to me, he confessed to Lucy in his next letter. All these mighty events of the past weeks trail behind me like a dream. It was the ultimate honor for a soldier. No one could rise above that rank, unless his name was Hermann Goring, of course. A special rank had been created to please his vanity, in Prussia, 
field marshals could never retire or be dismissed, they remained that rank for life, entitled to a secretary, a horse or car, a driver and other perquisites. It was the traditional tribute to a warrior who had conquered a great fortress or won a great battle. To become a field marshal was to become an immortal. Rommel was to the manor born. That afternoon, before the conferring of his immortality and without permission from Hitler or Mussolini, he had taken it upon himself to issue marching orders to the Afrika Korps. Both panzer divisions had started rolling at 7.30 p.m., to circle around the frontier defense line to the south. The panzers had seen no sign of the enemy yet, but the night sky above them was frequently pierced by the glare of parachute flares, so the enemy evidently knew what Rommel was up to. His interpreter, Lieutenant Armbruster, caught the excitement in his diary, June 22nd. We are moving on again and won't give the Tommies any peace. They believe we are going to need four or six weeks first, but our big attack begins, tomorrow. Let's hope they don't duck out. This is our unique chance. We may even make it to Cairo. Huge supply dump at Capust so. Later, in the evening we tuned into the special announcement. We're all delighted and Rommel too, like a small boy. Rommel slept like a log but was up again at 6 to brief the 90th light at Bardia for its rapid advance through the wire into Egypt. Our attack began at 2 p.m., wrote Armbruster. We drove a long way south, then turned east. The Italians, 20th Corps, and 90th light unfortunately lagged a bit. But at 7.22 p.m. we crossed the wire on the frontier of Egypt and here we spent the night. There are only very few of us. The Rommel diary also recorded that moment, 722p.m. The moment when the new field marshal began his attempt to conquer Egypt. The next day, June 24, Rommel heard a sound he had not heard for a week, enemy aircraft engines. The RAF's Desert Air Force had resumed operations, on a terrifying scale. At 6 p.m. 15 Boston bombers attacked in formation. Rommel dived for cover, and most of the bomb load fell around his combat squad. Almost at once, enemy fighter planes streaked in, their machine guns spewing fire. Armbruster, still shaking, jotted in his diary, a fighter plane has just flown over our dot s car, only 20 feet up. I thought it was curtains. There was no sign of the Luftwaffe, by invading Egypt, Rommel had caught Waldor's squadrons on the wrong foot. His panzer army's advance far outpaced the rate at which Waldor could move forward his airfield organization. Sidi Barani was occupied without trouble, but the little port was in ruins. The next morning the enemy bombers returned. There were eight separate raids on the Africa Corps. Over the following days the air raids multiplied. The Italian Armoured Corps commander, General Baldasser, and several of his officers were killed. But Rommel believed he had the British on the run and he refused to be alarmed by this loss of air supremacy. His optimism was infectious. He assured Marshals Cavallero, Kesselring and Bastico when they flew in to see him on June 26, if my panzer army succeeds in breaking through the enemy's line today. By June 30th we'll be in Cairo or Alexandria. But now there were new factors operating against Rommel. He was venturing into a terrain where no Axis soldiers had yet set foot. And General Sir Claude Orchinlech had taken personal command of the 8th Army and reversed the plans that had been laid for a last-ditch British stand at Mersometriou. Thus when the big port fell into Rommel's hands early on June 29th, the Hall of Prisoners was disappointing, only about 2,000. From a radio intercept, Rommel learned that the British were now slipping away to the east. Catch them. He radioed to the Africa Corps. This was easier said than done. The retreating British had laid all manner of obstacles to trip Rommel's advance. East of Rahim Duwiri three minefields block the highway, said the Rommel diary. Ground to left and right of the highway is mined. After several trucks have already hit mines on the road and roadside, CNC and Lieutenant Burnt personally clear the mines away. After 200 mines have been lifted, 
the road is free again and the advance is rapidly resumed. At dusk C&C halts six miles west of El Daba. In El Daba itself there are gigantic explosions, we can feel the blast wave from six miles away. The sound takes 30 or 40 seconds to reach us. Rommel did not know it, but the Panzer army had neared its limit. There were signs that day, June 30th, that his troops were almost finished. Sometimes his infantry fell asleep in broad daylight and were wakened by the enemy. The 20th Corps reported at 8.50 am that it had only 15 tanks left and was being blocked by 8 enemy tanks. Rommel loosened his collar and scribbled a rude reply on a message pad. The air that day was hot and full of flying grit, and by afternoon a full sandstorm was howling. Twice Rommel's clutch of trailers, trucks and headquarters cars was bombed and strafed. Twice he ordered them moved 1,000 yards, and still the enemy air force came back for more. He looked beyond the momentary difficulties to the glorious objective, the capture of Cairo. Just 100 more miles to Alexandria, and then, perhaps I can get away to Italy in July, he wrote longingly to Lucy. Get passports. He studied his maps. Ahead of his forces the British had withdrawn to a line extending inland from a grubby railroad stop near the coast, El Alam. Rommel knew it was the enemy's last defensive position of any consequence before the River Nile. That afternoon, Rommel called his generals to his command post, now concealed among sand dunes. He announced that he was going to attack the enemy before dawn the next day, July 1st. The conference was abruptly ended by another bombing raid. Took cover with CNC in a hole, says the Armbruster diary. Corporal Gunter, Rommel's orderly, injured. Windshield shattered. Terrific sandstorm all evening, and still another air attack on the road. Zero hour is 3 a.m. tomorrow. The pendulum of conflict in the desert had now halted. The impetus of Rommel's Panzer army was almost gone. Prelude to El Alam. Rommel is now only Lou miles from the powerful British naval base at Alexandria. To the British it seems quite possible that he will overrun Egypt, and his adversary, General Law Chin Lek, has drawn up a long list of demolitions in case this should happen, radio stations, telegraph and telephone systems, oil and gasoline installations, transport and power supplies. Defenses are being built near the pyramids. In the Egyptian capital, a state of emergency has been declared, agents inform Rommel, British troops have taken over Cairo to maintain civil order. Rommel's fame has gone before him. He knows that the Egyptians, tired of British rule, are awaiting his arrival with barely concealed excitement. He hopes that the ensuing riots against the British will seal the Eighth Army's defeat. From his special radio truck, in permanent contact with Ribbentrop's foreign ministry, a signal has gone to Berlin, Field Marshal Rommel requests soonest use of active propaganda in Egypt. In London, Prime Minister Winston Churchill is fighting for his job. The fiery Welsh Member of Parliament, Eniron Bevan, has commented once before that Churchill has won one debate after another, but lost one battle after another too. Now members of Churchill's own Conservative Party have tabled a motion of censure against him and his conduct of the war. Sir John Wardlaw Milne rises and challenges him, it is surely clear to any civilian that the series of disasters of the past few months, and indeed of the past two years, is due to fundamental defects in the central administration of the war. He is seconded by Admiral Keyes whose son has died in the futile commando attack on Rommel's headquarters at Pidolitoria. Lord Winterton supports the motion. Who is the minister who practically controlled the Narvik operation? He asks Churchill. It is the present Prime Minister, who was then First Lord of the Admiralty. We never had anything in the last war comparable with this series of disasters. Now see what this government gets away with, because the Fuhrer is always right. The next day, July 2, 1942, the parliamentary attack on Churchill mounts in fury. A member blames Britain's defeats on the army's class-ridden mentality. 
in this country there is a taunt on everyone's lips that if Rommel had been in the British Army he would still have been a sergeant. When Churchill rises, however, he shifts the blame squarely onto his generals, Klopper, Ritchie and even Ochen Lech. It is all brilliant oratory. He then describes the defeat in North Africa, sparing no melancholy detail, if there are any would-be profiteers of disaster who feel able to paint the picture in darker colors, they are certainly at liberty to do so, he observes. Churchill goes on to attribute the Eighth Army's misfortunes directly to Rommel's own ability. Thus Churchill survives the day. In Germany, his discomfiture has evoked hoots of derision. The Berliner Borsen Zitung headlines its report, Churchill says, blame Rommel. In distant East Prussia, Hitler stabs at his unappetizing vegetarian supper and reflects on Churchill's tactical error in boosting an enemy general like that, people frequently ask how it is that Rommel enjoys so great a worldwide reputation, he says. Not a little is due to Churchill's speeches in the House of Commons in which the British Prime Minister always portrays Rommel as a military genius. He chuckles. The mere name suddenly begins to acquire a value. Imagine what would happen if we kept on plugging the Soviet Marshal Timish and Go. In the end our own soldiers would come to regard him as some kind of superman. As the members of parliament filed into the voting lobbies, Rommel's troops were deadlocked with Orchin Lecks. The Panzer Army had reached Tel Alam's defenses with only 55 German and 30 Italian tanks. The troops were almost prostrate with fatigue, tortured by sun and thirst. Rommel had allowed himself the luxury of two sea baths, but the water was too warm to be refreshing. When the 90th Light Division pleaded for permission for its riflemen to do the same, Rommel refused and relentlessly pushed them on toward the new battlefield. Three hours past midnight on July 1st, the riflemen, machine gunners and other troops of the 90th Light climbed back into their trucks and moved off in broad formation against Tel Alam. Blinded by a sandstorm, Rommel's troops blundered right into the enemy defenses. For the first time the word panic figured in a German division's diary. Sections of the 90th Light crumbled away and fled to the rear. Their commanders forced them back onto the battle lines and they dug in. Later Rommel himself drove up to get the attack moving again and promptly felt the lash of the enemy artillery on his own little force of 20 trucks and armored cars. It was terrible, wrote Armbruster to that evening. A shell detonated just six feet away from the CNC's car. Under heavy fire we madly dug holes and had to keep our heads down for the next three hours. It was dusk before we could extricate ourselves. To add to their misery, by nightfall it was raining hard and non-stop air attacks had begun. The Africa Corps had only 37 tanks left and was still some distance away. The Italians had made no showing. As for the poor 90th light, it was less than one-sixth of its proper strength. Nonetheless, Rommel ordered the division to resume its attack when the moon rose. He was encouraged by news from Luftwaffe headquarters, the British fleet had weighed anchor at Alexandria and was making for the safety of the Suez Canal. Evidently, Rommel felt, Axis morale was better than the enemy's. The night was awful, Armbruster wrote. From midnight to 4 a.m. there were six or eight bombers constantly raiding us. I slept in my foxhole. An hour before dawn, the fatigued riflemen of the 90th Light dutifully began a new infantry attack, but without any artillery preparation. After only 2,000 yards their attack petered out in murderous artillery and machine gun fire. Rommel was told at 10 in the morning. That afternoon, undeterred. He ordered the Africa Corps to throw both its Panzer divisions into one more attempt to break through to the coast. But at 4.30 pm the 90th light was again stalled, after advancing only 500 more yards. Africa Corps's two Panzer divisions meanwhile clashed with British armored brigades until dark. By then, Nehring had lost 11 more tanks and was down to only 26. The next day, July 3rd. Rommel's main thrusts everywhere were blocked. At about noon, his diary finds him under air attack, 
trying to harry his exhausted tank commanders to yet greater efforts. CNC is convinced that both panzer divisions are loafing idly around and at 12.50 pm orders a forceful advance by the entire Africa Corps. But Rommel was now addressing only the deaf, or the demoralized, or the dead. Even Ariat, the pluckiest of the Italian divisions, had begun to disintegrate. Fierce New Zealanders had fixed bayonets and charged Ariat that morning, capturing nearly all of Ariat's remaining guns and 380 prisoners, the rest of the Italians had thrown down their weapons and taken to their heels. The death of one of his best officers, Captain von Hohmeyer, killed by shell fire that evening, seems to have at last brought it home to Rommel that he was fighting a losing battle. Unfortunately, things aren't going as well as I would have liked. He admitted privately to Lucy. Resistance is too great and our strength is exhausted. I'm rather tired and worn out. Rommel passed his decision to his relieved corps commanders the next morning, July 4. He was going to pull the tattered panzer divisions out of the line and replace them with infantry divisions, primarily Italian. For a while the panzers would rest, replenish and reorganize. Then Rommel would resume the offensive he assured them. Mussolini and a collection of fascist notables had already flown to Libya and were waiting impatiently to stage their grand entry into Cairo. The Duce's white horse was waiting, too. Telegrams were flying back and forth between Rome and Berlin on the appointment of an Italian governor of Egypt and his relation to Rommel and the army of occupation. Meanwhile, Enemy propagandists spread concocted rumors that the riches of a conquered Egypt would fall to the German troops alone. The rumor was one of many that caused powerful unrest among Rommel's Italian troops, and in mid-July he told Berlin that entire battalions were deserting in battle. Real cracks were now beginning to show in the Axis partnership. From Rommel's headquarters, Alfred Bernter wrote privately to Goebbels that there was much bitterness among the Germans at the undue credit being given to Italian soldiers by the Nazi press. Goebbels told his staff, we are going to have to brief Rommel on the reasons why the Führer has deemed it necessary to magnify the Italian effort. Rommel himself deplored all such politicking, but chose to disregard it until he had captured Cairo. He was well aware of his awkward situation. His ammunition and gasoline were low, his units under strength. In the month of June, 845 of his men had been killed and 3,318 wounded. His supple lines were long, while those of the enemy were short and well protected. Until now the Germans, although short of arms, had held their own because of the superiority of their weapons, but now the German qualitative superiority was being rapidly whittled away. Recent battles had shown, too, that enemy commanders were benefiting from contact with the Africa Corps in combat, improving their tactics and procedures. The line the Italian divisions held extended from the blue waters of the Mediterranean at El Alam to the impenetrable, sunken, dried salt marshes of the Qatar Depression 38 miles inland. The wilderness of the Depression was a spectacle that Rommel never tired of seeing. A dozen times in July 1942 we find him drawn to the Hiram looking down on the vast cavity, with its dunes rolling like flat waves into the shimmering distance, out of which rose silent and forbidding flat-topped mountains on which perhaps no human foot had trod. Goebbels's cameraman filmed him gazing down to the floor of the depression, 600 feet below. Was he planning some way of traversing this wilderness to reach the Nile? Once that July he said to the lieutenant on his intelligence staff who had been an Egyptologist before the war, Berent, I'll be wanting you to seize a bridge intact across the Nile. The lieutenant laughed. Herr Feldmarschall, he said, you ought to have given me that job in 1939. Alfred Berndt chimed in, if you go, I want to go too. Berndt shook his head, he knew who would get all the credit in that case. Rommel planned to throw his panzer divisions through a gap at the southern end of the line on July 11. Two days earlier, he had captured an abandoned enemy strong point nearby, at Bab el Qatara. Here in its complex warren of underground galleries, concrete bunkers and well-built slit trenches, 
Rommel conferred with the 21st Panzer Division's bullet-headed commander, Bismarck, and sketched with his familiar colored pencils the aspects of the coming Panzer attack. He set up the Panzer Army's advance headquarters right there in the bunker hospital. But the bunker, he discovered, housed a large flea colony. The CNC elects to sleep in his car after all, the Rommel diary for July 9th concludes. The night passes peacefully. In his sleep he heard thunder. At 4 a.m. he heard it again, distant thunder. Not thunder, he realized as his brain cleared, but the mighty roar of field guns in a barrage louder than anything he had heard since World War I. Forty miles to the north of where he now was. The enemy had begun a sudden and wholly unexpected attack on two ridges near the coast, Tel El Issa and Tel El Mikad, defended by Italian infantry. Rommel's main force could hardly have been far there away. Did we fall into a trap? Asks Armbruster's diary. Rommel saw the danger that the enemy would break right through and smash his army's supply lines. We at once drove north with our own combat squad and a battle group from 15th Panzer, said his diary. CNC personally briefs the two battle groups on the battlefield. In his absence Melanthin, acting operations officer, had thrown in every German unit to plug the gap, staff personnel, flak, infantry, signalers, even cooks because the Italian division Sabaritha had just melted away to a depth of 6,000 yards. Waldor's story puts it politely. There were regrettable symptoms of disintegration in the Italian units. The first real resistance was put up by C-Bomb's radio intercept company. Armbruster's diary reflects Rommel's more forceful language, the Tommies have netted two battalions of the Sabaritha shits. C-Bomb is missing. It makes you puke. The death of Captain Seabom was a terrible blow for Rommel. Seabom had commanded the brilliant radio intercept company that had so often given Rommel his tactical advantage over the British. Now Seabom was dead, his irreplaceable trained personnel captured and their collection of code books and enemy orders of battle gone. The loss was bound to hamper Rommel in the months to come and the captured materials were certain to show the enemy how lax their radio security was. Now the Panzer army would be fighting blind. To make things even worse, infinitely worse, there would be no more little fellas either. The enlightening intercepted messages from the American military attaché in Cairo. The enemy had realized that there was a leak and had recalled Colonel Fellas to Washington. A memo dated June 29th in the files of Foreign Armies West in Berlin closes this chapter, we will not be able to count on these intercepts for a long time to come, which is unfortunate as they told us all we needed to know, immediately, about virtually every enemy action. The next morning, July 10th, the Australians attacked Tel El Issa and by midday they had captured it. A small column of tanks and infantry scored a further resounding success over the Italians at Deir el Abiad, provoking this outburst from Armbruster at Army Headquarters, the Italians ought to be whipped. Six British tanks have just rounded up an entire battalion of the Trento Division and sent them to captivity in their own trucks. This nation of shits deserves to be shot. And we still have to fight for them. Now of all times, just before the finish, these guys turn yellow. It's a crying shame and we feel so sorry that the CNC has to make do with such troops. These limited enemy attacks had serious tactical consequences for Rommel. They had thrown the Panzer army off balance and drained gasoline and ammunition reserves that Rommel had planned to use for his own offensive. On July 13, he launched Bismarck's 21st Panzer Division once more against the enemy line. The plan was to cut off the fortified El Alamein box, then break in and finish it off. The attack would go in at high noon, when all desert contours shimmer in the heat and melt away, making good gun naming impossible. Dead on time, Waldor's dive bombers took out the enemy batteries southwest of the box, and the tanks began rolling until a useful sandstorm swallowed them from view. Rommel went forward to follow the course of the battle but there was little he could see. It was not until 5 p.m. that he learned that the Panzer Regiment had halted on a jebel south of Kasaba. 
Meanwhile the Luftwaffe waited in vain for further orders or requests. Finally, at 6.30, Waldor sent in a second heavy dive bomber attack and the tanks began rolling again. After that the battle just fell to pieces. At about 8 p.m. Rommel telephoned Waldor. He was in high spirits and announced that the Panzer Division had exploited the magnificent dive bomber attack to penetrate right through the enemy line, it's going to try and reach the coast road east of El Alam tonight. The ugly reality, as described by the war diary of an infantry battalion attached to the 21st Panzer, was different, we are lying right in front of the enemy barbed wire, and hacking ineffectually away at it with quite useless tools. Only a few sappers have got this far with wire cutters to clear lanes for us. It is almost dusk. The battlefield is lit only by guttering spurts of flame and there were moonlight. And then our tanks suddenly turn tail. Are they out of ammunition or gas? Captain von Rautenfeld leaps up onto the nearest tank to stop it going back. An anti-tank shell hits him in the neck and cuts him down. At midnight, Major Shutt leads our battalion back again. Rommel had returned meanwhile from the battlefield to Panzer Army headquarters. Toward 10 p.m., his diary reported, 21st Panzer radios that its attack has finally failed. CNC thereupon orders the division to withdraw to its original start line. Neither the sandstorm nor the well-aimed dive bomber attack nor the powerful support of our artillery was exploited by the division. A unique chance, and they blew it. Just how high were the hopes Rommel had set by this operation is shown by his flustered letter home next morning, my expectations of the attack were bitterly disappointed. It had no success whatever. Several of the next rounds in this increasingly confusing fight did go to Rommel. It is no coincidence that those were the days on which he elected to direct the battle from his army command post rather than to dash about the battlefield. Nevertheless, Two Italian divisions, Pavia and Brescia, collapsed and the British tactics became only too clear. The enemy, he wrote to Lucy darkly on the 17th, are rounding up one Italian formation after another. Our German units will be far too weak to stand by themselves. It makes me weep. Early that day he heard that the Australians had broken through between two more Italian divisions, the Trento and Trieste. Trieste had suffered mass desertions. Rommel was forced to throw in every last reserve he had. When the Italian High Command, Cavallero, Bastico and Air Force Commander General Reno for Ugia, visited him that afternoon, Rommel bleakly told them, any more blows like today and I do not anticipate being able to hold the situation. Arm Bruster, who interpreted their 90-minute conference, afterward jotted in his own diary, R paints the situation pretty black. To Rommel's relief, the next day, July 18th, brought no surprises. The front was quiet. He spent the next two days touring the whole line, directing the laying of minefields and construction of strong points. He did not spare the Italians from private criticism. He told the 90th Lights commander, through the failure of four Italian divisions that have been virtually wiped out. A temporary crisis has emerged that will last until major German forces arrive here, in eight or ten days' time. By July 21st he was a bit happier. He had about 42 fit German tanks in the Africa Corps, and about 50 Italian tanks. The front has now calmed down, thank goodness, and I've had a chance to take stock, he wrote privately. But it's going to be a long crisis yet because the build-up on the other side is faster than here. Kesselring's going to fly to the Führer's headquarters, a pity I can't do the same. He had started wearing his short trousers again, the heat was too much for full uniform. The dust and flies were terrible, and it was humid, too. Ochin Lek's new attack was a deliberate attempt to destroy Rommel's panzer divisions. A captured enemy soldier confirmed this. It began late that evening with violent air attacks, more spectacular than effective, and an intense artillery bombardment. During the hours of darkness a New Zealand brigade penetrated from the south toward the shallow Elm Rare Depression, a saucer-like hollow in the middle of the desert. At dawn, tanks were to arrive. 
However, General Nehring had kept an unflustered watch on these developments and gave his Panzer Regiment's instructions, three hours in advance, to counterattack at 4.15 am 4 am found the Germans, including their scanty machine gun and rifle battalions, waiting around the lip of the depression, their watches ticking towards zero hour. The New Zealanders had made themselves comfortable, even setting up tents on the valley floor. At 4.15 am exactly, signal flares arced into the air and tracer fire, high explosive shells and mortar bombs rained down on the congested mass of invaders. Then the panzers rumbled over the rim and poured into the enemy positions. Of the enemy's armor there was still no sign. This first phase of Orchinlek's attack had cost him 1,000 men and much armament. The second phase then began. The enemy threw about 100 tanks into the same sector from the east, two virgin tank regiments which had arrived from Britain only two weeks before. At 7.30 am they broke through the minefields and the leading tanks surged far behind Rommel's line. His thin infantry positions were overrun. To Rommel and Nehring it looked like the long-feared end of the army. Then a Colonel Brewer, who was commanding the 21st Panzer in place of Bismarck, who was injured, came to the rescue. He halted the fleeing artillery battalions and turned them to face the enemy. Then his 5th Panzer Regiment punched into the enemy flank, and the danger was past. In two hours Rommel's commanders, by sheer professionalism and gallantry, had robbed the British of 200 men and 87 tanks. There was heroism on every level. 19-year-old Gunter Harm was a gun layer manning one of two Russian-built 76.2mm anti-tank guns that had been positioned so that they would be the last defense before the enemy armor could break through. The gun crew was unable to dig the gun into the rocky ground, so two gunners had to sit on the gun's trails to absorb its recoil. Toward them roared a column of British tanks. In two minutes Harm brewed up four Valentines. The others halted, searched for the barely concealed guns, and opened fire on them. A shell screamed between Harm's legs. A second shell tore off his loader's legs, another gunner took that man's place. Five more British tanks were shot into flames before Harm's gun was disabled by shell fire. By that time the 21st Panzer had arrived and finished off the enemy tanks. One of the captured tank commanders angrily burst out, two years of training, a sea journey halfway round the world, and in just half an hour it's all over for us. One week later Rommel personally decorated Harm with the Knight's Cross. He was the first enlisted man in the German army to win the award. The next afternoon, July 23rd, Wilfred Armbruster penciled in his diary, The tide has turned with a vengeance. The British 23rd Armoured Brigade has been rubbed out. The Tommies lost 146 tanks and 1,200 men. What an excitement that was, but RC in C directed the whole show from the rear this time, he had every commander on a string and everything just clicked into place. A fine mess he got the British into. Rommel toured the battlefield, thanked his troops and handed out medals. Morale everywhere is sky high. His diary observed. He had a look at the new British tanks. Some had got within 2,000 yards of the 21st Panzer's command post, they were still there now, their crews captured or buried beside them. The difficulties we went through the last few days just beggar all description, he confessed in a relieved letter to Lucy. Of course, we are still nowhere near over the hump. The enemy is vastly superior in numbers. But the 146 tanks that we shot down in and behind our battle lines two days ago will take a lot of replacing, we have now blown them all up. The enemy won't be able to afford many such extravagances. Now he had time to open his mail. Hitler's chief adjutant, Rudolf Schmundt, had sent the cross-sword badges that Trommel would need as a field marshal. But he read the letters postmarked Wiener Neustadt first. There were new photos of Lucy and Manfred, the boy had been away from home for some weeks at a Hitler youth camp. With fatherly anxiety Rommel read his son's latest school report, a big improvement on the last one. 
Lucy wrote that Frau von Bismarck had telephoned from Pomerania, anxious for news of her husband. She had not heard from him for three weeks. Rommel knew how long it took letters to go from Africa, but passed the word to General von Bismarck. As events turned out, Bismarck had only three more weeks to live. Lucy also told him of the latest newsreel, it showed Mussolini in Africa, and Kesselring, Cavallero and Bastico touring the El Alam line with Rommel. Rommel looked far from pleased, in fact very grim-faced indeed. Lucy, better informed of Rommel's problems with supplies and the Italians than the other moviegoers, knew why. One letter from her told of Winston Churchill's recent chase and visit to Stalin in Moscow. How is the mighty England fallen? She added, Today the news said that your adversary Orchinlech has been sacked and replaced by a General Montgomery. The name meant nothing yet to Rommel. He guessed early in August of 1942 that he still had another four weeks before the British would attempt another move. Meanwhile, Hitler's big push through Russia toward the Caucasus would be bound to affect British dispositions in the Middle East. He knew that the Panzer Army could withstand minor enemy attacks, but he had had to issue the sternest orders to prevent repetitions of the kind of panic that had gripped sections of the line in July. I demand that every man, at staff level 2, hold to his position and not fall back. Abandoning your position means annihilation. By holding our positions in the night battles, we won through with little casualties. Any enemy that breaks through must be mopped up by reserves standing by. Anybody abandoning his position is to be charged with cowardice and stood before a court martial. Rommel. One thing was plain victory or defeat at El Alam would rest in the hands of the German troops here. Rommel never forgot that. To other generals, writing to congratulate him on his promotion, he replied. The credit for this lofty recognition from the Fuhrer is due solely to the courage of my trusty German soldiers. The gaps were being filled. During July he had received 5,400 replacement troops and the first two regiments of a new division, the 164th Light. That made 13,300 new troops airlifted to North Africa, and more were coming, at the rate of 1,000 every day. By early August one of the Luftwaffe's elite units, the 1st Paratroop Brigade, was under Rommel's command. Its commander, General Hermann Ramak, was a lithe, pugnacious veteran of the fighting on Crete. He had a mouthful of metal teeth replacing those he had lost in a parachute accident. His paratroops were well armed and fit, but since they were a Luftwaffe unit and not army, Rommel had little time or sympathy for them. Like the 164th Light, Ramuk's troops had arrived with no transport of their own. The 164th Light had actually arrived with bicycles, which were soon discarded. However, they were German and disciplined, so they were all fed into Rommel's thickening line of defense between the sea and the Great Depression. Artillery was arriving, ammunition dumps were building up. Dense minefields and mine boxes were being laid out in carefully conceived patterns. New Italian units were also arriving. Rommel omitted them from his calculations. The stuff that's coming over is virtually useless, he said. On July 29, when he met the new commander of the Bologna Infantry Division, General Alessandra Gloria, the Italian thumped his chest and proclaimed that Italian troops would never desert their posts. At that the CNC dryly enlightened him as to the way things have been around here, observes the Armbruster diary. It was later that day that Rommel issued his warning about cowardice. The Italians had contributed one first-rate unit, the Folghor Paratroop Division. Their training, by Germans, showed when their commanding officer snapped to attention and swung to a gaping Rommel a salute that would have done a Prussian drill instructor proud. For the rest, Rommel scorned the Italian newcomers. What I need here, he explained to Alfred Gors in a letter, are not still more Italian divisions, let alone the Pistoa, with no combat experience at all. But the German soldiers and the German equipment with which alone I am ultimately going to have to carry through my offensive. There were certain imperatives that gramped his freedom of decision now. 
against the advice of his own staff. According to Melanthin, he had firmly decided to stake his entire Panzer army on one throw, he was going to break through the enemy line at its southern end, engage the 8th army there, and simultaneously mount a lightning attack on the vital bridges across the Nile at Cairo and Alexandria. There is a map in Rommel's papers on which he planned the advance of every corps, division and battalion, half of them surging on from Cairo to the Suez Canal the other half turning south from Cairo along the Nile toward the heart of Africa. Mysterious visitors arrived at his trailer, Egyptian officers, who assured him that the moment that Rommel's forces hit Cairo and Alexandria they would stage a military uprising against the British. But by September, he knew. The Eighth Army would be too strong for even Rommel to defeat. So it had to be august. And since his daring plan for a night attack would require a full moon, that meant the end of the month. Then, he wrote to his old adjutant, Ernst Streicher, I hope we shall succeed in bursting open this last gateway barring our path to Egypt's fertile fields. Throughout August, Rommel's army dug in. The desert echoed to the staccato blast of pneumatic drills, of demolition charges, of pickaxe and shovel. Tens of thousands of mines were laid in case the enemy attacked first. On August 8, the Rommel diary hinted again at his imaginativeness, Reconnaissance Battalion 33 is given the job by C in C of finding out whether it is possible to descend to the Qadara depression with an entire division or even larger formations. Kesselring flew in the next day and approved Rommel's general plans. Armbruster's diary struggled to keep track of the tireless field marshal. It's stinking hot, but the CNC drives out every day. On the 10th he recorded, three camels hit mines here, and we caught five Arabs. They had been trying to cross the minefield by night, you can be dead certain that they were in the pay of the British and trying to spy on us. Not only did the stupefying furnace temperatures and the unhealthy proximity to the Nile Delta take their toll of the Panzer Army's troops, Rommel fell ill too, at this, of all times. On August 2nd he began to feel a general malaise, and by mid-month he was really ill. He was in fact the only officer over 40 to have lasted in Africa as long as he had. On August 19th his staff noticed that the field marshal could not get rid of a head cold and was laboring from a sore throat too. They thought it was flu, and he took to his bed while his staff rushed his personal doctor, Professor Horster, to him. Horster reported, Field Marshal Rommel is suffering from low blood pressure and he has a tendency to dizzy spells. The condition can be attributed to his persistent stomach and enteric disorders, and it has been aggravated by excessive physical and mental efforts over the last weeks and particularly by the unfavorable climate. A complete recovery is by no means certain at present, particularly if the demands on him increase. Recovery can only be expected from a long stay in Germany under proper medical supervision. Temporary treatment here on African soil would appear acceptable. Rommel radioed this diagnosis to Berlin on August 21 and recommended Heinz Guderian, a panzer general, as a substitute. He sent a telegram to Guderian too. He believed he would have ample time for this sick leave. Meanwhile Bernd procured a good cook for him and arranged for fresh vegetables and fruit to be flown to him daily, without his being told. Otherwise, being the man he is, he would refuse to accept the extra rations, Bernd explained in a private letter to Lucy. And he anxiously telegraphed to Goebbels in code, I suggest sending Professor Brandt, Hitler's personal doctor, out here at once to check Field Marshal's condition. On August 24, Rommel was well enough to drive briefly to Mercer Matthew for an electrocardiogram. When he got back to his trailer, there was a radio signal from Kiitel, chief of the high command, Guderian had been turned down, as not healthy enough for the tropics. The real reason was that Guderian was in disgrace, having disobeyed Hitler during the winter. So Rommel stayed at his post. He radioed in code to Key Eitel on the 26th that in his doctor's opinion he could retain command of the Panzer Army during the coming offensive while undergoing ambulatory medical treatment. 
after that he would return to Germany for a cure, and a substitute would stand in for him. Rommel conducted his last inspections of his entire battle line. As he now prepared his supreme offensive against the assembling forces of the British Empire, however, he was a sick man, sick, but sustained by the hope that with victory in his grasp he could return to Germany, perhaps in mid-September, and spend six weeks alone with Lucy and Manfred, somewhere in the mountains of Austria, where he could sleep in clean sheets wash in running water and wake without the menacing rumble of the adversary's guns. The Ridge The British Lieutenant General who flies into Cairo on August 12, 1942, to replace Orchinlech has had no combat command since the debacle of Dunkirk, two years before. Small and wiry, Bernard Montgomery has bird-like features and a high, nasal voice that is grating and unfriendly. His knees are white his face is pink. In many ways, however, he is like Rommel himself. Both are lonely men, with more enemies than friends among their fellow generals, both are high-handed and arrogant, professional soldiers devoid of intellectual qualities. Both are awkward and insubordinate officers in harness but become magnificent and original battle commanders in their own right, neither smokes or touches strong drink. Both share a passion for winter sports and physical fitness. Montgomery also has Rommel's flair for public relations. He woos Churchill with a comfortable accommodation near Egypt's bailing beaches, and plies him with brandy and good food, for just the same reasons that Rommel cultivates the admiration of Hitler and the friendship of Goebbels. Both have selected predominantly young and handsome officers for their military households. They are both publicity conscious. Rather as Rommel wears his famous cap and perspex goggles, Montgomery flourishes an incongruous Australian bush hat covered with regimental badges. And whereas a boy Rommel showed fleeting cruelty toward birds and animals, feeding peppered morsels to swans and guffawing at their agony, Montgomery's career at Sandhurst Military Academy was marred by his reputation as a particularly nasty type of bully. He was the ringleader, of course. But here the similarities end. Rommel is now a chivalrous soldier, and honors his enemy whatever the nationality. Montgomery's order to his troops, kill the Germans wherever you find them, gives a new accent to the desert war, a ferocity Rommel has scrupulously avoided. Montgomery is an eccentric, while his Nazi adversary is an orthodox military commander distinguished mainly by his flair for improvisation, his tactical insight. Rommel shows battlefield courage, but Montgomery will not be found leading supply trucks up to the front line, personally directing anti-tank guns onto targets when a breakthrough threatens or scrambling for cover with the leading rifleman during an infantry assault. Rommel relies on his own wits. Montgomery uses the brains of others, and relies on military might to compensate for any planning defects. One thing must be emphasized, Montgomery's intelligence sources are far superior in August 1942 to Rommel's. It is Montgomery's confident insight into Rommel's mental processes that enables him to last out the main crises, where a less informed commander would have called off the operation. Many of Rommel's top secret radio communications with his high command are reaching Montgomery as ultra intercepts only hours later. Thus Cairo learned on November 18, 1941, that Rommel had been so completely deceived about when Operation Crusader would begin that he was still in Rome with Frau Rommel. Thus when Rommel radios the high command in August 1942 about his illness, Montgomery gets a copy of Professor Horster's diagnosis too. Each time Rommel reports his plan of attack, the ultra-intercepts enable Montgomery to plan an appropriate defense. With great cunning, British intelligence also knows how to conceal its source, planted documents reveal to the Germans that Italian traitors have fed all this information to the enemy, a fabrication that Rommel and history ever after believe. The Panzer army was unquestionably weaker than its adversary, but this was nothing new to Rommel. He was 16,000 men below strength, and sickness was reaching epidemic proportions, 9,418 of his troops reported sick that month, his establishment was short 210 tanks, 
175 troop carriers and armored cars and 1,500 other vehicles. On August 30th, the day of his attack, Rommel would field 203 German battle tanks, including 100 of the long-barreled, deadly specials, but Montgomery would have assembled 767 tanks and he now had hundreds of the new six-pounder anti-tank gun. Rommel's plan differed only in minor details from all his previous attacks, it was to be the familiar right hook, outflanking the enemy's defenses. Perhaps he was wearying or just exhausted by illness, but none of the diaries refers to any new ploys or devices designed to throw the British off balance or off the scent, no truck-mounted airplane engines or carefully planned feint operations. Unquestionably, his main weakness was going to be his fuel supply. His two veteran panzer divisions had barely enough for 100 miles, provided the going was good. On August 18, Marshal Cavallero had assured him that the 6,000 tons of gasoline that Rommel was demanding would arrive in time for the 30th, X day for the attack. But on August 23 the logistics position was taut as Rommel put it in a code message radioed to the German naval commander in Italy, Vice Admiral Weichold. Rommel had been promised six ships altogether, loaded with gasoline and ammunition. He appealed to Weichold to see that they arrived by the end of the month, for without them, execution of the planned operation is impossible. Since all these signals were encoded by Enigma, it is no surprise that four of the six ships were sunk immediately, or that Montgomery was able to deduce the date of Rommel's attack. By August 27, not one of the ships had reached Rommel. When Kesselring's Storch landed at Panzer Army headquarters on the coast, Rommel impatiently told him, X day depends on whether the gasoline ship scheduled for tomorrow gets in. My final deadline is the 30th, the moon's already on the wane. Kesselring slapped him on the back and confidently promised to airlift about 700 tons of gasoline to Rommel if all else failed. By the next morning, Rommel had still not finally decided. He summoned all the generals commanding the armored divisions to his headquarters tent at 8.30 a.m., again went over his plan and warned them, my deadline for X day is still the 30th, but everything still depends on the fuel situation. How far we go on after the end of the Battle of Alam will depend on our logistic position, on our fuel and ammunition. On the day after that, Rommel decided he could wait no longer and would initiate the attack next day, the 30th, the last date possible, but it could only be of a limited nature now. Given the fuel shortage, they could at best hope to disrupt the British forces in the El Alam line. There would just not be enough fuel to go on to Cairo unless they managed to capture British dumps intact. The Panzer divisions had already begun moving inland down the desert tracks by night, heading for the southern end of the El Alam line, where Rommel was going to break through. In two night marches this stealthy shift of balance from left to right was accomplished, and Rommel hoped his adversary had not detected it. As he left his sleeping truck early on August 30th, he confided to his doctor with a worried frown, this decision to attack today is the hardest I have ever had to take. Either we manage to reach the Suez Canal, and the army in the USSR succeeds in reaching Grozny, in the Caucasus, or, and he made a gesture of defeat. They drove about 20 miles into the desert, and set up advanced army headquarters. Rommel's doctor, Horster, was with them. Waiting for the first news, Rommel began a long letter to Lucy, today has dawned at last. How long I've waited for it, worrying whether I was going to get together everything I needed to strike out again. Many things have still not been settled properly at all, and here and there we shall have big shortages. Despite that, I am risking this move because it will be a long time before we get the moonlight, balance of strength, etc., so favorable again. If our blow succeeds, it may help win the war. If it does not, I still hope to have given the enemy a sound thrashing. It was of course a gamble, a desperate gamble. But the Italians had again assured him in a code message that a shipload of gasoline was arriving next day. In the Gazala fighting in May the odds against Rommel had been the same, 
but he had won through then, so why not now as well? Today, he proclaimed to his troops, our army sets out once more to attack and destroy the enemy, this time for keeps. I expect every soldier in my army to do his utmost in these decisive days. Long live fascist Italy. Long live the greater German Reich. Long live our great leaders. 10 p.m., August 30, 1942. A pale moon lights the undulating desert north of the Katara Depression as Rommel's armor begins moving eastward toward the enemy minefields. To the left of General Nehring's Africa Corps is the Italian armor, the Littorio and Ariat divisions, and to the left of them the 90th Light. Soldiers waving pocket lamps and shouting instructions guide them toward the gaps in their own minefields, and then they are on their own. Just before they pass through their own minefields, they hear a long forgotten sound that brings a lump to the throats of many of the older men. General von Bismarck has sent the band of the 5th Panzer Regiment to play Rommel's army into battle with old Prussian marches, just as in bygone times. How often a band send off has been the prelude to disaster, a naval band had played as Hitler's proudest battleship, the ill fated Bismarck slipped secretly out of its harbor in 1941. It is an eerie sound, and the tank crews and infantry hear only blind snatches above the whine of engines in high gear and the crunch of tank tracks on gravel, but the sound is unforgettable. Early on August 31st, Rommel's mobile headquarters had driven to the Jebel Kalak, in the wake of his army. He believed that the enemy sector here was only weakly mined and defended but his intelligence had served him badly. Almost at once his troops had run into minefields of great density. His sappers later found 181,000 mines in this sector. The minefields were defended by stubborn infantry equipped with heavy machine guns, artillery and mortars. Worse still, at 2.40 am the whole area was illuminated by parachute flares and a non-stop air attack began. The lead elements of the Panzer Army became firmly wedged in the minefields, exposed to the planes, while sappers worked feverishly to clear lanes ahead of them. Trucks, personnel carriers and tanks were hit and began to blaze fiercely. The fires and parachute flares lit the battlefield as bright as day. There were explosions, screams and the rattle of heavy machine guns. Evidently, Montgomery had been expecting the attack, and right here, General von Bismarck was hit by a mortar bomb. Minutes later a British fighter bomber attacked Nehring's command truck, bomb fragments killed several of his staff, wrecked his radio and riddled Nehring himself. Bailen transferred to another vehicle and took temporary command of the Africa Corps. Rommel learned of all this only hours later, at 8 am, when he drove onto the battlefield. The first report was of the unexpected minefields which had thrown his whole timetable out of joint. Then Corporal Botcher registered in the diary, 8.05 a.m., second and third reports come in, Corps Commander Nehring has been badly injured. General von Bismarck killed. C&C considers breaking off the battle. Rommel was obviously deeply shocked at this unexpected reverse, but when he met Bayon ten minutes later, the colonel announced triumphantly that both panzer divisions had now broken through to the far edge of the minefields, ahead of them lay open desert. Rommel still hesitated. At 8.35 am he radioed to the divisions, wait for new orders. Bale argued that to abandon the attack now would make a mockery of the sacrifices made by the men who had breached the enemy minefields. Rommel accepted this argument but introduced a fateful change of plan. Instead of advancing 20 miles due east, with the forbidding ridge of Alam el Hafa on his left, and then wheeling around it to take the enemy's main positions in the rear, the whole force would now turn much sooner and attempt to cross the ridge itself. At 9.16 am the Panzer divisions recorded the new objective, Alam el Hafa. When Kesselring flew forward to Bayon's command vehicle half an hour later, he was shocked at Trommel's sudden mood of despair. Botcher recorded, CNC South, Kesselring, is all for a vigorous continuation of the offensive. 
The change of axis that Rommel had introduced was precisely the move that Montgomery had expected. Unknown to Rommel, the ridge at Alam el Hafa had been turned into a death trap for the Panzer Army. On that ridge Montgomery intended to destroy the Desert Fox's aura of invincibility once and for all. Between 1 and 2 p.m., Rommel's tanks began rolling east again. A sandstorm had blown up, giving them a blessed protection from air attack. They made good progress until about 4.30 that afternoon, then wheeled to the north. This new axis took them into soft sand, and everything churned to a standstill at 6 p.m., as they faced point 132, the most dominant feature on the ridge. Thus they had reached the killing ground. The weather cleared, and the British tanks and artillery massed on the ridge opened fire. After dusk, the bombers came. It was sheer slaughter, but with only 30 miles fuel supplies left, as the new Afrika Corps commander General von Weist bluntly told Rommel, they were stuck. They could not attempt to bypass the ridge to the east, where the going was far better, unless more fuel was brought up during the night. All night long the slaughter went on. Rommel drove out at dawn, September 1st, to watch, the cramped terrain was littered with the wreckage of his tanks, many were still burning. The idea of continuing with the main offensive has been abandoned because of the grave fuel shortage, Botch entered in the diary. Two days before, the Italians had again promised 5,000 tons of gasoline. But now the tanker San Andre was sunk with 2,411 tons, right outside Torbuk, and the next day the Pisai Fascio would follow, with the loss of 1,100 tons. Small wonder that Rommel advised Berlin in a message to play down his new offensive, to avoid any later setback in public opinion. That morning Rommel suffered six bombing attacks. The air was unbreathable, hot, acrid with smoke and choked with fine sand. Lethal showers of shattered rock fragments added to the blast and shrapnel effects. An 8-inch bomb fragment punched a hole clean through one of the shovels lying on the rim of his slit trench, wrote Botcher in the diary. The red-hot metal fragment landed on the sea and sea in the trench. During the night the enemy air attack intensified. Arm Bruster tells us, we have never experienced bombing before that was anything like last night. Although we were well dispersed on Hill 92, the bombs came very close. Our combat echelon has had many men killed, three Flak 88s were hit and several ammunition trucks. Again bomb fragments fell right at Trommel's feet. Thirty feet away a Volkswagen burst into flames. By 8.25 am he had had enough. He ordered the Panzer Army to retreat to its jump-off positions of August 30th withdrawing stage by stage. Rommel's troops were speechless and astonished. This morning, relates the history of the 104th Infantry Regiment, which was clinging to a shallow depression southwest of the ridge, our drivers bring water forward to us. They tell us that Alam El Hafa has been taken, and that in two hours we'll be marching on. Already we are thinking of the Nile, the Pyramids and the Sphinx, of belly dancers and cheering Egyptians. About 1 p.m. our trucks arrive, and we load up. Then we drive off, to the west. To the west. That was an end to our dreams of Cairo, the pyramids and the Suez Canal. The Battle of Alam el Hafa was over. At a dinner party in Alexandria, Montgomery announced to his distinguished foreign guests, Egypt has been saved. It is now mathematically certain that I will eventually destroy Rommel. When Kesselring arrived at Rommel's command vehicle at 5.30 p.m. that day, September 2nd, he was grim-faced and left the army commander in no doubt of the damage this setback would do to the Führer's grand strategy. Rommel heatedly explained why he had abandoned the attack, gave a vivid description of the enemy's terrifying air onslaught and demanded a fundamental improvement of the supple situation. Kesselring privately believed that Rommel was just using the supple shortage as an excuse to cover his own demoralization. As the armored divisions fought their way back to their starting line over the next few days, he found it hard to understand why the same gasoline could not have been used to prolong their attack 
particularly since they would almost certainly have captured some of the enemy fuel dumps in the process. It was this cast iron determination to follow through that was lacking, Kesselring said after the war. For years afterward, post-mortems were held into the reasons for Rommel's failure. The main reason was ultra, that is clear. But scarcely less important was Rommel's illness, he was too weary to see the battle through, even though the cards were stacked against him. I was convinced at the time, wrote Kesselring, that this battle would have been no problem for the old Rommel, he would never have called it off when it had already succeeded in outflanking the enemy. Today I know that his troops never understood his order to retreat. Just think, he had already outflanked the British last hope line of defence. From Waldor he heard rumours that the enemy's unexpected strength here actually caused Rommel to halt the attack at 8 a.m., only to renew it again a few hours later, thus forfeiting the element of surprise. The Rommel diary confirms that this was largely true. In December of 1942 Hitler showed by his remarks that he was worried by Rommel's change of heart. There's no doubt, he told General Jodl, no doubt at all that he was quite wrong to have called off that offensive, probably under the influence of the sinking of the 4,000-ton tanker. That's Kesselring's view too, and Ramuk shares it. He says, it was a mystery to us why he didn't go on with it. We had the British on the run again, we only had to pursue them and knock the daylights out of them. I really do feel, continued Hitler, that it's folly to leave man too long in a position of grave responsibility. It's bound to get him down as time passes. The victory that Montgomery had scored over Rommel was more psychological than material in nature. Rommel had marginally improved his own defensive line, by retaining the captured British minefields and commanding high ground at Keretel Haimimat, which gave him a splendid view over Montgomery's southern flank. His casualties were not excessive, 536 men killed, of whom 369 were German, and 38 tanks, while the enemy, although well dug in and on the defensive, had lost 68 aircraft, 67 tanks and many more casualties. But the British could afford the losses, while Rommel could not. In particular, the six-day battle cost him 400 trucks transport that he would sorely miss in November, as events would show. And British morale was now high. On September 4 he arrived back at his old headquarters, peeled off his boots for the first time in a week and took a bath. He was weary, perhaps weary of war itself. He was impatient for his substitute to arrive, so he could get home and see his wife and son. He had not been with them for six months, young Manfred would soon be as tall as he. At his headquarters there were two letters waiting from Lucy, and a laboriously typed effort from thirteen-year-old Manfred. Dear Daddy, it read. Today I learned to type a bit. It isn't easy at all. Don't get mad at me for not writing to you by hand, because it's far harder with a typewriter. It's wonderful that you're coming home on leave. I'm looking forward to it immensely. I was looking at the Frankfurt Illustrated just recently and it stresses the way you set your men a good example. It says in the article that when the soldiers of your division in France were asked about the situation, they answered, no neighbor division on the right, nobody covering our left flank, nobody behind us, and Rommel out in front. I sold off eight of my rabbits. I got eight Reichsmarks for them. I'm going to invest the money in fodder for more. It was September 19 before Rommel's stand-in arrived. General Georg Stumm was a large, good-humoured panzer warfare expert who positively relished the new climate here, at first. Kesselring found him more even-tempered than Rommel and watched approvingly as Stumm set about repairing the bruised relations between Germans and Italians and between commanders and troops. Rommel briefed him extensively and showed him the letters he had written appealing for reinforcements and supplies before Montgomery launched his main offensive, probably with the full moon in October. Before he left for Germany at last on September 23, Rommel also handed to Stumm the most inflexible instructions for the work still to be done on the Al Alam defences. Since the line could not be outflanked, 
Montgomery would have to penetrate it frontally. To minimize the effect of enemy artillery and air bombardment, Rommel designed a defensive system of great depth. The main obstacle to the British troops would be a continuous line of mined boxes, each unoccupied but sown with thousands of mines and booby traps. The front face of this line would be guarded by battle outposts, one company from each infantry battalion. About 2,000 yards behind the boxes were the main infantry defenses. The larger and anti-tank guns were held well back, and behind them came the armoured and mechanised divisions as a mobile reserve. The mine belts became known as Rommel's Devil's Garden. Most of the mines were big enough to break a tank track or wreck a truck, but 3% of them were of the deadly anti-personnel variety, triggered by trip wires or by being stepped on. Then they sprang into the air like a jack-in-the-box and burst, scattering steel pellets in all directions. Before Montgomery attacked, the Panzer Army laid 249,849 anti-tank and 14,509 anti-personnel mines. Together with the captured British minefields in the south, there were over 445,000 mines in Rommel's defence line. Rommel's general tactical plan was to let the enemy attack bog down in his minefields, and then counterattack from the northern and southern ends of the line, trapping Montgomery's elite troops. If the battle begins, he assured Stumm, I shall abandon my cure and return to Africa. Among Corporal Botcher's private papers I found a snapshot taken of Rommel leaving his tent on September 23, 1942, on his way back to Germany. He does not look ill, just very tired. That day, the British intercepted German signals revealing Rommel's departure. He saw Mussolini the next day, the fascist dictator confidentially decided that Rommel's illness was psychological. An ultra-intercept of this estimate was eventually shown to President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who commented, Rommel must have taken quite a knock. Up to now he has been accustomed to a diet of victories based on intelligence from inside the British camp which, thank God, we have now terminated. Colonel Fellers had been repatriated from Cairo in July. In Berlin, capital of Hitler's expanding Reich, the Marshal was guest of the Goebbels household for several days. There is a full description in the unpublished diary of the propaganda minister. With the beautiful Magda Goebbels bustling around him, Rommel worked up the maps and calculations he would need to sway the Führer. Far into every night the family listened to his spellbinding descriptions of the fighting in Egypt. Gradually they thawed Rommel out of his reserve, until he was telling scornful stories about the Italian nobility and officers, relating one appalling detail after another about their cowardice, about how they would desert to the first Australian or New Zealand troops they met. He told how he had so often escaped death or captivity himself, evoking squeals of admiring horror from Goebbels and his family. In return Goebbels showed him the newsreel films from North Africa. Before the family's eyes, new life and vitality flowed into Rommel as he relived Tobruk and the pursuit of the Eighth Army to El Alam. The Goebbels diary also reveals that he said a word to Hitler on September 29th. He had known for some months that Hitler was considering making Rommel commander-in-chief of the entire German army after the war. Goebbels agreed, a man like that certainly has what the job would take, laurels won on the field of battle, vitality, clarity of thought and the ability to seize the initiative. In Munich, Frau Annalise Schmunt telephoned my hotel. She is the widow of Rudolf Schmunt, Hitler's chief adjutant who was killed by the assassins of July 1944. It was ten years since I had first read her diaries and taken tea with her, a quiet, genteel East Prussian who has long put the bitterness of the past behind her. You're looking into the life of Rommel, she said. I met him only once, when he came to Berlin in the autumn of 1942. We had given a large dinner party, he phoned Rudolf, and of course Rudolf said he must come around. All the guests waited with excitement for the legendary Rommel to appear, and you know what? My son opened the door, Rommel asked what he had just been given for his birthday, my little boy said a train set, and they both went upstairs and played with it for the rest of the evening. 
he never came and met our guests at all. And so on the last day of September 1942, during one of Berlin's famous early autumn heat waves, Rommel marched smartly into Hitler's study at the Reich Chancellery and was handed the black leather case containing the glittering and bejeweled Marshal's baton. Behind Hitler stood Key Eitel, his adjutant Schmunt and his assembled staff. Behind Rommel stood his own aide, Alfred Berndt, who, for the occasion, had exchanged his army uniform for that of the Nazi party. At 6 p.m. Rommel was the guest of honor at a mass rally at the Berlin Sportpalast Stadium. The newsreel showed him marching past the serried ranks of the party and way back to the tribune, being greeted by Hitler, wagging his baton and then raising his arm in something between a wave and the Nazi salute. Every radio station in the Reich carried Hitler's speech of praise for Rommel. He was at the very pinnacle of his achievements. Halfway along my research trail, I found the heavy metal baton unexpectedly in my hands, after I had expectantly opened the cardboard box lying at the bottom of the grey metal cupboard in the village in Swabia. It was from this same village that Rommel set out on his last motor journey, I reflected. Such power had once been symbolized by this rod. I remember being puzzled at the stiffly worded letters in army files from his last adjutant, Captain Hermann Aldinger who was trying to establish what had happened to the cap and baton and demanding their immediate return to Lucy after that last journey. And I recalled the words used by the SS show for that fateful day to describe how he found this very cap and baton lying on the floor of the car and tried to hand them over to his boss in Berlin, Hitler's hunchbacked personal aide, Julius Schaub. Schaub said, I don't know anything about this. I want nothing to do with them. Schaub had recoiled from the baton as though it were infected by some plague. But now, in my hands, it was lifeless and inert, like a stick of worn-out batteries, or obsolete, like a device designed to operate a machine that has long since gone out of manufacture. I wrapped the baton up again and returned it to its forgotten cupboard corner. Some days later Rommel wrote to Stumm about his meeting with Hitler, both the Führer and the Duce have agreed to my intention to hold on to the positions we have won in North Africa at present, he said, and not to resume the attack until our troops have been thoroughly provisioned and refreshed and more forces have been sent out to us. Rommel added, the Führer has promised me that he's going to see that the Panzer Army gets every possible reinforcement, and above all the newest and biggest tanks, rocket projectors and anti-tank guns. Rommel had also demanded huge numbers of rocket projectiles, the 260mm mortar, the big new multiple rocket projectors called the Nebelwerfer 42 and at least 500 smoke screen generators as well. Rommel told Hitler of the crippling enemy air superiority, and he delivered a string of complaints about the Italians. Their officers and men were unready, he said, their tanks were too weak their artillery unable to fire beyond five miles. Italian troops had no field kitchens and were frequently seen begging food and drink from their German comrades. The Italians are a millstone around my neck, he said. They're useless except for defense, and even then they're useless if the British infantry attacks with fixed bayonets. No act of treachery was too mean for Rommel to blame on the Italians. Somehow the enemy had learned that he was ill, no doubt through Rome. Captured British officers, he said, had told of an Italian who had betrayed Rommel's surprise attack at Alamel Harfer. He explained the sinking of all those ships bringing him gasoline by insisting that traitors in Italy must be signaling the shipping movements to the enemy. The ordinary Italian soldiers are good, he now told his old friend Kurt Hess. Their officers are worthless. Their high command are traitors. He made a gesture of frustration. Give me three shiploads of gasoline for my tanks, and I'll be in Cairo 48 hours later. The morning of October 3rd, at Goebbels's request, he attended a press reception for international journalists at the Propaganda Ministry. As Rommel stepped into the auditorium, all eyes were on him. Deliberately he stopped with his hand on the doorknob. Movie cameras began softly whirring. Today, he calmly announced, 
We stand just 50 miles from Alexandria and Cairo, and we have the door to all Egypt in our hands. And we mean to do something with it, too. We haven't gone all that way just to get thrown back again. You can take that from me. What we have, we hang on to. At noon his plane left Berlin for Vienna and Semmering Mountain, near Wiener Neustadt, where he was to begin his cure. A few hours later he was in the arms of Lucy at last. If I don't return. 2.40 p.m., October 25, 1942. Beneath the low-flying Heinkel 111 bomber, the blue waves of the Mediterranean skim past in an endless blur. This is DHR, the Heinkel especially converted for Rommel's journeys. Lieutenant Hermann Giesen, the pilot, turns to his passenger and announces, landing in Crete in five minutes. Rommel reflects on the extraordinary events of the last two days. Just 24 hours earlier he was convalescing at a mountain villa in Austria, with Lucy, far from the troops desperately fighting street by street for possession of Stalingrad, far from the bomb-torn cities of the Ruhr, far from Egypt. He was lazing, strolling and reflecting, studying only statistical reports, such as those on the U.S. war effort, and the letters that General Georg Stumm sent him from the El Alam front. Only yesterday he sent his young aide, Lieutenant Berndt, with letters down to Rome. Berlin and the general staff were predicting a period of tranquility in Egypt. But at 3 p.m. the telephone suddenly rang in his villa. It was Berndt calling from Rome, Montgomery's offensive has begun, last night. And General Stumm has vanished without a trace. All Rommel's lingering suspicions about his enemies in Rome were aroused. Why had they left him in the dark until now? He put through a telephone call to the Wehrmacht High Command. But almost at once they telephoned him instead, and he found Hitler on the line. The Führer's voice was gruff, bad news from Africa, Rommel. Nobody seems to know what's happened to Stump. Rommel offered to fly out to El Alam at once. Are you sure you feel up to it? asked Hitler. Rommel said he did. Then stand by at Wiener Neustadt airfield, was Hitler's reply. I'll find out how urgently they need you. Rommel kissed Lucy goodbye and drove to the airfield at once. After that, silence. He waited at the airfield until the evening for further orders, until it was too dark for his Heinkel to take off. At about 8.30 p.m. the Wehrmacht headquarters in Vienna supplied him with the Panzer Army's latest situation report. Montgomery's main offensive had opened in the north, and it was expected to spread along the entire El Alam front the next day. General Stumm drove up front this morning, October 24, and was ambushed. He has been missing since 9.30 a.m., despite an all-out search. He must be presumed wounded and captured. General von Turma has assumed command of the Panzer Army. Turma was the new commander of the Afrika Corps. Rommel had yet to meet him. In fact, Hitler was of two minds, might it not be better for Germany to reserve Rommel for future employment on the Russian front, rather than rush him prematurely, still an invalid, back to Africa? At 9 p.m. he directed General von Rindelen, the senior German general in Rome, to obtain a fresh situation analysis by 3 a.m. to help him decide. Desperate with worry about his Africans, Rommel waited all night at the airfield for Hitler to telephone again. When he did, he said that the Panzer Army's verdict was that Montgomery's main offensive was about to begin, and that it would be a long, hard battle. Hereupon, according to the Rommel diary, the funeral gave the CNC the specific order to return to his army immediately and resume command. Rommel's Heinkel took off at 7.50 a.m., and he flew into Rome at 10. Rentelen was waiting on the airfield, Field Marshal Kesselring had already flown down to the battlefield. Rentelen stunned Rommel with the news that the Panzer Army only had enough gasoline left for three days battle. Rommel shouted, but when I left Africa, the army had eight days gasoline in hand. And it needed at least thirty. Rentelen coughed apologetically. You see, I've been on leave until a few days ago. Insufficient attention was paid to the supplely situation in my absence. 
Rommel raised his voice even more, then the Italians must use every possible means, including their submarines and navy, to rush supplies to the Panzer army. They'll have to start right now. At 10.45 he was airborne again. That was this morning. Now the airfield at Heraclean, Crete, is coming into view through the basket-like window frames of Rommel's Heinkel. It is 2.45 p.m. as he steps out, and the refueling tanker moves forward. General von Waldor, now commanding the Luftwaffe's 10th Air Corps from here, is waiting on the runway. His face is somber as he hands the field marshal the latest messages from El Alam. There have been heavy tank attacks by the British in both the northern and southern sectors. In a renewed search of the terrain, the body of General Stumm has been recovered. Cause of death, heart failure. As Rommel swings around to climb back aboard the Heinkel, Waldor checks him. I cannot permit you to fly on a Heinkel in broad daylight, it's asking for trouble. Rommel borrows a sleek, modern Dornier 217 bomber instead of the slower plane and takes off for Egypt without further protest. The Dornier lands at the sand-swept airfield of Casable at 5.30, where Rommel's torch is waiting. He flies on east until the darkness forces him to land, and then he continues along the coast road by car. The horizon ahead is ablaze with the flash of bombs and artillery. Again and again he asks himself, has Stum already lost the battle? Then he is back at Panzer Army headquarters, the familiar faces, the operations bus, the same barren desert strewn with stones, the same stifling heat, the same scorpions and flies, the same lean, brave troops that he left just 32 days before. At 11.25 pm that evening, October 25th, his signal goes out to all of them. I have taken command of the army again. Rommel. By the time Montgomery attacked it, Rommel's army was unequal to his in every respect and the British commander knew it. He had told his officers of Rommel's sickness, the depleted troop strengths and low food, gasoline and ammunition stocks. You have all been trained to kill Germans, Montgomery had jotted in his speech notes. So shoot tanks, and shoot Germans. Each side had eight infantry divisions and four armoured. But Rommel's were far below strength. The 15th Panzer Division had only 3,294 men instead of 9,178, for example. Sickness had disabled 10,000 of Rommel's troops. For weeks his army had been on half rations because of the supple shortage, in the last week before Montgomery's attack, they had had no fats or fresh vegetables. Instead of 46,000 German army troops, the Panzer army had only just over 29,000 that were combat fit. Montgomery's army numbered 195,000 men, and this crushing superiority was also displayed by his equipment. Rommel had only about 230 German tanks, as well as 320 Italian tanks not really worthy of inclusion in battle calculations. Facing him were Montgomery's 1,029 tanks, including 500 American-built Sherman, superior in armor and gunpower to the Panzer IV. The revival of Malta and consequent harassment of Rommel's supply routes had devastated the Panzer Army's logistics. In full battle, his Panzer army needed about 600 tons of gasoline every day, even on quiet days it required 300 tons for routine supply movements to the front. On October 13 Colonel Westfl, standing in as Chief of Staff for Bayern, who had also gone on leave, had written to Rommel that by the end of the month the stockpile would rise to 10 issues of gasoline, each of them a day's supply. He, Stum and Kesselring were all sure Montgomery's attack would fail. While many things have not gone as we would have liked, Westphal's letter said, you can be certain, Herr Feldmarschall, that if the British do attack in strength then we'll be ready and waiting for them. We're all itching to give the enemy a real thrashing. We only hope our supple lines don't let us down. And General Stum had also written, in his spiky and cramped handwriting, the Tommies are bound to attack, for political reasons they've got no choice. But they are none too happy about it. 
we're going to wipe the floor with the British. This cockiness evaporated overnight on October 20th. British aircraft and submarines, alerted by ultra intercepts, had lain in wait for an Italian supply convoy and mauled it. The cruelest loss was the tanker Panuco with 1,650 tons of gasoline and cargo for Rommel, sunk by a Wellington bomber. A series of near hysterical radio signals to Rome had followed. Westfall demanded another tanker immediately and insisted on being told when it could put into Torbruck. Back by radio came the obligingly detailed reply, encoded as always on the leak proof Enigma machine tanker Preserp in a sailing evening 21st with 2,500 tons army gasoline, arriving Torbruck early 26th. Tank Lou is unready to sail with 1,500 tons army gasoline on 25th. If tanker Preserpina arrives, tanker Luisana will sail with tanker Portofino from Taranto evening of 27th, put into Torbuk approximately 31st. Portofino has 2,200 tons army gasoline. When Rommel now arrived back, Westfall told him they were down to their last three issues of gasoline, and one of these was still 500 miles away at Benghazi. In Berlin. The general staff did not expect any major enemy attack at El Alam in the immediate future, so Colonel Rickliss, chief of foreign armies West, the intelligence branch concerned, personally assured General von Tommel as they toured the defense line early on October 23. At 9.15 that evening, Montgomery's thunderous artillery bombardment of Rommel's Devil's Garden began. Corporal Albert Botcher's shorthand text for the Rommel diary had ended abruptly on September 7, or so it seemed, as I laid aside the black exercise book in the archives in West Germany. But then during my research I stumbled on an intriguing reference to more shorthand pads, captured by the US Army, these shorthand notes were, it seems, kept by the adjutant of the German headquarters in North Africa. Writer frequently refers to the op, commander-in-chief, who is never mentioned by name. I flew to Washington, D.C., went to the archives building, obtained the microfilm copy, and excitedly threaded it into a film reader. There was no doubt, this was also Botcher's shorthand. One pad was temptingly headed, Daily Report, pad I the title that Rommel had also given his diaries of 1943 and 1944. Until late that night I cranked the photostatic printer, and when I returned to London I had the entire 458 pages in my luggage, three shorthand pads covering El Alamn and Rommel's last months in Africa. The first pad began with October 23, 1942. But what had become of Botche himself? His name is only a footnote in the works on Rommel. My search for him came literally to a dead end. A doctor in the little town where, I discovered, Botcher had worked before the war in a small savings and loan bank, wrote, a few years ago he committed suicide, he had a drinking problem. The Battle of El Alam had been raging for exactly 48 hours when Field Marshal Rommel stepped back into his headquarters truck, late on October 25th. The enemy artillery barrage was deafening. Rommel asked why their own guns had not shelled the British as they gathered for the offensive. Both General von Termer, whom Rommel found to be gaunt, ascetic, pedantic and highly unlikable, and Westfall explained that the late General Stumm had forbidden any such bombardment as an extravagance. This was a fateful error, in Rommel's view. It had enabled the enemy to overwhelm the outposts and capture German minefields much too cheaply. Thomas' view was that the enemy were building up their main focus of attack in the north and that the heavy casualties the enemy had taken from the Panzer Army's artillery were forcing them to go cautiously. The enemy's intention was obviously to use infantry to prise open lanes through the minefields, under dense smoke screens, so that tanks could break through. Between the lanes lay an almost featureless patch of elevated ground, Hill 28 high enough to be of value as an artillery observation post. This hill fell to the British during the night. During the night there was again intense artillery fire, began the Rommel diary the next morning, October 26th. 
It merged eventually in one incessant roar of thunder. CNC slept only a few hours, and was already back at his operations truck by 5 a.m. He drove forward to watch the enemy's moves through field glasses. He could clearly see the enemy digging in on Hill 28. Over the next days he launched desperate counterattacks on this hill. Rivers of blood were spilled over miserable strips of land which in normal times even the poorest Arab would never have bothered his head about, he later wrote. He was convinced too that Montgomery's main breakout attempt was coming here in the north, and his diary shows him during the afternoon of October 26 moving reserves, including the 21st Panzer Division and most of his artillery, from the southern sector, a major gamble because the Panzer Army's gasoline was already so low that he could never move them back if his conviction should prove wrong. The consequence was that the next day, October 27, Rommel was able to thwart every attempt of the enemy to break through. The Rommel diary noted, CNC once more ordered. The front line must be held. He launched his main Panzer and infantry counterattack on Hill 28 at 3 p.m. It was unsuccessful and left the assault troops in coverless terrain where they were subjected to merciless air attack. Rommel returned to his command truck, sick with disappointment. Nobody can ever know the burden that lies on me, he wrote dolefully to Lucy. All the cards are stacked against us. Even so, I hope we can pull it off. One tactical solution would have been to pull back a few miles, out of range of the enemy artillery and then lead the enemy tanks into a pitched battle, where air power could not intervene to help the enemy either. But Rommel just did not have enough gasoline for that. He had been handed the shocking news that the tanker Proserpina, with 2,500 tons of army gasoline, had also just been sunk, followed by the transport ship Turgesta with 1,000 tons each of gasoline and ammunition. Small wonder that he could not sleep that night but was beset by nightmare images of all that he had watched through his field glasses. Dearest Lou, he wrote as soon as he got up the next morning, October 28. Who knows whether I'll ever manage to write in peace to you, my darling, again. Today there is still this chance. The battle is raging. But the enemy's superiority is crushing and our own resources are pitifully small. It lies in God's hands whether I survive, if this battle ends in our defeat. The lot of the vanquished is difficult to bear. To the best of my belief I have done all I could for victory. Nor have I spared my own person. If I should not return, I want to thank you and our boy for all your love and our happiness, from the bottom of my heart. I came to realize in those few short weeks what you two both mean to me. My last thought will be of you. After I am gone, you must bear the morning proudly. In a few years Manfred will be a man and I hope he will always be a credit to our family. After this, he issued a signal, timed 850A.M. to all his commanders in a scarcely more hopeful vein. He told them this was a battle of life and death, that orders were to be obeyed without question and that every one of them was to fight to the end. Any soldier who fails or disobeys is to be court-martial regardless of his rank. The commanders were instructed to memorize the order, then destroy it. He was certain that Montgomery was about to make his main breakthrough attempt. C&C decides to transfer still more German units from the southern sector to the north, recorded the Rommel diary, leaving, apart from Italians, only weak German formations down there. By afternoon, he had seen a captured British map which confirmed that Montgomery's intention was to breach the main defense line near the northern end, then wheel northward to the coast at El Dabba. When Rommel drove forward, he could see through his field glasses the enemy massing tightly in the wedge that had been hammered at such cost into the German minefields. At 9 p.m. a thunderous artillery barrage began, and at 10 the big offensive commenced. These assault troops north of Hill 28 were General Leslie Morshead's veteran 9th Australian Division, the force that had cheated Rommel of Torbuk in April 1941. As Rommel had anticipated, this attack was driven farther into the minefields, northward toward the coast. 
opposing it was the 2nd Battalion of the 125th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, which fought with unparalleled heroism all night. Moreover, here Rommel had installed a powerful screen of anti tank guns. By dawn, the Australian attack had been halted. Later that morning, October 29, Montgomery was having to rethink his strategy. What Rommel did not know, in his Black Depression, was that this was also a day of gloom at Montgomery's headquarters. After five days and nearly 10,000 killed and injured, the British frontal assault seemed no nearer the strategic breakthrough than before. In London, Churchill tackled General Alan Brooke, chief of the Imperial General Staff. Why did Montgomery tell us he would be through in seven days, if all he intended to do was fight a half-hearted battle? Have we not got one single general who can win one single battle? He announced ominously that he would call a meeting of the chiefs of staff at midday. At the meeting, Brooke claimed that Montgomery was really winding up for a new and even bigger attack, but this was pure facade, because Brooke realized that for all he knew Montgomery might in fact be licked. In his office afterward, Brooke paced up and down. The loneliness of those moments of anxiety he wrote in his memoirs, when there is no one one can turn to, have to be lived through to realize their intense bitterness. It was fortunate that on that day I had not yet received a letter from Monty which arrived a few days later telling me what his feelings were at this juncture of the battle. In Egypt, Rommel is also pacing up and down, silently cursing the Italians and racking his brains for a way of surviving the coming crash. His battle headquarters has been moved some miles to the rear, but he has been on the battlefield all night, watching the heavy air raids, the parachute flares and the fireballs of artillery. At 3.30 am he goes for a stroll in the darkened desert, to clear his mind. The British can repeat this display of brute force as often as they wish, a voice inside him argues. They can destroy my army battalion by battalion until there is nothing left. However many British tanks and troops I kill, the balance will still tilt each day more against us. Thirty minutes later, as the first grayness of dawn fingers the horizon, enemy fighter bombers roar overhead. One thing is clear to Rommel, if and when the British do break through. His army will be encircled and exterminated if it stays here, because he can never withdraw his heavy equipment and the largely unmotorized Italian infantry at short notice to a new line. At 6 a.m., bleary-eyed with lack of sleep, he drives out to a nearby hill. He can distantly make out the wrecks of the enemy tanks knocked out during the night, but the sight does not inspire him. In fact his army has just won a four-day breathing space, but Rommel considers the battle already lost, when Balen reports back from his furlough at 7 a.m., the field marshal admits it quite bluntly. Four hours later comes the last straw for Rommel. The tanker Louisiana, with 1,459 tons of gasoline, has also been sunk outside Torbruck. It is significant that Rommel carefully conceals from his Italian superiors his developing plan to retreat to a new line. Indeed, he tells General Barbassetti at noon, it will be quite impossible for us to disengage from the enemy. There's no gasoline for such a maneuver. We have only one choice and that is to fight on to the end at Alum. But Rommel has already red penciled a new line on his map, it is 60 miles west of the inferno of El Alum. His diary this day, October 29, proves all this, 2.45 pm, CNC enlarges over lunch on his plan to prepare a line for the army at Fuca, to fall back on when the time comes, now that the northern part of the Alum line is no longer in our hands. 4 p.m., C&C discusses the plan with Colonel Westfall. That same afternoon, Rommel orders all non-combat troops to start moving back to Mersamatriu, far to the west even of Fuca. Rommel has thereby furtively begun to retreat. Rommel was not devious. Insisted Siegfried Westfall when I met him in October of 1975, a handsome, ex four star general living in luxurious retirement in northern Germany. He angrily thumped the polished dining table, so that the crystal glassware and silver rattled. Of course Rommel had a perfect right to retreat from Alum, 
as and when he wished, without informing or consulting the OKW or Hitler. I disagreed, pointing out that however sound and inevitable Rommel's decision later proved to have been, the consequences were bound to be more than local. It was a strategic decision of the first magnitude, and as such not one to be taken by Rommel alone and concealed from his superiors. It proved impossible to persuade Westphal that Hitler's mistrust of Rommel stemmed from this episode. Westphal is an officer so loyal now to the memory of Rommel that where his present memory conflicts with the diaries of 1942, he unhesitatingly pronounces his version right and the diaries wrong. The relative lull in the ground fighting lasted through the last two days of October 1942. Rommel got some sleep, his spirits lifted and he even began to hope he might pull through after all. An Italian ship had arrived safely with 600 tons of gasoline, one day's ration. Field Marshal Kesselring also came on the 30th, bringing fresh promises of airlift support. Luftwaffe transport squadrons were beginning to arrive from the Russian front. Rommel expressed his distress to Lucy the next day, it's a tragedy that this sort of support only starts when things are virtually hopeless. Late on October 30th, the Australian infantry wedged into Rommel's northernmost sector caused a minor flap by thrusting toward the coast again. Thirty enemy tanks duly reached the coast road, but Rommel stopped any further exploitation. His forces took 200 Australians prisoner and destroyed over a score of their tanks. Cavallero radioed to him Mussolini's deep appreciation of the local victory, and his confidence that Rommel was going to win the battle too. Rommel was less sure. The fight is getting on my nerves, he tersely admitted to Lucy. All this time he was stealthily preparing for the Panzer Army's sudden retreat, he was casting the fatal backward glances that no commander should ever allow himself in battle. On October 31st he tipped off those combat units like Gramach's paratroop brigade that had no motor transport, about the Fuga plan. The next morning his artillery commander General Fritz Kraus returned from a secret inspection of the proposed Fuca line, it was ideal. Steep declivities at its Kataro end would make it impossible for Montgomery to outflank it. A retreat timetable was worked out, and provisional positions in the line were allocated on the map. Ironically, now that Rommel had decided on retreat, the Panzer Army had 1,200 tons of gasoline and more was arriving each day. Even ammunition was evidently plentifully on hand in the rear. In March 1943 Kesselring sarcastically told another general, I still recall how there was a permanent outcry during the Battle of Alam that they had no ammunition, and when they retreated, 12,000 tons of it had to be blown up. What Rommel's army lacked now was truck transport, and more than that, it lacked morale. There could be no doubt that night, November 1-2, that Montgomery's Grand Slam was beginning. At about 10 p.m., 200 guns began a barrage on one narrow sector of Rommel's defenses, while wave after wave of heavy bombers pounded the same sector and targets in the rear. All that long, cold night the field marshal could see parachute flares hanging over the desert. Thomas Africa Corps headquarters was hit, all his telephone lines were cut and he himself was slightly injured, the radio waves were jammed and useless. At 5 a.m. the next day Rommel drove forward to find out what was happening. The news was that at 1 a.m. massed tanks and infantry had broken into the defense system west of Hill 28 on a 1,000 yard wide front and were pushing remorselessly through the minefields in an attempt to break out. A bloody battle was still raging in the semi-darkness there, but the German and Italian infantry holding that sector were outnumbered and outgunned. As daylight came, Rommel could see scores of enemy tank hulks in the minefields, but behind them hundreds more were lining up to roll forward into the breach. Scores of enemy armored cars had actually broken right through, like the first spray of water from the fissures that mark the bursting of a dam, they had vanished in the pre-dawn light behind Rommel's lines, where even now they were rampaging around, shooting up soft-skinned supply units. Then the dam burst. At 11 a.m. the phone rang, 
and the long expected message came to Rommel, tank masses have broken through, one or two miles southwest of Hill 28, and are advancing westward. The Rommel diary adds, Africa Corps estimates 400 enemy tanks here. Our own Panzer strength only meager after counterattacks. According to reports of artillery observers, there are about four to five hundred more tanks standing by beyond the mine boxes J and K. Rommel grabbed a hasty meal, chicken fricassee with rice, then left to fight what was to prove the last great desert tank battle of his career. Lieutenant Armbruster watched him go, and wrote, Today will probably decide the outcome. Poor Rommel, he has to shoulder too much responsibility and there's so little he can do. A cursed gang in Rome. Pray God we pull it off. Many times Rommel surveyed the battle from a hill. He snatched a few minutes to write to Lucy, things are not going well for us. The enemy is gradually battering us out of our position by sheer brute force. This means the end. You can imagine what kind of mood I'm in. Air raids and still more air raids. Between noon and 1 p.m. he counted seven attacks by bomber formations on the remaining defenses west of Hill 28. Despite its Red Cross insignia, the Big Field Hospital 288 was bombed, killing three officers. The Rommel diary records that he ordered British officers to be housed there as hostages, this is to be drawn to the enemy's attention. At 1.30 p.m. his radio intelligence unit intercepted a signal revealing that Montgomery's directive to his tanks was to turn northeast toward the coast at Gazel, halfway to El Daba, so as to cut off Rommel's forces north of that thrust. Rommel immediately decided to strip his southern front of his last reserves, he ordered the Italian armored division Ariat and the rest of his artillery to move northward to Tel el which was evidently Montgomery's interim objective. All afternoon the battle continued. The enemy's main tank forces were using American-built tanks, and greatly to the Germans' dismay, there were several hundred of a type not seen before, the Sherman. It was much superior even to the Panzer IV. It was able to open fire at ranges well over 1,000 yards, while its armor seemed impervious even to the Flak 88 gun. By 3.30 p.m. Rommel had seen enough. He had decided to start pulling back his front line that night, he announced his decision to his staff an hour later. We will hold a combat line on the Raman track, his diary quoted. CNC regards a withdrawal to the Fuca line as inevitable, since the entire northern sector of the Alum line has been lost, including all our minefields and defense works there. He reserved his final decision until General von Turmer telephoned him that evening about the battle. We have done what we can to string together some kind of defense, said Tum. The line is intact again, but thin. And tomorrow we'll have only 30 or at most 35 tanks fit for action. He added, there are no more reserves. Only 35 tanks. That clinched it for Rommel. He told Tum, my plan is for the whole army to fall back to the west, fighting. The foot units will start their move tonight. Your job in the Africa Corps will be to stand firm until tomorrow morning, and then fall back fighting, but as slowly as possible to give our infantry a chance to escape. At 7 p.m. Rommel asked for the latest ammunition and gasoline positions, both were bleak. Kraus, his artillery commander, warned him, I don't even have enough gasoline to transport ammunition from El Daba to the battlefront. Twenty minutes later, Rommel's staff began telephoning advance orders for the retreat. By 9.05 p.m. the last unit of his Panzer army had the order. The teletypes that confirmed these telephone messages all began with the same words, under superior enemy pressure, the army is preparing to withdraw, step by step, while still fighting. The distance between these clear, brisk signals and the convoluted and verbose signal Rommel sent to Rome for both high commands at midnight leaves only one conclusion possible, that he intended to conceal his retreat as long as possible from Hitler and Mussolini. An interim report that he had sent off that afternoon made no mention of his intention at all. As a first stage, 
During darkness the 10th Corps infantry would fall back from the Heimat Ridge to the old line occupied before the Battle of Alam el Hafa, while the 21st Corps infantry would begin a similar withdrawal in the center. The main retreat the next day would be screened by Rommel's armor, with the 20th Corps on the right, the Afrika Korps in the center and the 90th Light Division on the left. At what time the Italian High Command found out, in Rome, is not certain. Rommel had made thorough arrangements with Barbassetti, in Libya, to lend him truck transport that evening to help evacuate the Italian infantry. Barbassetti let him down, but Cavallero's first information came from Colonel Mancinelli, his liaison officer on Rommel's staff. Cavallero at once radioed him, please informed Marshal Rommel that Duce considers it imperative to hold present front at all costs. Supplies are coming by both sea and air, speeded up by every means at our disposal. This signal did not leave Rome until 11 a.m. the next day. From his diary it is evident that Cavallero believed Rommel still had over 250 tanks left and all the gasoline and ammunition he needed. It's his battle. He had rasped to Kesselring and Rintelen late on November 2. The unhelpful interim report that Rommel had sent that afternoon reached the high command in East Prussia some hours later. General Jodl read it out to Hitler. It stated. Despite today's defensive success, the army's strength is exhausted after ten days of tough combat against immensely superior British ground and air forces. The army will therefore no longer be capable of impeding the strong enemy tank formations expected to repeat their breakthrough attempt tonight or tomorrow. For want of motor transport it will not be possible for the six Italian and two German non-motorized divisions to withdraw in good order. A large part of these units will probably be overrun by the enemy's mechanized formations. But even our mechanized troops are engaged in such heavy fighting that only part will be able to disengage from the enemy. In this situation the gradual destruction of the army must therefore be assumed to be inevitable despite the heroic resistance and exemplary spirit of the troops. S.G.D. Rommel, Field Marshal. At about the same time, in that quiet country house in England, Rommel's signal was fed into the decoding machine. A teleprinter typed out his creed occur. Experts analyzed it, of course, it made no mention of his planned withdrawal, and a few hours later the man called C, the chief of the Secret Service, read it out over the scrambler telephone to Churchill and the select few officials allowed to know anything ultra-secret. A high official at the Foreign Office wrote in his diary, C, had news, which he phoned to me this morning which certainly seems to show Rommel is in a fix. I am inclined to think that R. is crying wolf to get more help sent him. But this certainly looks good. Toward midnight, Hitler himself telephoned one of Jodl's staff officers at the high command compound, is there any further news from Rommel? The colonel said there was not. Then telephone Rintelen in Rome, Hitler demanded, and find out. An hour later the colonel telephoned Hitler back, Rommel's final daily report has arrived in Rome. It's being decoded now and put on the wire to us. It repeats what he said in the interim report, virtually. Greatly relieved, Hitler went to bed. At 8.30 am next day, November 3rd, Field Marshal Keitel galloped into Hitler's bunker and insisted on seeing the Führer. In great agitation he handed over the teleprint a copy of Rommel's midnight report. Near the end of it Rommel had surreptitiously buried his admission that his army had actually begun to retreat, the infantry divisions are accordingly already being withdrawn during the night of November 2nd-3, it said. The sentence polaxed Hitler. Keitel explained that his night duty officers had not noticed this key sentence and had filed the teletype with routine papers. A few minutes later Rommel's routine morning report was also in Hitler's hands. It announced that the infantry withdrawal was going according to plan. Hitler clutched his head. His frustration and anger at this unexpected turn of events in Egypt were vented at Jodl's administrative deputy, General Walter Wallemont. At this critical moment, Rommel turned to me and the fatherland, he proclaimed melodramatically. 
we should have been a source of inspiration to him. If I had been awakened, I would have taken the full responsibility and ordered him to stand fast. But our Mr. Wallimont is snug asleep, while Rommel is appealing to me. He dictated an immediate message to be radioed to Rommel, one of the most famous signals of the war. With me the entire German nation is watching your heroic defensive battle in Egypt, with well-placed confidence in your leadership qualities and in the courage of your German and Italian troops. In your situation there can be no thought but to persevere, to yield not one yard, and to hurl every gun and every fighting man available into the battle. Considerable air reinforcements are being transferred over the coming days to sea in Sea South, Kesselring. The Duce and his high command will also do their utmost to furnish you with the means to keep up the fight. Superior they may be, but the enemy are surely also at the end of their strength. It would not be the first time in history that willpower has triumphed over the stronger battalions of an enemy. To your troops therefore you can offer only one path, the path that leads to victory or death. S.G.D. Adolf Hitler At 11.05 am Jodl telephoned Hitler's signal personally to Rintelen's adjutant in Rome. At 11.30 am it was on its way from the Via Enigma code to Egypt. Shortly. It was being rushed to Churchill in London too, Hitler has ordered his troops to choose between victory or death. Again Rommel had not slept. Since 6.30 pm on November 2nd, his troops had been under a terrifying air attack, with over 1,000 bombs per square mile. He lay in his truck, hearing the ceaseless roar of vehicle engines as men and materiel began pulling out of the battle zone. Burnt dictated into the Rommel diary, by evening countless trucks and tanks of the Littorio Armoured Division, packed with troops, are visible on the road as they make their individual ways back. Africa Corps reports that Littorio is no longer under officer control, it has just burst at the seams. Elements of it are in full flight. There are similar symptoms reported in the infantry of the Triest Mechanized Division. The battle is going heavily against us. Rommel wrote to Lucy in the morning, November 3rd. We're just being crushed by the enemy's weight. I've tried to salvage a part of my army, I wonder if I'll succeed. The dead are lucky, for them it's all over. I think of you both constantly with heartfelt love and gratitude. Perhaps fate will be merciful and we can see each other again. He told his staff that until the new line at Fuca was ready to occupy, he proposed to fight a running battle. He had only just enough gasoline for that. Still more supply ships had been sunk. Then at 9 am he drove forward along the coast road to his command post, leaving Colonel Westfall to mind the shop at Panzer Army headquarters. Lieutenant Armbruster sat with Rommel, colossal westbound traffic on the road. He penciled in his own diary. But the battlefront has quieted down. By 11 am the Tommies still haven't noticed we're moving out. Indeed, Montgomery's artillery was still pounding the 10th Corps' high at ridge positions, which had been abandoned several hours before. But at 11.30 murderous air attacks began on the coast road, by this time jammed with bumper-to-bumper, hub-to-hub convoys of trucks. He spent the morning at the artillery command post. The photos show him standing wearily in his open Volkswagen, his tunic creased and paunchy, his head sunk, his face morose. Colonel Balen reported that the Africa Corps had only 32 tanks left, confronting their tormentors in an open semicircle facing east near the Raman track. General von Turma told him by telephone that there were about 100 enemy tanks, including the awesome Shermans lying wrecked in front of his guns already, so the Africa Corps was not going out without a struggle. Rommel drove back to his headquarters bus. He lunched silently with Westfl, inside the bus. At 1.30 pm Major Elmer Warning, one of Westfl's staff, climbed into the bus with a paper in his hand and gave it to Rommel. Hitler's famous radio signal had arrived, the signal that ended, to your troops therefore you can offer only one path the path that leads to victory or death. As Rommel read this signal his mind fused. Something between rage and panic gripped him. 
Only 90 minutes earlier he had issued still more orders to his troops to retreat, he himself had seen the chaos on the roads, as Italians and Germans jostled to get away from the carnage of El Alam. But now Hitler had specifically forbidden any withdrawal. What was he to do? Over the next hour he drafted countless replies, Westphal recalls one as saying, for example, Mein Führer, I will obey as always but I cannot reconcile blind obedience with my own sense of responsibility. But they were not transmitted. Rommel was trapped between his loyalty to the Führer and the realities of the crisis on the battlefield. At 2.28 pm he telephoned General von Termer, his Afrika Corps commander. Termer reported, I've just been around the battlefield. 15th Panzer's got 10 tanks left. 21st Panzer only 14 and Littorio 17. Rommel tersely replied, you are to fight on to the very utmost. He read out the Hitler signal, gave Tamu authority to issue direct orders to the tanks of Ariad 2, and repeated, you have got to instill this order into your troops, they are to fight to the very limit. Tamu saw this as a reliable recipe for complete disaster and suggested withdrawing the tanks to regroup as he put it. Rommel shouted into the telephone, no, the Führer's order is, we are to stand fast to the utmost. There's to be no retreat. Tuma hesitated. All right, he agreed, that is our broad policy. But we must make minor withdrawals. Rommel approved this formula. But the signals that he issued during the afternoon to the Panzer Army's scattering units still ordered them to hold existing positions on instructions from the highest level, and that left them no room for maneuver at all. Rommel's staff, particularly Bayon, strongly deprecated this, but the field marshal had not yet learned to disobey a specific order from the Führer. More precious hours were lost while he radioed Hitler a stark account of their plight casualties to German troops in infantry, anti-tank and engineer units so far unto about 50%, and in artillery to about 40%. Africa Corps now down to only 24 tanks. Littorio Armoured and Triest mechanized divisions of 20th Corps have been virtually wiped out. To add personal emphasis to this, at 4.30 pm he packed off Lieutenant Burnt on the long flight to East Prussia to persuade Hitler to revoke the disastrous order. Berndt, as a party official, would be more likely to get a hearing than an army staff officer. Rommel also gave him secret documents to carry to safety in Wiener Neustadt first. His plane would touch down there on its way to Hitler's headquarters. Apprehensive that his army's inevitable retreat might be construed as open disobedience, at 6.40 pm Rommel meanwhile appealed to his commanders. I demand that you do everything within human powers to bring the present battle to a victorious conclusion by remaining master of the battlefield. When he telephoned Tom as chief of staff, he rubbed it in, the Führer's order rules out any kind of fluid defense. He rejected the corpse's proposed new line, and declaimed, I insist that you hold on where you are, it's vital. He regarded his army and himself as doomed as is plain from what he had just written to Lucy. I can no longer, or scarcely any longer, believe in a successful outcome. What will become of us is in God's hands. Farewell, you and the lad. Into the envelope he tucked all the money he had saved, 25,000 Italian lira, or about $60, and asked Bernd to make sure the letter reached her safely. In Munich, I found Elmer warning the member of Westphal's staff who handed Hitler's victory or death message to Rommel. He is now 69, an international banker, a towering man, six and a half feet tall, with broad shoulders and well-groomed dark hair. In a sonorous voice that boomed around the oak panels of his study, he told me about the agony of decision confronting Rommel that night. I could see him pacing up and down in the blackness of the desert near the bus, said warning. Westphal called me over, go and keep the field marshal company. I'm too busy. So I joined him for two hours, and we just walked up and down while he battled with the decision whether or not to resume the retreat. If we stay put here, Rommel said, then the army won't last three days and after a while, 
but do I have the right as C in C, or even as a soldier, to disobey an order? And then after more brooding, if I do obey the Führer's order, then there's the danger that my own troops won't obey me. After that, he exclaimed, my men's lives come first. It was on this occasion that he first said, the Führer is crazy. Armbruster had at this point stepped into Bernd's job and become the writer of the Rommel diary. When he reached the operations bus at 5.20 a.m., November 4, Rommel had just arrived too. The irony was that the battlefront had been quiet for several hours, so had Rommel ignored Hitler's order, the mass of the Panzer army would by now be safely ensconced in the new line at Fuca. But he had obeyed the order, and fate now took its course. At 7.25 a.m. Field Marshal Kesselring arrived, summoned by Rommel's staff from Rome the afternoon before to give moral support. He had been delayed overnight by engine failure on Crete. What I achieved on November 4 would have been of the greatest, perhaps even decisive, importance one day earlier, Kesselring later said, reproaching himself, initially, as is clear from his remarks to Waldor at Crete. He had intended to insist on obedience to Hitler's order. The Führer's thinking is naturally governed by the Russian campaign, he explained to Rommel now, and his experience in Russia has taught him that clinging obstinately to existing and well-built positions has always been the best thing to do. But when Kesselring learned that Rommel was now down to only 22 battle tanks, he revised his view at once. There is a transcript of their discussion among Rommel's papers, I would be inclined to regard Hitler's signal as an appeal, rather than a binding order. Rommel was horrified, I regard the Führer's directive as absolutely binding. You must act as the situation demands, Kesselring argued. The Führer certainly cannot have intended your army to perish here. It came just like a bolt out of the blue, Rommel said bitterly. And I always thought that the Führer trusted me. He would like most now to stage a fighting withdrawal, but only if the Führer expressly alters his order to me. Kesselring advised him to radio Hitler immediately, say that with your forces decimated and vastly outnumbered, the line cannot be held and the only chance of retaining at least a part of Africa lies in a fighting retreat. Kesselring promised to send a message to Hitler himself. Rommel did send such a telegram to Hitler. Meanwhile, for several hours he adhered to the standfast order. When he learned at 11 a.m. that Trento and Bologna were in full flight, he ordered the Italian officers to force their troops back into battle again. Air reconnaissance detected that the Italian 10th Corps infantry was also falling back, he repeated the order. Not long after, he had to remind the 20th Corps, your positions are to be held to the utmost. By this time he had driven forward to the Africa Corps command post, in a dugout near the 12-foot-high sand dune called Tel El Momfzra. From it, he could see enormous dust clouds towering into the autumn sky to the south and southeast, where the tanks of the Ariat division were in their death throes. Colonel Bayon came to the dugout at 12.55 pm he told Rommel that General von Turmer had put on all his medals denounced the orders to stand fast as lunacy and driven off in a tank to the focus of the battle. Bailen had driven after him an hour later and found a cemetery of blazing tanks, corpses and wrecked anti-tank guns. From 200 yards away, he had seen the general's tall, gaunt figure standing erect near a flaming tank, his little canvas satchel in his hand, as the British tanks converged on him. From Bailen's description, Rommel and Westphal were in no doubt that Tummer had deliberately deserted to the British. Westphal exclaimed, For God's sake, Bailen, keep it to yourself, otherwise Tummer's entire family will have to suffer for it. Soon after, Rommel's radio monitors heard a British unit reporting, We've captured a German general. He says he is von Tummer. That left no doubt as to the Afrika Corps commander's fate. I put all this episode to General Westphal. He revealed to me what the war diaries tactfully do not, that in a later operation Rommel's troops captured British documents, 
Among them an intelligence summary of the British Eighth Army which reported that Tom had accepted Montgomery's chivalrous invitation to dine with him that evening and had made no secret of Rommel's further plans and dispositions in their subsequent conversation. Rommel never did like that general, reflected Westfall. Still Rommel's order to stand fast was obeyed. At 3.30 that afternoon a riot's last signals were picked up. The plucky Italian armoured division had fought to the point of self-immolation. A breach twelve miles wide had now been ripped in the tottering Axis line. The entire 20th Corps had virtually ceased to exist. Without waiting for word from Hitler, Rommel now took his fate in both hands. He ordered the retreat. At 8.50 pm Hitler approved it anyway. In view of the way things have gone, he sourly instructed the field marshal in a signal that reached him only the next day, I approve your request. Thus began a harrowing retreat for Rommel's 70,000 men, a 2,000 mile odyssey. How many men would complete it? Humiliation. A week passes before Germany officially learns that Rommel's army is in retreat. A week passes before Rommel even writes home. On November 9, 1942, his secretary Corporal Botcher types a four-word message, I am all right, for Lucy, and the field marshal scribbles his name beneath it. The next day, Rommel finally writes her a letter, since the enemy's breakthrough at Alumni didn't get around to writing. When an army gets broken through, it gets a raw deal. You've got to fight your way out, and you lose the rest of your fighting power in the process. Things can't go on like this much longer because we're being pursued by a superior enemy. Few circumstances nor at the marrow of an army so insidiously as retreat. Yet Rommel will now show his great cunning in adversity. Reeling with sickness and bouts of fainting, he carries his 70,000 German and Italian troops across hundreds of miles of North Africa's harsh desert coastline, through the blistering heat of tropical day and the rainstorms and freezing nights. His 60-mile-long procession of tanks, guns, personnel carriers, trucks and cars is subjected to merciless air attack throughout. For days on end the entire movement is paralyzed by lack of fuel, while Rommel's loyal veterans fight desperate rearguard actions though thirsting for water and starving for food. The weeks become months, but then the green hills and forests of Tunisia come into view stabbing Rommel with pangs of nostalgia for his native Swabia. Your retreat has been a masterpiece, Field Marshal. Mussolini congratulates him. The Rommel diary is complete for these dramatic months. He makes the same mistakes that he has always made. He overestimates the enemy's strength. He transmits frantic inquiries about shipping movements never realizing the direct causal link between his own enigma-coded signals and the sinkings. He clashes violently with the Luftwaffe and the Italian High Command for failing to protect the supple ships. For their part, the Italians accuse him of deliberately abandoning their infantry divisions, and of purloining Italian trucks to rescue German troops from the wreckage of the El Alam line. They suspect Trommel of plotting to pull out of Africa completely. The German high command also mistrusts Rommel. He is seen as disobedient, willful, deceptive and defeatist. He hotly denies these allegations, but his intimate letters and remarks vividly portray that his mind is in commotion. He writes on November 12th, for instance, all our work in this theatre has been for nothing. I've made a superhuman effort, that's true enough. But for it all to end like this is very bitter. And on the 14th, how far we'll get, I just can't say. How will the war end? I only wish I could rid myself of these terrible thoughts. By mid-December, Erwin Rommel is writing secretly to Lucy to send him an English-German dictionary by courier. I think it's going to come in very handy. Lieutenant Alfred Berndt had reached Lucy's house in Wiener Neustadt on the afternoon of the 4th of November. He handed over Rommel's suitcase of secret papers and his letter. She was still in shock at eleven that evening, when she sat down to write to him. She could not believe what she had heard, it was all like some bad dream. How can the Lord have deserted us in our hour of need? She asked him. 
but she was glad that her husband had somebody solid like Bernd to lean on, loyal and upright, every inch the kind of national socialist the Führer wants us all to be. When Bernd returned to her from seeing Hitler, he hinted that the victory or death signal had been some kind of misunderstanding. Lucy handed him a parcel of fresh baked cakes to take to her husband, to remind him of his home and family during the coming weeks of travail. In Germany, everybody waited with her for the news from Africa. Joseph Goebbels reassured his staff at a secret conference on the 6th, we just have to hope that Field Marshal Rommel will master this situation as he has so many others before. By that time the Desert Fox had already eluded the first traps set by the fumbling and over-apprehensive pursuing enemy. His own headquarters unit had moved off after dusk on November 4. The coastal highway to their right was ablaze with burning trucks and the glare of sky flares, but most of his troops were driving across open desert too. Montgomery tried to outflank him by short, tight turns but each time the British reached the coastal road they found the bird had already flown and they had encircled nothing. By the early hours of the 6th, Rommel was driving through darkness toward Mersa Matriu, Arab villages looming up and dropping behind in the darkness. But in the morning, when Montgomery closed his main trap, his fourth attempt, just east of Matriu, Rommel had again escaped. And now torrential rain began to fall turning the desert into a quagmire stalling every enemy outflanking attempt. Here for two days Rommel took stock. The Panzer Army's fighting strength was negligible. He had only a dozen tanks left. He had lost 1,100 German troops killed, 3,900 wounded and 7,900 missing. Comparable figures for the Italians were 1,200 dead. 1,600 wounded and 20,000 missing. The Italian 10th Corps had been left at the El Alam line with no trucks, fuel or water, of the 21st Corps, half the Trento division had been overrun on October 24, the other half and Bologna had suffered the same fate as the 10th Corps, abandoned to their fate, the 20th Corps had been virtually wiped out on November 4. The Africa Corps was worth only one regiment. The 90th Light Division was down to about one and a half battalions, and only a third of the 164th Light had survived the battle. The only cheering event was the unexpected reappearance of General Ramak at Rommel's bus on November 7. Ramak swung him a snappy salute and tartly announced that he and 800 of his Luftwaffe paratroopers, written off by Rommel on the 4th, had ambushed a British truck convoy stolen its trucks and driven through the enemy army to rejoin Rommel's force. There was malicious delight in Ramuk's metallic smile. Rommel could not offer them much of a future. His supple position was desperate. 5,000 tons of gasoline had just reached Benghazi, but that was 600 miles ahead of him, there was no extra gasoline on Egyptian soil at all. There were 7,000 tons of ammunition piled up at Torbuk, 100 miles ahead, but between Rommel and Torbuk loomed the mountain passes of Solom and Half Fire, on the Libyan Egyptian frontier, and for 50 miles back from the hairpin bends, the only road was chocked solid with the traffic of the retreating army. 24 new tanks were due to reach Benghazi on the 8th, but Rommel's quartermaster warned that nothing could possibly get beyond that point, in order to reach him, for several days. Every detail of Rommel's plight was known, through the code breakers, to the enemy. On November 7 the official diary kept for General Dwight D. Eisenhower, commander of a new Allied invasion force at that very moment bearing down on the shores of Africa, recorded that Winston Churchill had just sent a very secret signal to him that a message from Rommel to the German general staff had been intercepted in which Rommel begged for aid immediately, or his force would be annihilated. On the 8th, the rains now over, Rommel decided he had to move again. He would have to abandon Mersamatru and resume the retreat. He met the Panzer Division commanders before they moved west again. Armbruster, keeping the Rommel diary in Berndt's absence, noted Rommel's instructions, keep the divisions rolling down the highway one behind the other, that way the enemy can't outflank us. 
Later Rommel told the Luftwaffe Commander General Hans Say Eidmann, the enemy will probably try to encircle us via Sidi Omar. We won't be able to put up much of a resistance, because we've hardly got any weapons. We salvaged large numbers of men from the shipwreck, but not many weapons. Early on November 8 Rommel himself headed off for the frontier. Cavallero and Mussolini were continuing to insist that he defend the frontier, and Hitler also expected this. But with his meager forces Rommel saw no prospect whatever of making a new stand there, and he told this to an emissary from Cavallero on the 6th. At noon a car brought a small, bustling major general to him, Karl Buelois, the Panzer Army's new engineer officer. Rommel told him to stop at nothing to delay Montgomery's pursuit. He assured him that Lieutenant General Count Theodor von Sponek's 90th Light Division would fight continuous rearguard actions while the engineers laid mines and demolished roads. Now the pursuit became a nightmare for the enemy, dummy minefields sewn with scrap metal alternated with the real thing, arranged with fiendish ingenuity to lull and kill and destroy and maim. Abandoned buildings were booby-trapped with explosives that detonated when lavatory handles were flushed or when crooked pictures were straightened. Airfields were unusable for weeks after the Germans abandoned them. Buelois used to deadly effect every day of respite that Montgomery's fumbling gave the Panzer Army. Buelois's name features so often in the Rommel diary that I made a strenuous effort to find him. Like botchers, the trail came to an abrupt end. Said one of his former officers in Dusseldorf, West Germany. He was always a bit of an eccentric, I got the impression that something had once happened to him, years before. He was interned by the Americans in Tennessee with Count von Sponek and myself. One evening we were sitting with him and he began screaming, they're coming for me. We calmed him down and he seemed quite normal. The next day he went for a walk with Sponek. Then that evening he hanged himself, with a luggage strap. On the road to the Libyan frontier, Rommel ran into Lieutenant Berndt, who had met Hitler late on the 4th. Berndt quoted Hitler's key message, the only thing that matters is to re-establish a new front somewhere in Africa. Precisely where is unimportant. The Führer had promised to restore the Panzer Army to its old strength, Rommel would get the entire initial production of the brand new high-velocity version of the deadly 88 gun, the Flak 41 and the first dozen of the mighty new pans of I, the Tiger tank, each weighing 60 tons. Any encouragement that Rommel drew from Berndt's report was short-lived. An hour later Rommel learned from his operations officer, Colonel Westfl, that a huge convoy had just landed over 100,000 American troops in Algeria and Morocco. Thus Rommel would always have this new enemy army advancing on him from the other direction, with virtually no other Axis forces to shield him. Now he felt that a stand was helpless and it was time to get out of Africa while he could. He radioed urgently to Kesselring to come and see him with Cavallero, as the position has continued to deteriorate. Neither came. So Rommel decided to send Berndt over their heads, quite literally, by plane to Hitler again. Berndt would put to the Führer the Field Marshal's startling plan for an immediate Dunkirk not a stand but a holding operation on the coast, to permit the evacuation of the Panzer Army from Africa. The young lieutenant saw Hitler in Munich on November 12th. Rommel's opinions were outlined in his diary of the 10th, evidently Rome still believes that Torbruck can be held. In the CNC's view this will lead to our encirclement from the landward, and the annihilation of the army's remnants within a few days. CNC is firmly convinced that with our remaining forces and weapons we cannot even hold Cyrenaica, and that we must prepare for an evacuation of Cyrenaica right now. The Gazala line affords us no support, because we have insufficient troops to man it and we would be quickly outflanked. We must resign ourselves from the start to a withdrawal clear back to the Mercer Brega line, behind which we may possibly find some respite. If it proves impossible to rehabilitate the army on a large scale and to throw out a strong cordon against the enemy forces now advancing from the west as well, 
then the C in C considers it will be best to withdraw into a defensive position in the mountains of Cyrenaica and to evacuate as many trained soldiers as possible by U-boats, little ships and aircraft at night, and ferry them back to Europe for use elsewhere. Hitler, however, had a much larger political and strategic canvas to consider. To abandon Africa, as Rommel suggested, might result in the overthrow of Mussolini, and an anti-fascist Italy would have grave consequences for the Reich. So he had no intention of allowing the American troops to exploit their invasion of northwest Africa. On November 10 he had already airlifted the first Axis troops to Tunisia to establish a new bridgehead there under General Walden Ehring, Rommel's former subordinate. Hitler accordingly gave Bernd this message for Rommel, just leave Tunisia out of your considerations. Act on the assumption that we are going to hold on to Tunisia. There is to be no question whatever of your barricading yourself into Cyrenaica and being evacuated from there. Britain's command of the air and sea rules that out anyway. The Führer's headquarters will do everything to rebuild your army via Tripoli with everything you need. Bernd repeated these words to Rommel. He tried to cheer the field marshal up, but in Hitler's own words Rommel read a veiled rebuke. I am absolutely convinced that your field marshal and his army did their utmost at Alum, Hitler had dictated to Bernd and that the command of operations there was beyond reproach. And I have persuaded myself that the Panzer Army's withdrawal to the Fuca line was only planned after the entire northern sector of the Alum line was already in enemy hands. Rommel was depressed. On the 13th he burst out to Lieutenant Arm Bruster, I wish I were just a newspaper vendor in Berlin, then I could sleep nights, without the responsibility I have now. Bernd resumed the diary, dictating to it on the 14th, in consequence of the many upsets and his interrupted cure, the C&C's health is very poor. Several bouts of fainting. Rommel had abandoned the half fire pass and even Torbuk without a fight, he had neither the troops to garrison nor the ships and aircraft to supply the Torbuk fortress as the enemy had done. He accepted its loss philosophically, after all, nobody could rob him of the fact of his victory there in June. The Italians, however, feared that Rommel was not even planning to halt at El Agla, where the Mersa Brega line afforded one of the coastline's best defensive positions. Early on November 15, General Ritter von Boll, Luftwaffe liaison officer in Rome, arrived in North Africa. It was Rommel's 51st birthday. Paul brought greetings and a big cake from Kesselring, and there was a loving letter from Lucy with a box of the chocolate and almond macaroons that were his favorite. But Paul also brought a message from Cavallero, Mussolini wants you to know that massive reinforcements are already flowing into Tunis and Tripoli, but they will take time to reach the front line. The fate of the Axis presence in Africa depends on your holding the new line at Aigla. Rommel told him the situation. The Panzer Army's Afrika Corps, its Panzer divisions, had no gasoline at all and hardly any tanks. Rommel told Paul that he needed 400 tons of gasoline every day, but on some days he was getting none at all. Yesterday, he said disdainfully, barely 40 tons had arrived. Stop fobbing me off with phony figures, he exclaimed to Paul. What I need is gasoline by the shipload. If your Luftwaffe offers to airlift certain quantities to me, then I must expect you to keep your word. I need 175 tons to enable my army to move at all. You can't just bring me 40. Meanwhile the Italians in Benghazi were indulging in orgies of destruction. The port authorities had fled, and destroyers, Submarines and tankers laden with Rommel's gasoline were being diverted to other ports. For days his vehicles thirsted, and his army lay stranded between Benghazi and Ejidabia. Waldor of the Luftwaffe, who had come with Paul, took one look at the huge convoys of trucks, jammed nose to tail along the highway as he scrawled in his diary, and fled back to Crete. Rommel confided to Lucy, it's enough to make you scream. The fate of the German merchant ship Hansa, with 500 tons of Rommel's gasoline, was typical of the grim chaos. It sailed for Benghazi, was diverted to Razel Ali by the Italians, 
and redirected by the Germans to Benghazi. From Rome Rintel and radioed Rommel, in the Enigma code, that the ship would arrive there at dawn on November 17, followed by two destroyers with more gasoline. He also reported that the ships Algerino, Marodi, Salon and Ginari were bringing fuel from Tripoli, and that the tankers Jordani and Syria were each berthing at Tripoli with several thousand tons of gasoline on the 17th and 18th. With this target list thoughtfully provided to the enemy code breakers, the enemy submarines could hardly miss. The Hansarp was torpedoed at dawn on the 17th. The next day Waldo wrote in his diary, all the tankers have been sunk. How are? Is going to keep moving now is a mystery. The Panzer army was still 600 miles short of Tripoli. It's raining and blowing hard, Rommel wrote on November 17. Our position is all but hopeless because of our lack of supplies. But we must not give up, perhaps we will still manage to get through. His air reconnaissance could see hundreds of enemy vehicles herding near Msuz, halfway across the peninsula. But the rain had drenched the desert, and many of them had sunk deep in the soggy morass, while ahead of them the desert had turned into one vast watery lake. Kesselring managed to airlift 80 tons of gasoline to Rommel, and in the two days respite granted by the rainstorms Rommel pulled out of Benghazi and escaped once more. Down at Ajadabia, the fuel crisis began all over again. Rommel ran out of fuel altogether, and Kesselring radioed him, gasoline airlift now impossible as you are out of range. Rommel anxiously radioed to his high command that in all Africa he had only 10 tons of gasoline at Burat, 250 miles farther along the coast, and 500 tons at Tripoli, even farther ahead. He demanded that Hitler be told. Camping in his little cubal automobile, with the rain drumming ceaselessly on the metal roof, Rommel brooded on the plight of his proud army. I dare not help for a favorable turn in our fortunes, he wrote sorrowfully on the 21st. But miracles do happen. And they did. That morning General Say Eidman landed nearby in his storch, ran over to the field marshal's car and shouted excitedly that from L.A. Glitter Brega the entire coastline was strewn with thousands of crates and oil drums. It was the cargo of the torpedoed Hansa, no less which fate had now spread out at the feet of Rommel's prostrate army. On these last drops of fuel the Desert Fox safely evacuated Ejidabia on the 23rd and carried his Panzer army to the Mercer Brega line. He had retreated 800 miles from El Alam, virtually without loss. Upon reaching the Mercer Brega line, Rommel surveyed it and decided it was a bad place to try and defend. He was anxious to start moving westward again but Mussolini had ordered him to make his stand here, and Hitler had agreed with him. For the next ten days, Rommel bent all the rules of diplomacy and military usage to persuade them that they were wrong. Tactically, he was right. The new line was 100 miles long, two and a half times as long as at El Alam, and he had neither the gasoline nor the mobile forces to counter a determined enemy outflanking attempt. He had only 32,000 mines compared with the 500,000 he had hit at El Alam. His troops had lost most of their heavy weapons and anti-tank guns. Behind them, as they faced Montgomery, lay a 250-mile desert highway to the port of Burat, every drop of water and gasoline, every ton of food and ammunition would have to be carried forward across this vast barren tract. Far better in Rommel's view to inflict that 250-mile stretch on Montgomery instead, by retreating to Burat, or even to Homs, almost on the doorstep of Tripoli, and making a stand there. Armed with these powerful arguments, General Giuseppe de Stefanis, of the 20th Corps, was sent by Rommel to Rome on November 20. Cavallero asked the general where Rommel did intend to halt his retreat and de Stephanes shrugged and replied, Rommel's going to keep withdrawing from one line to another, he even talks of surrendering. Cavallero was shocked. If Rommel keeps on like this, he said he'll end up in Tunisia. Cavallero flatly refused to allow Rommel such freedom, and this was confirmed, on Hitler's orders, by Guy Itel. 
the chief of the high command promised Rommel reinforcements of tanks and guns, but he once more subordinated Rommel to the little Italian governor of Libya, Marshal Bastico. Rommel repeated all his arguments to Bombastico, as he had contemptuously dubbed him, on November 22 and even warned him, North Africa cannot be held. Armbruster's diary notes. Bastico said he had no authority himself but would ask Cavallero to come over as soon as possible. A three-hour conference between four field marshals, Rommel, Kesselring, Cavallero and Bastico, took place on November 24. The venue was the Arco di Filini, the marble arch through which Mussolini's colonial armies had marched into Cyrenaica in the 1930s. Rommel was in a truculent mood. He did not want to hold this line at Mercer Brega, but kept repeating that since Mussolini and Hitler had both now ordered him to do so, it was pointless to debate other possibilities. He just wanted to place it on record that he had only 35 tanks and 57 anti-tank guns, while Montgomery would have over 420 tanks and 300 armored cars. If this Mercer Brega line is lost, he insisted, it will not be possible to organize any other resistance before Tripoli. Kesselring tried flattery. We're all full of admiration for your retreat from El Alam, he cajoled Rommel. To have brought back a major army over 800 miles along one highway, without the enemy being able to prevent you, is surely unique in the history of this war. Rommel impatiently interrupted. What am I supposed to do? he asked, if the enemy ties into my army in the next day or two on this front and then outflanks me with strong forces. He got no answer. It was at this time that a poignant episode occurred that annoyed Rommel more than he cared to admit, as Manfred recalled. Armbruster's diary recorded it on November 25, in the evening there was a movie show at Panzer Army headquarters. We saw I don't know you, but I'm in love old as the hills, but quite nice, and roses in the Tyrol. But the newsreel was a calamity, as it showed Rommel at the Berlin press reception. As Rommel saw the scene with his hand on the doorknob, we have the door to all Egypt in our hands, the blood rushed to his cheeks, and as hoots of laughter drowned the soundtrack, he realized that the same laughter must have sounded in thousands of cinemas throughout the Reich. Was his great name now an object of mockery? Marshal Bastico radioed to Rommel on November 26 that Mussolini now even expected the Panzer Army to launch limited counter-attacks on the British advance guards. On no account, said Mussolini, was Rommel to withdraw any farther without his, Bastico's, express permission. Despite this, Rommel briefed Navarini and his own Colonel Muller to prepare the army's further retreat to Burat. He put General Gustav Fenn in temporary charge of the Panzer Army. Fenn had arrived in Libya only three days before as Tumma's successor, and then he did something dramatic that was a characteristic Rommel act. Without so much as informing Bastico, he climbed into his Heinkel airplane with Lieutenant Berndt, flew north to Wiener Neustadt, where he said hello to Lucy and put through a telephone call to Hitler's headquarters in East Prussia and then flew on to land at Hitler's headquarters, 1,500 miles away from Libya, some time after 3 p.m. Kiai Tellens Jodler waited him in person at Rasenberg airfield and darkly asked him what business he had to transact with Hitler. At 5 he was shown into the conference room of the secret headquarters. The Führer was thunderstruck. His first words to Rommel were, How dare you leave your theater of command without my permission? there was ice in the air for the next hour. Hitler later ordered only one copy of the stenogram of this special conference S29-42 to be typed, it was eventually destroyed, but two long descriptions survive in Rommel's diary and the Panzer Army papers, now Rommel learned that Hitler had far more on his plate than just Libya. On the Russian front, the Sixth Army had just been completely encircled at Stalingrad and there were signs of more trouble farther north at Velikai Iluki. Supplies were being airlifted to the Sixth Army, and Hitler was planning a counter-attack under Erich von Manstein's command. Rommel's uninvited appearance from a relatively quiet theater did not please Hitler at all. 
he paid lip service to Rommel's exemplary and unique retreat, but his temper snapped when Rommel began his carefully prepared speech about his army's weakness, the inconveniences of the new line and the failings of the Italian supply organization. How many men do you have? Hitler interrupted him. Rommel answered, 60 or 70,000. And how many did you have when the British offensive began? 82,000. So, Hitler pointed out, you've hardly lost any. Rommel persisted, but we have lost nearly all our weapons. Thousands of the troops do not even have rifles. Hitler raised his voice, that is because they threw them away. Rommel's voice was rising too. Africa cannot be held, he declared. The only thing left for us is to try and transport as many Germans out of Africa as we can. This renewed plea for a Dunkirk put the spark in the powder keg. Hitler shouted, you are suggesting precisely the same thing my generals did last winter. They wanted to fall back on the German frontier. I refuse to allow it, and events proved me right. I am not going to allow it in Africa either. There are sound political reasons why we must retain a big bridgehead in North Africa. If we do not, there will be the gravest repercussions for Italy. So there is to be no talk whatsoever of abandoning Tripolitania. Your army will be given so many weapons that you can put every man possible into the front line. You must cut back your supply echelons to the absolute minimum. Kesselring must use the entire Luftwaffe strength down there to escort supply convoys. I will send an immediate telegram to the Duce, unfortunately he is ill at present, and ask him to receive Goring and yourself. At 8 p.m., with Hitler's earnest promises, of more arms, ammunition and troops, of 20 of the still secret 88 Flak 41s, and of Tiger tanks, Rommel was escorted out of the Führer's headquarters. Shortly after that he found himself in Rye Marshal Goring's opulent state train, Asia, rolling down to Rome. For the next 42 hours he unwillingly witnessed the spectacle of Hermann Goring in the flesh, dismayed as this flabby six-star general in his pearl-gray uniform, with bejeweled tie clip and matching rings fastidiously varnished his fingernails and prattled on endlessly about his growing collection of liberated paintings and sculptures. By the time they passed through Munich, where Lucy joined him, her fine features lined with worry, Rommel realized one certainty. The war was lost. In the shorthand Rommel diary is a tantalizing entry, November 29, 1942. Journey continued. Frau Rommel came aboard the train in the evening at Munich. See separate transcript of conversation. The document itself is missing, but Rommel evidently considered their confidences highly significant, for a few days later he wrote to her, I'm glad I was able to talk things over with you, my darling, about how grave things look for the future. In June 1944, facing defeat in Normandy, Rommel again reminded her, Though writing in suitably veiled terms, you can probably imagine what difficult decisions we shall soon be faced with, and you will remember our conversation in November 1942. What can it have been about? Most probably, he was pondering on how to reconcile his honor and allegiance to Hitler with a formal surrender to the British. Of that train ride, Lucy later recalled, my husband was quite shattered. They just can't and won't see the danger he said. But it is coming at us with giant strides. The danger is, defeat. And in the same breath he added, let's keep our voices down. They may even be bugging our conversation. All Rommel's intimates agree that his rowdy meeting with Hitler was a turning point in the development of his attitudes. In Goring's train, Rommel conceived a new ploy to make the inevitable loss of Libya seem palatable. Why not let the Panzer Army fall back right through Burat and Tripoli to Tunisia? There it could combine with General Nehring's new force and spring a surprise attack on the raw American invaders. He sent Burnt down the corridor to put the idea to Goring. The Rye Marshal liked it. Rommel amplified, he proposed to fall back on the Meerath line, built by the French on the frontier between Libya and Tunisia before the war. It was well screened to the south and west by salt marshes. And in Tunisia, 
He pointed out, the main port, Tunis and Bayezida, were very much closer to Italy. Besides, the country was rich in foodstuffs. Rommel could launch a joint offensive to the west, into Algeria and Morocco. The retreat from El Alam, concluded Berndt's memorandum on the idea, would suddenly appear in a new light, as a cunning stroke designed to concentrate strength in Tunisia. There would be a world sensation when Rommel suddenly appeared on the offensive in Tunisia. When the train arrived in Rome, the idea was put to Kesselring, who ridiculed it. He regarded it as one more Rommel ruse to prolong the Panzer Army's excursion since El Alam. He had ceased to regard Rommel as a fitting commander for a Panzer Army. He now accused him of passive resistance, of arbitrary actions like his senseless flight to the Führer's headquarters, of insubordination. Every fresh Rommel retreat, he protested, brought the enemy's airfields closer to Kesselring's bases. The argument raged back and forth at conferences that afternoon with Mussolini and with the assembled Italian generals the next day, December 1. The outcome was a compromise. The Duce ruled that Rommel would be permitted to withdraw yet again, but only to the Burat line, 200 miles east of Tripoli, and only when he was certain that Montgomery was on the very point of attacking Mercer Brega. There was a luncheon that day at Rome's lavish Hotel Excelsior. Field Marshal Erhard Melch, whom Goring had summoned from Berlin that morning, wrote in his private papers, during lunch Goring savagely insulted Rommel, which cut him to the quick. Rommel asked me up to his room afterward, and for several hours I tried to console him. But he was such a nervous wreck deep down inside, that he finally buried his head in my right shoulder and wept for some time. He just couldn't get over Hitler's lack of trust in his leadership. Goring sent a telegram to Hitler afterward. The Führer read it and turned to Alfred Jodl, chief of his operations staff. He says Rommel's lost his nerve, Hitler told him. Thus the curtain went up on the final act in Africa. At 6.30 am on December 2, 1942, Rommel landed back in Libya. Colonel Westphal met the plane and found Rommel a broken soul. His interpreter quietly observed in his diary, CNC seems to have been taken down a peg by Fuhrer. We've got to stay where we are for the time being. Rommel himself admitted in a brief letter to Lucy, I don't feel at all well. My nerves are shot to pieces. He was weary and apathetic, but immediately began planning for the move across the desert to Burat that would commence as soon as Bastico gave the word. The next day he got into his Storch and flew to Burat to survey it from the air but until more gasoline arrived the Panzer Army had no choice except to remain at its present position. Somehow, he scraped together enough fuel, and the first of General Ennio Navarini's Italian infantry began pulling out of the Mercer Brega line after dark on December 6. Rommel had ordered that one man must precede each truck on foot, guiding it through the darkness, and that any stray lights were to be extinguished by rifle shots if necessary. But soon Africa Corps headquarters telephoned him that the 1st Italian Division had driven out of the line with headlights blazing, motors roaring and horns honking. All night long the desert road to Burat was busy with hundreds of army trucks laden with cheering Italians, yet the British noticed nothing. By daybreak the road was again deserted. Rommel's spirits rose. The rain had stopped and the weather was warmer. He moved into a new and more comfortable trailer built by his engineers. Air reconnaissance told him that 5,000 enemy trucks and tanks were massing to attack his line. But more gasoline arrived and that night, again with headlights lit, the Giovanni Fascisti division scurried to Burat. Apparently the enemy still hasn't realized that we are pulling out, the Rommel diary observed with grim satisfaction on the 8th. There are now 7,000 vehicles confronting us. CNC is in much better spirits today. Armbruster's diary echoed this, CNC was in magnificent form, though according to Berndt it's just gallows humor. The next night the Pistoa, the last of the Italian infantry divisions, withdrew without incident as well. At any moment now Rommel expected the truth to dawn on Montgomery and an enraged tank onslaught to begin. 
he spent all day at his headquarters, waiting for the telephone to ring. It was a question of split-second timing. He wanted to zip his remaining forces back just as Montgomery's massed forces wound up for the last punch, there is nothing more satisfying than seeing a bully overreach himself and fall flat on his face. The countryside is emptying fast, said the Rommel diary. Now our supperly echelons are also pulling out. Rommel filled the hours of waiting by writing to his son. He made no secret that he might well never see him again, given the enemy's superiority and the Panzer Army's lack of supplies. He and his soldiers, he wrote, were bitter at such a finale to a heroic and often victorious fight. And now to you, dear Manfred. You know how much I love you and how much your mother and you are in my thoughts. You will soon be fourteen. Soon you will have your school days behind you. Try and see how serious life is, and learn as much as you can at school. You are learning for your own good. You may well soon, dear Manfred, have to stand on your own two feet. It was hard to write like this to a son he hardly knew. On the morning of December 10th, at Africa Corps headquarters, General Fenn warned him that Montgomery's attack seemed imminent. Enemy fighter bomber and reconnaissance activity had increased, particularly along the vulnerable southern sector. The next day British forces were seen circling south for a classical outflanking move, just as Rommel had predicted. That evening Rommel watched an entertaining movie appropriately called Shall We Dance? Toward midnight the usual methodical artillery bombardment began, as always before a Montgomery attack. German radio intelligence confirmed the intention from intercepts. Rommel issued a code flash 222 the pre-arranged signal for the remaining German and Italian armor to withdraw, at least as far as their gasoline would permit them, and then watched another aptly titled movie, What Happened That Night. When daylight came the Mercer Brega line was empty. Montgomery's artillery was still pounding away at it, but again the bird had flown. Evidently, observed the Rommel diary smugly, the enemy has not remarked our nocturnal withdrawal. Hundreds of elaborate minefields laid by Buellois and his experts awaited the probing enemy. Montgomery's vaunted offensive thus ended in a fiasco. Later that day, December 13, the Rommel diary said. The British claim to have taken a hundred prisoners. An immediate investigation by us has established that the report's untrue, we haven't lost a man. The Art of Disobedience For the next three days, from December 13 to 15, 1942, the crucial withdrawal of Rommel's Panzer divisions from the Mercer Brega line was beset by the fuel crisis. Montgomery must have been aware of it from the ultra intercept, but he signally failed to exploit it. Meanwhile relentless air attacks harried Rommel's troops. The one and only highway was scarred and cratered by bombs, the shoulders on either side strewn with blazing hulks of transport. More than once Rommel ran into dive bomber attacks, and had to hit the ditch. The next three gasoline ships were all sunk. 1500 enemy vehicles were sighted circling warily around his army in the desert, but there was enough gasoline left for only 30 miles. Said the Rommel diary, it means that the Afrika Corps has already been outflanked. Was this the end at last? The two German panzer divisions bringing up the rear of Rommel's retreat, with their 54 remaining tanks, never came closer to annihilation than on the afternoon of December 15. But General Fenn, their commander, ordered the tanks of the 21st Panzer Division to empty all their remaining gasoline into the tanks of the 15th Panzer, so that at least one division's tanks could fight on during the night and protect the other until more gasoline could be trucked forward. Thus the Germans managed once more to extricate themselves from the enemy's jaws of encirclement before they fully closed, they scattered Sherman's, armored cars and enemy troops in all directions as they burst through to the west again. That evening the enemy's Radio Cairo and the BBC were heard crowing that Rommel and his army had at last been bottled up at Nophilia, a town on the coastal highway that Rommel had in fact slipped through already and that at that very moment Montgomery was hammering home the cork. 
Rommel burst out laughing, provided we get some gasoline tonight, they're going to find the bottle empty. Radio Cairo now announced that Nazi troops trapped at Nophilia were fighting desperately to break out. The Rommel diary noted with some glee, in reality, just one platoon of the 115th Regiment got cut off. And they have managed to escape, too, leaving only their transport behind. German aircraft observed that even the road from Mersa Brega to Nophilia was deserted, so evidently Buelois's lethal handiwork and booby traps were forcing the enemy to make tortuous detours instead. And there was proof that Montgomery was also encountering logistical problems, eight American bombers landed in error at Tamit airfield, still in German hands, and were found to be airlifting gasoline from Torbut to Montgomery's leading units. The Germans did not let the gasoline go to waste. Rommel had driven off along the desert road to Burat early on December 17. The landscape here was very different. It's already spring where we are now, he wrote home. The air is spiced with the fragrance of a thousand flowers. His staff were impressed by the Burat defenses and the deep anti-tank ditch, but Rommel's eyes were, inevitably, already cast much farther west, to the Meath line, on Libya's frontier with Tunisia. He claimed that this Burat line was, like all the others, vulnerable to outflanking in the south. Most of its gun sites were empty, since he had only 160 anti-tank guns left. He had virtually no mines, ammunition or supplies at Burat. Most of his troops had only rifles or machine guns, better suited to the defense of a mountain position like Meath. The more he flew and drove up and down the Burat line, the less he liked it. Nor did he see any tactical reason to defend Tripoli any longer. The big port was already under heavy air attack. And what good was it as a port if no ships could reach it? Of eight more big ships recently bound for Tripoli, all but one had been sunk. So the arguments began all over again. He made his pessimistic views plain to Marshal Bastico on the first morning of his arrival at Burat. It all hinged on the gasoline supply. I have sixty tanks left with twelve more at Burat and ten stranded with no fuel at Tripoli, said Rommel. Many of them are the new long-gunned Panzer specials. They can pack quite a punch, provided I get the gasoline. Armbruster summarized, conference at Burat with Bastico. He too holds the view that the Burat line cannot be held, as no ammunition or gasoline has been arriving. We'll need to fall back on the Homskarian line, just east of Tripoli. He also is seemingly for a link up between the two command theatres meaning Libya and Tunisia. Bastico's report on this to Rome brought an avalanche down upon Rommel. Mussolini himself signalled him, resistance to the utmost, I repeat, resistance to the utmost will be offered by all troops of the German-Italian Panzer Army in the Burat line. The Italian High Command followed this message with an even harsher directive, on no account were the 30,000 Italian infantrymen under Rommel's command to be sacrificed like the first bunch.